All right, now welcome to lesson seven, the Foundry Fund Me. If you're on the GitHub repo associated with this course, you can of course scroll down to lesson seven here and the code is all gonna be right here. This is going to be the first code base that you actually push up to GitHub yourself. Doing this is an incredibly important step in your smart contract journey. Yes, being on GitHub or GitLab or Radical or some version control system like this is incredibly important for being a part of the Web3 ecosystem. We're gonna be using GitHub because it's the most popular at, the, at this time. So let's do a little walkthrough of what we're actually going to be building here. We're going to be using the FundMe contracts that we created before. And if we go into the SRC of this folder, you can see we have our FundMe contract in here. And you can see we're using the more advanced syntax here. We've got all caps for our constants. We're using I underscore for our immutables, S underscore for storage or state variables. And I know we talked a lot about storage and state, and we didn't really explain what it was though. And so additionally, we're gonna finally learn what this storage stuff really means. And we have an example that we're gonna go through called fun with storage. We're gonna learn how to, in a professional way, deploy this code using Foundry scripts, we're also gonna learn some really cool stuff about interacting with storage. We're gonna learn how to make it easier to deploy these contracts on different chains that require different addresses. And we're gonna learn how to use Foundry scripting to actually interact with our contracts in reproducible scripts instead of always from the command line. We're gonna learn how to make our contracts more gas efficient so that people spend less gas using our transactions. We're gonna learn a little bit more about advanced debugging techniques and more on making a professional Foundry setup. And additionally, we're gonna learn how to write really fantastic tests for our contracts. Writing tests is an essential piece of becoming a powerful and effective smart contract engineer. So a lot of this lesson, we're going to be writing awesome tests. When you get to the end of this project, you should 100% push this up to your personal GitHubs and share this on Twitter, on LinkedIn, on Lens Protocol, whatever, because this is going to be a huge, huge step in your journey. And, and at the end of this, you're gonna understand what all of this code does and be able to use it and talk about it effectively. So with all that being said, let's go ahead, let's jump into the code and let's start building our Foundry FundMe. All right, so here we are in our VS code and we're in our Foundry F23 folder, which if we type LS right now, we just have our Foundry simple storage. This is the only folder that we've created. So let's create a new one. We'll do MKDIR, which stands for make directory, Foundry fund me F23 and hit enter. Now, if we hit LS, which stands for list, we can see these two folders and we can type code Foundry tab F U N D tab and it'll auto complete and we'll hit enter. And this will, will open up a new VS code in that folder, which of course is going to be blank. Now, if I pull our terminal back up, we can run and we pull up the Explorer. We can run our command to initialize a blank foundry project. So we can do, of course, forge init or forge init dash dash force. And we get our basic project set up here. Fantastic. So we have some tests, SRC and scripts. We know what SRC is. We haven't worked with tests, but we have worked with scripts. Most of the time, Foundry will come default with this counter thing. And if your Foundry doesn't come with these, don't worry, just watch for now. But if it does, you can play along with me. If we look in SRC or source, we see this counter.soul contract. It's a very basic contract. We have a set number, which takes a uint256 new number as an input parameter and changes this storage variable to whatever that new number is. We also have this function increment, which just uses this plus plus syntax. This plus plus syntax is equivalent to saying number equals number plus one. So whenever we see plus plus, that's the same thing as number equals number plus one. We have a script here, which doesn't really do a whole lot of anything, but we have this test, which we haven't talked about. Testing our smart contracts and testing our code is absolutely essential to being a top blockchain engineer. You'll see out throughout the rest of this course, we're actually gonna spend a decent time inside of this test folder, inside of this test file, testing our code, testing our smart contracts. And if you run forge test, 
in your terminal and you do have this counter.t.sol, what it will do is it'll compile all of our code and then it'll run these tests from this test file. So we see two tests pass for this test file and they're gonna be test increment, which is a function here, and test set number. What the test keyword does is it runs this function in our test file, it runs all the code inside of here, and it checks to see if some assert is accurate. So what this test does is it first calls this setup function, so it, it'll deploy a new counter contract, sets the number to zero, and then increments that number by one, and then we check to see, okay, well, is the new number of counter equivalent to one. So this assert equals saying, hey, is this equal to this? And since we incremented the number by one, these do indeed, this is indeed true, these two are equal. So that's kind of the basic rundown of this test file. We're gonna be going over it a lot more very soon. So to keep going, let's go ahead and get this set up the way we want. We can delete the three counter files because we don't need them. We're gonna be using our own contracts. Now for this section, we actually wanna start from lesson four, Remix Fund Me. We don't wanna copy paste from our Foundry Fund Me. This is because we're actually gonna modify our Foundry Fund Me a little bit to make it a lot easier to write tests and interact with. So for now, we wanna to go to the Remix Fund Me and copy paste the contracts from here. So we'd come, copy this whole thing, go to SRC, let's create a new file, we'll call this fundme.sol, paste it in here, paste it into fundme, and then go back, we'll go over to price converter, we're gonna do the same thing, we're gonna copy this whole thing, we're gonna make our price converter.sol, paste it in here like that. And all right, great. Now, if we try to compile this right now though, forge build or forge compile, you'll see we get some errors. We get a few errors. Una we see compiling, unable to, resolve imports at chain link contracts, blah, blah, blah. It's having a hard time with both of these imports. In Remix, when we do this at chain link slash contracts, Remix automatically reaches out to the NPM package repository. However, Foundry doesn't do this. We need to be very explicit and tell Foundry exactly where we need to pull our dependencies from. And we actually need to download this directly from GitHub. There's a package out here called Smart Contract Kit slash Chainlink Browning Contracts that has all of the contracts that we need. And this is the GitHub repository that we're gonna pull from. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna copy this link and go back into our terminal. And we're gonna say, we're gonna install this dependency with forge, install. And actually we don't need the whole link. We just need the name of the org and the name of the repository. So it's gonna be smart contract kit slash chain link brownie contracts. Forge install, paste that in here. And most of the time, you're also gonna to wanna to add this dash dash no commit. And just to make sure that we're working on the exact same version, you can also add this at sign here and choose a version in the releases tab. I'm gonna use 0.6.1 since that's the latest version, 0.6.1. For now, just auto default to adding this dash dash no commit. You'll learn about why we need to add that later. But let's go ahead and hit enter. And now it's gonna say installing Chainlink Brownie contracts and it'll give you the path to where we're actually installing them. If we go to our explorer now and we open the lib folder, we can see we now have Forge STD, which comes default with Foundry, but we also have Chainlink Brownie contracts. And if we click into here and we click contracts, we can see all the list of all these contracts that come with downloading that package. So now we have all these contracts locally in our own environment. And in here, of course, is gonna be our aggregator v3 interface.sol. It's in contracts, src, v0.8, interfaces, aggregator v3 interface.sol. So we can go ahead and import from here, but we need to do one other thing. Right now, in our contract, we're saying, import aggregator v3 interface from at chainlink slash contracts, we need to tell Foundry that at chainlink slash contracts should point to this lib folder. So we need to create something called a remapping. In our foundry.toml under profile.default, we can create a new section called remappings equals, and we'll do this for now. And if you wanna see the entire list of possibilities that can go in here, 
you can click this link that comes with the repo, which brings you to this config section. And it has all these different endpoints and all these different parameters we can use in our foundry.config. Yep, there's a lot of them. But in this remapping section, we're gonna put some text. We're gonna tell Foundry, hey, anytime you see at chain link slash contracts, that should equal, or you should redirect, or you should point to the lib slash chain link brownie contracts slash contracts folder. So we're saying, hey, Foundry, if you see this, replace it with this. So in fundme.sol, it's equivalent to us swapping this out with the path to chain link brownie contracts in the library. Cool. Now, of course, if we try to compile, we clear, forge build or forge compile, we still get an error because we can't find price converter.sol. So let's do the same thing. Let's go back to the GitHub repo associated with this course. Go to SRC, price converter, and let's copy this whole thing. Folders, new file, price converter.sol. And we'll paste it in here. Now we'll hit clear. We'll do forge build. And awesome, compiler runs successful. We can see we've got our little out folder with all this stuff in here about all the compiled stuff. Fantastic. All right, great. Also, so it's a best practice when you name your errors, you name them with the contract name and then two underscores. This way, when you do get this error, you can very easily tell what contract it came from. In this case, it came from the FundMe contract. So this is just a nice convention for error handling. So now we have our contract actually compiling correctly. Next, normally we'd go ahead and write our deploy script, but let's actually get used to writing some tests. And we're gonna refactor these tests a couple of times. So stay with me here. You ready? All right, let's write our first test. Now, like I said, tests are absolutely critical for our smart contract development journey. And if you try to deploy your smart contracts without tests or go to a smart contract auditor without tests, they're gonna turn you away. You absolutely are not writing mature code if you're not doing tests. And writing badass tests separates a lot of the mediocre devs between the really good devs. So let's write some badass tests. For now, we're just gonna go ahead and we'll create a new file. We'll call it fundmetest.t.sol. This .t.sol is just a convention in Solidity for saying, hey, this is a test file. So fundmetest.t.sol. And we're gonna write our tests in here in Solidity, exactly as we would write any other Solidity contract. So we're gonna get this started the exact same way we get anything else started. So we'll do SPDX, license, identifier MIT. My GitHub Copilot automatically recommended that. So I just went ahead and hit tab, drag my Solidity, GitHub Copilot again, give me some decent recommendations. And then we can say contract fund me test. Now the Forge standard library has a couple of standard packages or standard contracts that we can import to make running our tests easier. That assert command, for example, is something that Foundry automatically has built in. So for now, we'll do import test from std slash test.sol. And we'll say fund me test is test. So we're, we're going to inherit everything from this test contract. And if you command click into here, you'll see this abstract contract test is a whole bunch of other stuff. And these are all different contracts that help us write our tests. So what's the first thing that we should do when we write our tests? Well, we want to test that our FundMe contract is doing what we want it to do. So one of the first things that we're going to have to do is actually deploy that contract. Now, pretty soon, we're going to learn how we can actually import our deploy scripts in here to make our deployment environment the exact same as our testing environment. But for now, we're going to just deploy our contracts right in this test folder. So we're gonna say function setup external like this. And on all of our tests, the first thing that happens is this setup function. And then here is where we're going to actually deploy our contract. Now I do wanna show you something though. Here's what one of our tests is gonna look like. We're gonna say function test demo. We'll make this public. I'm doing this just to have a demo test. If this is your entire test file and you pull up our terminal, and we run forge test, you'll see it'll run this and everything will pass. Oh, I should spell external, right? Now, if we run this, we'll see compiler run successful and we'll see test demo went ahead and passed here. 
However, setup always runs first. For example, if we have uint256 number equals one, and then setup, we say number equals two, and then we run test demo, where we say assert equals number in two, there, and run our test, we'll see this indeed does pass. So we first run our setup function, and then we run our tests. Another way to actually test this and actually do some debugging is using something called console.log. So if you control click, if you command or control click or just command P to test.sol, this test.sol is a huge file. And another library that it comes packed with is this thing called the console. If you go to the forge documentation, it talks about this thing called console logging. And we can actually do print statements that will print stuff out from our tests and from our smart contracts. So if I import this console into here, and then I do function test demo public, and I do console.log number, I should get printed out to our terminal, the number associated with number, which should be two. I can also do something like console.log hello, with an exclamation mark. Now, if I pull up the terminal, let's clear what we have so far, and we run forge test dash VV, this dash VV specifies the visibility of logging in this test. We can have one, two, three, four, or five. We're just gonna go with two right now. We should see those two logs output. And we do indeed. We see a new section of our output here where we have logs and we see two and hello. We minimize our terminal. We change this to, hi mom. Pull up the terminal, run it again with the dash VV. We now indeed see two and hi mom. And this can be an easy way for us to start debugging, but it's something I wanted to show you just to show you again, hey, this runs first and then this runs. We're gonna leave console in here for now because you're likely gonna wanna use it later when you run into issues and when you start debugging yourself. All right, great. So now we know how to write a basic test and how the test actually gets set up and we know a little bit about console logging. Let's go ahead and let's deploy our contract in this setup function. So in order to deploy it, we're gonna have to obviously have this contract know about it. So we're going to say import fund me from, we're going to go down a directory. So we're going to go, so the two dots stands for going down a directory because this is in fund me. So we go down to, to this overall file and then we're going to go slash src slash fund me dot soul and GitHub Copilot and VS Code are actually even helping me out a little bit there. And now that we have our fund me, we can actually deploy this in our setup. And then actually let's get rid of these lines because we don't need them anymore. So in our setup now, we're gonna say fund me, fund me, right? And so this has a capital F, this has a lowercase f, these are slightly different, equals new fund me. Fund me, fund me equals new fund me, right? A little confusing, but we're saying our fund me variable of type fund me is gonna be a new fund me contract. And if we go to our fund me, we go to the constructor here, we can see that it doesn't take any input parameters, so we can actually just go ahead and deploy this as we see fit. Those of you watching though, know that this address here only works for Sepolia, and we'll see how we can work with this in a little bit. But we've actually deployed our FundMe contract like this. Now in our demo, we can test this FundMe contract, and we could pick a function or a public variable to check to see if what we're working with is good. So for example, since minimum USD is a public variable, we could check to see if the minimum USD is indeed five or five times 10 or it's the 18 or just, you know, five E 18. So what we could do in our test demo, we could see, we could change the name of this to test minimum dollar is five. I like to make my test names very verbose to explain exactly what they're gonna be doing. But in this function here, we would then call this minimum USD function and make sure that it's equal to five or five E 18. In order to call this, we need access to this fund me. And since it's scoped in this setup, let's go ahead and make it a storage or state variable by putting it up here and initializing it in the setup. So now that we've scoped it in this entire contract, we can now do fund me dot minimum USD. And this test contract gives us access to this assert equal function, and we can just wrap our whole test up like this. So now that we have this, we can pull our terminal back up and run forge test. And fantastic, we see compiler run successful. Test minimum dollar is five. 
is now passing. Great. If we change this to six, we should see that actually fail. So running forge test now, we'll see that it indeed failed because the starting minimum USD is five and we're trying to check to see if it's six. So let's change this back to five, clear the terminal, rerun the terminal and boom, compiler run successful. Awesome, you just run your first basic test. Great job. When you're working with systems where you don't have to work with any external contracts, just continuing to write your tests like this is a great practice. And with the advent of AI, we can go even further with this. So let's go ahead and write another test. Maybe let's check to see that the owner is actually the message.sender. So what we'll do is we could say function test owner is message sender public. And we could say assert equal. And this is the other good thing about writing very verbose tests. It gives GitHub Copilot a better idea of what you want to do. I'm actually going to go ahead and hit tab again here, but assert equal message dot, excuse me, assert equal fund me. I underscore owner is equal to message.sender. What I can do now, let's go ahead and write forge test. Compiler successful. Uh-oh, it looks like this actually failed. How can we find out why this failed or what's going on? Well, we can do a lot of different things here. We learned recently about console.logs. So we could console.log out the actual owner and console.log the message.sender as our starting point. So let's go ahead and clear that. Rerun forge test with two Vs so that we can see our console.log outputs. Huh, we can see that indeed, these are two different addresses. The reason they're two different addresses is technically in our setup function, the fund me test is the contract that deployed our fund me address and would be the owner. Down here, our message.sender is whoever's calling the fund me test. So it kind of looks like this. Us is calling fund me test, which then deploys fund me. Up here, this fund me bit is basically us calling to fund me test, which then will deploy the fund me. So the owner of fund me is actually fund me test and not us. Down here, we shouldn't be checking to see if message.sender is the owner, but we should be checking to see if fund me test is the owner. So instead we could say address this and delete these. Let's see if that works. Aha, that's exactly what the issue was. Great job. So you'll see how using some of these console.logs can be helpful. And like I said, we're gonna continue to find more and more helpful ways to write tests. But let's take a pause on these tests for now because we're gonna come back to them and refactor them pretty soon. If you've written just these tests, great job. And if you wanna even pause and try to write some more tests yourself, feel free. But we're actually gonna run into an issue. One of the issues is that we're hard coding this contract address in here. And this contract address only exists on Sepolio, but we're testing on not Sepolio, we're testing on our local chain. So how are we gonna deal with that? Keep that question in the back of your mind as we continue with this section. Let's go ahead and let's move on to writing our deploy scripts because we know that we're gonna to have to deploy this at some point anyways. So let's go ahead and let's write a new file called deployfundme.s.sol. Remember the .s is a convention that we use to say something is a script. And in here, we're gonna do the same thing, spdx, license identifier MIT. I went ahead and hit tab. Feel free to slow me down if I'm talking too fast or the tabs are too fast. Copilot also gives me the pragma solidity. Now we're gonna say contract deploy fund me like this. And remember, since we're using a script in Foundry, we're gonna to need to import script from forge std script.sol once again. GitHub Copilot, thank you for letting me just hit tab. And of course, since we're deploying fundme, we're gonna to need to import fundme from dot dot slash src slash fundme.sol. Great. As we know, in order to run a script, we're gonna say function run. And remember, if this is confusing to you, feel free to go back to our lesson six to remember how we did this before. This is gonna be an external function. And in here, we're gonna say, vm.start broadcast fund me lowercase fund me equals new fund me and then we're going to say vm.stop broadcast 
And we can go ahead, try to make sure this runs by running forge script, script, deploy fundme.s.sol. Oops, it's saying I can't find the VM keyword. That's because we need to do is script. It's clear, let's redo. Unused local variable. Oh, we actually don't even need this line. We can just say new fund me. We don't love warnings. So let's just do this again. Hopefully we get no warnings. And great, compiler runs successfully, script ran successfully. If you wish to simulate on-chain transactions, pass an RPC URL. So, fantastic. Now, what's one of the most important pieces of our FundMe that we should absolutely get right? Well, obviously the funding. We wanna make sure that this conversion rate is actually working. And in order for this conversion rate to actually be working, we need to make sure that we're actually able to get the version from our aggregator v3 interface. We're able to interact with them correctly. Let's use this get version function to try testing if our price feed integrations are working correctly. We know from Remix that this get version should return version four. So what we can do is we can go back to our test now and write a, a new test. We can say function test price feed version is accurate. Like this, and we'll say now, We'll say fund me dot get version like this. This should return four and it's a UN 256. So we could say UN 256 version equals fund me dot get version. And then we could say assert equal version four. What do you think will happen when we run this test? Do you think this will pass? Go ahead, pause the video and write down what you think will happen. Well, when we run forge test, we actually get an EVM revert. Huh, why did this revert? We don't really have that much information. Now, something that's really annoying is that we're still running these tests and we don't care about them. So what we can do is we can double click this function, copy it, let's clear the terminal. We can do forge test dash M, paste this in here, and now we'll only run that single test. Awesome, but we still don't have that much detail in here. Okay, let's clear. Let's change the visibility using two Vs. Okay, that didn't really do anything. Let's use three Vs. Oh, now we got some more information here. It looks like we get a what's called a stack trace of the error that we're getting. And it looks like we're calling our fund me test. We're calling this test price feed version is accurate. We're calling get version and that get version is reverting. It doesn't tell us why it's reverting but we know that it's reverting because we're calling a contract address that doesn't exist. Remember, when we run tests in Foundry, when we don't specify a chain, Foundry will automatically spin up an Anvil chain and then delete it right after the test is done. So when we run forge test and we don't give it an RPC URL, it's gonna spin up a completely new blank Anvil chain and run our tests. And we're making a call to a contract that doesn't exist. So obviously we're gonna get an error because nothing exists at that address. So what can we do about this? Well, we can do a couple of things. And in this course, we're gonna talk about four different types of tests. Unit, integration, forked, and staging. Forked can kind of be considered like a unit slash integration add-on, but I think it's important to call out as something a little bit different here. This is something known as a unit test. A unit test is where we test a very specific piece or a specific part of our code. For example, here, we're testing a single function. We're testing get version. We're testing to make sure that works correctly. So that's gonna be considered a unit test. However, one could argue that it's also an integration test because we're testing this function works and this function actually calls out to another contract. So in this case, we're testing actually multiple different contracts are working correctly together. A forked test is when we test our code on a simulated real environment, and we'll talk about this soon. And staging test is actually when we deploy our code to something like a testnet or even a mainnet and run all of our tests in that real environment to make sure things actually work correctly. These are all important and they have different trade-offs and they have different best times to use them. For the purposes of this course, we're gonna focus on number one, kind of number two, and especially number three. We're not gonna to do too much staging tests in this course. However, it is definitely something important, definitely something to consider. I've seen protocols skip this step and get screwed because 
their production environment was completely different than their testing environment. And I'll explain what this actually looks like in a little bit. But let's go back to the problem that we're working with here. What can we do to work with these addresses outside of our system? How do we test our test price feed version when we're working with Forge and Anvil? Well, one thing that we can do is when we run our command here, we can pass what's called a dash dash fork URL. And we can go back to Alchemy, we'll sign back in and go to our, we'll grab our API key. And just so that we'll have it, we're gonna create a dot env. We're gonna say sepolia rpc url equals that. And we're gonna make sure the dot env is in our dot get ignore. Okay, great. And then actually let's run source dot env. So now if we run echo sepolia rpc url, we see that we're successfully using this as an environment variable. But if we hit up a couple times, we can now run this test price feed version is accurate with a dash dash fork dash URL, dollar sign Sepolia RPC URL. This is how we access our Sepolia environment variable. And what will happen is Anvil will actually get spun up, but it'll take a copy of this Sepolia RPC URL. It'll spin up an Anvil but it'll simulate all of our transactions as if they're actually running on the Sepolia chain. So it'll pretend to deploy and read from the Sepolia chain as opposed to a completely blank chain. So if I run this now, what do you think will happen? Whoa, we see we go ahead and we get an okay here. We can see we're getting returned the hex value of four, and we can see that in our test here, we're actually getting four returned. And if we go over to our alchemy node, we hit a little refresh here, we could scroll down and we can see recently, we made a whole bunch of calls to our alchemy node. When we use a fork URL, we're gonna simulate what's on that actual chain. And this is a great way for us to easily test our contracts on an actual network. Now, the downside of doing these forks is that you're gonna make a lot of API calls to your alchemy node, which can run up your bill which is why I still think I still think it's important to write as many tests as possible as you can without forking. But there's going to be a lot of tests that you have to run that can only be done on a fork or using mocking. to Make sure that we get plenty of coverage to test all of our contracts. And that's another interesting thing that you hear me talk about is coverage. So if we delete all this, we can also run this thing called forge coverage. And then if you do dash dash RPC URL or fork URL, those are the same thing. And we can actually see how many lines of our code are actually tested. So if our unforged coverage with fork URL, we'll run our entire test suite, and then we'll actually see how much of our test suite, how much of our code is actually tested. Right now, as you can see, a lot of our code is read and not tested, right? Fundme.soul has barely any tests. Price converter .soul has barely any tests. We want to get this up as high as possible. Now, sometimes it's infeasible or doesn't make sense to bring this up to 100%, but 16% is incredibly low. As we're continuing with this course, I'm not always going to write tests that bring us up to 100%. And the times that I don't, it's on you to actually try to see if you can bring the number up higher or if it even makes sense to bring the number up higher. But in any case, we're going to set up our contracts here to write an elaborate set of tests so that we can maximize our test coverage. We can write unit tests, integration tests, fork tests, and staging tests, and all that good stuff. And if this is a little bit confusing to you right now, this is one of these times when I am gonna say, don't worry. The more we work with it, the more that it'll make sense to you. Just continue to follow along with me for now, and it'll become clear as we do more of it. Now, the thing is, we wanna make this process even more robust. Right now, our contracts are hard-coded so that this will only work for Sepolia. Sepolia is the only chain that we can deploy this contract to, and it's the only chain that we can actually test our contracts on. That's incredibly restrictive. And if we were to go to change our minds and deploy to a different chain, we'd have to refactor our entire code base. We'd have to consistently update all the addresses in here, both in FundMe and, of course, in our price converter. And it could take a lot more work to get that done correctly. So what we really wanna do is we wanna make it such that whenever we deploy our contracts, we deploy them in a way that's modular with addresses or external systems. 
If we deploy our code without hard-coded addresses like this, we can actually make our deployments more modular, deploy to other chains much easier, and actually test much easier no matter what chain we're working on. So we're actually gonna do a little bit of refactoring of our core code base so that it's not just hard-coded to Sepolio. So let's go back to the fund me. Oh, and we actually wanna do, looks like I copied this wrong. This should be fund me underscore underscore not owner like this. But let's come back to the fund me and let's update this so that we're not hard coding the address here. What we can do is we can actually pass a constructor parameter so that whenever we deploy this contract, we deploy it with the address that we wanna use. And this address will depend on the network we're actually deploying to. When you go back through your code, and you change the way it's architected, but you don't really change a lot of the functionality, that's something called refactoring your code. Refactoring is something that's really good for engineers because it helps keep your code maintainable moving forward. So in our constructor, what we can do is we can pass an address price feed as a constructor parameter. And up here, where we have our state and storage variables, we can create a new one, aggregator v3 interface, private s underscore, price feed. And then what we can do is in our constructor say s price feed equals aggregator v3 interface price feed. So now down here where we're hard coding the address, we can actually just go ahead and delete this whole thing and do s price feed dot version. Call the version function directly on our price feed variable that we're passing in. And additionally, in our price converter, we can update this function to take in an input parameter for this price feed address. So for get price, we'll just say as an input parameter, it's gonna take aggregator v3 interface price feed. We're gonna actually just delete this line. And then for get conversion rate, we'll have it also take an aggregator v and v3 interface price feed. And then for this get price here, we'll just pass it the price feed as an input parameter. Now back in fundme.sol, when we call get conversion rate, we will pass in this price feed here. So I know we just did a lot of refactoring, but let's recap. When we deploy this contract now, we're gonna take as an input parameter this price feed object. If we were back in Remix and we were to copy paste this into a Remix here, let's go ahead and copy paste both of them, both the price converter and the other one. Let's compile FundMe, looks good. And we were going to go deploy FundMe we now see in this deploy box, we have this address price feed as an input parameter. That's exactly what we're gonna be doing when we deploy our FundMe contract here. We're gonna pass it a price feed. And this price feed is gonna depend on the chain that we're on. So if we go back to our deploy fundme.sol, we now actually have an error. It's saying, oops, wrong argument given. You need to pass a price feed in here. What we could do is we just stick the price feed in here and now, and it should work. Of course, in fundme.test, we're also gonna have to go and stick the price feed in here. And this is where you're seeing there's kind of a lot of work happening every time we update how we deploy this, right? If I update how I deploy in my script, I'm also gonna have to update how I deploy in my test. That's too much work. And remember, we're engineers. We wanna do as much work as possible to be as lazy as possible. Additionally, if maybe we update something in our deploy script over here and we forget to do it over here, that means we're not gonna be testing our deploy environment. So how do we set this up so that anytime I change the way I deploy my contract, I don't have to also change the way I do my setup function? Well, what we can do, instead of deploying our FundMe contract ourselves in here, we can just call out to our deploy function over here. So let's update this, this a little bit. Let's instead, in our FundMe test, let's just import our deploy fund me contract from dot slash script slash deploy fund me dot s dot soul. And let's just use our deploy fund me so that we always deploy in our test setup the exact same way we deploy in our script. So let's update our run function to instead return a fund me contract. And now we'll say fund me fund me equals new fund me. And we'll say return fund me. I know there's a lot of uppers and lower cases in here. Make sure we have it right. Returns. And what we can do is in here, instead of doing this line, we could say, we'll first create a new deploy fund me contract. Deploy fund me equals new deploy fund me. Because remember, deploy fund me is a 
solidity contract. And then we'll say fund me equals deploy fund me dot run because run is now going to return a fund me contract. So now that we have this set up, all we have to do is update how we deploy in here and our tests will deploy it the exact same way every single time. This is us being much more intelligent with the way we approach the architecture of our code base. Awesome. And once again, I love saying this, but by you learning this, you're already better than half the Solidity developers out there. So great job. Excited that you learned this. And just to make sure everything's working, let's go ahead and run forge, test, dash dash fork URL, Depolia, RPC URL. Let's make sure everything's working correctly here. And it looks like we broke something in our refactoring. So this is good. We broke test owner is meshed sender. Ah, well, the reason that failed is because now our deploy fund me contract over here is actually doing the deploying. And when you do this vm.start broadcast, this makes the funder actually message us sender again. It's a little bit confusing. This is one where you don't have to worry too much about it right now. But just know that instead of doing address this now, we can actually go back to message.sender. And now if we run our test again, great, we can see everything passes. Fantastic. Now, the next piece that we're going to do is going to also help it help us so we don't have to always be making calls to our alchemy node here. We don't want to have to run up the bill every single time we run a test suite. We want to be able to do everything locally for as long as possible and not even have to make any API calls to alchemy. We do want to absolutely test our fork URL, but maybe not all the time. So let's go ahead and clear let's hide the terminal and let's keep going. And this is why it's good to have some tests before you even start doing refactoring. This way you can make sure you don't break anything in the process. But all right, great. So how can we update this now? We said before the whole purpose of this refactoring was so that we wouldn't have to hard code an address in here. And psh, sure enough, here we are, we're hard coding an address in here. This still only works with Sepolia. If I try to run this test without a forked chain, it's just gonna fail, right? Because this test price feed version is accurate, needs to make a call to a contract that exists. So what can we do? We can do something called creating a mock contract. On our local Anvil, we can deploy our own fake price feed and interact with that for the duration of our local tests. And that's what we're gonna do right now. So to work with these mocks, we're actually gonna go ahead and in our script folder, we're gonna create a new contract called helperconfig.sol, excuse me, .s.sol. And in this contract, we're gonna do two things. Number one, we're going to deploy mocks when we are on a local Anvil chain. And number two, we're gonna keep track of contract addresses across different chains. For example, Sepolia ETH USD price feed has a different address or mainnet ETH USD has a different address. And if we set up this helper config correctly, we'll be able to work with a local chain no problem and work with any chain we want no problem. So let's go ahead and let's do this. So this is a contract. Once again, we're gonna need to do the SP SPDX license identifier MIT. Once again, I'm using GitHub Copilot, which just let me do it by hitting tap. We're gonna do pragma solidity 0.8.18. I hit tab again. Thank you, GitHub Copilot. Contract helper config like this. And this helper config is gonna be a script, which is why we have this dot s dot soul to signify it's a script. So to do that, we're gonna do import script from forge std slash script.soul like this. And like I said, what this is going to do, we're going to say, if we're on a local Anvil chain, we're going to deploy these mock contracts for us to interact with. Otherwise, let's grab the existing addresses from the live networks. So let's go ahead and create this helper config, which is going to set this up for us so that we don't have to hard code this address in here. And our test will work no matter what we're on, a local chain, a forked chain, or a real chain. So first, let's create a function. Function, and we're going to call it get Sepolia ETH config like this. This is going to be a public pure function. And what this is going to do is it's going to return a configuration for everything we need in Sepolia or really any chain. All we need in Sepolia is going to be the price feed address. However, we're probably also going to want one for function get anvil ETH config. 
public pure, which is also just going to need a price feed address. But what if we have a whole bunch of stuff we need? Maybe a price feed address, a VRF address, gas price. What if we've got a ton of stuff in here? Well, this is where it's a good idea to maybe turn this config into its own type. And how do we create types? You got it. That is with the struct keyword. So we're going to create a struct keyword and we're going to call it network config. So we're going to create a new object of type network config. Right now, our network config is only going to be one thing, address price feed, which is going to be the ETH USD price feed address. And we're going to have both of these return a network config object with this price feed. So both of these are going to do that returns network config. And we have to use the memory keyword because this is a special object. So we're going to do that for both of them. Now for get Sapolia ETH config, it's really easy, right? All we have to do is say network config, Sapolia config equals network config. And we'll just wrap and we'll just create this object by saying price feed and pasting in the address in here. Network config memory. Since this is a struct, obviously we can use these little brackets here to say the type and the object. We could also just do this, right? We could delete these and just go like this, but I like to be a little bit more explicit. So put these little squiggly brackets, the name of the thing, and then the address. And then we could just say return Sapolio config. And now we have a way to get the Sapolio config. So great. So we have a way to grab an existing address on a live network using this. How do we get that back over here so we can input into the fund me? Well, what we can do is we can create a new public variable, network config, public active network config. And we can set this active network config to whichever one of these configs is the active network that we're on. If we're on Sepolia, we'll return this. If we're on Anvil, we'll return whatever is in Anvil. And then we'll have our deploy me just point to whatever the active network config is. So how do we, so let's pretend for a second we are on Sepolia. How would we set the active network config? Well, in our constructor, what we do is we'd say if block dot chain ID equals equals one, 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 five, five, one, one, one. I'll explain this in a second. Active network config equals get Sepolia ETH config. Now, what is this chain ID thing? Okay, well, first of all, we know that Solidity has a lot of these global variables. One of these is the block dot chain ID. The chain ID refers to the chain's current ID. We saw a little bit of that with MetaMask and Ganache, and we can see that actually every network has their own chain ID. On the site, chainless.org, you can see a list of a lot of these different chain IDs. For example, Ethereum mainnet has a chain ID of one or zero X one. Binance Smart Chain 56, Arbitrum 46161, Polygon 137, Optimism 10, Avalanche C Chain, blah, blah, blah. They all have different chain IDs. So Polia has a chain ID of 11155111. So we can just say, hey, if we are on the Sepolia chain, use the Sepolia config. Great. And then we can say, if we're not on Sepolia, let's use the Anvil config. Fantastic. So we'll say else active network config equals get Anvil ETH config. Okay. So let's try this out. We don't have our get anvil ETH config identified yet. We don't have it set up, but that's okay. Let's just make sure that this get Sapolia ETH config works with our forked tests. So let's give that a whirl. So let's update this now to work with our helper config. So we'll do import helper config from dot slash helper config dot s dot soul. And what we're going to do is before the broadcast, we're going to create a new helper config and GitHub Copilot. Thank you again. I just had to hit tab, but helper config, lowercase helper config equals new helper config. So we're going to create a new contract like this. The reason we're going to do this before the start broadcast is we don't actually want to have to spend the gas to deploy this on a real chain. So this is going to be a little bit confusing, but you'll get used to this. Anything before your star broadcast, it's not going to send it as a real transaction. It's going to simulate this in its simulated environment. Anything after star broadcast, it's going to be a real transaction. So we just want to be very certain and very particular with what we've put before 
and what we put after this vm.start broadcast. So now that we have this helper config, we now have access to this active network config, which when we deployed it is going to be updated with the correct helper config here. Now we can get the right address by grabbing it from the helper config. So we can say address ETH USD price feed equals helper config dot active network config price feed, excuse me, helper config dot active network config. Now, normally, since we're returning a struct, we would have to wrap this in parentheses. And if we had multiple return values in the struct, right, if this was like an address, and then another address, and then another address, etc, we'd have to do an address, and then another address, you know, and then another address, etc. But since it's only one, undo all these as well. But since it's only one, we can wrap it in parentheses like this, and Solidity will just automatically take those away. So, so this works. So even though active network config is of type network config, this will work correctly. Great. But now we have the ETHUSD price feed. We can stick it in here. So if we're doing this right, if we run forge test dash dash fork URL, Sepolia RPC URL, we should indeed pass. We should have refactored our code correctly. Fingers crossed. And boom. Okay, our helper config is coming along fantastically. This is great. Let's clear, let's hide this, and let's keep going. So we're able to get this working well. And now this is a strategy we can work with different chains. For example, if we wanted to work with another chain, for example, Ethereum mainnet, we could copy paste this here. We could say get mainnet ETH config, public pure returns network config. We could say ETH config. Network config, we could go to docs.chain.link. Let's scroll over to Ethereum. Let's go to ETH mainnet. Where's ETH USD? Let's scroll ETH USD. We would copy this address here. We'd come back. We'd paste it in here. Copy this, paste it here. And now we would scroll back up. And, and again, if I'm moving too fast for you, feel free to pause or slow me down. Copy this. We'll come up here. Then we can say else if. And then Copilot's giving me the answer here. But if chain ID equals equals one, then active network config equals get mainnet ETH config. So we can use this little else if syntax here to just toggle through all these different chain IDs. And awesome. Now we have a way we could even get the mainnet ETH config. And if we wanted to, what we could do is we go back to Alchemy, create a new app here. We'll call it mainnet. Mainnet Ethereum, Ethereum mainnet. We'll zoom out a little bit so we can click the button. And what we can do is we can grab this key, copy the HTTPS, come back in here. Let's go to our .env file, we'll create mainnet RPC URL equals this, pull up the terminal, source.env. That way, this, if I do echo mainnet RPC URL, I can now see this as an output. What I could do is I could do forge test dash dash fork URL dollar sign mainnet RPC URL. And now I can run my test even on a forked mainnet. Awesome. And even that passes. So this is a really important step that we want to get really good at is it's running our tests on a forked mainnet or a forked blockchain that we're actually going to be deploying. So if we wanted to deploy to ETH mainnet, we would do something like this. These days, I don't deploy very much to Ethereum mainnet. I'm usually going to deploy to an L2. So maybe I'll do like a Polygon ZK EVM, Optimism, deploy a lot on Arbitrum, but something like that. And that's where I would do the fork testing against. But in any case, awesome. And the coolest thing about this setup is that if I want to deploy to mainnet, great, it'll just work. Or if I want to deploy to Sepolia, great, it'll just work. And if I want to deploy to any other chain, all I have to do is add an additional network config and we're good to go. But the anvil is going to be a little bit different, right? If we scroll back to the top, we're saying otherwise grab the existing addresses from the live network. Great. Well, on a local network, those contracts don't exist. So we're going to have to deploy those contracts ourselves on the anvil config. So what we're going to do down here is we're going to do something a little bit different. So one of the first things that we're going to do is we're going to have to 
deploy the mocks, and then return the mock addresses. A mock contract is, is basically like a fake contract. It's like, kind of like a dummy contract. It is going to be a real contract, but it's going to be a contract that we own, we can control, etc. So what we're going to do is actually we're going to do a vm.start broadcast down here. This way we can actually deploy these mock contracts to the Anvil chain that we're working with. And since we're using this VM keyword, we actually can't have this be a public pure. And additionally, our helper config needs to be is script in order to have access to this VM keyword. And let's also add a vm.stop broadcast as well. So in here, let's deploy our own price feed. In order to deploy our own price feed, we're gonna need a price feed contract. So what we're gonna do is actually in our test file, we're gonna create a new folder called mocks. And this is where we're gonna put all of our contracts that we need to do testing, right? It's gonna be a real contract, but we're gonna put it in the test folder just so that we separate it. We say, hey, this contract is different than our core code base. And we're gonna create a new file, call it mock v3 aggregator.sol. Now, instead of us actually creating this ourselves, there's actually already a mock v3 aggregator in the Chainlink Brownie contracts section. However, it's an older version of Solidity. It's version 0.6.0. So I'm gonna save you all some trouble from having to rewrite that in a new version. And if you wanna just come to the Foundry Fund Me F23, go to the test folder. Oh, it looks like I don't have it in a mock here, but it probably will be in a mock folder here. And we can just copy paste this entire contract. We'll copy it, go to our code base and paste it in here. This has all the code of a price feed, essentially. We have, if we scroll down, we can see some functions that we're familiar with, like latest round data, which is what we use in our price converter. And if we scroll up, we can see in the constructor, we get a vid decimals and an initial answer. And we also have an update answer function so that anytime we wanna mess with this contract or update it ourselves in our Anvil tests, we can, which is great. So we're gonna deploy this and we're gonna use this address as the price feed address on our Anvil chain. So in here, well, first off, we need to import that. So let's go ahead and import mock v3 aggregator from dot slash mocks, or excuse me, slash test slash mocks slash mock v3 aggregator dot soul. And down at the bottom, we're gonna say mock v3 aggregator mock price feed equals new mock v3 aggregator. And we can see the constructor of this. It takes a decimals and an initial answer. So we know that the decimals of ETUSD is eight. So we can just put eight in here. And then initial answer, we can do something like 2000 E8. Because it has eight decimals, we can say it starts at a price of 2000. And this will be the address that we put into the network config. So now we could say outside of the broadcast, because we don't need to do this inside of the broadcast, we could say network config, memory anvil config equals network config, do a little parentheses like this, price feed, and it'll be the address of the mock price feed like that. We'll add the little semicolon there. And then of course we say return anvil config. All right, great. Style guide tip. So something you'll see me do a lot is talk about this concept called magic numbers. I hate magic numbers. <laughs> I'm not a big fan of magic numbers. If I'm just reading this code and I see this number eight and 2000 E8, if I haven't looked at this code in a while, to me, I like I don't know what these numbers stand for. I'd have to go to the mock V3 aggregator and see, oh, okay, it's the decimals and it's the initial answer and then come back. But if I have a ton of code that I have to do that for, this can be really annoying to do. So I hate magic numbers. Using, instead of having kind of random numbers lobbed in my code, what most developers will do is they'll turn these magic numbers into constant variables at the top of their contracts. So if we scroll at the top of our contract, maybe we'll make a new line. We can say uint eight, because decimals is gonna be uint eight, public constant decimals equals eight, and then a uint, or excuse me, and then an int 256, public constant initial price equals 2000 E8, like this. And then what we can do down here is we can say, instead of eight, we'll say decimals. And instead of 2000 E8, we'll say initial price. 
and this makes it much easier for us to know what that eight and that 2000 stand for. That eight stands for decimals and the 2000 stands for the initial price. This makes our code much more readable. And even when I'm doing an audit report, if I'm doing a smart contract audit, this is something that I will point out. It's a lot easier to maintain readable code. And that's something that you'll hear me talk about a lot. Even this is a magic number in a, in a sense, right? I don't think it's that important for me to say, hey, this is the Sepolia chain ID though, because to me it's kind of obvious. So it's a little bit of an art rather than a science, but a rule of thumb is I hate magic numbers and you'll see me pretty much always do this convention up here. All right, awesome. Now, just one more thing we're gonna add in here is we're just gonna say, if active network dot, I mean, active network config dot price feed does not equal address zero. This, this is a way to get the zero address or the default value return active network config. And the reason I'm going to put this in here is if we call get anvil eth config without this, we actually will create a new price feed. However, if we've already deployed one, we don't want to deploy a new one. So we do this, this active network config dot price feed does not equal zero is basically saying, Hey, have we set the price feed up as something? Remember because address defaults to address zero. So if it's not address zero, it means we've already set it. So just go ahead and return and don't run the rest of this. And with that being said, the name of this function I'd argue is not very good because it's not just getting the anvil eth config. It's actually creating the contracts in here. So I would change this to get or create anvil eth config and copy this and paste it up here. Again, like I said, I love being very verbose with my functions to make my code much more readable. But okay, so now that we have this, remember before, every time we ran forge test, it failed, right? And why did it fail? Well, if we go back to the test. When we call test price feed version is accurate, every time we called get version, this would fail because the contract didn't exist on Anvil. Now that we have our helper config here, we do indeed deploy our own fake price feed. And if we go to the fake price feed, is there a get version? There is indeed a version function, which returns zero. And let's actually update this to four so that it actually will pass. Cause right now if it's zero, it'll fail. So version is four. So now it should be able to call this version parameter cause it's a public and return four. So let's go ahead. Moment of truth. So if we do forge test dash dash fork URL, Sepolia RPC URL, we know that this is going to pass because it's going to fork the Sepolia chain. And our helper config is going to give it the Sepolia address. We know that if we go to our Alchemy dashboard, go to our Sepolia, we little do a little refresh here. We're going to see just now we see we see a whole bunch of calls coming in, and we do indeed see this passes. Now Foundry was failing whenever we ran this without a fork. Now let's do a little clear. Now if I do Forge test without a network, without an RPC URL, let's see what happens. Oh my goodness. And see, this was also so much faster because we didn't have to make any API calls up to Alchemy. We didn't have to say, hey, Alchemy, what's the Sepolia chain look like? And wait for it to tell us what the Sepolia chain looks like. We were able to do everything locally on our own computer here. It was much faster. We didn't have to make it any API calls. And boom, we've got this network agnostic setup so that we can deploy our fund me contract on any network that we want. This is incredibly, incredibly powerful. And I know I keep saying this, but I'm being incredibly honest when I say learning these skills right here is making you all better than the current status quo of Solidity developer out there. I'm giving you the skills to leave this course and not just be a good smart contract developer, but I'm giving you the skills to raise the entire bar of smart contract developing. So, Congratulations for getting this far. And I know we've gone over a lot of stuff and we're not done with this project. We have a lot more to go, but this is a great time to take a break because you have just accomplished in a, a massive amount and learned a ton. If any of this is confusing, remember to use the course resources to your advantage. We have artificial intelligence that can help answer some of these questions. We have the discussions forum as well with a ton of people taking this course with you who can help you out. And remember, you can come in here and you can help other people out as well. So take a quick break. Here's a cute picture of a frog 
Here's an even cuter picture of the frog as a reward, and I'll see you soon. All right, welcome back. Hope you took a break. Hope you took a rest. Taking rests are incredibly important, especially in this earlier parts of the course where you're learning a lot of these advanced pieces and it's starting to get a little bit harder. If you try to do the rest of this course in a day, you're not going to learn anything. Repetition is the mother's skill, but that repetition will only result in you gaining that skill is if you take the rest you need for your body to recover. So let's keep going though. We've learned a lot. We're doing fantastic work. Now we've got our deploy fund me. Holy mackerel. We can deploy on any chain we want because we've got this fantastically advanced helper config set up for us. So now that we have this, this means that we can continue to write our tests over here. We don't even have to care or think about which network that we're actually on because our deployment setup is going to work no matter what. All right, great. So let's focus now. Let's switch gears. Now that we have our testing and our deployment harness set up, let's do this again. Forge coverage. And now I don't even have to put an RPC URL anymore because this is going to work for a Thanville. Oh, feels good, doesn't it? If I do forge coverage, oof, but this doesn't feel so good. If I do forge coverage, you see, oh, we are not testing very much of our code. Now, coverage isn't an end all be all, right? If you don't have 100% coverage, it's not the end of the world. However, if you have 0% or 7%, that's not a great look. So we want to do our best to at least get this up and write some tests for as much of the code as we can. If we don't have a test for it, it could be wrong. The functionality could not work as expected. So let's write some tests so we make sure our code is actually doing what we want it to do. If we look at our fund function, what's the first thing that we want it to do? Well, if we don't send it enough ETH, it should revert, right? Okay, great. So let's write a test for that. So we'll say function test fund fails without enough ETH. And the way that we can test something fails in Foundry is we can use another one of these cheat codes. So if we scroll back over to Foundry, over to the Foundry docs, on the left hand side here, we can scroll down to cheat codes, cheat codes in the test section. And it tells us all about some of the different cheat codes we can work with. So if you want to learn more about cheat codes, you can select that or we can scroll to the bottom go to the appendix and go to the cheat codes reference. Hit the little drop down. We have environment assertions and a whole bunch of other stuff. Let's look under assertions and we can see there's one called expect revert that tells us all about this revert bit. Expect revert is a cheat code in Foundry. It allows us to say, hey, if we do vm.expect revert, we're saying, hey, the next line should revert. And so it's kind of equivalent to saying assert this TX fails slash revert. So if I put vm.expect revert, the next line we're telling Foundry to revert. So if I were to run something like uint256 cat equals one, this test will fail because this line doesn't fail, which is a little confusing, right? So if we pull up our terminal here, I run forge test dash M, I paste this in. Remember dash M is how we run a single test. I hit enter you'll see that this fails because this didn't fail, right? So we see call did not revert as expected. So that's a, a little bit confusing. So we need to do something here that fails. So now if I do fund me dot fund, but I don't send any value, right? Remember, if we want to send value, we do it in these little brackets here. If we don't send any value. The zero value is going to be less than the minimum rate, which again is $5. Right. So since it's less, it should fail with you need to spend more ETH. So if we add this expect revert fund me dot fund, we hit clear or we'll on that single test again. Now it'll pass because this line is indeed failing and that's what we want. So great. We're testing the fund me fails without enough ETH being sent. Great job. Perfect. So what else should we test? Well, OK, let's say it. We do send enough. If we do set enough, we update these data structures. Okay, so let's test for that. So we'll say function test fund updates funded data structure. Make this a public function. And now we'll want to do fund me dot fund. And we'll want to send some value. Maybe we'll send we need to send a value greater than $5. So we'll send like 10 ETH. Why not? Because 10 ETH is almost definitely going to be more than $5 or I Hope so. And then we'll need to check if 
address to amount funded is getting updated. Now I'm going to do a little bit more refactoring here. Now I believe I showed you already that these these storage variables, which we haven't talked about too much, should indeed start with s underscore. So if you haven't done this already, we're going to do a little bit of refactoring. Address to amount funded, storage variable, funders, storage variable, price feed storage variable. So now oh, we just do a little s underscore here. We do a little s underscore here, a little s underscore here, a little s underscore here, s underscore, s underscore. Okay, great. And typically, as a best practice, we want to default all of these variables to private. Private variables are more gas efficient than public ones. So we want to default them to private. And anytime we actually need to make the public, we go ahead and explicitly do that ourselves. And this is where if we're not using the updated fundme.soul, be sure to just copy paste it from foundry fundme.soul. It's got everything we want in here. But the most important pieces is down at the bottom, it has these view functions. So in order for us to actually check that these are actually being updated, we want to scroll to the bottom. And we're going to create a section for our view slash peer functions. These are going to be our getters. So in here, we'll create a new function, get address to amount funded, we're going to do an address funding address, this will be an external view returns you into 56. And this will be return s underscore address to amount funded funding address, I just hit tab there, we want to do this for a couple of reasons. Again, I said we want to make our code very readable. And using getters as opposed to kind of this gross s underscore methodology is a lot more readable and a lot more sensical. Additionally, like I said, private variables are more gas efficient. So we just want to default them to private and then only make public or external view functions as we need. So we want to be able to get that. We also want to be able to do function get funder and have a uint256 index be passed in. This will be an external view which will return an address and we'll just say return funders at the index. So these are two getter functions that we can now use to check to see if these are populated. So back in our test, after running this fund me dot fund, we can say unit 256 amount funded equals fund me dot get address to amount funded. And then who are we going to pass in here? And then we're going to say assert equals amount funded 10 e 18. So so a couple things are going on here. So this is probably going to be message dot sender. But this can be a little confusing. Let's run this test forge test dash m pass that in here. Let's see if this works. Okay, it failed. So it looks like message dot sender isn't the one who called fund. Well, it was probably then the address fund me test. Is that who it was? Let's just say address this is that is that correct? Let's try this now. Okay, it looks like it was address this. But as you can see, knowing who's doing what can be a little bit confusing, especially in our tests. So in our tests, we want to be very explicit with who's sending what transactions. And that's where we can use another foundry cheat code called ranking. So if you go to the cheat codes reference, you go to environment, we can scroll down and we can see there's a prank cheat code in here. This prank code sets the message dot sender to the specified address for the next call. So we can use prank to always know exactly who's sending what call. And remember, this only works in our tests. And this only works with foundry. So above this fundme.fund, we can create a fake new address to send all of our transactions. So up at the top, let's create a fake user who's going to send all of our transactions. There's another for sheet code called make ADDR, where we can pass in a name and it'll give us back a new address. This comes from forge STD as opposed to the VM. So we can just use make ADDR like this. So what we can do at the top is we can say address user equals make ADDR, we just give it a name of user. And this will be who we use for all of our anytime we want to work with somebody, we can't make this constant because because this isn't compile time constant, but it's tests anyways, so we don't really care. But in any case, so if we scroll down, we can say vm.prank user 
which is saying the next DX will be sent by user. So this fundme.fund .fund will now be sent by user. So now in amount funded, we can say amount funded equals fundme.getadders to amount funded. Delete that, paste that in here. And one other thing we can do to make this cleaner is, as you know, I hate magic numbers. So we're gonna make this a constant variable as well. So if we scroll to the top, we're gonna make a new value. We're gonna say u256 constant send value equals, and we're gonna say 0 0.1 ether. Decimals don't work in Solidity, but if you do 0 0.1 ether, that makes it, you know, one, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And now we can do back down on our test, instead of some value here, we can just boop, use send value each time instead. So let's check to see if this works. We'll hit up a couple times, forge test. Oh, and it looks like we have an issue and this is good. Let's learn how to triage this issue. So let's hit clear. We'll hit up a couple times and then we'll dash VVV to see what's wrong with this, to see where this is actually reverting. Ah, so we pranked the user, but we're getting this error out of fund. So we created a new blank user who doesn't have any money. So they can't send the send value since they don't have any money. So what we can do is we can use another cheat code to actually send him some fake money. So if we go to cheat code references, there's a cheat code called deal, which allows us to set the balance of an address to a new balance. Oh yeah. So what we can do is we can scroll back up to the top and this is a cheat code, not a forge standard cheat. And in our setup, we can just say vm.deal user and we can give them some starting balance. So maybe we'll say you went 256 constant starting balance equals 10 ether. So we'll give our fake user 10 ether to start out with using a cheat code. And now if we scroll down, we hit clear. Now we run our test. Ta-da, we are now successful as we are now giving them some fake money so that they can run our tests. And we have a couple more tests going on here. So now if we pull up our terminal again, we run forge coverage you'll see we've gotten a little bit better with our coverage. We've gotten a tiny bit better here, but let's keep going. All right, let's keep going. Let's do function test adds funder to array of funders. Make this public. So up here, we're seeing that this get works. Let's also make sure that the this get funder that we just created works. So we'll say, vm dot prank user fund me dot fund. I'm going to hit tab a couple times because I'm going to do this exact line up here. Thanks, GitHub Copilot. And then we're going to say address funder equals fund me dot get funder at index zero. So this should be user because we're we only have one funder in here. An important note is every single time we run one of these tests, it'll run setup and then the test and then start over and then run setup, and then run the test and start over. So even though we called fundme.fund up here, we're actually gonna reset every single time. Now that's why if we made this a different user, we would still go to the zeroth index. So now we just do assert equal, or say funder is user, right? So assert equal, we're saying this equals this. That's what this test is checking. So we'll run this, do a little clear, forge test, Dash M, paste that in here. But, uh, okay, that worked as well. Great, let's keep going. Okay, so we've tested that this data structure is getting updated correctly. This is also getting updated. That's great. We could probably add some more tests to check to see if multiple work, but let's say this is good for now. We probably also want to check this withdraw piece. So, task uh, function test only owner can withdraw. Right? We want to be able to, we want to make sure that only the owner can call this withdraw function. So we want to make sure this only owner modifier is working correctly. So, well, what can we do? First, let's fund it. So we can copy this line here, paste it in here, and then we'll do vm.expect revert vm.prank user because the user is not the owner. And we'll do fundme.withdraw. So we're going to fund it 
with some money with this. And then we're going to have the user try to withdraw because the user is not the owner. Now you'll notice that we're doing a via that dot expect revert. And I said, Hey, the next line is should revert. It ignores these VM stuff. So this is saying like the next transaction, that's not like a VM cheat code. So it skips over this one and says, this is the one I'm expecting to revert. Same thing with this. If these were in this order, it would say, I'm going to pretend to be the user for not this one, because this is a, a VM, but for this one. So now if I hit clear, we'll copy this forge test dash M paste it in. Boom, we see that this is indeed successful. Awesome. Now, as we get more and more advanced with more and more functionality, these tests are going to get bigger and bigger, right? Let's say we want to do test only owner can withdraw after 18 withdrawals have happened, right? We'd have to do maybe a whole bunch of whole bunch of these, whole bunch of these or something like that. We want to make our tests very minimal, like we want them to have minimal lines of code. So a really good methodology by a very well known solidity dev in the space, Paul, he has a great proposed solidity best practice, organize your unit tests by using a state tree. Start by defining the parent nodes at the specific state conditions that drive the behavior of the smart contract. So if this is your contract, write some tests that test something. And once it's good, create a modifier for it. So you don't have to copy paste the code from those tests. And if that's confusing, don't worry, I'm going to make it make sense in just a second. We're going to add this modifier called funded like this. And I know we've worked with modifiers before. And in here, we're going to say VM prank user fund me fund value send value i'm going to go ahead and hit tab there and then this little underscore here now instead of every single time we want to fund one of our tests instead of writing a ton of code we can just do public funded in the test declaration and now we can say okay any test we write after this modifier we can add this funded and we can save ourselves a lot of code once some setup gets really big right let's say we had to do some setup to write this test that took a ton of lines of code, and we needed to write a ton of tests for it, it's going to make it so that we don't have to keep repeating ourselves over and over again. So big fan of this little best practice. Thanks, Paul, for setting this up. And now we can just do this instead. So let's go ahead and try to run this again. Now that we're using this modifier, and great, it does indeed pass. Okay, cool. So now, let's say let's actually test withdrawing and we'll test withdrawing that actually works. So we'll say function test withdraw with a single funder, we'll make this public funded. And now it's automatically going to get set up to be funded already. So there's a single funder, and we're going to go ahead and test withdrawing with the actual owner. And this is where I'm going to introduce the arrange act cert methodology for working with tests. Whenever I work with a test, I always think of it mentally in this pattern. First, I'm going to arrange the test, I'm going to set up the test, then I'm going to do the action I actually want to test. And then I'm going to assert the test. So in a lot of my tests, you'll actually see me write these explicitly out. So mentally, I can compartmentalize the different parts of the test. So for a range, in order for us to test that the withdraw function actually is going to work, we first want to check to see, okay, what's our balance before we call withdraw so that we can compare it to what our balance is after. So to arrange, we can do a UN256 starting owner balance, because it's the owner who's going to do the withdraw. And this will be equal to fund me dot. And then do we have a get owner function? I don't think we do. We do not have a get owner function. So let's actually make this I owner private and create a getter for get owner. So we'll scroll to the bottom. We'll do function get owner. This will be external view returns address return I owner. And in my test, I'm going to say fund me dot get owner dot balance. So we're going to get the owner's starting balance. We're going to do a uint 256 starting fund me balance. So the actual balance of the fund me contract, which since it's funded, it's just going to be this send value. It's going to be equal to the address of the fund me contract dot balance. And now in the act, we're going to do vm dot prank fund me dot get owner because only the owner can call withdraw. So we just want to prank, make sure we're actually the owner. And we're going to call fund me dot withdraw like this. And this is what we're testing, right? We're testing the withdraw. So we put this in the act section. And now we can move over to the assert section. So we'll say UN256 ending owner, or excuse me, 
yeah, and the owner balance equals fund me that get owner that balance like that. You and 256 ending fund me balance equals address fund me dot balance. And we could say assert equal ending fund me balance should be zero. Now I know I said I hate magic numbers, but zero often I don't create a constant for because it's just zero. So we should have withdrawn all the money out of the fund me. And then we can also do assert equal the starting fund me balance plus the starting owner balance should equal the ending owner balance because we withdrew all the money out of fund me. So we should just be able to add it to their address and that should equal the ending balance. So let's go ahead and let's test this. Forge test dash M paste that in here. Oops, oops I'm doing I owner somewhere. Oh, yep. So this actually fails now. So this should actually be get owner instead. Let's clear run this again. And awesome. So that does indeed pass great work. Now let's just do one more test a test with multiple funders. So this is going to be the big function here. So we'll do function test withdraw from multiple funders, public funded. And so it's going to be funded once but let's add a ton more funders. So let's do a uint 256 number of funders. We'll say there's we'll do 10 and a uint 256 starting funder index equals two. And you'll see why I'm doing this in just a minute. Let's go through a loop. And let's just keep creating new addresses for this number of funders. So we'll do a for loop, which I know we know how to do We'll do four, uint 256, I equals starting funder index. I is going to be less than the total number of funders, I plus plus. So we're going to go every time we go through a loop, we're going to add one to I here. And what we're going to do is we're going to do a VM dot prank and a VM dot deal and create addresses. And they're going to fund the fund me VM dot prank a new address, we're going to deal that new address some money, and then we're going to fund it. So we could do vm.prank and vm.deal. But the forge standard library, which again, is slightly different from the cheat codes, actually comes with this standard cheat called hoax, which sets up a prank from an address with some ether. So it does both prank and deal combined. And since it's a forge standard, we can just do hoax, some address, which we'll talk about in a second. And then we'll give it send value. But how do we actually populate the address? Well, I showed you before we can do address zero to generate an address. Well, guess what? We can also do address one, address two, address three, address four, address five, address six, etc. Except they must be a uint instead of 256, a uint 160. As of Solidity v0.8, you can no longer cast explicitly from address to uint 256. You have to do a uint 160. And the reason for this is a uint 160 has the same amount of bytes essentially as an address. So that's a little bit confusing. Don't worry too much about it for now. Just know that if you want to work with addresses, if you want to use numbers to generate addresses, those numbers have to be a uint 60. So actually, we're just going to use uint 60 for everybody. And actually, we're going to start with starting index v1, excuse me. But what we can do is we can say address of i, and we'll make this a uint 60 as well. We're going to create a blank address of I, which starts at one, and we're gonna add send value. And the reason we're starting our starting index is actually gonna be one here is because sometimes the zero address reverts and doesn't let you do stuff with it. When you're writing your tests, you just want to make sure you're not sending stuff to the zero address because there's often sanity checks to make sure you don't do that. So but in any case, we're going to hoax that address and do and add some ether to it. And since we're hoaxing it, it means we're pranking it. So now we can call fund me dot fund with this new address, we do the value It's going to be send value like this. And cool. So we'll have this many funders actually loop through the list and fund our fund me contract. Awesome. So now we're going to do some of the same stuff that we did above. Right? So this is all in our arrange setup. So we're going to say you in 256. And my GitHub Copilot actually already knows starting owner balance, 
you went to 256 starting fund me balance. Thank you, GitHub Copilot. I hit tab again. And if you want to just copy from up here, you can just copy from there as well. And then we're going to say vm.start prank, excuse me, vm.prank fund me.get owner like this. And then we'll call fund me dot with draw like this. Now, another thing that you'll see instead of just prank is you'll see start prank and you'll see vm dot stop prank. This is the same as start and stop broadcast. It's saying that anything in between start prank and stop prank is going to be sent pretended to be by this address here. So you'll see this syntax a lot as well. And it's the syntax that I actually prefer to use. And you'll see that I use it a lot. But after we call this withdraw function, which again, this is going to be in the act, we can now move on to our assert phase. And we could say, let's assert that the address of fundme dot balance is going to be equal to zero. So we should have removed all the funds out of the fundme. We can assert the starting fundme balance plus the starting owner balance equals fundme dot get owner dot balance like this. Okay, great. So let's run this test there. Forge test dash M paste that in. Ta da! That has also been successful. Now, if we run forge coverage, let's see what happens. How good are our tests now? Aha! They're a lot better, at least for the fund me. We haven't done a whole lot of testing a price converter, but that's fine. Fantastic. We can see we've covered at least 93% of the code in our contracts. So this at least makes us feel a lot better that we've done a much better job of writing some tests, right? Like I said, writing tests can be a little bit of an art, but if everything here is red, that's a bad sign. So we have green on this line, so that's a good sign. Now you might be asking, oh, hey, Patrick, we just wrote this test, but shouldn't the balances actually be lower because we spent gas? And that is a wonderful observation, and we will come back to that. So hold on to that. We'll come back to that in a minute, but let's keep writing the rest of these tests. All right, awesome. So now let's look at some other ways that we can actually debug some of our tests. If we run into any issues, one of the ways that comes packed with Foundry that I absolutely love is a tool called Chisel. Normally, if I want to test that some Solidity works really quickly, I might come over to Remix and I might do some random code and see if it works. But instead, what I can do is in my terminal, I can just type in Chisel and I'll get outputted into this shell here. If I type exclamation mark help, It'll give me a ton of information about what I can actually do in this terminal here. Chisel allows us to write Solidity in our terminal and execute it kind of line by line. So for example, if I wrote UN256 cat equals one, and now type cat, and I can see, oh, cat is one. I can type cat here again, I can do UN256 cat and three equals cat plus three, do cat and three, and see, you know, one plus three obviously equals four. So Chisel is a fantastic tool that I use all the time to quickly sanity check some small Solidity pieces that I need. So Chisel, you can write, you can literally write Solidity right in here without having to go to Remix and test stuff out. Chisel, awesome tool, Solidity in your terminal. Control C, Control C to exit. Now let's go down to this test withdraw from multiple funders. What if I told you there was a way to make this a lot cheaper gas wise, it caught it would cost less gas for us to actually perform, that would be a pretty valuable piece of information, wouldn't it? Every single time we send a transaction or we deploy or we do anything on chain, we have to spend gas. And the more complicated and the more computationally expensive our contracts are, the more gas we have to spend. So what if I told you there was a way for us to make this cheaper? let's figure out how to do that now. How do we even know how much this is going to cost? That would be probably be a good thing for us to benchmark, right? What we can do is run forge snapshot dash M paste that exact test in. What this is going to do is it's going to create this file called dot gas snapshot for us. And if let's open this up, it's going to tell us exactly how much this single test is going to cost in gas. 
And if we wanted, we could do the conversion between gas and guay and price and everything to figure out how much this actually costs. But this is now our benchmark. We now have this in our dot gas snapshot. Test withdraw from multiple funders cost this much gas. Okay. All right, cool. So now that we have these functions here, let's go back up here and talk about that gas thing. Because we did vm.prank fundme.getowner and we called a transaction. We should have spent gas, right? Well, how come when we calculate the final balance, the ending owner balance, there's nothing to do with gas here? This has to do with the gas price of the actual chain we're working on. When you're working with Anvil, the gas price actually defaults to zero. So when working with a local Anvil chain, be it forked or not, it actually defaults the gas price to zero. So for us to simulate this transaction with actual gas price, we need to actually tell our test to pretend to use a real gas price. And this is where there's another cheat code that we can use called TX gas price, which sets the gas price for the rest of the transaction. So what we can do is same as where we're doing vm.prank, we can do vm.tx gas price, and we can set some gas price. And up at the top, we'll do a uint256 public, or excuse me, uint256 constant gas price. And it could be anything, let's just set it to one. And down here, we'll just say vm.tx gas price, we'll set that to the one. And now in our test here, we'll actually have a gas price. In order for us to see how much gas this is actually gonna spend, we need to calculate the gas left in this function call before and after. To do that, we'll do uint256 gas start equals gas left. This gas left function is a built-in function in Solidity. It tells you how much gas is left in your transaction call. Remember how on an ether scan, when we scrolled down, there was a gas limit and gas usage. Whenever you send a transaction, you send a little bit more gas than you're expected to use. And you can see how much gas you have left based on how much you send by calling this gas left function. So we can get the gas start. And then after we call withdraw, we can do UN256 gas end equals gas left. So this is how much gas we used. So let's say we sent a thousand gas. Let's say this cost was 200 gas. That means down here we would have 800 gas. And so we can say you went to 256 gas used from this withdraw transaction is going to be equal to the gas start minus gas end times whatever the TX dot gas price is. TX dot gas price is another built into solidity, which tells you the current gas price. And then we can use this methodology to do console.log gas used, rerun this test with the dash VV, and we'll actually be able to see how much gas that exact call actually did, which is right here. But I'm gonna go ahead, and now I'm actually gonna go ahead and remove all this gas stuff and just bring it back to this. All right, great. All right, anyways, so we have this gas snapshot. Is there a way for us to make this cheaper and much easier? By golly, there absolutely is. And this is where we're gonna actually learn about storage. This thing that I keep talking about and keep referring back to, we're actually finally gonna talk about storage up here. So let's watch an excerpt from the previous Free Code Camp video so that we can understand what storage is and what it looks like. We're gonna look at one of the first and most obvious gas optimization techniques, and it has to do with all of these variables at the top and this thing called storage. So this gas snapshot, we're actually gonna write some code to make this test be much more gas efficient. So let's learn about storage so we can learn this gas optimization technique. Let's say we look at the average gas for these and we go, huh, this looks like it's actually a lot more than what we originally expected. Is there a way for us to make this a little bit cheaper? We go back to our fund me contract we look at our withdraw function and we notice something. Oh, there is actually a way to make this a lot cheaper. And it has to do with something called storage variables or these global variables that we've been working with this whole time. Let me, let me paint you a little picture here. We're gonna look at one of the first gas optimization techniques you can take to drop these down. And it has to do within our FundMe contract these state variables and how they're actually stored and how this contract actually keeps track of all this stuff. 
This section is going to be a little bit more advanced. So we'll have a note here saying that this is an advanced section. And if you want to skip over it, you can, because now we're getting into gas optimizations here. This information still is really good to know. So if you want to skip it for now and then come back later, you absolutely can. But let's talk about what happens when we actually save or store these global variables, AKA these storage variables. Now, everything I'm about to go through is in the documentation. And there is a link to this, of course, in the GitHub repo associated with this course. Whenever we have one of these global variables or these variables that stay permanently, they're stuck in something called storage. You can think of storage as a big giant array or a giant list of all the variables that we actually create. So when we say we have some contract called fund of storage and we have a variable called favorite number, we're basically saying we want this favorite number variable to persist, right? We saw in a lot of our examples, we had a favorite number variable that we could always call to see what this contract's favorite number was. Well, the way it persists is it gets stored in this place called storage. Now storage works as this giant list associated with this contract where every single variable and every single value in this storage section is slotted into a 32 byte long slot in this storage array. So for example, the number 25 in its bytes implementation is 0x00 with a ton of zeros 19. This is the hex version of the UNT256. This is why we do so much hex translation. This is the bytes implementation of a UN256. And each store slot increments just like an array starting from zero. So for example, our next global variable or our next storage variable just gets slotted at the next slot that's available. So Booleans, for example, get transformed from their bool version to their hex. And we modified our sum bool variable to be true. And the hex addition of the true Boolean is 0 x 0 one. Every time you save an additional global variable, or more correctly, one of these storage variables, it takes up an additional storage slot. And what about variables that are dynamic in length or that can change length? What about something that's dynamic? Well, for dynamic values like a dynamic array or a mapping, elements inside the array or inside the mapping are actually stored using some type of hashing function. And you can see those specific functions in the documentation. The object itself does take up a storage slot, but it's not going to be the entire array. For example, my array variable here at storage slot two doesn't have the entire array in storage slot two. What it has actually is just the array length. The length of the array is stored at storage slot two. But for example, if we do my array dot push 222, we do some hashing function, which again, you can see in the documentation what that is, and we'll store the number 222 at that location in storage. The hex of 222 is 0x00000DE. So it gets stored in this crazy spot, and this is good, this is intentional, because 32 bytes may not be nearly big enough to store my array if our array gets massive. And it wouldn't make sense for it to put the elements inside the array at subsequent numbers, because again, the size of the array can change, and, and you're never gonna be sure how many subsequents that you need. So for my array, it does have a storage slot for the length. For mappings, it does have a storage spot as well, similar to array, but it's just blank. But it's blank intentionally so that Solidity knows, ah, okay, there is a mapping here and it needs a storage slot for its hashing function to work correctly. Now, interestingly, constant variables and immutable variables do not take up spots in storage. The reason for this is because constant variables are actually part of the contract's bytecode itself, which sounds a little bit weird, but you can imagine what Solidity does is anytime it sees constant variables name is it just automatically swaps it out with whatever number it actually is. So you can kind of think of not in storage is just a pointer to 123 and it doesn't take up a storage slot. Well, when we have variables inside of a function, those variables only exist for the duration of the function. They don't stay inside the contract. They don't persist. They're not permanent. So variables inside these functions like new var and other var do not get added to storage. They get added in their own memory data structure, which gets deleted after the function has finished running. Now you might be asking, okay, well, why do we need this memory keyword, especially when it comes to strings? We saw before that we had to say string memory. The reason we need it for strings is because strings are technically this dynamically sized array. And we need to tell Solidity, hey, we're, we're going to do this on the storage location, or we're going to do it into the memory location where we can just wipe it. 
arrays and mappings can take up a lot more space. So Solidity just wants to make sure, okay, where are we working with this? Is it storage? Is it memory? You have to tell me. I need to know if I need to allocate space for it in our storage data structure. And again, everything here you can read in the Solidity documentation. Now in the GitHub repo associated with this course, if you go to SRC, you'll go to example contracts, we have this fun with storage here as well. And if you go to the scripts of this, we have a deploy storage fun as well, which has some functions in here called print storage data and print first array element that you can play with to actually see where in storage these are being located. We're not gonna code these right now and I'm not really gonna go over what these are doing because, oh, and I'm gonna have to change this name here but I definitely recommend trying to run this yourself on Anvil to see what these storage functions actually print out for you. One other thing that's really cool about Foundry, I can actually check my FundMe contract storage a couple different ways. The first one I can do is forge inspect FundMe storage layout and enter, and it'll tell me the exact layout of storage that my FundMe contract has. Whoa, and it gives me this giant object here. If I scroll up to the top, I can see the storage layout here, we can see that this S address to amount funded actually is in slot zero. If we continue down, we can see S funders is in slot one. We can see S price feed is in slot two. Then we have all this information about types and some other stuff as well. But this part of the top storage is where we can easily see where stuff is being stored. We can see there too that these immutable variables didn't show up in storage, which makes sense. Minimum constants and immutables don't get stored in storage. They are part of the contract's bytecode. The other way that we can see storage is using cast storage keyword. If I spin up an anvil chain, create a new shell here, and I run forge script script deploy fundme.s.sol dash dash rpc url. Let's use this http slash dash dash private key. Let's use this one right here, paste it in. We're gonna compile, we're gonna deploy. Oops, I forgot to do broadcast. Let's do it again with dash dash broadcast. Let's actually deploy this to our own locally running Anvil chain. Script ran successfully, awesome. Contract address here. What I can now do, I can run cast storage, paste the contract address here and pick a storage slot, for example, two which is the price feed address, and it's gonna give me exactly what's in that storage slot at storage slot index two. Obviously, zero and one are just gonna be empty because those are what? These two arrays, which right now are this mapping and this array, which right now are blank. If you have a connection to Etherscan, you actually don't even need to add an index, and it'll fetch the source from Etherscan and tell you the whole storage layout, but I'm not connected to Etherscan. This will be something that you should try in the future is actually doing cast storage on a live contract and seeing a live contract's storage. So that'll be your homework for later. So this is just a double down that even when you have the private keyword, that doesn't mean your data is private. Everything on the blockchain is public information and anybody can easily read that information off of your or anybody's blockchain. Now you might be asking yourself, hey, cool, Patrick, but why are we talking about this storage thing? Yeah, this is really interesting to know, but I thought we were trying to optimize gas-wise. The reason that we're talking about storage is because reading and writing from storage is an incredibly expensive operation. Anytime we do it, we spend a lot of gas. Remember how before when I said, when you compile your code, it gets compiled down to this weird bytecode? Let's go back to Remix. Let's hit compile. Let's go to compilation details. Go to Remix, then we select bytecode and we scroll down a little bit all the way to the bottom. We'll see this thing called opcodes and object. The object is the contract in pure bytecode and these opcodes are the bytecode converted to something called opcodes. These are the low level computer assembly level instructions that are actually executing and actually doing what our smart contract should do. And guess what? Each one of these incredibly low level codes has a specific gas cost associated with it. If we go to evm.codes, this is a website that actually keeps track of a lot of these opcodes gas costs. And right on the left-hand side, we can see the opcode in its bytecode format, and then the name of the opcode, and then the minimum amount of gas it actually spends to do that opcode. So anytime you add two numbers, it costs three gas. 
multiplying costs five gas, dividing five gas, so on and so forth. And if we keep scrolling, keep scrolling, we're seeing a lot of threes, a lot of twos, a couple of hundreds, some twenties. We get down to here. Oh my goodness. S load and S store are both 100. That's way more expensive than a lot of these other ones that we're seeing, which are like two or three or five. S load is the op code that loads a word from storage. Anytime you read from storage, you're spending a minimum of 100 gas. S store is the op code that stores a value in storage. Save a word to storage, which also costs a minimum 100 gas. If we look just up above that, we actually see M load and M store, which stand for memory load and memory store. If we load or read from memory, it only costs three gas. So it's almost 33 times more expensive to read and write to storage than read and write to memory. So a really easy gas optimization we could do is we can read and write from memory way more than we should be read and writing from storage. So with this in mind, if we come back to our fund me withdraw function, and we look in here, are we reading and writing to storage a lot in here? Oh my goodness. Let's look at this loop here. So we're saying u and 256 funder equals zero. Okay, sure, whatever. Funder index is greater than s underscore funders dot length. The length of the funders array is stored in storage. So every time we loop through this for loop, we're rereading from storage. Ah, let's create a new function, function called cheaper withdraw. This will be public only owner as well. Let's keep this memory to storage gas optimization piece in mind. And let's rewrite this function so that we're reading it and writing from storage a lot less. So first off, instead of reading from storage every single time, we could say uint256 funders length equals sfunders.length. That way we'll only read it from storage one time, and then every time we loop through, we'll only read it one more time. And this is why this syntax of adding this s underscore here is really good. Anytime you see this s underscore, your brain should go, oh my goodness, I'm actually reading from storage. Maybe I should consider not doing that and reading from memory instead. So we're gonna read from storage once here. And for our for loop, we're gonna say four, do the same thing. You went to 256, funder index equals zero. Funder index is less than funders length, which is now a memory variable instead of a storage variable. And then funder index plus plus. Okay, cool. Now, okay, in the withdraw function, what do we do? Okay, we get the funder address from storage. There's really not a great way around this. We pretty much have to read from storage every single time here. So let's go ahead and stick that in here. And then we do this mapping. There's really not another way around this. So we're just gonna stick this in here as well. We still need to reset the storage, so we'll do that. And there's not a whole lot much to do in here. So we'll just do this as well. So we now have this cheaper withdraw function that we're gonna loop through this array reading the length from memory as opposed to reading the length from storage over and over again. So now that we have this cheaper withdraw function, let's go back to our fundme test.sol. Let's scroll down and we have this test multiple withdraw funders. I'm actually just going to copy paste this whole thing, which wouldn't be good practice in an actual test file, but for us, we're going to do it. I'm going to paste it. I'm going to call this test withdraw from multiple funders cheaper and instead of calling withdraw we're going to call cheaper withdraw and that's it that's the only difference that we're going to do now let's pull up our terminal and we'll run forge snapshot so now we should create a gas snapshot with all of our tests but what we have test withdraw from multiple funders and test withdraw from multiple funders cheaper and if we go to our gas snapshot go to the bottom we see Test withdraw from multiple funders, 987915 gas. Test withdraw multiple funders cheaper, 987136. We're saving almost 800 gas by using this cheaper, less storage intensive reads or running our contract. Amazing. This is fantastic. We've learned so much and we only have a couple more things to do for this lesson. And then we're gonna push this code up to GitHub and have your first project, which is incredibly exciting. So I fumbled this a little bit. I didn't really talk about it too much, but I did update some of the errors and I updated some of the variables without explaining it too much. Immutable variables, again, these are not stored in storage. So it's good to have some 
identifier to say that A, they're unchangeable, and B, they're actually not in storage. So I go by the chain link style guide, which does this I underscore for immutable variables and uppercase for constant variables. Having style guides is really important and gets more important the more advanced you get because it makes your code much more readable and much, you look like a more advanced developer. So immutables have I underscore, storage variables have S underscore, and we just explained why that's so important to know what storage variables actually are. A lot of people use the Solidity Visual Developer, which also automatically points out storage variables for them as well. I don't really like to use it though, because I feel like it clutters up my user experience a little bit. But if you're having a hard time identifying storage variables, maybe that's an extension for you. The Solidity Docs actually have an entire style guide as to what to do for code layout, function names, line length, and all this other stuff. So I've already updated these to iOwner, as price feed. We've added some getters at the bottom. There's a couple of more style guide things for us to do, but we'll do that in later sections of the course. I subscribe to the Chainlink Solidity Style Guide, which I've left a link in the GitHub repo associated with this course, which talks about everything that we went over here. You want to keep everything private, use S underscore, use I for immutables, S for storage variables, etc. And you can read this if you want. Style guides seem like they're a little bit bored, but the more you code, the more you'll realize how they make your life way easier. But all right, awesome. So we have some tests. We've done mocking. We have a gas snapshot. We're of course gonna wanna add a readme.md at some point. Later on, if you want, you just copy from my readme in here. We've only got a couple of things left to do. These are the four things we have left for this project. Just do a proper readme, a couple integration tests, where we're gonna programmatically verify our contracts inside of Foundry, and then we're gonna push our code up to GitHub. And this we absolutely need to get here because this is how we're gonna build our portfolios. And so I'll, and how other people are gonna see, oh my gosh, they're such awesome engineers. So let's push through the rest of these. So for a readme, you can use my readme here as an example of what a good readme should look like. A readme in your contract in your GitHub should really explain, hey, what your code actually does and then how to actually do it, right? So you'll notice in most of my readmes, I have a getting started section, which tells you the requirements that you need to actually run anything. We have a quick start, which starts with a git clone, which I'll explain in a little bit, and then how to actually use it. If you look up best readme and Google or Brave Search or whatever you want to use, there are some fantastic templates to write amazing readmes. Okay, cool. That's done. What's next? All right, integration tests. So if we want to actually interact with our contract here, right now we don't have a programmatic way to do that, like funding and withdrawing. And in our tests here, we tested funding and withdrawing but we didn't test funding and withdrawing using the methods that we're actually gonna to use to do that. When we actually call funds and withdraws, we're probably gonna do cast, send, and then you know the address, and then fund, or whatever, and the value and everything, or we're gonna do it with forge script, right? Let's do it with forge script so that we can have a reproducible way to actually fund and withdraw. So in our scripts section, we're gonna create a new file called interactions.s.soul. And in here, we're going to have all of the ways we can actually interact with our contract. So we're just going to make a fund script and a withdraw script. So let's go ahead. SPDX, license identifier MIT. Thank you, GitHub Copilot. We're going to do pragma solidity 0.8.18. We'll do a little caret. We'll do contract interactions. This is going to be a script, so we'll say is script. We're going to import script from forge std script.sol. We're going to spell contract correctly. Okay, great. Excuse me, not interactions. We're going to call this fund fund me. So this is going to be our script for funding the fund me contract. We're also going to make a contract called withdraw fund me. So this is going to be our foundry script for funding. This is going to be our foundry script for withdrawing. So in here, as we're going to do function run, it's going to be external, external. And this is where we're going to put the code to actually do our stuff. Now, something that's important though, is we are pretty much going to want to fund our most recently deployed contract. So what I typically like to do is I have a script I've got a tool called Foundry DevOps that I use to actually grab my most recently deployed contract address. 
There's some other Foundry DevOps tools coming out and I will have a link in the description to the most up-to-date one that you should use because I'm probably not gonna maintain this moving forward unless people, unless a lot of people use it. This package helps your Foundry keep track of the most recently deployed version of a contract because I'm pretty much only gonna to wanna to run fund on my most recently deployed contract. So to work with this, we're first going to install it and you'll see why this is important very soon. We're gonna run forge install chainxl.org dash foundry devops dash no dash commit. Great, we're gonna install that. Now what we can do is say import devops tools from, and we'll just grab it right from the package. So we'll say foundry devops slash src slash devops tools dot soul. And in here, in this library, Foundry DevOps, SRC, it has this script called get recent deployment.sh. So in Foundry, you can actually run bash scripts or other types of scripts from Foundry. But in order to do this, in your foundry.toml, you need to set FFI equals true. Now, a word of caution here. If you set FFI to true, this means that you're gonna allow Foundry to run commands directly on your machine. More often than not, I recommend you try to keep this off as long as possible. But it is important for us to know how it works and how we can use it for something like this to get our most recent deployments. So this Foundry DevOps tool, you just install it, and then to use it, it has this DevOps tool that get most recent deployment that we can use to get the most recently deployed version of a contract. This way we don't have to pass the fund me contract address that we wanna work with every single time. So the first thing we do in our run function is we can say address most recently deployed equals DevOps tools dot get most recent deployment. And we pass the name of the contract, which is gonna be fund me and the block dot chain ID. So it knows what to do. The way that this works is it looks inside of the broadcast folder based off the chain ID and then just picks the, this run latest and grabs the most recently deployed contract in that file. So now that we have the most recently deployed contract address, we can just call fund on this most recently deployed address. Now I'm actually going to separate where we actually do the funding into its own function and you'll see why soon. So I'm gonna say function fund fund me address most recently deployed. I'm gonna make this public. Say vm dot start broadcast. And in order for us to actually do anything with the fund me contract, we're gonna to need to import fund me from at dot slash src slash fund me dot soul. We're gonna wrap this most recently deployed address in here. We're gonna say dot fund. And I'm going to create a uint256 constant send value equals 0 0.01 ether send value. We're going to fund value is going to be send value. Close that off here. Vn dot stop broadcast like this. And we actually have to typecast most recently deployed as a payable because we're going to be sending value here. But then I like to do a little console.log and we'll say funded fund me with, and if we do percent %s, we can actually populate that with send value. And so since we're using console, this is also located in the script.md, so we can import console from there. And I just like to see that, hey, this actually went through. So we have this fund fund me, and instead in our run, we're just gonna say fund fund me, with this most recently deployed. So we're gonna have our run function call our fund fund, our fund fund me function. Whew, big mouthful. So this is what we're actually gonna do to fund our fund me contract. So if I pull up my terminal, I would run forge script scripts interaction.s.soul. And I'll put this little colon here to pick the contract. So we have fund fund me and we also withdraw fund me. I'm going to pick the fund fund me here. And then I would do dash dash RPC URL, blah, 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 dash dash private key, blah, blah, blah. And that's how I would actually call fund fund me. So that's how I would call it as a script. And we want to test this 
as well. And this is where our integration tests are going to come into play. So integration tests are when you test a lot of your interactions, you test combinations of systems. And I usually like to separate my integration tests and unit tests in different folders. So I'm actually going to go ahead and do that. I'm going to create a new folder called unit. I'm going to take this fund me test .sol, stick it in here. And since we did that, we need to update some of our imports because they're now in different areas. I think I did it right. If I do forge test, I'm doing everything right. I'm kind of like halfway done with a bunch of stuff. Yep. Okay, cool. Test pass. That's great. And I'm also going to make a new file called fund me test dot fund me test integration dot dot soul. And I'm going to copy a lot of this from the fund me test, paste it in here, fund me test integration. Or we can also just call this interactions test dot dot soul. So maybe in here, we'll have our function set up, which is going to be external. We're going to say deploy fund me deploy equals new deploy fund me. So we have deploy fund me. Great. Say, and then same as the test, we're going to do this bit here. So I'm just going to paste that. Uh, let's, let's copy a lot of this actually <laughs> change the name here. Cool. So we copied most of this. Let's change this name to interactions. Test is test. All the setup is the same. The only difference is now we're going to say function test user can fund and user can fund public instead of funding directly with the functions. We're going to import fund fund me from dot dot slash script slash interactions dot s dot soul. And in here we're going to say fund fund me. Fund, fund me equals new fund and me. Isn't that wonderful? Stay with me here. I swear this makes sense. And then we can do fund fund me dot fund fund me with the address of fund me. And this is why I separated those scripts out, right? Because I, I can't run with this. I want to run fund fund me and be able to add my own address in here. So we're testing this specifically to make sure our funding works. And we can actually go back to our test and do something similar to when we did the fund, we can make sure that they get added to the list of funders, we can do something like this in our test, paste it in here, test user can fund into actions like this, and we'll run this single test, forge test dash m paste that there. Boom. Oh, assertion failed. Oop. And let's actually put these VM broadcasts in the run. So that's actually where we're going to be doing them like that. We want to put the broadcast down in the run, not up here. And I should probably have deal user. Let's just do one E 18. And this is where we're actually going to test that script. But let's also make the withdraw. I'm actually just going to cheat a little bit. We're just going to copy pretty much all of this, paste it in here. Instead of fund fund me, we're going to call this withdraw fund me. And instead of fund, we're going to call withdraw no value. Close this off, close this off. And instead of fund fund me, we're going to call withdraw fund me. And now in our test, we're going to say first, we're going to call fund me dot fund me with the address fund me, then we're going to say, draw fund me, withdraw fund me equals new withdraw fund me, we're gonna do withdraw fund me dot withdraw fund me address fund me, stay with me. And we're just going to assert address fund me dot balance equals zero. Stay with me here. So we need to import withdraw fund me from interactions as well. Excuse me, what we're going to do is we're going to fund using our scripts and then we're going to withdraw using our scripts as well. So let's go ahead and let's run this forge test dash M paste that in here. Looks like we got a revert. Let's do let's do dash V V V V. See what's happened. Oh, looks like we are indeed out of funds. Oh, and in the withdraw fund me we need VM dot start broadcast. And then of course, VM dot stop broadcast like this. Now let's run this test here. 
and we get it's passing. Whew. Okay. So I know we wrote a lot here and I know I went through that kind of quickly, but feel free to pause and take a minute to real understand what we did here, right? So now we can run forge script interactions.s.sol fund fund me and then our network information here so that we're always calling the fund the way we want to call it. And then we created some integration tests, which kind of bring it all together. And then we did the same thing with withdrawing money as well. And now we've got a huge suite of tests that we can test all at once with forge test. And we see we pass everything. And then we also can do forge test dash dash fork URL, Sepolia RPC URL, or even mainnet RPC URL. And we see everything pass he passes here as well. So even when we're pretending to deploy to a live network, everything is passing. Awesome. Now you might be asking, hey, Patrick, running Forge, script, all that other crap, there's so much text. There's so much stuff to do there. I don't wanna write all that stuff. And to that I say, you're thinking correctly. We wanna work incredibly hard to be incredibly lazy. So I love the way you're thinking. And I know we're diverging from this a little bit, but we learned how to do integration tests. This is what we have left, but we're gonna make a pit stop. I lied, pit stop. How can we make running these scripts a lot easier? And this is where we're gonna use something called a make file. So if you right click and you create a new file called a make file, this is where we're going to add some shortcuts for ourselves so we don't have to write those long scripts every single time. A make file is a simple text file used by the utility called make to automate the process of building and compiling programs for projects. It's pretty, it's really popular in the Foundry world. You should have, if you create this make file in your folder and you type make, should get something like no targets stop. If you don't get this, it means you don't have make installed and you'll need to install make. If you have a hard time installing make, be sure to leave a discussion on the GitHub repo associated with this course. Additionally, make files are great because they allow us to automatically grab what's ever in our .env without us having to do source .env every single time. So what we can do in our make file, we can do something like dash include .env and now we can create shortcuts for commands, including whatever's in our .env file. So for example, if we wanted to make a shortcut for build, which wouldn't be much of a shortcut, we would type build, colon, semicolon, and then just do forge, build. Now what we could do in our terminal is type in make build, and you'll see it'll run forge build. So this was a short example, but what about a much bigger example, right? What if we wanted to do something like deploy, Sepolia, what would that look? This little semicolon is if you want to do the command on the same line. If you don't want to do this command on the same line, you just hit enter and then tab and write your command down here. So for deploying this to Sepolia, we've done this a couple of times here, but it would be forge script script slash deploy fund me dot s dot sol deploy fund me dash RPC dash URL is going to be Sepolia RPC URL space dash private key. It's going to be private key to actually deploy it. We would do dash broadcast. And then finally, we probably would also want to automatically verify it, which we're going to teach you how to do right now. We would do dash dash verify dash dash ether scan dash API dash key and ether scan API key dash one, two, three, four, and then just some visibilities like that. Whew. Now, if I toggle my word wrap, this is obviously a very big command, and this would suck to have to write out every single time. For us to verify every single time, up oh, and actually, excuse me, in make file, you need to circle your environment variables with the dollar sign and these parentheses. In order for Foundry to automatically verify stuff for us, we need to get, we need to go to Etherscan, and we need to sign up for our own API key. So we're gonna go ahead and sign up, Foundry course. We'll get our email, we'll go ahead and log in. I'm not a robot. And cool, once we're logged in, we can go up to our profile 
down to API keys. We can add to create a new API key. Or maybe foundry full course. And now we can use this API key, copy it, bring it over here, drop it into our .env as our ether scan API key like this. And while I'm here, I'm also going to add in my private key. But remember, this is for your dummy account only. I would never ever add my actual private key associated with real money in a .env file. That is ridiculous. Cool. Let's copy the private key. Go back in here. We'll do private key equals this. Okay. And cool. And now we have this super giant script, but we can run this whole thing in one command by just saying make deploy Sepolia. Now you don't have to run this command with me because again, we are deploying to a real network here and this does cost money, but feel free to watch and follow along here. So now you can see what the actual script is doing down here. And we can see it's actually running our script without us having to do this giant command here. And just to note, I am doing toggle word wrap. All this is on one line, but if you do jump into the command pilot, which again, this is command palette. This is file viewer, command palette, file viewer, command palette. And you do toggle word wrap, it'll automatically wrap the words around. But we can see we're actually sending this contract. We can see we actually are starting to verify the contract as well, right from our command line, just because we have an etherscan API key. In fact, now if I go to polia.io, paste this contract address in here, we can see, oh my goodness, it's already been verified for us. And we didn't even have to go to Etherscan ourselves and verify. It did it for us. Fantastic. So we deployed it and verified it all programmatically directly from our command line. Great job. So we've done this and we've done this. Now, I'm not going to go too deep into make files. However, I'm going to give you a framework that I like to use to make setting up make files a lot easier. If you go to Foundry Fund Me F23, the GitHub repo associated with this course, and you scroll down to the make file, we've got actually this whole setup to make it a lot easier that you can go ahead and use. Using that make file, if we scroll down to usage in here, oh, and by the way, you can of course always do cast send to interact instead of scripts, but whatever you wanna do, you can use this as a much easier way to get set up. So for now, I'm actually just gonna copy paste this whole thing, paste it into my make file here. I copied too much, way too much. Wow, okay, whoopsies. And let's just walk through this. So this dot .phony just tells make that all of these are not folders. And just anytime I have any command here, I pretty much just always put it in dot .phony. Default anvil key, this is the just the default private key for anvil. We add this little help section so that if you just run make help, it'll tell you exactly how you can do stuff which is really helpful. So if we want to deploy something, we do make deploy args equals dash dash network Sepolia, which is really nice, or make deploy args equals, or make fund args equals network Sepolia. We can do forge clean, remove Git modules. We can reinstall all the packages, update packages, compile, test, snapshot, format our code, run an Anvil node. And then this is the most interesting stuff down here, because if I wanted to, if I did this, I could do clear, I could do make anvil, which will spin up an anvil node. I could spin up a new terminal and then run. Well, let's run make help real quick. So I'll do make deploy args equals dash dash network anvil. Actually, we don't need to do any args for anvil because it defaults to anvil. If I just do make deploy, we'll automatically deploy to our anvil chain here. And we do indeed do that. If we wanted to deploy to Sepolia, we would do make deploy args equals dash dash network Sepolia, like that. Like I said, I'm not going to go too deep into make files. If you want to learn more about make files, you can definitely chat GPT them, AI them, or Google them. But they're incredibly helpful for making it so that we don't have to write these super long commands anytime we want to do something basic. All right, so now let's finally do our last step here, which is gonna be push to GitHub. You have done a ton this project, and this is the final step. Oh my goodness, what a badass GitHub repo you are about to push up. 
A couple of notes when we do this. The first thing is make sure that .env is in your .gitignore. I additionally like to add broadcast in here as well. I don't like to push broadcast up. Anything that's not in here, you could accidentally push up publicly to your GitHub. So we don't want to do that. Sometimes it's good to even keep lib out, and I'm actually going to do that here. I'm going to put take lib out as well. All right, so let's learn how to push our code up to GitHub. We're using this hard hat free code camp because I've made it in one of my previous videos. And we're starting from a blank GitHub. So at this point, you should have a GitHub repository. And you'll probably see even less on here than what you see right now because yours will be totally blank. GitHub and Git and version control is so crucial because it's how most of the crypto community interacts and builds with each other. So anytime you go to any GitHub repository, like for example, the Aave protocol, which is completely open source, you can come in here and you can make issues on the repo. You can make pull requests. You can actively participate in working with these protocols. For example, Solidity, which is what we're working on right now, is also an open source repo. And I know I've been saying this a lot, but repo is slang for repository. A code repository is where all the code of a project belongs. It's one of the beautiful things with Web3 and crypto is that all the smart contracts you're going to work with are open source. You can actually see the code, learn from the code, and get better yourself. And if you're asking for places to participate and contribute, most of these protocols have grants and they'll actually pay you to help them work with their code. Or if you just want to learn, you can make pull requests to code bases as well. When I was first getting started in Web3, one of the best things I did was make contributions to the Brownie repo, which is a Pythonic smart contract framework similar to Foundry. And I did it for free because I wanted to learn and I wanted to see if I could contribute. Doing stuff like this allowed me to learn much faster and get to meet and interact with a lot of people in the community. And it's a ton of fun. And like I said, this will be your profile for careers, for jobs, etc. Anytime I'm interviewing a candidate for my roles, one of the first things I do is actually look at their GitHub. Now, GitHub is a centralized company, and there are decentralized Git solutions being worked on right now, but none of them are really popular at the moment. So with that being said, if we're at the GitHub docs right now, we can go ahead to get started, and we can even go to the quick start. There's a whole lot of docs here. We should, of course, already have a GitHub profile set up. And if you want, you can go to this create a repo section, which will teach you how to create a repo directly through the website. But we want to do it from the command line. Why? Because we are engineers and we want to do what? That's right. We want to work incredibly hard to be incredibly lazy. And we don't want to have to log onto the internet every single time. We want to make changes to our code. So what we're going to do is we're going to follow this documentation called adding locally hosted code to GitHub. Because our code here is obviously locally hosted. And we're going to push it to GitHub. So if we scroll down in the docs here, it gives us a little bit of and we down we get to the, our first bit, initializing a Git repository. So if we haven't already installed Git, which we should, you want to first install Git before we keep going. The directions for installing Git can be found here and the GitHub repo associated with this course. And you'll know you've done it right if you can do Git dash dash version and you see something like this show up could be a slightly different version. If this Git version doesn't pop up, pause the video and go and install Git. If you run into trouble, of course, you can use the discussions here or your AI friend. Now that you have Git, we need to initialize a Git repository. Foundry actually automatically initializes a Git repository for us. Most of the time, you can just run Git status and see some type of output that might look like this. If you don't see an output that looks like that after running Git status, you might have to do Git init dash B main. <clears throat> and if we run this now, we'll get a warning. Reinit ignored, reinitializing existing Git repository because we already have a Git repository in here. If you're using an earlier version of Git, we could do something like this. But then what we want to do is we want to do something called adding our files. So if we do clear now, so first let's make sure we're on this correct folder, right? So we'll do an LS. Ah, we can see all the stuff that we're in. We'll do PWD as well. PWD allows us to see the path that we're currently in. LS prints all the folders and files in our current directory or folder, right? This is indeed the correct folder. If you're not in the correct folder, you can CD down or CD up into your correct folder. But before we do git add, we usually want to do a git status. This git status will tell us, well, let me pull this up here. This git status will tell us 
what files and folders we're going to push up to GitHub. One of the things we should always check when doing git status is, is a dot env in here, or is there any sensitive information in here? And then I'll explain some of these greens and red stuff in a second. But looking at this, I see get modules, that's fine. Those libs are fine. Git ignore is good. We definitely want to push up git ignore because git ignore is good. We deleted those counters, so those are good. Git snapshot, make file. Okay, the rest of this looks pretty good. Let's clear this for now. If I were to pull this down, and I were to open up my dot git ignore, which we can do by either going to here and selecting dot git ignore, or we can open up our file explorer with command P or control P, depending on your environment, and typing in dot git ignore, we scroll to the bottom, we see this dot mv. If I were to remove this and then save, pull my terminal up and do git status, you'll now see this dot env does indeed show up in here. We absolutely don't want this because these are the files that we're going to potentially push up to GitHub and expose to the internet. So we don't want to, we absolutely don't want to do this. We want to make sure our dot env is in our dot git ignore. So we can do that. Or if you're being a total badass, you've encrypted your key in a separate file outside of this package, or maybe you're just going to use third web deploy instead of actually putting private keys in here. But in any case, we're going to do clear. And now we're going to do git add period. This period says add all of the folders and all the files that are in here in that git status, except for the ones obviously in the dot git ignored. Now, if I do git status now, you'll see they're all green. This means that all these green stuff are changes to be committed. They're staged, if you will. They're in a stage position. These are all the changes that we're going to commit to our history. So if we type git log right now, we can actually see a list of something called commits. We can see two in here right now. You might see a different number. I see two. Git keeps a versioned history of your code base. This way in the future, if you make a mistake, you can revert back to a previous version very easily. So now if we do git status again, we'll see all this green stuff. We'll look through these and it looks like these are good. There's no dot env here in here. All of this looks like looks solid. We'll do our first commit. So we'll do git commit dash M, which stands for message, our first commit, little exclamation point, and hit enter. And you'll see something like this pop up. And then you might get something like this if you've never worked with Git before. Your name and the email were added automatically. We're a little bit confused here. We'll talk about this in a second. Now, if I do a git status, it says on branch main, nothing to commit, working tree clean. But if I do git log, I now see a new commit, our first commit, even though it's the third commit, it's fine. <laughs> our first commit, great. But if you flip over to your GitHub and you hit refresh, there's still nothing up here. So this commit history is stored locally in our computer. We wanna push up all that code up to GitHub here. And that's what we're gonna do next. So we did git add, we did git commit, and then we're gonna do this bit, importing a git repository with the command line. After you initialize the Git repository, you can push the repository to GitHub using GitHub CLI or Git. One thing we can do is you can download this GitHub CLI with GH. We're gonna do it directly with Git because if you wanna work with GitLab or Radical or something else in the future, you'll be able to do it fine. So we're gonna scroll down to adding a local repository to GitHub using Git. It's important to note that GitHub and Git are actually different. Git is this version control thing. If I do Git log, it's this tool that allows us to do this version control. GitHub is a website that allows us to push our Git logs and our Git commits and all of our Git stuff. So Git is a tool. GitHub is a company and a website that allows us to push our Git stuff. So first thing we're gonna need to do is create a new repository on github.com. So we're gonna go to GitHub, our GitHub. We're gonna go to repositories. We're gonna do new. We're gonna call this foundry fund me f23 or whatever you want to call it and call it foundry first repo probably no exclamation mark or be like thanks crypto is awesome or something like that i'm going to do foundry fund me f23 add a description if you want let's make it public we're going to do some open sourcey stuff and we're going to skip the rest of this for now if you're really nervous about private keys and stuff, you can make this private, but keep in mind, even making this private doesn't mean your private key is safe because 
anybody who works at GitHub could see your private key. So we're going to make this public and it's good to get used to making public projects. And now you have a project on your resume and that's really cool. If you make it private, nobody can see your sick projects on your resume. So let's create this repository. And now we see we have a repository here and it's completely blank, right? There's no code in here. There's nothing going on in here. So we've done that though. Let's move to the next step. At the top of your repository, click the little copy thing to copy the remote repository URL. So here, so on my GitHub, we scroll down here, quick setup. If you've done this kind of thing before, just go ahead and copy this bit here. And we're going to run a couple of commands here. So first we're going to run git remote add origin and then paste that URL. This remote keyword refers to a website like GitHub. Add is saying we're going to add a remote place for us to push our code. Origin is a shortened name for this giant URL and this giant URL is the actual place. So with that, if we do git remote dash V, we actually can see all the different places we can push and pull our code from. Right now it's just the single because that's the one we added. So fetch is pull and push and they're both pointing to the same place. Next, we're going to do git push dash u origin main. Git push dash u origin main. This is saying we want to push all of our current code to the URL associated with origin, which it's this one right here and on the main branch. Don't worry about branches yet. Now, if you run into an issue like this, or if you just run into any issue, there's a couple different ways to troubleshoot. One of the ways is actually asking ChatGPT. ChatGPT is pretty darn good at troubleshooting Git and GitHub issues. One thing I can do for me, my issue is that I'm logged in as my main account, but I'm trying to push to this hard hat free code camp account. So I might do git config user.name and then I'll add user.name and I'll add this. And what this will do is it'll change the user that I'm trying to sign in with. And then we can do git push origin because origin is now pointing to this repo that we made and this is where we want to push to. And then we'll say main because main is the main branch that we want to work on. Again, don't worry too much about branches. And for me, it's asking for my GitHub password. And hopefully you'll see an output that looks like this. If you go back to your code and you ref and you hit refresh, you'll see all your code being pushed onto this GitHub repository. Fantastic. Now you have a project on your GitHub. And like I said, if you run into problems, ChatGPT or find or some other AI buddy are normally very good at helping you out and working with Git and making sure that Git works. This is phenomenal. Now, of course, we're going to go ahead and check this off. Our readme looks pretty terrible here. So if this were going to be more professional, we would have a little about section. This is a crowdsourcing app. We'd have a quick, a getting started with requirements, quick start and some, and yada, yada, yada. We would do, if we save that, we would do then get add dot, get commit minus M updated readme, get push. Oops. And then actually we can just do this so that we can just run git push instead of git push or domain every single time. I'm going to copy this line. Now, if I come back over to my project and I refresh, we'll see there are now four commits. This updated readme is my most recent one. If I scroll down to the readme, we now have an about blah, blah, blah and stuff. If you're looking for some extra credit, try setting up this readme without reading my readme. And then once you think you have a pretty solid readme, go to the foundry full course, GitHub repo associated with this course, scroll down to less than seven, go to the code base here, and you can actually go ahead and see if your readme is better than mine. Now that we know a little bit more about how Git works, you can see actually in my readme, if you scroll down, we have this thing called quick start with Git clones. Anytime you want to copy somebody else's code base locally, you can just run this Git clone. For example, if I'm in my VS code, I pull up the terminal, I'm going to go down a directory, pwd, great, great, I'm here, ls, I can make a directory, Patrick fund me f23, I can come in and do git clone, paste that URL, the chain excel org, Patrick fund me f23, hit enter, and now if I type ls, I'll have Patrick fund me f23, and if we do code, 
Patrick fund me F23, which will open up our VS code or do file open this folder. We can see this, this is actually Patrick's project pulled down from GitHub for us. Awesome work. And with that being said, you now have a project on your GitHub that you can show off. If you're excited about this, just scroll down, hit this tweet me button and tweet at me like this and just get super hyped up, right? Like I said, it's great to celebrate the little wins. Whew. So I know this was an absolutely massive section. So let's do a little refresher on what we learned and then we'll call it a day. So here's what we learned. We learned more about how to set up a Foundry project more professionally. We have our source folder with many different contracts in here. We learned how to refactor our code base so we can make it more modular. We're passing a price feed in so that we can deploy this FundMe contract to any chain we want. We've added an interactions script, which has two different contracts, fund fund me and withdraw fund me, which we can use to withdraw and fund our most recently deployed contract. We learned more about working with mocks and testing, running integration tests, forking testing. We learned a lot about gas. We learned about storage. We learned a tiny bit about make files and we built our first GitHub repo and we pushed it up and we are incredibly proud that we've done so. So now is a great time to take a break. And if you've made it this far, you have most of the basic knowledge to begin going on your own. If you really wanted to, you could stop taking the course right now and just be on your way. <laughs> However, we wanna make you not just okay, but phenomenal and prepared for everything this space has to offer. So take a walk, take a break, get some coffee, get some ice cream, do whatever you want to do to take some you time and we'll see you in the next project. All right, welcome to lesson eight. You come down to the GitHub repo associated with this course. We can scroll down to lesson eight and all the code that we're gonna be working with is here. Now, it's gonna be a little bit easier. You do not have to code at all for this one. Congratulations. For this one, we're gonna do it a little bit different. For this one, I'm going to teach you the basics of how your MetaMask or how your wallet interacts with a website so that you have that foundational knowledge. I think it's incredibly important for you to know how to do this, and it's incredibly important for you to verify that your wallet is sending the transaction that you actually want it to send. We are not going to be teaching you how to build a full stack application here. However, if you want, there are some examples on how to do this in the full blockchain Solidity course JS, where we actually make full stack applications with Node.js. However, this HTML FundMe F23 has a very basic raw JavaScript full website application that if you want to try to replicate it, you can absolutely do so. Additionally, once we get web3education.dev up, we will have some full stack examples in here as well. But it is important that you understand what's going on under the hood when you're interacting with these websites. And the knowledge we're gonna teach you here will work for every single website that you interact with. So you can actually know exactly what's going on when you interact with a website, sending a transaction to the blockchain. So normally I walk you through what we're gonna do, but for this one, we're just gonna go ahead and we're gonna jump right in. And now that you've downloaded Git and you've been working with Git and GitHub, we can actually start working with this code base as if we had just come across it. So if we pull up our code base, we're at Foundry F23, that repo with all of our code in it. What we can do is we can copy this URL and begin to work with it as if we just downloaded right from GitHub. Now, all of my readmes, like I said, are gonna have this quick start, which you can go ahead and follow. This of course should be Cypher. But what we can do to get started with this Git repo is we can go ahead and clone it, Git clone, paste that in here. And then we can code HTML, fund me F23 or file, open that. Oh, it looks like I already have it open here. And great, we have this HTML fund me repo here. 
Now, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to spin up this website. So this HTML fund me has some very basic HTML and JavaScript to run a website. I'm going to use this extension called live server, which you can install to run the website right from your VS code. Alternatively, you can open this up. You could right click reveal and finder or just open this up in whatever file explorer you, that you use, double click it and open it up right in your browser. And this is what the website looks like. I'm going to go ahead though and use this go live button instead, which will open it up here as opposed to in my path, the VS code will actually be serving it up. So this is the website. This is the minimalistic website that we're going to be using to show you exactly how MetaMask interacts with the website. Now, the first thing to understand when working with a website is this MetaMask bit. If I right click and I hit inspect, I get this little window over here. And if I hit this double arrow, I can go over to the console. Now, this is a live JavaScript shell, which has a lot of information about the browser that we're working in here. If you don't know JavaScript, don't worry about it. But the most important bit here is that if you have MetaMask or some wallet, what it does is it injects it into your browser object. This browser object in this JavaScript shell is known as the window object. And if I type window in here, I get all this stuff, all these functions that I can call on this window object. And one of the objects that comes with the window is this window.ethereum. MetaMask injects this window.ethereum object into our browser. And it's this window.ethereum JavaScript object that these front ends, these websites interact with to send transactions to our MetaMask or to any wallet that we're working with. If, for example, we were to switch to a browser that does not have MetaMask installed, go to that same site, we right click, inspect, we go over to console, and I type in window.ethereum here, we get undefined because this has no MetaMask. It has no API for us to connect with. The MetaMask documentation has all of the information in here that you need to know to actually send and work with this window.ethereum object if you want to learn more. So cool. So this is our website and we know we have this window.ethereum object. Now in our HTML fund me F23, if we scroll over to this index.js, we can actually see the code that a website will use to actually interact with our wallet. And usually one of the first things that you'll see is most websites will have some connect button. It's a button for them to know, hey, there is a man of mask here and there are accounts in here that we can actually connect to and send transactions to. So here's an example, if you go to this index.js file of some JavaScript that allows people to connect and work with the MetaMask. This is what one of those async functions will look like. So one of the first steps they do is they check to see that this window.ethereum object even exists. And if it does exist, they'll do something and they'll call something like this function, await ethereum.request eth request accounts. This is a function that the MetaMask object has that allows the website to see that there are indeed accounts that it can send transactions to. It's not taking your private key or exposing your private key. It's just allowing the website to send transactions for you to actually sign. So in my HTML here, I've got this button. And again, you don't really need to know HTML or JavaScript here, but I've got this button called connect button. And in my JavaScript, I've got this line connect button equals document dot get element by ID connect button and connect button dot on click is going to call our connect function. And this connect function is going to first check to see if MetaMask exists with this line and then try to connect one of those accounts. Right now, if we go to our MetaMask, we can see here that we're not connected to the site. But if we go ahead and we click the connect button, you'll see MetaMask pop up and ask to connect to one of our accounts to which we can select an account to connect. And this is how our website actually gets connected. And now we can see, oh, let me switch to account one. Now we can see our account one is indeed connected. Now that we're connected and we have some accounts, we can then lower on call one of these functions. And great. So this website has some functions that look pretty familiar or should look pretty familiar. We have a get balance, a withdraw and a fund. This website is actually designed to work with our Foundry Fund Me that we just created. So if we go back to Foundry Fund Me, it's designed to work with this contract. If we go to SRC, fundme.sol, function fund, it's designed to work with fund. 
and then also withdraw. And then finally, see the balance. If I right click and I hit inspect, and I hit the drop down, I go to console, I hit get balance, depending on the network that I'm on, I'd get the balance of some address. And if we look in the code, there's this constants folder, which has this contract address that's hard coded in, and we'll get the address of whatever contract is here. On ETH mainnet, apparently there's a contract there. How is it actually making this call? How is it reading off the blockchain? If we go back to this index.js and we look for that get balance function. We can see it's doing some interesting stuff here. So first it's checking to see that MetaMask exists. And then it's doing this line, const provider equals new ethers.provider.web3 provider. This ethers package is a JavaScript package that makes it easy to interact and work with MetaMask. Remember how in MetaMask, if we go to our MetaMask, we select the little button, we go to settings, networks, add network. We can actually see in our MetaMask popping up, we can see all these different networks. We can go to add a network manually. Actually, let's just go back to networks. We see that each one of these networks comes with this RPC URL. So what's happening when we call this get balance function, and it looks like for some reason this address has some balance in it, it's making an API call via this RPC URL in our MetaMask. So if we try to call fund or withdraw, it would try to call fund or withdraw onto this address. Now, in our MetaMask right now, we're connected to ETH mainnet. And what we're gonna wanna do is we're gonna wanna practice interacting with a real contract using the Foundry Fund Me that we just created. So if we pull up our terminal, we'll go down in directory, we'll go to CD Foundry Fund Me F23. What we can do is we can say make Anvil and we'll start a local Anvil chain, create a new terminal here. Now we'll go down a directory, we'll go down back to Foundry Fund Me F23. Now we'll run make deploy. This will deploy a Fund Me contract onto our Anvil chain. Remember, Foundry Fund Me, we go to our Foundry Fund Me repo, we go down to our make file, we go to the deploy target in the make file. We see we're running forge script deploy fund me with network args, which if you don't say anything, it'll default to the Anvil network. So now we ran make deploy, we deployed a contract fund me to this address. And if you look in constants.js, it looks like that's already the address that's right here. Perfect. So what we can do on the front end then is we go up to our MetaMask, we'll go to settings, networks, add network, and we'll go ahead and we'll add a network manually for Anvil. We'll type Anvil, the RPC URL we can find right here from our terminal. We'll copy that. We'll do HTTP dot dot slash slash paste that in. I already have this network, so it's going to tell me, hey, this URL is already currently in use. The chain ID is 31337. Currency symbol is ETH or GO or whatever you want to make it. And there's no block explorer. And then you normally hit save. Well, like I said, I already have it in here. So we can just select Anvil and boom, all the details are right here. Now in our MetaMask, what we can do is we can flip over to this Anvil chain and begin to interact with this website connected to our blockchain with this FundMe contract that was just deployed. So now we go and we can go ahead and connect. We can hit get balance, which is gonna be zero because we just deployed this contract and we have our withdraw and fund functions here. Now, obviously if I try to fund with 0 0.1 at fund, we're gonna get an error here because this account doesn't have any money. But what we can do is we can grab one of the private keys from Anvil, we'll copy this, we'll go back, go to accounts, import account, private key, paste it in, hit import, and I've already imported it, so it's saying the account I'm trying to import is a duplicate. Then we can scroll down to that account that we just imported and connect to that account instead. And now we have an account with some actual money in it. Okay, great. So now we have an account, it's actually connected via the Anvil chain. Now an important note, if this Anvil chain goes down, or for example, you are following along and you turn it off and you come back to MetaMask, and maybe you'll switch networks, switch back to Anvil, you're gonna get this whirling circle of death and you can X out or do something like that. Or you can kill the network and re-import it. Or you can just turn your chain back on. Come back, switch over to Anvil, and we're connected again. Now, since you just killed this network and restarted it though, if you did deploy with make deploy, you'd have to run make deploy again. And great. 
and we can go back to our front end, and we can see it was this account four that was the one that actually deployed that contract. So let's do a little refresh to get rid of that warning. We'll go ahead and reconnect. Looks like we're good. If we go to MetaMask here, we're connected. Awesome. So now we can hit this get balance function, like I said, and it's returning the balance of that contract address that we just deployed. So what we can do now is we can call this fund function by putting an amount in the amount section. If I call fund, MetaMask actually pops up saying, hey, do you want to call this fund function? And we're going to go, oh, how does it know actually how to do that? If we go back to our Git repo and we'll go ahead and hide the terminal, not delete it. We can go to our index.js. We'll look for the fund function because we have the fund button and we're saying fund button click call the fund function. We'll scroll down here. What it does when we call this fund function is at first it gets this eth amount by calling document dot get element by id eth amount dot value. So it's grabbing this 0 0.1 out of here on the front end. We're checking to see if MetaMask exists on the front end. We're doing this provider line, which gets the RPC URL from inside of our MetaMask. Again, we use ethers to get the RPC URL out of it. We get this signer, which allows us to grab this contract, this account for that is connected. This signer equals provider dot get signer. It gets that account for. And then we're doing this line contract equals new ethers contract. And to interact with anything, remember, we need a contract address. We need an ABI. And to send the transaction, we need a signer. So the contract address we're getting from our constants file, which is right here. And if we pull up our terminal, it's the same as what we deployed here. And if it's not the same, we would just copy paste it in there. The ABI we also get from our constants file. And this ABI has all the functions that we can call on that contract. One of them obviously is the fund function down here. I'm gonna, I'll go ahead and hide this again. And then we have this transaction here where we do await contract.fund the transaction and we send some value by doing this ethers.utils.parse ether, which turns that 0 0.1 into way like 0 0.1 gets sent to 1, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, right? And that's how this MetaMask actually pops up here because we're sending this transaction in JavaScript. Now, what this does is it sends the transaction to our MetaMask. So the website never accesses and never actually sees the private key. The private key always stays inside of this MetaMask. So the website sends a transaction to the MetaMask. The MetaMask pops up and says, do you want to sign this with the private key? And you can confirm or reject. Now in here, there's a lot of data, right? If we go to data, it looks like MetaMask was smart enough to know that this is calling a fun function, but it's having a hard time knowing what is actually happening. But we can see the raw transaction data in this hex section of the transaction. And then of course we can see 0 0.1 go or Ethereum, the value being 0 0.1, right? So this should be the fund function. And we can actually verify that this is indeed the fund function by using the cast command to verify this data. So here, now I'm going to be teaching you a little introduction to function selectors. And we're going to talk about this a lot more later on. But the important thing to know is that in our contracts, all of our solidity functions get transformed into this thing called a function selector. And like I said, we'll learn more about it a lot later. But if we go to our function fund, this needs to get broken down to some low level bytecode, right? And when we send this transaction, we need to convert this human readable fund into the actual bytecode, the actual EVM low level code for Ethereum to understand what function we're actually calling. So what MetaMask actually does when calling this fund function is it converts it to its function selector. And we can actually find the function selector ourselves by using a cast command. So we'll run cast sig, which stands for signature fund like this. And we'll get an output like this. This means the function signature fund returns the function selector this. And again, don't worry about these terms right now. We're going to explain them in depth much later. And this will make sense much later. But what we can do is we want to make sure that this website that we're using isn't calling a malicious function, right? We want to make sure it's actually calling the fund function. So we can run this command, get this function selector, and then go check out the hex here and say, do these 
do these actually match? So I can actually copy this hex data. Maybe I'll drop to the bottom of this, paste it here, and we'll grab what it should be here. And boom, okay, great. These do indeed match. If I were to, for example, reject this transaction, and I'm going to go to our constants, I'm going to update this fund function from fund to steal money. Let's say there is another function called steal money, right? I'm going to go ahead and save this. Cast sig steal money would have a different what's called function signature. And again, don't worry about it too much, but it just has a different like low level hex encoding of this. So now if we change this to steal money, and maybe the website was malicious, and instead of the fund function calling fund, it called steal money instead, we would want to make sure that we're not calling this steal money function. So if I refresh the front end, I'll put 0 0.1 in here, I'll hit fund. If we go to the data, if we go to the hex, what we can do then is we can copy this hex, bring it back to the bottom, paste it in here, we can say, oh, it looks like this is the function that our MetaMask is calling. And we can run cast sig, steal money like this and see, oh my goodness, our website is actually calling the steal money function and not the fund function that I want it to be calling. So this is a taste of how we can actually verify the transactions that we're calling. Now, if this has function parameters, we can do this thing called call data to code. So these are functions that don't have any parameters, right? fund and steal money both don't have any parameters if they did have parameters this hex data would be a lot bigger right because you, we'd have to send a lot more data to call the function so later on when you want to verify a transaction that has parameters what you do is cast dash dash call data dash decode you paste the data actually let me see what this does it goes say call data so you do cast dash dash call data to code maybe something you know paste the signature paste the call data and if there are parameters in here and parameters with the call data, it would tell you what each parameter of this function is. And this is not a great example because there's no parameters in here. But like I said, you'll learn about this methodology later. So I just wanted to introduce it to you here that when you are sending transactions in MetaMask, you are going to be the developers. You are going to be the ones smart enough to know how to actually decode them. Like I said, we'll go in depth more with that a little bit later. But I'm going to go ahead and reject this for now. We're going to go back to our constants, we're going to change this back to fund, we're going to refresh, we're going to go back to index, and we're going to steal money, we're going to change this back to fund like this. Okay, great. So now, if I go ahead and refresh now, I put 0 0.1 in here, I hit fund, MetaMask is going to pop up, I can go to hex, I can see this here, I can go down, I'll do cast, I'll clear, I'll do cast sig fund like this, I'll see that I'm expecting to call this function here. So I'll paste this here and I'll go to my MetaMask. I'll copy this. I'll see if they're the same. And sure enough, they are. Okay, great. So now though, I'm going to go ahead and hit confirm. And when we hit confirm, our MetaMask is actually signing this transaction and sending the function via that API call, right? That 127.0.0.155000, that RPC URL that we gave it for Anvil. Right? And if we're on a mainnet or testnet, it's going to be that Infura endpoint that comes built into MetaMask, right? But now that we've sent it, we can actually call get balance now. We can see the balance has indeed increased, right? The balance has upped. What I could do now is withdraw, as we know. We go back to our Foundry Fund Me. We go to SRC. We go to Fund Me. We go to Function Withdraw. We know that this is an only owner function. So if we go back to our our application here, calling withdraw from the owner will of course work. But if I switch, let's go ahead and switch to a different account. We'll go, actually, let's go ahead and we'll send some money between our accounts. We'll send some money to account three, we'll send maybe a hundred, doesn't really matter. We'll go ahead and confirm this. And this is sending, of course, on our Anvil chain, right? Because that's the one that we're on. Now, if I switch over to account three, which now has 100, I'll connect to my account three. If I try to call withdraw, we're going to get this RPC error, right? Execution error, right? Call withdraw. Maybe we'll go ahead and refresh. Are we still on account three? We sure are. Withdraw. We're getting an error, right? Because it's only owner. But if I switch back from Anvil from account three back to account four, now we're connected via account four. I'll call withdraw here. We'll see MetaMask does indeed pop up. If we go to the hex. We can see this hex here. I'll pull up my 
MetaMask to make sure. I'll do cast sig withdraw. Okay, great. This is the hex for our withdraw function. Those look like they're the same. Awesome. So I can have some assurance that I want to head and confirm and call this withdraw function. So we're going to get that 0.1 out. Remember before the balance was 0.1. Once this finishes mining, the balance will go back to zero. And sure enough, that's exactly what we see. So I know this was a quick lesson, but I wanted to show you from a low level what actually interacting with these websites really looks like. And if you're interested in doing more full stack work, feel free to come check out this repo, this HTML, which has all the HTML and raw JavaScript for interacting with a website. There are a ton of tools for working with React and Svelte and other frameworks as well if you're interested in building more full stack applications too. And if you're unfamiliar with JavaScript, some of this might have been a little bit tricky, but let's at least do a refresher on the important things to know when it comes to interacting with websites and what's actually happening under the hood. In order for a website to send a transaction to your wallet, you need to connect to that wallet in some capacity. And one of the most popular ways is by injecting your browser extension into right into the browser. A browser can check to see that the MetaMask object is there by doing a check on window.ethereum and seeing if it gets a return. There are other ways to inject other types of wallets into browsers as well, like Wallet Connect, Ledger, et cetera. But at the end of the day, they're all going to connect some type of object to the website so the website can send transactions to the browser. You'll usually hit connect, and then you'll see in whatever wallet you're using that you're indeed connected. When a website wants to send a transaction to our wallet, what it does is it first needs to get the provider or the RPC URL out of the MetaMask. And with ethers, you see that the line that does that right here. And what that line is doing is essentially is saying, hey, MetaMask, I know you got some settings. I know you have some networks in here. I would like access to that RPC URL, please, so I can send transactions. And additionally, I would like access to one of those accounts in there so I can send transactions to one of those accounts. Can you tell me who's connected so I can go ahead and send transactions? Once it's connected, it'll send a transaction to our wallet. Again, the private key never leaves your wallet and we wouldn't want to use a wallet that actually exposes the private key. So the website sends a transaction to our browser where if we do one now, the browser will prompt us, hey, would you like to sign this transaction to which we have to confirm or deny? We learned a very basic way of checking on something called the function selector or the function signature to make sure that the website isn't trying to be malicious and do a bad transaction for us. We will learn later on in the course how to decode more complex transactions and more complex functions rather than just this one, which has no parameters. But we could go ahead and, for example, confirm this. In my YouTube, I've got a much longer video if you want to check it out which goes over how to actually connect your front end, if you're interested, to your smart contracts a couple different ways. We have a raw HTML, a Next.js and Ethers, Next.js and Web3 React, Next.js and Morales, Next.js and Web3 Model. There's a lot of different ways to actually connect your front ends to your websites. But if you want to learn more about how this works, definitely be sure to check out this video. The link to this will be in the GitHub repo associated with this course. And of course, all the code associated with this lesson is in the GitHub repo associated with this course as well, if you want to learn more about how front ends and websites work. So that's it for this lesson. I know this one was quick, but I do think it's really important that you understand how websites work when working with these smart contracts so you can work with them intelligently and know what to look out for. This was a basic introduction. And as we learn more, like I said, about function selectors and function signatures, we'll get a lot better at working with these websites. And then additionally, being sure to protect ourselves against malicious transactions. So now's a great time to take a break. I know this was a quick one and I'll see you in the next one. All right, welcome back. Hope you had a fantastic break because we are about to get started with lesson or project 
9. Once again, if you scroll down in the course, down to lesson 9 here, we have the entire code base that we're going to be working with right here. And this is going to be a wonderful project for your portfolio. Why? Because we are going to not only write an advanced lottery or raffle smart contract, we're going to give you even more best practices to work with so that not only can you build a really cool project, but you understand the best practices and your code looks phenomenal. So we're going to be learning a lot in this lesson. We're going to learn about events, working with true random numbers, working with modulos, chain link automation, and so much more. Now I'm going to show you exactly what the final product is going to look like and all the code here. So don't follow along, just go ahead and watch. But one of the things that's cool is we can actually just scroll down the readme and go ahead and just go right into the quick start, right? We have Git, we have Foundry. So if we were looking to contribute to this code base ourselves, we could just do a little Git clone. Now, if we do LS, we have this smart contract lottery, we could do a code or a file open Foundry smart contract lottery here, open this up here. And here's going to be our final product. So now that we have this, we can see some of the contracts in the left here, we want to run a forge build or a make build since we're going to do a make file. And this is going to install all the dependencies that we need and compile our code, of course. All right, great. And then we can even go into these contracts here and we can see what we're actually going to be building here. We've got some weird comments at the top, which we'll talk about in a little bit. And we have even more better looking and professional NAT spec for this project. And this is why this is such an amazing project to do because again, the code base looks good. You can often tell how good a software engineering group is just by how good the code looks. And we have this raffle or lottery smart contract. And what this contract will do is we have a way for users to enter the raffle and we have this weird check up keep stuff, which we'll talk about in a little bit. And we have this weird fulfill random words, but this fulfill random words basically picks a winner based off of those who entered and pays them money based off of the entered people. So this is a provably fair, a provably random lottery. And then we have a whole bunch of getter functions down here. We're going to be building some more scripts as well to interact with this. And we're going to be using some more advanced foundry work. And this is just going to be a phenomenal project for us to have. So once we've done forge build, we can look in our make file and we can see all the different commands that we have here. We of course can deploy our smart contracts. We have a couple of scripts here that we haven't worked before to interact with the chain link automation much easier. We can, with all these scripts and all this code, we can actually deploy a provably fair and a provably random lottery, which if you remember back at the beginning of the course, we talked about the lottery example, this would be a solution to actually solve that. So let's go ahead and let's start building this. If you did go ahead and get clone, we'll see the downer directory, we can type rm r f boundary smart contract lottery f 23. Be very careful with running this rm r f command. This stands for remove dash remove force. So only run this if you absolutely have to, but I'm going to remove this directory. And I'm going to go back to f 23. And we're going to go ahead and start from scratch. Let's so let's go ahead and dive in. Remember, repetition is the mother of skill. The more you do this, the more you code, the better you'll get. So code along with me. If you want, even feel free to pause as we're coding and try to code some of this yourself. Maybe see how far you can get without me. But we're going to be explaining a lot of different things in here. So be sure to listen and follow along. And let's jump in. So since we're creating a new Foundry project, we're going to start with the basics. We're going to make a new directory called Foundry Smart Contract Lottery F23. And we're going to CD into it. Foundry Smart Contract Lottery F23. Again, I'm hitting tab to autocomplete. I'm going to do code period now that I'm in that direction. Now that I'm in that directory to open up a new VS code in that folder. And again, you can do file open that folder as well to get in here. Now that we're in here, you know, we're going to run forge init to create our new project. And if you created some stuff in here, go ahead and write forge init dash F. Cool. So now that we've started and created our initial project, one of the things that I actually like to do before I even start doing any coding is come up with a blueprint of what I want to do, 
right? What am I even trying to get this to do? What do we want this lottery to do? So this is maybe where I'll open up a readme. I'll even start building the readme right now, right? This is going to be our proveably random raffle contracts. And then maybe we'll do a little about. This code is to create a provably random smart contract lottery. And I'll think, okay, well, what do we want this to do? Okay, well, number one, users can enter pay by paying for a ticket. And maybe I'll say the ticket fees are going to go to the winner during the draw. Cool. Then I want to say after X period of time, the lottery will automatically draw a winner. And this will be done grammatically. So we're going to programmatically automatically draw a new winner every time the period is up. And we're going to be using Chainlink URF and Chainlink automation to do this. So Chainlink VRF is going to be to generate a true provably random number. Chainlink automation is going to be a time-based trigger for our lottery to automatically trigger. Now we'll talk about randomness in a little bit and how getting true randomness on the blockchain can actually be really difficult. And we want to use Chainlink VRF to actually generate a random number outside of the blockchain. Additionally, as you guys have been seeing, in order for something to happen on the blockchain, somebody has to pay some gas. Somebody has to trigger something to happen. So if we need to rely on somebody to constantly trigger something, ideally, we don't have to trust them, to be honestly. We can just use Chainlink Automation, which is a more decentralized way of having some trigger happen every X time period. So lottery is going to automatically go. We're going to use Chainlink VRF for random number. Cool. This sounds good. So now we have a rough skeleton of what we want to do, and we want to keep this in mind when we're building our contracts. Okay, so let's begin. So we have tests, SRC and script. I don't want any of these. So we're going to delete all three of them. I did command click to click all three. So I was able to delete them in just one delete. But if you're unfamiliar with that, just go ahead and right click and delete all of them. And let's create our raffle.soul. So I'm going to go to SRC, new file, raffle.soul. You already know where we're going to start with this SPDX license identifier MIT. Again, I have Copilot on, which is what's allowing me to automatically do a lot of this stuff. As of recording, version 0.8.20 just came out, which is exciting, but we're going to use Pragma Solidity Carrot 0.8.18. And this will be contract raffle like this. We'll pull up our terminal. Just to make sure we're doing a little sanity check, we'll do forge build and it looks like it's working. So we are good to go here. So let's do this. So you you saw when we were going through the walkthrough of the code that we had some code here. Typically having NAT spec to describe what your contract should even do is the best practice. So let's actually learn and do that ourselves. Oh, and it even added it in for me. Oh, and we even got a little pop up to add it in title, author and notice. Title is going to be a sample raffle contract. Author is Patrick Collins. Little notice here. This contract is for creating a sample raffle. And then maybe we also do at dev implements Chainlink VRF V2 because we're going to use Chainlink VRF V2. Cool. A little bit of NAT spec here to give the people reading our code or the AIs reading our code a little bit more. So what are some of the functions that we're going to want to do here? We're probably only going to want a few functions, right? We're going to want a function, pick winner, or excuse me. The first one we're going to want is enter raffle, right? We want users to be able to enter raffles. And we're probably going to want a function, pick winner, right? At the end of the day, this is really all the lottery needs to do. Enter a raffle and pick a programmatic, verifiably random winner. That's it, right? The pick winner should randomly choose anybody who entered and give them all the money. Right, there's we're not going to take a fee here or anything like that. Let's focus on our enter raffle function here. So we want people to pay for a ticket to enter the raffle, right? And we'll set some ticket price. We'll have the ticket price be an ETH or whatever native currency. So we obviously want to make this function payable. And then we'll probably want some ticket price, right? So the up at the top, we could do our U256 private entrance fee. And this is where you'll start to see me just automatically defaulting to making these state variables private and then creating getters later on in the section. But 
this kind of brings up a good point. Should this entrance fee be a constant? Because a constant's going to save the most money. Should this be an immutable? Because that's going to be cheaper as well. Should this be a storage variable? And we can start having this gas conversation. For us, I think we want to be able to update and change the entrance fee based off of the actual contract. So we could set that in a constructor. U into V6, entrance fee. And we'll say entrance fee equals, oops, entrance fee equals entrance fee. I know that for this contract, I don't really want to have to bother updating the entrance fee. So we can actually make this an immutable variable to save some gas. So private mutable I underscore entrance fee, and we'll only be able to save I entrance fee once. At the same time, though, we'll probably want the world to be able to get the entrance fee. So right. So at the bottom, I'll do this thing called getter functions. And we'll create a little function, get entrance fee. This will be an external view that will return a u into 256. We'll say returns I underscore entrance fee, or excuse me, return I entrance fee. All right, cool. And this setup is going to bring me to a point about the layout of your contracts, how to make your code look really good. So we talked a little bit about the style guide for solidity and the different code layout and different, and we talked about NAT spec. However, we didn't really talk about the ordering of our functions and the ordering of our calls. The Solidity docs actually do have an order of layout where we first start with our pragma, which we're actually doing great. Then we do import statements. We don't have any yet. Interfaces and libraries, we don't have any. Contracts comes next. Okay, great. And inside the contracts, do type declarations, state variables. Okay, no type declarations, but state variable right here. No events, which we'll talk about in a little bit. No modifiers. Obviously, we have some functions, which are coming next. Awesome. And even the functions have an order where you do constructor, receive, fallback, and then your external and public functions, and then your internal and private. And then within a grouping, place the view and pure functions last. And I really like that code layout, but sometimes I forget to do that. So what you'll see me do actually sometimes at the top of my code is I'll even just paste this at the top, this version -y layout, so I remember how to do that. Uh, if you go to the GitHub repo associated with this lesson, let me scroll down to where is it? The code base here. You go into src, raffle.soul. You can actually just copy this and paste it at the top. So this is the layout that we're going to be following here. And I think this layout makes your code base just look so much more professional. And it helps you know where to look for stuff when you're working with code. So this is the layout we're going to use. If you want to use your own, though, you're absolutely more than welcome to use your own code layout. But this is what the Solidity Docs recommend. And I'm down to go with the Solidity Docs. So let's get going. Cool. We have an entrance fee. Now let's use this entrance fee to allow people to call enter raffle. So this is a public payable. This actually probably should be external payable, right? Instead of public. The reason we want it to be external payable is we're probably not going to have anything inside of this function. Call it and external is a little bit more gas efficient. So we're going to do external payable. And now we're going to do our require message dot value is greater than or equal to I underscore entrance fee. And if not, we're going to say not enough ETH sent like this. Now, here's where we come to our first update. So I really want to teach you require because you're going to see it a lot. And I expect the way require works in the future will actually change. However, Solidity A, as of V0.8.4, added this thing called custom errors, where you can add an error, say the name of an error, and instead of doing a require, you just revert with the error name. Custom errors are actually a more gas efficient way to send errors, whereas require is more gas inefficient. Instead of doing a require, we can do a conditional like if something and then if that is filled, just do a revert. So in remix here, we've got an example of two different functions, which are essentially the exact same. We have one which is revert with an error. So we're saying if false, do this revert and we have this error up at the top. And down here, we have revert with require, where it's require true, otherwise do this revert. So the functionality of both of these is pretty much exactly the same, right? It's just a little bit backwards. This is saying if false revert, and this is saying require true, otherwise revert with this. And if we actually deploy these contracts, deploy, 
drop down and pull up our terminals here. If we call revert with error, we can see how much gas this would have cost if we actually sent it, right? Because remember, even a revert, you're still going to spend gas. So this revert with error would have spent 142 gas versus revert with require. If we hit that would have spent 161 gas. And you can even see Remix kind of gives a little gas heads up over here. So this revert with error, this custom error is actually much more gas efficient. So whenever we're working with errors at the moment, we actually don't ever even want to work with require. So I know I taught you require and it requires important to know because a lot of people still use it. But as of recording, you pretty much should always use custom errors because they're going to be more gas efficient. In the future, I'm willing to bet they're going to allow custom errors in here, but at the moment they don't. So please default to this syntax up here. So now that you've learned require, you learn, you've now learned to never use it again because it's much less gas efficient. So we're going to be working with errors now. And let's look at the layouts. So we have version imports errors in our layout of a contract. So what we're going to do is we're going to create an error right at the top of our raffle. So we're going to do error, not enough ETH sent. Like this is going to be the name of our error. And instead of doing this require, we're going to do the opposite of this and even GitHub Copilot's help me out. We're going to say if message.value is less than I underscore entrance fee, then revert with not enough ETH sent. So these two blocks of code essentially do the same thing. This one's just going to be more gas efficient. So that's the main difference. If message.value is less than, this one is if message.value is greater than or equal to. So use custom errors. Now, one other thing that I want to steal in you, a best practice is actually to name your errors have a, with a prefix of the name of the contract with two underscores and then the name of your error. Because when you get errors in the wild and you have hundreds of contracts, sometimes it can be really difficult to know which contract your error came from. And if they just have a prefix of the name of the contract, it becomes really easy. So now you know about how to work with errors. And then you know some best practice about actually writing these reverts out. Great. So what's next? So we have we have a minimum fee that people need to pay. Let's also now keep track of all these users in here. So we're probably going to want to store them in some type of data structure. Now, here's a great question. What data structure do you think we should use? We need a way to keep track of everyone who entered the lottery, right? So that when we pick a random winner, we can choose from all the people who have entered. So what should we use? Should we use a whole bunch of address variables? Should we use an array? Should we use a mapping? Pause for a second and type into the chat what you think we should use. I'm going to go ahead and use an array, a dynamic array, an array that will grow in size. And the reason for this will become more apparent, especially when we get to picking a winner. But the most important thing is that, as we know, mappings can't be looped through. So if we're looking to pick one random person, how are we going to choose the random person using a mapping? I don't know if you can figure that out. It's phenomenal and you should win a Nobel Prize or something. But we're going to use a mapping for this. And this is going to be a state variable. So we're going to want to put it with our other state variable right here, right underneath this. So we're going to do this is going to be an address array because it's going to be an array of players. We'll call it private and we're going to do S underscore players. Since this is going to change the number of players in this array is going to keep changing. This is going to be a storage variable and not an immutable variable. But I'm going to add one more thing to here as well. Since we're going to need to pay these players some ETH, this is going to be an address payable. So we know we can actually pay all these players once they enter the lottery. So we have our array. And now when somebody enters the lottery, we can just say S players dot push and we'll push the payable message dot sender. Remember, we need this payable keyword to make an address allowed to get ETH or whatever native token. So we're going to go ahead and push them onto our array. Awesome. So this looks pretty good. And our functions almost done here, but it's missing a couple of things. And one of the main things is actually an event. As a rule of thumb, whenever we make a storage update, we should emit an event which is this new place that we haven't really spoken about. We have a couple of videos that we're going to go ahead and watch now to 
to explain what events are and why we even use them. But the two main reasons for events is they make migrating or updating your contracts easier, and then it makes front-end indexing or storing data about contracts much easier as well. Since we're not doing too much on front-end in this course, the second one might be a little obscure to you for now, but for those of you interested, we're working on a new full stack course, so be sure to stay tuned for that. But let's go ahead and let's watch this video that I previously recorded about events. Now I have two videos on this. One is on my channel, one is on the Chainlink Labs YouTube channel. The one on the Chainlink Labs uses Hardhat, the one on my channel uses Brownie. Let's watch just the part about setting these up and working with these. And we won't actually watch the Brownie or the Hardhat part because we're gonna be working with events in Foundry ourselves. Now, if you've worked with Solidity, you've probably seen these things called events before. Or maybe you haven't seen something like events, but you've always wondered how Chainlink or the Graph or some of these other off-chain protocols work under the hood. Or maybe you just love watching these VODs. In any case, in this video, we're gonna learn all about logging and events in Solidity, how to view them on Etherscan, and we'll work with them in Brownie as well. Now, if you like Hardhat, once again, I also have a Hardhat version of the code that we're gonna go over, and I've got a Hardhat blog as well. Links are in the description. All right, let's get froggy. Now it's the Ethereum Virtual Machine, or EVM, that makes a lot of these blockchains tick, like Ethereum. And the EVM has this functionality called a logging functionality. When things happen on a blockchain, the EVM writes these things to a specific data structure called its log. We can actually read these logs from our blockchain nodes that we run. In fact, if you run a node or you connect to a node, you can make a f get logs call to get the logs. Good function naming design. Get logs gets the logs. Now inside these logs is an important piece of logging called events. And this is the main piece that we're gonna be talking about today. Events allow you to print information to this logging structure in a way that's more gas efficient than actually saving it to something like a storage variable. These events and logs live in this special data structure that isn't accessible to smart contracts. That's why it's cheaper, because smart contracts can't access them. So that's the trade-off here. We can still print some information that's important to us without having to save it in a storage variable, which is gonna take up much more gas. Each one of these events is tied to the smart contract or account address that emitted this event in these transactions. Listening for these events is incredibly helpful. Let's say, for example, you want to do something every time somebody calls a transfer function. Instead of always reading all the variables and, and looking for some to flip and switch, all you have to do is say, listen for event. Listen for that event to be emitted instead of writing some weird custom logic to see if the parameters changed at the certain time and doing some weird stuff like that. Listen for these events. So a transaction happened, an event is emitted, and we can listen for these events. This is how a lot of off-chain infrastructure works. When you're on a website and that website reloads when a transaction completes, it actually was listening for that transaction to finish, listening for that event to be emitted so that it could reload or it could do something else. It's incredibly important for front ends. It's also incredibly important for things like Chainlink and the graph. Chainlink, for example, in the Chainlink network, a Chainlink node is actually listening for request data events for it to get a random number, make an API call, or et cetera. Sometimes there are way too many events and you need to index them in a way that makes sense so that you can query all these events that happen at a later date. The graph listens for these events and stores them in the graph so that they're easy to query later on. So events are incredibly powerful and they have a wide range of uses. They're also good for testing and some other stuff, but you get the picture, they're really sick. Now that we know what events are, let's look at what they look like, how we can use them and how we might use them in our smart contract development suite. Now here's what an event is going to look like. We have an event here called stored number. So we have basically a new type of event called stored number. We're saying, hey, Solidity, hey, smart contract, we have this new event thing. We're gonna be emitting things of typed stored number in the future. When we emit this event, it's gonna have these four parameters. It's gonna have a uint256 for called old number, a uint256 called new number, a uint256 called added number, and an address called sender. Now for the astute people here, you might have noticed that there is another keyword in here the indexed keyword, and this is a really important keyword. When we emit one of these events, there are two kinds of parameters. There are the indexed parameters and the non-indexed parameters. You can have up to three 
indexed parameters, and they're also known as topics. So if you see a topic, you know that that's going to be an indexed parameter. Indexed parameters are parameters that are much easier to search for and much easier to query than the non-indexed parameters. In fact, way back in that getlogs function, it even has a parameter allowing us to search for specific topics. So it's much more searchable than the non-indexed ones. The non-indexed ones are harder to search because they get ABI encoded and you have to know the ABI in order to decode them. If that confused you, don't worry about it. We're gonna explain it. Isn't this video great? Now this just told our smart contract that there is a new type of stored number, a new kind of event here. We need to actually omit that event in order to store that data into the logging data structure of the EVM. To do that, we need to do something that looks like this. This is what it looks like when we omit an event. It looks very similar to calling a function. So you call omit and then the name of the event and then you add all the parameters in there that you like. Here's the full example of a smart contract that has an event and is gonna be the example that we're gonna walk through in Brownie. Again, if you want to see a hard hat edition of this, link in the description for the hard hat edition, both of this video and the blog. Now in this smart contract, whenever anybody calls the store function, we're going to omit this event. Here's an example of a transaction where we called the store function with a value of one. Let's look into the logs to see what this event actually is gonna look like. An event is gonna be broken down like so. The address of the contract or account the event is omitted from, the topics are the index parameters of the event, data. This is the ABI encoded non-index parameters of the event. What does this mean? This means that we took those parameters that were non-indexed, we matched them together with their ABI or application binary interface, pumped them through an encoding algorithm, and boom, this is what we got. If you have the ABI, they're very easy to decode. If you don't have the ABI, they are very hard to decode. These non-indexed parameters cost less gas to pump into the logs and are harder to query, like we said. So if you think something's important, but like not that important, you dump it in data. You dump it into non-indexed. Now in this particular contract, since we have verified the code, we verified the contract, Etherscan knows what the ABI is and we can view this in deke or decoded mode. Hex mode is obviously the non-decoded mode or in its raw hex or hexadecimal or encoded mode. You can read more about the layout of these events in the Solidity docs. All right, great, so now that we've learned a little bit more about events, we can go ahead and start using them in our project. Remember, just as a rule of thumb, anytime we update storage, we want to omit one of these events. Like I said, the use case for these right now might not be crystal clear, but as you get deeper into the space, it'll start to become more clear why events are so important. So for us, we're gonna go ahead and create our own event. And if we scroll up to the top, we can even view our layout and see where our events should go. Okay, imports, errors, contracts, types, state variables, events. Okay, great. So this is gonna come after our state variables, but before our functions. So I'm even gonna make it look nice. I'm gonna say events like this. We'll create a new event. And I like to do verb based events. So we would do raffle entered or entered raffle, entered raffle. And we would put the parameters in here. We do address indexed player like this. So now that we have this entered raffle event, we can go ahead and do emit raffle enter or entered raffle message dot sender like so. And awesome, our enter raffle function is just about done. We're gonna update it pretty soon with something else, but this is pretty good. So now we wanna go ahead and pick a winner. Wow, this is gonna be so easy. Our code's almost done, right? This is actually where it's about to get interesting. So our pick winner function, we actually wanted to do a couple things. Number one, get a random number use the random number to pick a player. And we want this to be automatically called. I don't wanna to have to come back to this lottery and hit pick winner all the time. I want this to automatically happen. So let's just focus on these first two right now. Get a random number and then use the random number to pick a player. And we'll update this to be automatically called later. And we could even make this a public function where any, or a public or a better external function where anybody can call this pick winner function to pick the random winner. But since it's external, we probably only want them to pick a winner once our lottery is ready to have its winner be picked, right? So what we could do is we can make sure that enough time has passed to actually pick a winner. So what we could do 
is we can create some variable called interval where we where we give our lottery an interval of time of how long it's going to last. I don't want to have to change this. I really just want to set it once and forget about it. So because of that, we're going to make it a immutable variable from the constructor. So in the constructor, we'll do a unit 256 interval. And in here, we'll do I underscore interval equals interval. And we'll even copy paste this line. And we'll create a new state variable called I interval. This is going to be an immutable variable, this interval, and this is where comments are helpful. We can say duration of the lottery in seconds. So we'll have in the constructor, we'll have some interval be passed, which will be the duration of the lottery in seconds. And then what we can do in pick winner, we can, we can check to see if enough time has passed. We can even track of the current block time and comparing it to the interval and the last time a winner was picked. So to get the current time, we can do block.timestamp, which is another one of these global variables, which is in seconds. We say the block.timestamp minus the last timestamp that we took should be greater than I interval, right? This is to say, let's say the, let's say the block timestamp is a thousand. The last snapshot we took was at 500. That would equal 500. And let's say the interval was 600 seconds. This means that not enough time has passed, right? But if the block timestamp was currently 1200, which is Block time save was currently 1200, 1200 minus 500 is obviously 700. And if the interval was a 600 second lottery, that means enough time has passed. So that's why this line will work. But what we have to do is though, we do have to take some snapshot, some snapshot of time. And this is going to persist. This is going to be some storage that persists so that we know this is probably going to be a state variable, a storage variable. So we do u into 256 private s underscore last timestamp like so. Our first timestamp will probably need to be set right in the constructor. Last timestamp equals block dot timestamp. Right when we launch this, we'll basically start the clock, if you will. And now down here, we can check this. We could say if block dot timestamp minus that snapshot, or better yet, let's do the reverse of this. Let's say if this is less than or equal to the interval, or actually just, excuse me, let's just do strictly less than we know this we should revert, right? Because enough time has not passed, we want to revert. And this is where we would put one of our custom errors. However, we're going to refactor this code pretty soon. So let's just leave it like this for now. So if it gets past this point, it means that enough time has passed and it's time to pick a random winner. And this is where we're going to go ahead and use the Chainlink VRF, which again, we can go to docs.chainlink and go to VRF to start learning about this. So to get a better idea of Chainlink VRF, how it works, and a quick walkthrough of it, let's go ahead and watch this video from the Chainlink team talking about Chainlink VRF. Chainlink's verifiable randomness function, or VRF, gives developers better scale, flexibility, and control. Hi, I'm Richard, one of the developer advocates here at Chainlink Labs, and today we're going to take a look at Chainlink's VRF. The big important thing to know about VRF is you're funding a subscription, which is basically an account that allows you to fund and maintain balance for multiple consumer contracts. I like to think of it as a bucket that all your contracts can pull from. Let's dive into the docs and see what using VRF looks like and feels like. In order to show that, Let's dive right in to getting a random number from the documentation. So we'll take a look at the documentation now. If you head to docs.chain.link, you'll see this page. And we have data feeds, functions, automation, and VRF. If we head to the VRF documentation, we'll go directly into getting a random number. Now, the documentation does cover a lot of other information that is very useful to know. But for this tutorial, we're skipping right to getting a random number. You can read about subscription management here and how it works. Instead of reading through this, we'll actually just walk through this process. If we click Open Subscription Manager, we'll see the Subscription Manager, and we'll need to create a subscription. Now, you can give it your email and project name if you like. I won't for this example, but we'll be creating a subscription. And you'll notice here that we're prompted to actually confirm this on a test network. Now, something to note, I'm doing this on the Sepolia test network. Most of the Chainlink documentation references the Spolia network as the default test network. 
So that's what I'll be using just to make life a little bit easier. You can use other test networks that are supported if you like. You will need some ETH and LINK tokens for this. If you don't have those, you can head to faucets.chain.link to secure that. And we'll take a look at that here in just a moment. So we create our subscription. We'll need to add some funds. So click add funds and it'll take us to the next page. And I mentioned the faucet right here. If we need link for testing, you can get that from the Chainlink faucet. It's at faucets.chain.link. You'll need to connect your wallet. I've already done that. Uh, once you have, you'll pick the network that's applicable. Remember, we're using Ethereum Sepolia in this example. Uh, we can request link and ETH. If you do need ETH, you will need to verify via Twitter. Uh, but for link itself, you'll just need to complete a CAPTCHA. So once you've done that, you should be able to get your link. So we'll need to add some funds. For this example, I'll just use five. It's going to be more than enough. We'll prove that transfer as well. And our link has been transferred. Now we'll need to add consumers. And this gets to an interesting point in creating Vera. So we've created that bucket, right? That subscription. We have funded it with link and we have what we need there. But we haven't actually deployed a contract yet. And the way that VRF works, a mental model think of besides the bucket of link for our subscription is that you need to let your subscription know about the contract you're deploying. And when you deploy your contract, you're gonna to need to let that know about your subscription. We'll see what that looks like. But basically, they need to know about each other in order to function properly. So at this point, we'll head back to the documentation. We'll just leave the subscription manager right here on this Add Consumer page. As we scroll through the instructions, we'll see deploying a VRF V2 compatible contract. And there's this awesome Open and Remix button here. We'll click that. And from here, it'll take us to Remix. So Remix will allow us to deploy and interact with this contract on the blockchain. Uh, let's take a look at the actual contract that we'll be deploying briefly. At the top here, you can see that we have our imports of the coordinator interface, our consumer base, and confirmed owner. Coordinator interface is going to be what allows that coordination of reaching out to the Oracle network to get the actual random values. Consumer base contains some functions we'll be importing and using within our contract, as well as confirmed owner, which will bring in information that allows us to ensure that only the owner of this contract can do certain functions. We look at the contract itself. You can see we declare some events. Uh, we have a struct for the request status. That'll let us check the status of our request. We have a mapping for those request statuses. We have our subscription ID. This is what I was mentioning. We need to let the contract know about our subscription. So that's what we'll store that information. We have a few variables for the request IDs. We have a key hash. Now this key hash is important because this is specifying the gas lane that we'll be using. It's basically how much we're willing to pay as a premium for gas for faster responses. On the test nets, there's only one. If you take a look at the link there in the documentation, you can see the different gas lanes that are available on the different networks. Each gas lane will have its own address. So it's something to keep in mind. We also have the callback gas limit. The way that VRF works is it goes and makes a request to the Oracle network. And when it makes that request, the Oracle network goes off, generates the random numbers, and then comes back, right? And when it comes back, that's when you need to actually do something with the random values that are returned. If you don't do something with them as soon as you get them back, then they're stored and that information becomes public. So they're not really as random as you would like. Now, when it comes to that callback gas limit, that's going to be the maximum amount of gas that is available to be used in that callback function. And we'll see that callback function here in just a moment. We have a number of confirmations that we would like to have. This is how many block confirmations need to go by before those values are returned. The way I like to think about this is the lower this number, the faster you'll get your response back, but the less secure. The higher it is, the more secure, but the slower. So it's a trade-off. You need to balance it with what's important for your project. And then we have the number of words. When it says words here, if you were to look up words from a computer science standpoint, you'll find that's technically the correct term for the values that we're getting back. I like to think of them as just random numbers because it makes my life a little bit easier when I'm thinking about them. So this is a number of random numbers that you'll be getting back. In this case, we're getting back two, uh, but it can be more than that. And it can be as little as one. So you can get multiple values back in a single transaction, which is really cool. So we have our constructor here where we set things up. We give it the coordinator. When we deploy this contract, we'll give it that subscription ID. And then we have the function request random words. Again, this is going to be reaching out to the Oracle network to make that request. So we store a few things in here like the request ID. 
and we get that information and we emit the event. Then once everything has happened within the Oracle Network, we get our random numbers back. The way it comes back into our contract here is through the fulfill random words function. Now, this function doesn't do much, right? It just stores the information. This is where though you'd want to actually do anything with those random values. Think if you are assigning traits to an NFT or something like that, you'd want to do that here as soon as they come back into your function. We have one last function, get status request, just to see what's going on with our request. So let's deploy this contract now. We'll need to make sure that we change it to our injected provider, and then we need to give it our subscription ID. If we head back to our subscription, we'll notice here our ID is 1923. If you're following along doing this yourself, your ID is gonna be different most likely. Paste our ID in here and click deploy and confirm this transaction. All right, so our transaction is confirmed. We have our contract down here. Now we'll need to grab the address of this contract and head back to our subscription. This is gonna be the consumer address. So we'll paste it in here and we'll add a consumer. All right, so our consumer has been added. Let's look at our subscription now. We can see here a brief history of what's happened, right? We created our subscription, we funded it, and we added that consumer. Now, when we actually make a request, we should see it here in our subscription that the request has happened. So let's go do that now. Let back to Remix and we will request random words. We'll confirm this as well. And then we can head back to our subscription and take a look. But we'll need to wait for our transaction to actually be confirmed before we'll see anything here. All right, so it's been confirmed. If we take a look at this page, now we'll see that we have a pending transaction, right? Now remember, depending on the network you're on, depending on how many block confirmations you said, this can take a while. So we'll wait for this to go through and then we'll see it actually in the history here that we have completed our transaction. While we wait for the transaction to be completed, if we take a look here and we say last request and we copy this ID to get the status, we can see that it's actually been fulfilled while I was checking this. So our Boolean is fulfilled is true and we have our random values. Now the thing to note is that we asked for two random values, right? And if you look closely right here in the middle, there's a comma. So we have one number here and the second number afterwards. So that's it. This is what it takes to get random values back using Chainlink VRF. Now from here, you have tons of opportunities with what to do with this, right? It's everything from determining randomness when it comes to game assets, NFTs, anything that you like really. So yeah, I can't wait to see what you'll build with this and I'll catch you in the next one. All right, great. So now that we know a little bit more about Chainlink and Chainlink VRF, let's begin to use it. For those of you who are looking to get a good feel, definitely be sure to go through the documentation, scroll down to get a random number, and even scroll down to this button, open in Remix, where you can actually try this code out yourself in Remix. You get a little pop-up that looks like this with all this code already in here for you to work with. It's defaulted to using the Sepolia chain. So if you wanna try this out in Sepolia, feel free to do so. Now you'll notice in the docs, there's a couple different ways to do it and a couple different steps. So there's two main methods, subscription and direct funding. Direct funding is when you send link to the contract that's gonna be calling the random number. And subscription is when you have a separate contract that you load up with link that your contract will pull from. We're gonna be learning the subscription method because it's a much more scalable model in my opinion. However, doing this requires a few extra steps like setting up a subscription, for example. We're gonna learn both the ways to do it through the user interface and how we can just do it completely programmatically so that we never have to go to a website. Remember, we wanna work incredibly hard to be incredibly lazy. So let's go ahead and let's add this randomization. Now remember, getting a random number is actually a two transaction function. Unlike most of what we've been doing, which are atomic, right? They all, everything that we've been doing so far all happens in the same transaction. Chainlink VRF is two transactions. One is to request the RNG, and then the second transaction is actually get the random number. So pick winner is really just going to be us requesting the winner, and then picking the actual winner will be in the what's called the callback function, or the transaction that the Chainlink node sends back to us. So we're gonna send a request, and the Chainlink node is gonna give us the random number, and we're gonna use that instead. So what we wanna do is we're gonna go ahead and use the documentation here 
We're going to scroll all the way down this get a random number section, and we're going to use this code to actually get the random number. The actual function call we're going to be doing is this right here. Request ID equals coordinator dot request random words, blah, blah, blah. And actually, I'm just going to go ahead and copy that and paste that into my code here. And we're going to get a whole bunch of red lines, which is fine because we're about to update everything. So to make this call, we're going to first need a coordinator address. This is the Chainlink VRF coordinator address to actually make the request to. On every chain where Chainlink VRF exists, there's an address that allows you to make a request to a Chainlink node. This key hash is going to be your gas lane. If you don't want to spend too much gas, you can actually specify you don't want to spend too much gas. Your subscription ID is going to be the ID that you've funded with Link in order to make these requests. Request confirmations is the number of block confirmations for your random number to be considered good. We have a callback gas limit as well, again, to make sure we don't overspend on this call. And then we have number of words or more simply number of random numbers. And then we get returned a request ID. So this request ID is going to be a UNT256. So we can do UNT256 request ID. The coordinator is going to be the VRF coordinator address, which is different chain to chain. And since the address is going to be different chain to chain, we probably should pass this in through the constructor and make it an immutable variable. So right up in our constructor, we're going to add a new variable in here. We're going to add an address, VRF coordinator. And we're going to make this an immutable variable as well. So I'm just going to stick all my immutable variables together here. So we're going to do an address, private, a bowl, I underscore VRF coordinator. And in here, we're going to VRF coordinator equals VRF coordinator. And instead of coordinator, we're going to do I underscore VRF coordinator. So this VRF coordinator has this function request random words. And if we actually go to GitHub chain link, we can actually scroll through everything in here to actually find this. So we go to contracts, RC, V0.8, scroll down to VRF, VRF coordinator V2. And we do a little find in here. We can see that there's this request random words function that we're calling, right? So we're calling this external contract request random words. Now, Work with this, we're going to need a key hash, a subscription ID, number of confirmations, callback gas limit, and number of words. Some of these we can actually just grab from the documentation. I'm going to scroll down to supported networks. We're going to scroll down here. So we're, there's the ETH mainnet ones here. If we scroll lower, Sepolia has some different ones, right? We have this key hash, some gas limit stuff, some premiums and stuff. So this key hash is going to be also dependent on the chain. So since the key hash is also going to be dependent on the chain, we're going to go ahead and put this into our constructor as well. So the key hash is a bytes 32 key hash, but I actually prefer to call it the gas lane because I feel like that's more accurate of what it is. So we're going to have this gas lane parameter, and this is also not going to change. So we're going to do I underscore gas lane equals gas lane. Let's create a new private immutable, but this is going to be a bytes 32 I underscore gas lane. And now that we have this, we can scroll back down instead of key hash, we'll do the gas lane. The subscription ID is going to be our specific subscription to the Chainlink VRF. So this again is going to be something that we're going to get from our constructor. So we'll do a little comma. This is actually a UNT64 subscription ID. And we'll make this an immutable as well. So we'll say I underscore subscription ID equals, equals subscription ID. We'll copy paste this. This is a uint64 i underscore subscription ID like this. Now we can take our immutable subscription ID, stick it in here. Request confirmations. This is how many confirmations we want. This doesn't have to be chain dependent. It could be if you wanted to. I'm just going to go ahead and default this to three request confirmations no matter what. This is going to be a constant variable since we're not getting it through the constructor. Um, and yeah, sure, GitHub Copilot, we'll call this state variables. So we'll do UN256 private constant request underscore confirmations equals three. So since this is a constant variable, we're going to do all uppercase here, right? This is more gas efficient. So we're going to do private constant request confirmations. We're going to scroll back down. 
boom, request confirmations, callback gas limit. This is going to be the max gas that we want the callback function to do. So on that second transaction, when we get the random number back, we're going to limit the amount of gas that it can spend because if it spends too much gas, we're actually going to be the ones to front that cost. And if it's like a bajillion gas, I don't want to have to pay that. Different chains have different costs for gas. So this is something that I probably would want to put on my constructor here. So this is going to be a uint32. Again, all this is in the chain link documentation. If we ever want to refer back, call back gas limit. <clears throat> we'll make this immutable as well. I underscore I underscore callback gas limit equals callback gas limit. Thanks, GitHub Copilot, for the auto tab here. And then up here, a little copy paste. This is a uint32. So we uint32 private immutable. I underscore callback gas. Perfect. Now we can do I underscore callback gas limit. And then number of words is the number of random numbers that we want. We only want one. We only care about getting one for one winner. So we can always make this a constant variable. So we'll do private constant num words equals one. Grab the sum words, paste it down here. Okay, cool. Now our IVRF coordinator, we're getting a little error here saying request random words was not found or visible after argument dependent lookup in address. What's going on here? I VRF coordinator right now is of type address. So we can't call request random words on an address. This needs to be of type VRF coordinator interface. So what we can do is we can grab this from the chain link package and we can even see this if we go back to the docs here, go to get a random number, we'll scroll down and we can see they're actually importing from import at chain link slash contracts, SRC, V0A, interfaces, VRF, V coordinator, V2 interface dot salt. So we're gonna do the same thing, uh, except for we're gonna do a named import, of course. So we're gonna paste that in here. At chain link slash contracts, VRF coordinator, V2 interface. We're gonna do a named import for that because we are awesome engineers. And then of course, we're gonna have to download this as well. We could download this from the smart contract kit slash chain link repo, but we know there's the chain link there's the Chainlink Browning Contracts repo, which is a lot smaller and more minimal. So we're actually going to install from here. So we're going to pull up our terminal. We're going to do forge install smart contract kit slash Chainlink hyphen Brownie hyphen contracts at 0 0.6.1 like this. Oh, and then we have to do, uh, let's hit up twice dash no dash commit. And we're going to install this same as what we've done before. And since we have this installed, we go to our foundry.toml. We're going to do remappings equals at chainlink slash contracts equals lib slash chainlink brownie contracts slash contracts. Awesome. So now if we go here, all should be well and dandy. We're getting an error for our linter, but let's try running a forge build. Let's see if, oh, saying lib chainlink brownie contracts, contracts as you see. Saying this folder doesn't exist. So let's see. Lib chainlink browning contracts, contracts, SRC, V0.8, interfaces, VF coordinator, V2 interface. That looks like it sure as heck does exist. Let's go back to our foundry.toml. Maybe I messed something up in here. Do I need this? Ah, I don't need the backslash there. Okay, cool. Cool. All right. Now we're working fantastically. Okay. Now, instead of an address private I VRF coordinator, we're going to make this type VRF V2 interface. And what we could do now down here is we can wrap, we can typecast this address as this interface. And now I VRF coordinator is of type VRF coordinator V2 interface. And now if we scroll down, we don't get the error here anymore. Huzzah. We are getting two errors here invalid type for argument function call, invalid implicit conversion from type uint256 to use uint16 requested. Ah, so it looks like request confirmations is of type uint16 instead of uint256. So we're just going to change that. And number of words is a uint32 and not a uint256. So let's go ahead and change that. And stuff's looking good. Let's just make sure this all works. Let's do a forge build. All right, awesome. So everything's working and we have an unused local variable, which is fine. We don't care about that. So cool. So now pretty much just with this, we have a way to actually make a request with the chain link contract. 
However, we also need to be able to get that random number back. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna need to actually import some code. So if we go back to the Chainlink docs, we scroll down all the way down here, we have request random words, which we've pretty much done. They give some other stuff we can do. We probably should omit an event as well, but they also have this fulfill random words that's an internal override. And this is gonna be the function that we're that the chain link node is gonna call in order for us to get our random number back. So we're actually gonna implement that function so we can get our random number back. So we're gonna call function fulfill random words. And it takes a uint256 request ID and a uint256 array memory random words. And all this is in the docs, of course. This is going to be an internal override like this. And this is the function the Chainlink node is going to call to give us the, so why is this internal override? We know what override does and we know what internal does. So if we're overriding this function, it means that this function should exist in an, our inheritance so that we can override it. And sure enough, if we look at the docs, we scroll up, they have us import this VRF consumer base V2. So we're actually gonna go ahead and import that as well. We're gonna use a named import though. So we're gonna scroll back to the top, new line, paste that in here. And we're gonna import this VRF V2 consumer base and we're gonna say our contract raffle is VRF V2 consumer base. And if we look in this contract, again, I'm gonna command click, it might be control click depending on what OS you're using. When we scroll down, we can actually see there's this function raw fulfill random words. And this is an external function, but it has this check. If message.sender is not the VRF coordinator, revert. So this is the function that the VRF coordinator is actually calling. So when the Chainlink node gets a random number, it calls the VRF coordinator. The VRF coordinator will then call this VRF consumer base V2, which is gonna be a part of our raffle contract. And then this function calls that fulfill random words function that we just created which is up here and it's internal virtual. So we need to override this, which is why we override this. Now this VRF consumer base V2, if you just do is VRF consumer base V2 here, it's gonna say no arguments past the base constructor, specify the arguments or mark raffle as abstract. So whenever we do inheritance and the inherited file that we use has a constructor. So in VRF V2, in VRF consumer base V2, there's actually a constructor for that contract we need to pass it that VRF coordinator. In order to use an inherited functions constructor, we need to pass that in our constructor ourselves. So here's our constructor. We'll paste the name of that contract in here, and then we'll pass whatever variables it needs in here. It needs the address of the VRF coordinator. So we'll just paste that in there, and we'll go ahead and save, and we'll see the red lines disappear, hooray! So let's do a quick recap of that, because I know we talked about a lot. So what's gonna happen? We're gonna make a request to the Chainlink node to give us a random number. It's gonna generate the random number and it's gonna call a very specific contract on chain called the VRF coordinator where only the Chainlink node can respond to that. That contract is gonna call raw fulfill random words, which is gonna call fulfill random words, which we are going to define by overriding it. So we're gonna define this fulfill random words. Basically we're gonna say, okay, now that we have the random number, what do we do? And for us, of course, we're gonna pick the winner. Yay! So that's how we're gonna get a random number. This is the input parameters for fulfill random words. The request ID is gonna be the request ID that we got up here. And then actually, let's even just delete that. Eh. We're, gonna, we're gonna use this request ID in a minute, but the request ID is the request ID. And then it also passes this array of random words or random numbers. We're only gonna be using the first one in here. So now that we have this list of random numbers, or we just have our random numbers, we want to pick a random winner from this S players array. So what we're going to do is something called a modulo function to use that random number to actually pick one of the people in our array. Let's talk about the mod function. Here in Remix, I've got this contract called example modulo with two functions, get mod 10 and get mod two. This modulo function is going to basically do divide operation. It's going to divide our number by 10, but instead of returning our number divided by 10, it's going to return the remainder. So if we think of it like this, if we think of 10 divided by 10, this divides evenly. 
So the remainder is zero. There's zero groups or zero numbers unaccounted for. But if we did 10 mod nine, let's think of this even differently. 10 divided by nine equals one point something, right? Some fraction. So basically nine of the 10 are divided evenly, but there's one left over. So 10 mod nine would equal one. Or even easier, we take two mod two, we'll get zero because two and two divide evenly, but two mod three would equal one because there's one left over. What about two mod six? Does two mod six divide evenly? Well, yes, it does. So this would equal zero. What about two mod seven? Two divides evenly into seven three times and there's one left over. So this would be one. So our modulo function is going to be, it's going to get the remainder after dividing. So we can even do some examples of mod 10. And this is going to be in the GitHub repo associated with this course. If I have one, two, three, I get the mod. We have three left over because 120 divides evenly into 10. And then we have three, 123, we have three left over. So if I do this major huge number, what do you think our remainder is going to be? Yep, it's two because this number divides evenly into 10, and then we have two left over. So if we do mod two, what do you think this is going to be? It's an even number, so it's going to be zero. If I do this, what do you think it's going to be? It's going to be one, right? So this is this modulo function, and we're going to use it to pick a random winner out of our array. So if we go back to our code here, we can pick the index of the winner by using this mod function. Let's say S players is of size 10. There's 10 players. How do we use this random number to pick a random winner? Let's say our random number, our, our random number, our RNG is 12. So what we would do is we would say, okay, 12 mod 10 is going to equal two. So whoever's at index two in the array is going to be our random winner, right? The random number we're going to get back is going to more likely be something like this. And then we just do that number mod 10 or the length of the array to get the winner. And this one, it's probably gonna be five, right? So this is how we can always get a number between zero and nine to pick one of our random players. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna say in 256, index of winner equals random words at index zero, because we're only getting a single random word, mod or modulo s players dot length. So this is how we can pick a random winner. Once we have the index of the winner, we can say address payable and get the payable winner equals s players index of winner. Huzzah. And now this winner, what are we going to do? We're going to give them some money. And for this, I like to keep track of the most recent winner just to make it easier to see who most recently won. Up at the top, we're going to make a new address private s underscore recent winner. We're going to copy this. We're going to scroll down. We're going to say recent winner equals winner. And then we're going to want to pay them, right? And we learned how to do good payments strategies. So we're going to say bool success, comma blank equals recent winner dot call value is going to be address this dot balance. So we're going to give them the entire balance of this contract. So all of the ticket sales are going to go to this, this winner. We're going to pass up nothing. Oops, so this is going to be a winner. Excuse me, winner.com. Uh, bank blank bytes for the object. And then we're going to say, and then we're going to make sure that this transfer went through successfully. We're going to say if not success. So this little exclamation mark stands for bang or not. We're going to go ahead and revert with some custom error, right? So we are going to make a custom error for this one. So we're going to go up to our other errors that we have. We're gonna make a new error, error, raffle, underscore, underscore, transfer failed. I'm gonna copy this, scroll back down to my revert here, paste it in, boom. So if it fails for whatever reason, we're gonna go ahead and do this transfer here. All right, awesome. So a couple other things we wanna keep in mind here though, is when we're picking the winner, when we're waiting for that random number to come back, we probably don't want anybody else to enter the raffle. So what we can do then, we can add a new type to check the state of the raffle and see if it's open or not. 
if we're in the middle of picking a winner, we can say, hey, we're in the middle of calculating the winner. You're not allowed to enter the raffle. So we can create a new type using something called an enum. So to keep track of the state of the blockchain, we could scroll up to the top. We could say, okay, we create some state variable like a unit 56 calculating winner, or better yet, bool calculating winner equals false, and then just update this. But oftentimes you're gonna have a lot of different types of states rather than a binary calculating winner, right? Maybe instead we have a lottery state where it could be like open, close, calculating, etc. We don't want it to have a different variable for all these different things. So what we can do is we can create a single variable of a new type that we create called an enum. And this is gonna be a type declaration. So this is gonna go above all of our state variables, but below our errors. So right here, I'm gonna make a new section called type declarations like this. And we're gonna create this new thing called an enum. And in the Solidity docs, we have this section called enum types. Enums can be used to create custom types with a finite set of constant values. They are explicitly convertible to and from all integer types, but implicit conversion is not allowed. So we can see here's an example contract and there's this enum action choices, go left, go right, go straight, sit still. And so once we create this enum, they get this new action choices typing that they can use throughout their contract. For us, we're gonna make an enum called raffle state. And this is just gonna be open or closed or excuse me, open or calculating. So either the raffle is open or it's calculating and you should not be allowed to enter the raffle. In Solidity, these can be converted to integers. So open would be zero and calculating would be one. And if we added more, they would be like two, three, like if we added more states like close, some other state, right? We could add more like that. But now we have this raffle state variable what we can do is we can create a new storage variable. So we'll do raffle state private s underscore raffle state. What we can do is we can default this to being open. So in our constructor, we can say s raffle state equals raffle state dot open. And what we could do is in our enter raffle, we could make sure that the raffle is currently not calculating a winner, right? So we could say if s underscore raffle state does not equal raffle state dot open, then we're gonna go ahead and revert with a new error, raffle underscore underscore raffle not open like this. And we're gonna create a new error up here. Say error, paste that in, raffle not open. So you can only enter the raffle if the raffle is currently open. Now down in pick winner, what we're gonna do is before we send this request, we're gonna set the state of the raffle to calculating. So S underscore raffle state equals raffle state dot calculating. And now while we're waiting for the random number, since it's calculating, people won't be able to enter the raffle, which is good, that's what we want. And then of course, once we get the random winner back, we're gonna to wanna to flip it back to actually being open. So once we get our winner, we're gonna say raffle state equals raffle state dot open. Awesome. Now you'll notice here, if we just let this rock as is, the S players array is still gonna have the players from the previous raffle. So we're gonna to need to reset this array to start a new game, right? We don't want the old players to get into the new lottery for free. So we're gonna say S players equals a new address payable array that's gonna start at size zero. So we're gonna create a, we're just gonna to totally reset the S players array so that we can reset everything. And then additionally, we wanna update the S underscore last timestamp so that we can start the clock over. We can start the clock over for the new lottery, how long it has. So we'll say S dot last timestamp equals block dot timestamp. All right, nice. And since we picked a winner and we updated the state here, it's a good idea for us to omit a log. So we're gonna go ahead and omit a winner picked log with the most recent winner here. And we're gonna take this, scroll up to our event, which is down here. We're gonna create a new event, winner picked, address indexed winner. I guess this should be picked winner. 
entered raffle, picked winner. Let's do picked winner. Picked winner. Scroll down, we'll do picked winner instead of winner picked. I kind of like the verb first. I don't know. I don't have a I don't have a recommended best practice for naming your events. But all right, great. So this is starting to shape up. This is starting to look pretty good. Now I want to say something important. As I'm building this now, it looks like I'm just going from start to finish, right? And a big reason for that is I've already, I've done this demo many times, right? I've written this code many times. I've written a lot of solidity in my career. However, most of the time, instead of me just writing a contract beginning to finish, I don't do it in one go. In fact, it's incredibly difficult to do it in one go. Most of the time, instead, I'm actually writing a deploy script and then testing individual components of my contract as I build it out. So at this point in my coding, I probably would have wrote a test get entrance fee function. I probably would have wrote a test pick winner function. I might have wrote a test enter raffle function. I'm writing tests as I'm coding this. The reason that I'm not writing tests and not writing the deploy script right now is we're going to do a lot of refactoring as we go along here. And the way I'm coding this is I'm coding it in a way to explain the different concepts of what we're doing piece by piece as opposed to coding it in a way that I would code a real project. But I do think it's important for you to keep in mind that this doesn't actually look like what really coding this project looks like. It's gonna be you going back and forth, you compiling code, stuff not compiling, you going, well, wait, why, why doesn't this compile? You debugging stuff, and that's okay, and that's good. So just wanted to give you that heads up. Now, an important thing to note, we are coding our smart contracts using a style called checks effects interactions or CEI. And this is one of the most important design patterns that you 100% need to keep in mind because it's going to help you stay secure and stay safer. Towards the end of the course, we'll talk a little bit about reentrancy, different attack vectors, and a little bit about security. But one of the design patterns you should always have in your mind is checks effects interactions. So when you're setting up your code, you first, you could even put it in here. You could even say, okay, what are the checks that we're doing? And this would be like, this would be like your requires or your if then errors, right? And you generally wanna start your contract with the checks first. Why? Because it's more gas efficient. If I revert here, it's more gas efficient than if I do all this work and then revert down here, right? Because remember, I'm still paying for the gas of all the computation I do. So I want to revert much quicker in a function call. So we really want to do our checks first. Then we want to do our effects. So this is where we affect our own contract. We affect our own contract. So all of these in here are effects within our own contract. And then finally, we want to do interactions. And this is going to be with other contracts. One of the biggest reasons we do this is to avoid something called reentrancy attacks, which we'll talk about later. But if you keep this in mind and you learn this now, you'll be a lot safer once you do start to learn about reentrancies and different types of attacks. Now, this is a good point here. We're saying, okay, cool. We're going to do interactions last, interact with other contracts. Hey, we're doing an emit at the end. Is that an interaction with another contract? No, it's not. So we should absolutely move it up here. Now, there is some debate about events. Some people do like putting them after the interactions. If I'm doing a code review or an audit on your code and you have a, an event after an external interaction, I'm usually going to say, I'm usually going to recommend to put it up here for a whole lot of reasons that we'll go into much later in the course. Just remember this design pattern, checks, effects, interactions. Do your checks first, your effects next, and then your external interactions. Checks, effects, interactions. All right, great. So our code is starting to look pretty good here. We've got a pick winner function, which will kick off a chain link VRF call, and it will return with our fulfill random words function, which is going to pick a random winner out of our array here. But this kind of has an issue, right? We're getting the random number, awesome. We're using the random number to pick a player, awesome but we're not automatically calling this. Somebody has to call this pick winner function. And we could hope a good Samaritan will call pick winner to end our lottery, but we are engineers. And what do we do? We work incredibly hard to be incredibly lazy. So what we can do 
is use Chainlink automation to actually automatically kick off this process of picking our winner for us. If you come to the Chainlink docs, again, we can actually scroll over up at the top over to automation on the left-hand side, we can look at any of these guides. For us, we're gonna go down to time-based automation or custom logic. The documentation here tells us how to actually work with Chainlink from the UI. And we're gonna watch a video using the UI for setting this up. However, we're also gonna do a lot of this programmatically because remember, we're lazy and that's how we like it. And scrolling down through this create compatible contracts will actually give us an example contract of the actual code we would need to use to work with Chainlink Automation. If you wanna open up this remix and try it out yourself, I highly recommend you do so. But let's go ahead and watch this video from somebody from the Chainlink team, explain Chainlink Automation and walk us through a demonstration. Hi, I'm Richard, one of the developer advocates at Chainlink Labs. And today, we're going to take a look at an update to Keepers. Now, maybe you're like me, and you know, on a regular Tuesday, you're just browsing the Chainlink documentation, and you come across these Chainlink Keeper release notes. You say, whoa, what's changed? What's new? Let's dive into that and see what's new with Keepers. If you head on over to the documentation and look at the Keepers release notes, you can dig in and see what exactly is new with Keepers. But I want to jump right in and head on over to keepers.chain.link. When we head there, we'll be prompted to connect our wallet. So let's go ahead and do that first. And then we'll take a look at what's new with Keepers. So here, everything looks mostly the same. But when we register a new upkeep, we're presented with this new option, Trigger. This is amazing, in my opinion, because one of the most common use cases that I use are time-based trigger mechanisms. And that used to mean dealing with block hashes and trying to figure out how to do all that within a contract, uh, using check upkeep with those block hashes to see if enough time had passed on a blockchain in order to trigger that upkeep. Now, you can do that right here through this UI. I'm gonna head back to the documentation and we'll take a look at creating a time-based automation. Now, this will walk you through all the different steps that you need about connecting your wallet, how to register, and everything like that. But let's look at creating a Keeper-compatible contract. This is what we used to have to do every single time. We used to have to create a check upkeep function and then we had to create a perform upkeep function, right? You remember that? Well, you can still do that if you need some sort of more complex logic behind what's going to trigger an upkeep. If it's not just time-based, you can still use those two functions. But we want to use that time-based function. How can we make a contract and do that? Let's take this sample contract and we'll modify it and go from there. So we have our sample contract. If we click open in Remix, we'll get it popped open in Remix. And Remix is an online IDE for developing Solidity smart contracts. We've got our contract here, and we'll know that this one is based upon the way that we used to always use Keepers, by creating a Keeper compatible contract with check upkeep and perform upkeep, both as functions available within the contract. Now we don't need those anymore. This is a good example, I think, for showing this change. Because this contract, it checks upkeep based upon the block timestamp, the last time that we did something, and an interval. So when we deploy this contract, we set the interval. That's what the constructor does. The constructors run every time you deploy a contract. And in this case, we pass in an interval to the constructor. Based upon that interval, you then will check the block timestamp and the last time that we actually performed upkeep and compare them to see if enough seconds have passed in order to need upkeep again. This is a perfect use case for that time-based upkeep. So how do we go about doing this? I think probably the best way to start is by creating a new function to count, right? That's what this contract is doing. It's taking a counter, starting it at zero, and then it's increasing it at a regular interval. So let's do that. Let's create a new function 
and we'll call it count. And it won't need to take anything in because we're just going to be increasing that counter. And so we'll just say counter equals counter plus one. Now, what type of function does this need to be? We can let anybody run this. So we'll say external. And that should be it, right? We have this function count. It's an external function. And we don't need check upkeep anymore for this use case. We don't even need perform upkeep. We can get rid of both of these. Our contract just got a whole lot simpler, right? So anytime that we want to increase our counter, we just call count. Fantastic. Let's go ahead here and see what we have as far as compiling. We have a warning. It's saying that it should not be a keeper compatible interface anymore. That's true. We don't need that as well. We don't need last timestamp and we don't need interval. We'll set those in the keepers interface so we can get rid of them as well. Suddenly this contract just became really, really simple. So we create a constructor and let's clean it up all, all the way. We have our constructor. It's gonna set the counter equal to zero. It's a public variable that we can see. And then we have a function to increase that counter. That's it. That's all that the other version of this contract was doing using check upkeep and perform upkeep. This one, much simpler. And if you're using a use case like this where you just need to perform an action based upon time passing, this is all you need. So we're good here. We've got our green check mark. That means it compiled correctly. We'll need to deploy this. So let's do an injected provider. I'm going to be deploying it to the Fuji Avalanche test network. Just picked one. And we have my account. We need to make sure we deploy the counter contract. Let's go ahead and do that. We'll approve this transaction. We should see it pop up here. We've got another green check mark. That means we're good to go. We have two values here. We have counter. It'll tell us that we've counted zero times. And we have count. This will actually increment the counter. So let's do that. Go ahead and make sure everything's working before we head over to keepers. Cool. Awesome. We have counted one time. Now, let's head over to keepers. And what will we need over there? So we're going to be using time-based triggering for this contract. Now, we'll need to give it the address of our contract. And this is going to give us a couple of interesting options here. So if we had verified this contract on the network that we're working on, it will populate the values of the functions that it can call. We haven't verified this contract. Are we out of luck? We're not. We can get the ABI, the Application Binary Interface. It essentially gives keepers and other applications interacting with your contract the information about, hey, what does this contract do? How do I interact with it? If we head back to Ethereum, we can see under the compilation tab here, under the compiler, we have an ABI. Now, make sure that you pick the correct contract. This contract is counter. So we'll need to make sure we select that and then we'll click on copy for the ABI. Head back to the keepers window over here, paste it in and click next. At this point, it should give you all of the functions that you can call. Now, our contract's pretty simple. It has one function, it's called count. So we'll use that function, right? We've told it what function we want to call. Now we need to tell it how often do we want to call this function. When it comes to automating smart contracts on the blockchain, we're gonna have to wait for blocks to be verified, right? And blocks to be mined on that blockchain. That can affect how quickly we can do things. I'm gonna run this every minute. The Fuji test network is pretty fast. Some other networks, it takes a little bit longer for those block confirmations to come in. That's just something to keep in mind. The syntax here is the same as cron. If you're not familiar with cron, there's a basic breakdown of it over here. It has five different values. It's got minutes, hours, days of the month, the month, and then day of the week. Now, you can get really fancy with cron schedules. 
And there are some tools out there that are fantastic. If you're not familiar with cron, head on over to crontab.guru. And you can kind of get an idea of what is happening. They have an example in here. We'll just talk through it real quick. So the minutes is five, the hours is four. The rest are stars. Stars means always. So this says at 4.05 every day. Every day of the month, every month of the year, every day of the week. Right? You can get some pretty interesting things going on. So this one would run at midnight, five minutes past it, on the for like every day in August, only in August. So every day and every day of the week in August, the eighth month. At 14.15 on the first of the month. This is a great place to kind of get a easy, human readable output from cron tabs. So let's head back here. We wanna run this and I'm gonna say every one minute. And this is what I mean by interesting things. We can divide up every minute divided by one. So that's gonna say every one minute, right? If we had just one, then it would only run on the first minute of the hour. So at one minute past the hour, but we want every one minute. We'll click next. And this is very similar to what the keepers used to look like, right? So we'll say uh, count every, now let's do something more fun. Make every minute count. Uh, we'll give it a gas limit, 15, 150,000, should be plenty. We'll pop in some link. Do you need link? If you don't have link, you can get it from the faucet right here. We've got a link to the link faucet right there. We do ask for your email address. That's to email you in case your keeper starts to run out of link or there's a problem. And you can give it a project name if you need to. We'll click register upkeep. We'll need to approve this on the blockchain. We'll wait for that approval process. We'll need to approve one more time to actually request the upkeep as well. So this will transfer the link from our wallet to the keeper's subscription that we've got going on here. Uh, and it will set up our upkeep. And then we can view that upkeep. So if we take a look here, we can see the history. We can see, hey, we set up our upkeep and we funded it. We have when it's going to run based upon our cron expression. Uh, we've got all that information. We also have the ability to say, hey, you know, I don't want to run this every minute. That's way too often, maybe every hour. We can go in here. We could edit the upkeep, change things. We can add more link if we need to. We can edit that gas limit. That will be important too. If you have a function that costs more gas than your gas limit, your upkeep won't run. So just a few things to keep in mind. But you can see here, we've performed our upkeep already. So if we head back to Remix, go back to our contract, right? Last time we ran counter once and then we had one on our counter. If we check now, we can see our counters too. And again, in just a minute, we'll be able to see that our counter has increased again. So just like that, we've taken our contract and we've automated it using Keeper's time-based triggers to create that decentralized automation of our smart contract. I think that's really cool. This use case, I'm stoked about it because I do this a lot where I want to just have something trigger on a regular interval, a regular cadence, and having the ability to do that is Awesome, and it simplifies the contracts down so much, right? Look at this thing, it's tiny. When you compare that to this, my goodness, it's so much easier to understand, so much cleaner, because our use case is so simple. So thanks for watching another tutorial and for checking out the new Keepers version 1.2. I'm Richard, and I'll catch you in the next one. Awesome. So now that we know a little bit more about Chainlink automation, how it works and how we can actually set it up, we can actually use Chainlink automation to automatically kick off our lottery whenever it's time. And the Chainlink nodes will be the one to do this. To do this, we're going to need these two functions, check upkeep and perform upkeep. So right now in our code, we have this pick winner function. And we're going to revamp this so that it's 
so that we're kicking off our contract calls with Chainlink automation instead. So as that video went over, we first need to create a check upkeep function. And this is the function that's gonna tell the Chainlink nodes when it's time to call perform upkeep. And for us, perform upkeep is gonna be kicking off a Chainlink VRF call. So what we can do below our enter raffle is we can create a function called check upkeep. And this is gonna take a bytes memory check data, which we're actually going to ignore and have it be blank. If a function of yours requires an input parameter, and for the Chainlink nodes to recognize this function, we need an input parameter, but you're not gonna use that input parameter, you can just ignore it by wrapping it in a comment like this. So this check upkeep function, they have it in the docs as external view. We're gonna have ours as a public view for reasons I'll explain later. They have theirs as an override as well because they're importing the automation compatible. We're gonna ignore that because this is just an interface and we actually don't really need it. This is just to make sure that we don't forget to add the check upkeep and perform upkeep. But if you wanna add it, you can add it as well. But this is gonna be a public view and it's gonna return two things a Boolean upkeep needed, and a bytes memory perform data. So I'm actually gonna copy this, paste that here. So it's returning whether or not an upkeep is needed. And for us, the upkeep is needed when the lottery is ready to pick a winner. And a bytes memory perform data is if there's any additional data that needs to be passed to this perform upkeep function. For us, we're just gonna ignore it, so we'll go like this. And so the question for us is, the check upkeep function should really just return when the winner is supposed to be picked. And we can do some nice NAT spec here, like this. And we can say at dev, this is the function that the Chainlink automation nodes call to see if it's time to perform and upkeep. The following should be true for this to return true. One, the time interval has passed between raffle runs, and this is that interval that we set above. Two, the raffle is in the open state. Three, the contract has ETH, aka players. And then four, this is implicitly, the subscription is funded with link. And if we want, we could add the parameters, which is this check data, what it returns and everything. I'm just gonna ignore those for now. So this is what we want our check upkeep to do. We want it to return this upkeep needed as true if all of these conditions are met, otherwise return false. Now something cool about the returns piece is we can actually initialize variables in this like returns section here. So when we say returns bool, if we just did this, right? Returns bool and returns bytes memory, we would have to create some Boolean variable. We would do bool some var, some var equals true, return some var. Or if we name our variable in this return statement up here, up keep needed, and then we'll also do this perform data like this. Instead, we can actually just leave it blank and it will automatically return whatever upkeep needed is even without a return keyword. So we could say upkeep needed is true and it would return upkeep needed. We could say upkeep needed is false and it would return upkeep needed because we defined it in the function up here. All right, so let's actually check all these pieces up here. All right, first one, the time interval has passed between raffle runs. We actually already did that down here. So for now, I'm actually going to copy, delete, and paste this in here, but I'm gonna change this up a little bit. Instead of making this a, a conditional, we're gonna turn this into a variable. We're gonna say bool time has passed equals this stuff. So block the timestamp is less than, actually let's do it greater than or equal to. So we gotta do the reverse. Since we're saying time has passed equals block minus timestamp is greater than the interval. So if the current block stamp minus the last one is greater than the interval, then time has indeed passed. So great, so that's gonna be the time interval has passed. The raffle is in open state. So we could say bool is open, and this is just gonna equal raffle state dot open equals s underscore raffle state. So if the raffle is indeed open, excuse me, if the raffle state is indeed open, is open will be true. We wanna check that the contract has ETH, AKA players. We could also check the contract has players. Well, let's just say bool has balance. 
this will be equal address this dot balance is greater than zero. We probably should check for players too. We probably should check for players too. So let's check for players too. So we'll do bool has players equals s underscore players dot length is greater than zero. And then we can say upkeep needed equals whatever all of these being true is. So we could say time has passed and is open and has balance and has players. This double and sign is logical and if any of these are false, upkeep needed will be false. So now it's going to return upkeep needed automatically. And if we had perform data named, it would return perform data. I like to be very explicit. So I like to do return upkeep needed. And we'll do some a blank bytes object. And this is how we can say it's a blank bytes object. Okay, cool. So now we have a function that's actually going to check to see, hey, is it time for this lottery to get updated? And now instead of pick winner, we're going to have this be our perform upkeep function. So the chain link nodes are going to call this check upkeep function, but they're going to call it as a view function, right? They're not actually going to send a transaction. They're going to simulate this. And then if this is returning true, then they're going to call perform upkeep. So first we're going to actually have to change our pick winner to perform upkeep. So I'm going to grab this here, copy paste. So now we're going to change its name to perform upkeep takes a bytes call data perform data, which we're not going to pass any perform data. Again, this is for customizing this and we don't really need it to be super custom. So now since this is an external, anybody can call this, right? So we want to make sure that it's actually time to call this function, right? So we can validate this a little bit. We'll first say bool upkeep needed equals check upkeep. We'll pass some blank data in here. So we're going to call this check upkeep function in our perform upkeep function to make sure it is indeed time to do an upkeep. Then we'll say if it's not time for an upkeep, then what do you think we're going to do? We sure as heck are going to revert with a new error raffle upkeep not needed. And for a raffle upkeep not needed error, we could make it just blank like this, or we could add some debugging tips to make it more helpful for whoever runs into this error. So maybe we'll say, okay, let's, let's, let's give them the address. Let's give them the balance of the contract. Maybe we'll do the S players dot length, and then we'll do a UNC 256 S underscore raffle state. So the state of it. So now this is going to show you guys that we can actually make errors, error raffle upkeep not needed with parameters in them. So we could do UNT 256 current balance, UNT 256 num players, and then UNT 256 raffle state. We can do this because we could also do raffle state, raffle state, or UNT 256 raffle state, because again, a raffle state can directly be converted to a UNT 256. So we could do either one here. But okay, great. So now we have a different error, a different revert here, if it's not ready. And then it's going to be the chain link keepers that are actually going to kick off the chain link VRF call for us. And you know, what? let's just delete this for now. Uh, but we might add it back in later. Cool. And let's actually get rid of some of these warnings. We don't need the request ID. So we'll just block that off. Cool. And stuff's looking pretty good. Let's try to compile this forge compile or forge build and awesome. It compiled our codes looking fantastic. Let's see, let's do a quick recap of where we are so far. And now might be a good time to take a break because we've just written a lot of really good code. So we have a raffle contract and that's going to use Chainlink VRF to get its random number. We've got a whole bunch of state variables. We've got this very intense constructor, but the constructor is to set up the rest of this. We have this enter raffle function, which makes sure people buy their tickets with the entrance fee. It adds them to this array. And after enough time has passed and after people have entered the raffle, this check upkeep gets called. And if it returns true, if it's time for the lottery to be drawn, some chain link nodes will, in a decentralized context, call this perform upkeep function, which will kick off a request to the chain link VRF. We'll have to wait a couple blocks. And then once the chain link node responds, it'll respond with this fulfill random words, which will pick a random winner and reset everything. And boom, just like that, we've got a minimalistic, provably fair lottery. Not bad, huh? All right, guess what? We just wrote 
some awesome code here. This is pretty much done, right? We probably want to have a couple more getter functions at the bottom, but our code is set up in an intelligent way. And I think it's time for us to start writing some tests so that we can make sure this actually does everything that we want it to do. So now that we're a little bit more intelligent with how we write our tests, let's come up with the game plan to write our tests. So first we're gonna write some deploy scripts and then we're going to write our tests such that it'll work on a local chain, a forked testnet and a forked mainnet. And we wanna do all this integrated with our deployment scripts. So let's go ahead and get cracking. So to get started writing our deploy script, let's call up to scripts, create a new file, deploy raffle.s.sol like this. And in here, you already know the drill, SPDX, license identifier MIT, thanks chat. Thanks GitHub Copilot, contract, deploy, raffle, is script like this. We're gonna import script from forge std slash script.sol like that. All right, cool, clear. Let's run a little sanity forge build in our terminal. Looks good. Oh. Source file does not specify required compiler version. Consider adding a pragma. Oh, yeah, well, I should probably do that. Pragma solidity 0 0.8.18. Let's do this again. Wonderful. In here, what are we going to do? We're going to create a run function. Now, remember, if we briefly pull up our foundry fund me again. And we just look back at how we did our deploys here. Remember, we had this run function which is gonna return that fund me object at least, and also potentially the helper config. This way we can use that run function directly in our scripts. So let's go ahead and do the same thing. We're gonna create a function run. This will be external, and this will return our raffle contract, which we should probably import. Import raffle from dot dot slash src slash raffle dot soul like this. Function run, external, like that. Okay, cool. Now we gotta write our deploy script here. So let's look at our raffle. What does it take for input parameters? It takes an entrance fee, interval, VRF coordinator, gas lane, subscription ID, and callback gas limit. As we know, a lot of these are gonna depend on the chain that we're using. So because of that, we're gonna need to make a helper config that has all of this stored so that no matter what chain we deploy to, we're good to go. So before we even can finish this run function, we're gonna go ahead and create a new file called helperconfig.s.sol. Same thing, spdx, license identifier, pragma, solidity, 0 0.8.18. Contract, helper config is script. And if you need to refer back to the Foundry Fund Me, feel free to do so. We're gonna import script from forge std script.sol. A lot of what I'm doing when I'm actually coding is gonna be copying and pasting stuff. Maybe my own past examples, maybe from ChatGPT or whatever AI that you're using. In here, we're gonna create our struct network config. And this is gonna have a whole bunch of stuff in here. And we can figure out what we want based off of this constructor. And in fact, I'm even just gonna copy my constructor and paste it in here. All right, the entrance fee. All right, cool. Entrance fee will be different chain to chain. Interval, yep, cool. Coordinator, cool. Gas lane, yep. Sub ID, yep. Callback, gas limit, yep. We're gonna need a couple other things in here in a little bit, but th these are gonna be the main pieces that we need. So let's first pretend like we're gonna deploy this to Sepolia, right? Because at the end of this, we are gonna deploy this to Sepolia. At least I am. You don't have to if you don't wanna wait for all the transactions to go through. So for Sepolia stuff, we're gonna need all of this stuff in here, right? So let's go ahead, we'll do function get Sepolia eth config. This will be a public view and it'll return a network config memory object. Let me zoom out, I'm definitely too zoomed in here. Zoom out twice. This is too small, feel free to zoom in on your homes there. And we're gonna say, we're gonna return this network config object, little parenthesis bracket here, so we can define exactly what we want. So first we're gonna need an entrance fee. So we're gonna say entrance fee. Let's have it be 0.01 ether. Let's have our interval 
be 30 seconds. So we can just do a 30 here. We can have our VRF coordinator be the actual address of the VRF coordinator on Sepolia. So we'll go back over to the documentation, supported networks, Ethereum. We'll scroll down to Sepolia. Oops, excuse me. This is, we need to be on VRF. Excuse me. We'll go down to, we'll go down to supported networks. We'll scroll down. We see ETH mainnet, Sepolia testnet. Okay, cool. VRF coordinator. I'm going to copy this address, paste it in here. What's next? Gas lane. This is also in here. It's called the key hash. So we're going to copy that. Great. We need the subscription ID, which for right now we're going to set to zero. But we want to update this with our sub ID. And we'll learn how to do this very soon. And then, of course, we're going to need our callback gas limit, which for this we're just going to say 500,000, which this is 500,000 gas, which should be more than plenty. Cool. That's right. Great. So we have at least the Sepolia ETH config. We're also going to need the Anvil config, right? <clears throat> because this is just for the test net. We also need for our local net. So we're going to say, same as last time, function get or create Anvil ETH config. This will be a public, same thing, returns network config memory. And this one's going to be a little bit more involved, right? Same as FundMe, we want to create a whole bunch of mocks for the contracts that we're going to be working with here. So first, we're going to say if, and then actually let me scroll up here, go at our constructor, same as last time, right? And we're going to say, have some conditionals. We're going to say if block dot chain ID equals one, 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 five, five, one, 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 which is the chain ID of Sepolia. Then we're going to set some active config. So let's create a network config, public active network config, active network config is going to equal get Sepolia ETH config. And then we're going to say else active network config is going to equal to get or create Anvil ETH config. Oops, this should be double equals. All right, cool. Great. So now that we have this active ETH config down in our get or create, we can just say if active network config dot VRF core denator does not equal the zero address, we can assume that it's been populated and we can just return the active network config. So we don't create any additional mocks. But now we get into the question of, okay, now it's time to create some mocks for this. Same as last time, right? If we want to run our script, if we want to run our code completely on an Anvil chain from scratch and not even on a forked testnet, we're going to need a couple different contracts. What are we going to need? We're going to need a VRF coordinator at the very least. So how can we deploy our own VRF coordinator? Let's go ahead and scroll up and let's click into this and we can go into our lib folder, Chainlink Browning contracts, contracts, SRC 0 0.8. And we can look for this VRF code in here or look for some mocks. And in fact, there's actually a mocks folder in here called VRF coordinator V2 mock. And we can just use this directly in our tests as opposed to writing one ourselves. Chainlink VRF already has one for us. Perfect. So let's go ahead and just use this VRF coordinator V2 mock in here. So we're gonna have to deploy this mock. So we're gonna actually import it in the top, we're gonna say import at chainlink slash contracts, oops, excuse me, import VRF coordinator v2 mock from at chainlink slash contracts, where's this located chainlink contracts, contracts, SRC v0.8, oops, SRC, B0.8 slash mocks, mocks slash VRF coordinator v2 mock dot soul. And so now what we can do is we can deploy this with a VM dot start broadcast. Remember, we need this VM dot start broadcast to actually deploy to any network. And I always like to do VM dot stop broadcast right afterwards. And we can say VRF coordinator v2 mock. VRF coordinator mock equals new VRF coordinator v2 mock. And let's go see what the constructor parameters are. Constructor 
it needs a base fee and a gas price link. So for Chainlink VRF, it gets paid in Chainlink tokens. Whenever you request a random number from your subscription, it gets paid in link tokens. So it has two payment parameters. The base fee is the flat fee it takes, and the gas price link is how much link it gets paid for each additional piece of gas that you use. When the Chainlink node calls back, calls to fill random words on our contract, the Chainlink node is the one actually paying the gas to do so. And so it gets reimbursed in link for that gas cost based off of this gas price link parameter here. So in our helper config, we could just default those to uint96 base fee, which is equal to 0 0.25 ether, which is really 0 0.25 link, right? Or uint96, excuse me, and u 96 gas price link, which is gonna equal to one E9, real small link per gas, which is just gonna be like one GUE of link really. So we'll take this base fee, gas price link like this. And then now at the bottom, we can return all of our good stuff here. So we'll do return network config, same setup here. So the entrance fee, let's have, let's actually just copy this whole thing and just adjust it as needed. 0 0.1 ether, that's cool. Interval 30, that's cool. VRF coordinator, now this is gonna be the address of the VRF coordinator mock. Gas lane doesn't matter, so we can leave it like this. Subscription ID will matter, but our script will add this. And let's keep 500,000 gas here. So this is actually gonna be real similar to our Sepolia, really with the only main difference is this VRF coordinator mock is different. And oh, sorry, this could actually be a pure function instead of a view function. But this one has to be neither because we actually send a transaction. Okay, cool. So now we have a Sepolia config and an Anvil config with our mocks in here. Badass, very nice. So now that we have both of those, we can go back to our deploy script and finally start looking into to deployment. So we're gonna say, we're gonna first import that upper config from dot, dot, oh, dot slash upper config dot s dot soul like this. Now in here, we're gonna deploy a new helper config. So we're gonna say helper config, helper config equals new helper config. And now based off the active network config, we're gonna get all this stuff. So I'm actually just gonna copy this, copy all this here, all this whole struct, paste it in here, remove the semicolons, replace them with, oops, replace them with commas, except for the last one. And I'm gonna say all of those equal helper config dot active network config, right? So this line here is equivalent to if I did, if I imported network config from the helper config, I did network config equals this, but I'm deconstructing this network config object into the underlying parameters. So this is deconstructing that, and that's how I can just get all the individual pieces like this. Cool. So now that we have all those, what we can do is we can actually do our vm.start broadcast, and then we'll do a vm.stop broadcast like this, and we'll say raffle, raffle equals new raffle. I'll put on all these parameters in here. Raffle.sol. Are these in order? It looks like these are in order, so I can just do them in order here. Entrance fee, interval, VRF, coordinator, gas lane, gas lane, subscription ID, and callback gas limit. Cool. And then we can do return raffle. Now, at a high level, this should be good enough, but we're actually going to make this deploy script even more robust. There's a couple of things that we need here. Number one, we need a subscription ID. We need to get that either from the UI or we need to make it ourselves. Because I'm a dev, I want to have my script do everything for me. But if you want, we could 100% just get that subscription ID from the UI. So we're gonna to need to refactor this, but let's pretend for now that this is good. So let's just pretend this is good, even though we know this isn't good. Let's go ahead and start writing our tests, right? So cool, we've got a deploy script, we've got our helper config, great. Let's go ahead, let's write our first test. So in here, we're gonna make two different folders. We're gonna do unit tests. We're also gonna make another folder called integration tests. As always, we're gonna start with our unit tests. So we're gonna create a new file, raffle test. 
dot t dot sol. So you know the drill, SPDX, Y since identifier MIT, pragma, solidity, 0 0.8.18, contract, raffle test, like this. I spelled solidity wrong. That's better. And we're going to need to import some stuff. So we're going to need to import that deploy raffle, first of all, from dot 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 slash sr series give me script slash deploy raffle dot s dot soul. We're going to need to import raffle, of course, from dot 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 src slash raffle dot soul. We're going to need to import test and console if we want to use that from forge std s dot soul. And we're probably gonna to need to import some more stuff, but let's just start from here. So we're gonna say raffle test is test. And let's go ahead and create some stuff. So first we're gonna need function setup. It's gonna be external. And we're gonna create our raffle deployer. So deploy raffle deployer equals new deploy raffle. And we're gonna do raffle raffle equals Employer dot run, right? Because our deploy raffle is returning our raffle here. So that's how we're going to get a raffle. And oh, we should actually save this up top. So we're going to say raffle, raffle, and do this so they don't shadow each other. And we should create some starting user to interact with our raffle here. So we're going to say address public player equals make ADR player. And this is one of the standard cheats that we're going to be using, right? This make ADDR. And we're probably going to want to give them a starting balance. So we'll say uint 256 public constant starting user balance equals 10 ether. Now, a good point that I want to point out here is that in my tests, I'm a little bit more lax with the layouts and the conventions. They're, I think they're more important for your actual contracts here the layouts and conventions and everything, just because this is the actual code that's being tested. I still think it's good to do them in your tests and everything, but you'll notice I'm a little bit more lax. Now, additionally with all this, we probably also want to be testing our deployments. So we also probably want to get all of our stuff from the helper config, right? So we can do import helper config from dot, 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 slash script slash helper config dot s dot sol. And right now, our deployer.run is only returning the raffle, but it's probably a good idea to return both the raffle and the helper config. That way our tests can have access to the exact same variables that our deploy had access to. So at the bottom, we can say return raffle, comma, helper config. Now in our tests, we can say, we can add a new helper config, helper config, like this, and we can say raffle comma helper config equals deployer dot run like that. And then we can get all the variables by doing a little bit of, by doing exactly what we do here. So I'm actually just gonna copy this line in the deploy raffle, paste it in here, but I'm gonna copy all these, make these state variables. I'm gonna turn all these commas into semicolons. There's a much faster way to do this, but I'm just gonna do it like this for now. And then remove the types here. So now all of these are getting saved up as state variables and I can use them in my test below. Cool. So let's even do a quick sanity check. So we'll say function test raffle initializes in open state. We'll make this a public view of a test. And we'll just say assert raffle dot get raffle state. Do we have a get raffle state function? Oh, we don't. So we should make a get raffle state because we have our raffle state private here. So I'm actually gonna copy raffle state, scroll to the bottom, we'll do function, get raffle state, external view returns raffle state, turn s raffle state. Now we have this get raffle state function. So we'll say raffle.get raffle state equals, and this is where we do a little bit of weird stuff that you probably haven't seen before. We can get that raffle state enum by saying raffle, raffle state dot open. Since raffle state is a type, or excuse me, open. Oops. 
since raffle state is a type, what this part is saying, hey, on any raffle contract, that raffle state enum or type, get the open value for that. So it should initialize in the open state. So let's go ahead and test this out. We'll say forge test, since this is the only test we have in here. We're gonna go ahead and compile everything, get a whole bunch of issues with the libraries, which we're not really gonna bother fixing. But we see we go ahead and this does indeed pass. So cool, so it does indeed start in an open state. Awesome. Let's start approaching this programmatically. Let's start writing some tests. So remember, where are we at right now? Let's do some forge coverage. And again, coverage is an end all be all, but practice makes perfect. The more you practice writing these, the better you're gonna get. And we're gonna learn some new tips and tricks along the way. So let's write some tests. So first, we're gonna start with enter raffle. We're gonna start with this enter raffle function. So I'm gonna make a fun little doodad, say, hey, we're gonna do some enter raffle functions here. So we're gonna create our function and we'll say test raffle reverts when you don't pay enough. Let's be public and we're gonna do arrange act assert. You don't have to type this arrange act assert out every time. I'm probably not going to, but remember this is what we're doing. So first let's have somebody try to enter the raffle without paying enough. So we're gonna do a little VM that prank player. We're gonna pretend to be that player. And then we're gonna do, we're gonna do, we're gonna expect this to revert. Remember we went over expect reverts from the book, expect revert. This is one of these cheat codes, only it works in Foundry, or we can say vm.expect revert. And we can even put in here the exact error we want it to revert with, and we should do this. So if we go back to our raffle here, if somebody enters our raffle without paying enough, we should revert with raffle not enough ETH sent. So what I can do is the same thing with the enum up here, the error is also a state. So I can say raffle dot paste it in raffle underscore underscore not enough ETH sent dot selector. And I know I mentioned function selectors previously, and I know what's coming up here. For now, just ignore it. We will explain what function selectors are in the coming courses. So now that we have that, and this is actually act slash assert, but now that we have that, we can do raffle dot enter raffle, and then we'll just not send any value, right? So we're expecting this to revert. We can test this out. We can test this out by running forge test dash M, paste the exact text that we wanna use. And we do indeed see that it passes. All right, cool. So it's actually reverting here. Nice. What else do we want to test? Okay, well, function test raffle records player when they enter, right? We want to make sure that our S players array is being updated. And we probably want to test this too, but I'm going to skip it for now. So let's do the same thing. So we'll do vm.prank, we'll pretend to be the player. We will call raffle.enter raffle, but this time we'll actually pass some value in. We'll pass value entrance fee. So this one should actually go through. And now we should be able to look in this players array and find our player. But we don't have a way to access this players array, so let's scroll down to the bottom. We'll do function, get player. We'll pass a u into 256 index of player. This will be an external view function that will return an address. And we'll just say return s underscore players index of player, right like that. So now we have this get player function. We can say raffle dot get player zero. And this will be address player recorded equals raffle dot get player. Now we can assert player recorded equals player. So we'll copy this. Of the terminal forge test dash m paste that in there. Uh oh, and we have an issue. Oh, this is exciting. So let's run this again dash vvv this time to get a little bit more information about what actually happened. And we get up uh, an out of fund error. Whoops. What do we forget to do? We forgot to give our players some money. So we need to give them some money. Let's go ahead and do that in our setup. So we'll scroll up to our setup. We'll do another cheat code here. We'll do vm.deal player 
starting user balance like that. This is another cheat code, remember, to give this address some money or 10 ether. So let's pull up our terminal. It's clear. Let's run this again. And ta-da. Great. So now they actually have some money to actually enter the lottery with. Perfect. What else? What else do we want to test? We tested this line. I skipped this line because I'm being lazy. We test this line. Let's test this line as well. Let's make sure it emits an event. Function test emits event on entrance. Be a public. Public. So same thing. We'll do vm.prank. Now making sure events are emitted are a little weird in Foundry. We're going to use this cheat code called expect emit. And what it takes as parameters is a bunch of bools, some check data, and then an address of an emitter. And the way that it actually works is we are going to say, hey, we're expecting an emit. We're expecting an emit event. The topics or the indexed parameters of an event, remember, if this is our raffle.soul, the index parameters are called topics. If we had some in here, like a UN256, something else, right, that would not be a topic. But so we're going to pass the topics that we expect to be emitted. And then we actually emit the expected event ourselves. And then we run the transaction. And what we're trying to say is that we are expecting this emit to happen in this transaction. So when we write expect event, we're saying this next emit that I do manually, I expect that to happen in this next transaction. So that's what we're going to do here. So we're going to say, we're going to say what we expect to mint emit. We're going to say vm.expect emit. This only has one topic or one index parameter. So we're going to say true. The other ones are going to be false, false, excuse me. The other two are going to be false and false. And then finally, is there any data or unindexed parameters? Nope, there's no unindexed parameters. So that's also going to be false. And then we're going to pass the address of the emitter, right? The address of the emitter is going to be our raffle contract. So we're going to say address raffle. Now we need to manually emit the event that we expect to emit. And unfortunately, we actually have to redefine them in our raffle test here. So we have to go to the top because events aren't types like enums or structs where we can just import them. We actually have to redefine them in our tests. It's annoying, but it's okay. So we'll make a little section called events at the top and we'll say event entered raffle address indexed player. And so we need to emit the events that we're expecting. So we're going to say emit entered raffle player. And then finally, we make the function call that should emit this event. So we'll say raffle dot dot enter raffle value entrance fee. Great. We can make sure this worked correctly. We're doing forge test dash M pasting that in there. And, and voila, that is indeed working. And you know what? Yeah, we should actually write a test for this, right? So let's do function test can't enter when raffle is calculating public vm.prank player. Let's actually enter the raffle as well. So we'll do raffle dot enter raffle value will be the entrance fee. Now that we've actually entered the raffle, we do need to go ahead and kick off a perform upkeep, right? We need to the perform upkeep is going to set the raffle to a calculating state, right? So in order to do this, we need check upkeep to return true. So we got to do all this stuff. First thing we got to do is we got to pass enough time. Now this is where there's more foundry cheats. So when we're working on a forked chain or a, lo a local chain, we can actually set the block time and the block number to whatever we want. There's a cheat code called vm.warp, which sets the block, which sets the block to timestamp. And there's also a cheat called vm.roll, which sets the block number. So what we're going to do is we're going to do both of those. We're going to say vm.warp, the current block.timestamp, plus the interval. And then we'll do plus one just to make sure we're absolutely over the interval. And we're also going to do vm.roll, whatever the current block.number is, plus one. We don't have to do this, but I like to do an extra block in my test if I'm also 
changing the time. Now that we've done that, we should be able to call perform upkeep and we'll just pass some empty data. So we'll say raffle.perform upkeep. And now that we've done this, it should be in a calculating state. So we shouldn't be able to enter the raffle. So if I do vm.expect revert with the revert firm enter raffle, which is going to be this raffle not open. So we can say raffle dot raffle not open dot selector. Again, we'll explain selector later, but I'll do vm dot prank the player. So this is saying the next real call is going to revert. This is saying the next real call is going to be pretended to be with the player. So it's going to be with the player. So we'll say raffle dot enter raffle value entrance fee. And this should revert here. So we test this forge test dash M paste that in. Hmm. And we get a different error. We get this invalid consumer error. Let's add some V's to see what's up. I'll even add five V's. All right. So it looks like this is the error that we're getting. And if we scroll down, we can see what's happening. So in the test can enter when raffle is calculating, we're going, we're entering, no problem. We're rolling, no problem. When we call perform upkeep on our VRF coordinator mock, we call request random words, but we're getting this invalid consumer error on our VRF coordinator mock. So let's open up that VRF or the nator v2 mock dot soul. Let's look for this invalid consumer here. So it looks like there's a modifier in here called only valid consumer, right? And if we look at this, it says it only allows this to work if a consumer is indeed added. So this is a little bit more information about the Chainlink VRF. When you're working with the subscription model, you got to do a whole bunch of steps, right? And we watched video where they did these all these steps through the UI. And you can see even create and fund a subscription. First, they create a subscription, then they fund the subscription, and then they add the raffle contract as a consumer to that subscription. This way, random people can't use your subscription. So what we need to do actually, is we need to up our deploy script here to make sure that we have a valid subscription once we deploy. And when we deploy this contract, we need to add this as a consumer to our subscription. Now, when we're doing this on a real test net, we could do this all in the UI, but when we're testing, we're gonna to need to do this all programmatically. So we're gonna refactor our deploy raffle so that we can run this test as if it's a real test here. So we can run this test. Now we could just go in here and tweak and automatically add a consumer to our VRF coordinator mock, but let's go ahead, refactor our deploy raffle because we're gonna to need to do this anyways. So there's a couple things we need to do. So let's start the refactor. So the first thing is this subscription ID. If we don't have this set, or if this is defaults to zero, we're never gonna be able to make any calls, right? So we need to have a subscription ID. If we're in the helper config, if we already have a subscription ID from working with the UI, right? If we go to subscription manager and we do have a subscription in here, if we already have one, we would just use that, right? If we don't have one, Oh, we would just use that and then we would paste it in here, two, three, four, or whatever. If we don't have one, we're gonna need to actually create one. So in here we can say if subscription ID equals equals zero, we should assume we don't have one set. So we're gonna need to create a subscription. And this is where, and we could put all of these in this deploy raffle script, or we go ahead and we could create our interactions dot s dot soul that will have a create subscription function for us. So let's go ahead and make our interactions now. So this will be SPDX, license identifier, MIT, Pragma, Solidity, 0 0.8.18, contract, create subscription is script. We have to import script from Forge STD slash script dot soul like this. All right, cool. And now, and if we pull back up our foundry fund me code, remember we actually split up the run and the actual funding so that we can just pull this into our script. And for the run, we'll just use that to get the most recently deployed address. 
And for a subscription, we don't actually even need the raffle address at all. So let's go ahead and let's create a function run because this is the main thing we're going to need to do. We'll have this return a uint64 because the subscription ID is a uint64. And in here, we're going to just have it return create subscription. We'll say using config. So we'll, we'll create a function called function create subscription using config public returns uint64 like this. And then up here, we're going to use our config to create a subscription. Why should we use this our helper config, we're going to need this VRF coordinator address. In order for us to create the subscription, we're going to need to call this VRF coordinator here. And in fact, if you go to the front end, if you go to vrf.chain.link, let's go ahead and connect, I accept, connect MetaMask. Oh, it's gonna be mad. We're on an unknown network, we're on Anvil. Let's go to Ethereum, let's go to Sepolia. If I hit create subscription, we're gonna get all this stuff in here. Let's just hit create subscription for now. Our MetaMask is gonna pop up. First, we're just gonna sign in. And then we're gonna get this method here called create subscription on this address. And we can even see the hex of what this is calling. So it's calling this function here. And I know we've done a little bit of, of cast work. But if we're pretty sure we know what this is going to do, we can check it, we can say cast sig, create subscription. And we can see that this is indeed the same as this. So we know we're calling the create subscription function on the front end. We can do that in our script as well. Now here's something interesting. Let's go ahead and copy this and let's reject here. Let's say you don't know what the function call is and you want to figure out what's this front end telling me to do. There's things called Ethereum signature databases where you can paste one of these hex things in here and look for the name of the function that's actually being called. So this is one such example, openchain.xyz. Paste this in and we can see, ah, create subscription. Now these databases only work if somebody else has already added them to the database and Foundry has a way to actually push them up. Again, I know I'm not really explaining these function signature things right now, but I will in later sessions. So in any case, we're going to be calling this create subscription function exactly the same as the front end's doing. But the VRF contract to call, but we need the VRF coordinator address to call it on. So we're going to do helper config, helper config equals new helper config like this. And we're gonna have to import helper config, of course import helper config from helper config And then we're going to get the active network information kind of exactly the same as here. I'm just going to copy from the deploy raffle, bring it over to interactions, I'm going to paste it in. But we don't need most of this, we only need VRF coordinator. So I'm actually going to delete everything except for the VRF coordinator. So that it kind of auto formats like this. And now because I like modularity, I'm going to create another function called create subscription function create subscription, which just takes the address VRF coordinator public returns you went 64 like this. And we're just going to have this function return create subscription. Now that we have the VRF coordinator address. So create subscription using config just gets the config create subscription just grabs the just creates a subscription based off whatever VRF coordinator we pass it. So now in here, this is where we're actually going to do, we're actually going to create the subscription. I want this to do some console logging, I, I would like it to print out to me what it's doing. So we'll do console dot log, creating subscription on chain ID, I'm a block dot chain ID, like this. Now we're going to do we're going to start our broadcast, which is actually going to call the create subscription function. So start broadcast like this, and then we'll do VM dot stop broadcast like this. So we're going to do, we're going to call the create subscription function on the VRF coordinator mock, which we're going to have to import, import, and we see the VRF in the VRF coordinator mock, there's a create subscription function. This is exactly what we're going to be calling. So that we actually have a subscription, first of all. And then later on, we're going to figure out how to add a consumer, we're going to do that soon. But first, we got to start with create subscription. So we're going to import VRF coordinator v2 mock 
from. We could also just import the interface if we wanted at chainlink slash contracts slash src slash this whole thing, this whole song and dance here. But now we can do BRF coordinator mock BRF coordinator dot create subscription. Call the create subscription function. And if we open up the VRF coordinator v2 mock again, we can see that this indeed does return a subscription ID. So cool. So that we'll say you went 64 sub ID equals that. And then we can just say return sub ID. And we'll do a little console.logging. We'll say your sub ID is comma sub ID. And then we'll even say console.log, please. Update subscription ID in helper config.s.sol. Great. So now we have a way to actually create a subscription programmatically. And this is something that we'd probably also want to write some tests for, right? In test, in unit, we'd do like interactions s.t.sol. But I'm going to skip this for now. But I'm going to skip this in this section because we're going to do some of that in the integration as well. But all right. So we have a way to actually create a subscription now. So now that we've done this, I'm going to remove everything. We'll go back to our deploy. The whole reason we were doing this is so that if we don't have a subscription, we're going to make a subscription. So that contract that we just created, we're going to import it, import, create subscription from interactions.s.soul. And in here, we're going to say create subscription, create subscription equals new create subscription. Thanks, GitHub Copilot. And we're going to create a subscription. So we're going to say subscription ID equals create subscription dot. And this is why we have this create subscription function that just gets passed a VRF coordinator because in our deploy raffle, we already have the VRF coordinator. We don't need to get the config again. We can just do create subscription dot create subscription, pass the VRF coordinator address like this to get the subscription ID. And we're going to override this one. And okay, cool. So I actually am on the front end going to show you what it looks like. if you wanted to do this on the front end too and create your own subscription. You do not have to do this with me again, because this is on a test net takes a long time test nets are annoying. But I am going to go ahead and create a subscription just so that I can show you the next step as well wants us to approve. Yep, I'm going to go ahead and prove this. I have a transaction. I, I am right now on a test net calling create subscription on the front end myself. So I'm essentially doing this create subscription transaction. I'm just doing it on the front end. And now we can view our transaction, we can add funds, whatever. But now if I go to the home, I can see my subscriptions, I can see that now I have a subscription with a subscription ID 1893. And I could add this to my helper config. Or if I ran this create subscription script, I would just grab the subscription ID from my script. But then what I need to do is I need to fund it with link. So I would go to actions fund subscription, I need to make sure that I have link in my wallet, which I do not. So I'm going to go to faucets.chain.link. We're going to scroll down with Twitter connected. I would like 20 test link. I'm going to verify that I'm human. I'm going to put my address in here, send request. And we're going to get this pop up saying sending 20 test net link. And we have some transaction hashes for getting the link and the ETH. And awesome, we have the tokens transferred. Now in the next lesson, we're going to talk about these ERC 20 tokens, and these different types of tokens. But for now, if you get the if you did follow along and you did get the 20 test ETH, if you open your up if you open up your MetaMask, you won't see it in here. ERC20 and ERC677 and a different type of smart contract based tokens actually are contracts on blockchains as well. And what we need to do is we need to go to docs.chain.link, getting started, scroll down to link token contracts, scroll down to Sepolia testnet. And we could copy this address. You can also just hit this add to wallet button. But we could copy this address, roll up to our MetaMask, hit import tokens, paste it in there for the Sepolia testnet, add custom tokens, import tokens. And now we can see we have Sepolia ETH and we have Lincoln here. So this is just us needing to tell our MetaMask where to look for these different cryptocurrencies. 
since there are so many, it's not going to just be defaulted with any, and anybody can create a cryptocurrency. So we need to actually import them and tell MetaMask, hey, can you look at the balance of this token? So now that we have that on our front end here, we'll do a little refresh. We can see our subscription is active. Let's go to actions, fund subscription. Let's put in three for now, confirm. I'm not actually going to run this. I'm just doing this to see, oh, okay, well, what's the, what's the function being called? Okay, it's this transfer and call function that's being called on, interestingly enough, on the link token contract. So if we go to this contract, it's actually the link token contract that we're calling transfer and call on, not on our VR app or, or anything like that. We're actually transferring tokens to the subscriptions contract and we're calling transfer and call on our contract to do so. I'm actually not gonna call it. We're gonna, we're gonna do this programmatically and you'll see that our balance right now is zero, but we're gonna write a script in Solidity to add link to our ID here. So we've created a subscription. Now, after we create our subscription in here, now we're gonna need to fund it. So you already know. We're going to go to our interactions and we're going to create a new contract called fund subscription contract fund subscription is script like this. And we're going to leave it all in this interactions.soul. So we should first pick an amount. I know that the amount has to be a uint 96, but we'll say public constant fund amount equals we'll say three ether. We'll just do three. And now we'll create our function run which will be external. And in here, we're just gonna call fund subscription using config like this. We're gonna create a new function above it called function fund. Actually just gonna copy paste here. And this will be a public function. And here we're gonna do something very similar to what we did up here. But in order for us to fund the subscription, we're gonna need our subscription ID that we wanna fund. We're gonna need the VRF coordinator V2 address. And then we're also going to need the link address, which we haven't actually talked about yet. So I'm actually going to copy this bit up here. We're going to copy this, paste it here. So we're going to need the VRF coordinator address. We're also going to need the, the uint64 sub ID, right? Because this is the subscription that we're actually funding. Oh, sorry. The sub ID is way down here. My bad. we're also going to need the link token because it's the link token that is the contract that we're actually making the call on. Now in our helper config, we don't have a link token, right? So we're going to need to add a link token to these. For Sepolia, the link token already exists. So we would just add like a comma here and just add the link token address, which again, we can get, we go to the docs, let's go to getting started, link token contracts. Let's copy the Sepolia token here or just click it. <laughs> and then copy it, paste it in here, and we'll call this link like this, which means up on our network config, we're going to have to do address link. And now for Anvil, we're going to have to do what? That's right, we're going to have to deploy a mock link token. So I made your life a little bit easier for this. Instead of having to deal with the chain link contracts versions and the different link tokens and stuff, I just rewrote the link contract for a newer version of Solidity. So if you want to just come to my Foundry Smart Contract Lottery F23, go to test mocks link token dot sol. You can actually just copy paste this whole thing. So back in our VS code, we're going to go to test, new folder mocks, new file, link token dot sol, and paste that in there. Now we did one other thing at the top. We imported this soulmate package. Soulmate is a gas opinionated building blocks for building smart contracts, right? So it's a way to very easily create different types of common smart contracts very easily. So this link token that we created, I based off of this soulmate package. So we're going to have to import this soulmate package. And again, if this isn't making sense, this token stuff doesn't make sense. Don't worry. We're going to explain all this token stuff in the next section, but let's do forge install. And we'll do transmissions 11 slash soulmate transmissions 11 slash soulmates like this. Another really popular, another really popular library is going to be this open Zeppelin slash contracts library. And we're going to use this a lot very soon. 
but we're going to use soulmate for this one. So forge and forge install and the dash no commit. All right, great. And since we installed this new library, we're going to have to go to our boundary.toml, do a little comma here, and we're going to say at soulmate equal, oops, soulmate equals lib slash soulmate slash src. Like this. I even want to toggle the word wrap. Okay, cool. Now this looks good. Now in our helper config, we can now use that link token. So we can say import link token from dot dot slash dot dot slash test slash where is that too many? Oh, excuse me. Slash test slash mocks slash link token dot soul. And now down here in our anvil, we can do link token link equals new link token because there's no constructor parameters. And then we can finally say down here, link is address link. So now we have a link address. And so we'll need to do a little comma here, address link. And now anytime we call this get helper config, we're going to just need to add another comma here. Perfect. That looks good. That looks good down here. Just for a sanity check, we're going to do a forge build. Make sure I didn't miss anything. Looks like I did miss some stuff. Aha, in the deploy, we need a new comma. Let's say address link here. In the test, we need a new comma as well. Scroll up, we'll say address link. Let me scroll down. We'll say link here. So it looks like I got it everywhere. Let's do forge build again though, just to make sure. Cool. It's mornings, that's fine. Everything is compiling. Awesome. Okay, <laughs> so let's go back. So our helper config has now been updated to deploy a mock link. And if we're on a live network, we're using the actual link token or for Sepolia, the link testnet token. So if we go back to our interactions, we now have this link contract. Well, this link address, and we're going to work with the link contract in a second. What we can do now is we can create a new function just called fund subscription that takes the BRF coordinator, the sub ID and the link and actually does the funding. So we'll create one more we'll do function fund subscription, address VRF coordinator, V2 or VRF coordinator, uint64 sub ID, address link. And we'll make this public. And here we're going to run the same functions that the front end would do to fund the subscription. So I want to, I want to do some print statements though. I want to do a console.log funding subscription. I'm a sub ID console.log using VRF coordinator, comma VRF coordinator, console.log on chain ID, on block dot chain ID. And now this is where unfortunately we have to do some wonky stuff. If this part doesn't make sense either, don't worry. And I know I've been saying that a lot for this lesson, but it's really okay. We're going to power through this. The VRF coordinator mock actually works with the link token transfers a little bit differently than the actual contract. So we're going to say if block dot chain ID equals three, one, three, three, seven. So if we're on a local chain, this means that we have a mock deployed. We're going to do something else. We're going to call, we're going to do VR VM dot start broadcast VM dot stop broadcast. So if we're on Anvil, we're going to say VRF coordinator v2 mock. And if we go to the VRF coordinator v2 mock, there's actually a fun subscription. There's actually a fun subscription button or a fun subscription function on the actual contract. This doesn't exist. We have to do a transfer and call thing, but we're going to do VRF coordinator v2 mock VRF coordinator fund subscription sub ID and the fund amount be able to stop broadcast else. We're actually going to do the real transfer here. We're going to say VM dot start broadcast VM dot stop broadcast link token. So we need the actual link token here. We're going to import link token from test slash mocks slash link token dot so link token at address link dot transfer and call VRF coordinator fund amount and then ABI dot encode sub ID for now. Don't worry about what this is doing. 
We can come back much later once we explain ABI encoding in this section. For now, literally just feel free to blindly follow along. So we're going to do this transfer and call to fund our subscription. Great. Let's do a forge build. And all right, cool. Contracts are indeed compiling. Fantastic. And you know, what? I'm actually going to run this fund subscription script right now to show you it in action, right? You do not have to do this with me. And in fact, I recommend you not because there's a whole bunch of stuff I haven't explained to you yet. But this is our this is our subscription on Sepolia. Right now it's got a it's got zero consumers, balance of zero. Let's go ahead and let's run this as a script though. Let me zoom in a little bit. So we're gonna say forge script script interactions.s.sol. We're gonna call fund subscription contract, which is going to call the run, right, which is going to use the config, which is going to get Sepolia and all that stuff. And we're going to pass this. Oh, actually, before we do any of this, excuse me, we're gonna need a couple things. So let's copy this. Before we do any of this, we're gonna do a little clear, we're gonna to have to create a dot env. Again, this is just for testing. So it's okay. Dot env. We're going to create our Sepolia RPC URL equals, you could copy paste this from your last project. I'm going to sign into alchemy here, grab a key from here and do private key equals. I'm going to grab mine from my MetaMask here again, because this is just a dummy account and I do not care. Account details, export private key, confirm, copy this. And we're not going to really do this with real money. So it's fine. We're going to do source dot env. Okay. Now we're going to run forge script script interactions dot s dot soul fund subscription dash dash RPC URL It's going to be dollar sign Sepolia RPC URL dash dash private key. It's going to be private key dash dash broadcast like that. And let's give this a whirl. And if we did this right, which we didn't, oh, invalid subscription, duh. So it's good. It's good that we got an error back, right? But it's better if we test before we do this. So I'm going to grab my subscription ID. And this is why you test on a fork, right? Uh, we're going to update this here. Boom for Sepolia. I'm going to hit clear. Now we're going to run this. Looks like it's actually working now. But yeah, I mean, exactly what you just saw is why we do all these tests and stuff and don't just yellow it like what I'm doing here. So again, don't run this. Don't do this. Just watch just showing the power, giving you guys a chance to take a breather. I know we've been coding a lot, but we successfully ran it. If We go to our MetaMask now, go to assets. Once this transaction goes through, we'll see our MetaMask balance actually deplete, which we do indeed. We see it went down by three. And if we refresh the front end, we see we now have a balance of three. Wow, our script is working. Hooray. So now that we can do all of this, let me zoom out a little bit because we're actually not even quite done. We can create a subscription. Hooray. We can fund a subscription. Hooray. What was the issue we were running into? Invalid consumer. Okay, one more. We got to add a contract to be able to add a consumer. So let's do this. So interactions, we're almost there. Interactions, new one, contract, add, consumer, is, script. We're going to do a lot of the same stuff that we did before. So we're going to say function, run, external. For this one, we are going to need the raffle contract because we're going to need to add consumer. We're going to say, hey, the raffle contract is cool to work with this subscription ID. So we are going to need the most recently deployed raffle contract, which again, we can find in our broadcast section, or we can use, and we can use this foundry DevOps repo that I made to go ahead and do this. So we're going to go ahead and do this forge install. I'm going to copy this, pull this up, clear, paste it, and then dash dash no dash commit. Great. Now we have foundry DevOps. And what we can do is we'll scroll down. We'll install port DevOps tools, we'll scroll to the top, paste this. And now that we have the DevOps tools, we can run this. I'm going to just copy this pay copy and paste this right from the docs. So run. All right, address contract 
contract address. This is going to be raffle equals DevOps tools dot get most recent deployment. The contract is going to be raffle with the block dot chain ID. And now we're going to do add consumer using config with this raffle contract address, the most recently deployed. Of course, this function doesn't exist. So we're going to have to do this function add consumer user config. It's going to take an address raffle public. And this is going to do the same thing we've been doing. Helper config, helper config equals new helper config. And now in order for us to add a consumer, this one does have an add consumer function. We can go to the front end again, check to see what this would actually do. Consumer address, let's just put any old address in here for now. We'll call add consumer just to see what MetaMask will pop up with. Go to data, it can't decode it. But we can see, okay, it's calling add consumer with a uint64 and an address. And here's the hex bytes of the add consumer. This little function selector thing, which I know I haven't explained yet, is pointing to add consumer. And this is all the data associated with a uint64 and an address. But we're gonna reject because now we at least know that's the function we need to call. And actually, if we look at the VRF mock, add consumer is the same, right? Add consumer is a sub ID and a consumer. So we're going to need a sub ID consumer. We're going to need a sub ID, which we're going to get from the config. We're going to need the VRF coordinator address, which we're going to get from the config. And we need the raffle, which we are going to pass like this. So we'll say we can actually scroll up. We can cheat again. We're just going to copy this line. Scroll back down, paste it in here. We need this. We need this. We don't need this. And that's all we need. Okay, cool. So now we can create one more function called add consumer, which is going to pass in the raffle, the VRF coordinator, and the sub ID like that. All right, one more. We'll make this at the top. So function add consumer. This is take an address raffle address VRF coordinator and a uint64 sub ID public. Boom. And here we're going to put some console logs. We'll say console.log adding consumer contract. We'll semicolon raffle console.log using VRF coordinator. VRF coordinator console.log on chain ID block.chain ID. And now we'll do our vm.start broadcast, vm.stop broadcast. VRF coordinator v2 mock VRF coordinator dot add consumer raffle sub ID. Ooh, okay, a lot of stuff. I'm going to zoom way out. Just explain this once more. Oh, and what's this? I need to do boundary.toml. Is this in my lib? Looks like it's indeed in the lib. So I need to do lib slash. Ah, okay, I need to do lib slash. Sorry, lib slash here. But we can create a subscription. We can fund our subscription and we can add our raffle to our subscription. Oh, and what's this? What did I mess up here? I put these in the wrong order. Let's switch the order. Okay, cool. That looks good. Forge build. Yes. Yes. Okay, okay. All right, so stuff is looking good. Now, now that we have all this stuff, we can finish our deploy raffle finally. So we created our subscription if we don't have one. Now we're going to fund it because if we created it, it's going to be blank and we're going to go ahead and fund it. And remember, if you already have a subscription, none of this would even get executed. So now we're going to do fund subscription, fund subscription equals new fund subscription like this. And are we importing this? We're not create fund and then add consumer. All of these are coming from interactions. Fund subscription is new fund subscription. We'll call fund subscription dot fund subscription. Isn't that confusing? VRF coordinator subscription ID and also the link contract address, because if we go to this contract, we have, we don't need to call, we don't need to call run, right? We don't need to call fund subscription using config because we're already doing that. We only need this for when we're running fund subscription as a script from the command line. We just need to call this because we have all these, right? Your coordinator subscription ID link. 
Now it is funded. Huzzah. We deploy it. And then we just need to do one more thing after it's deployed, which is add it as a consumer. So we do add consumer, add consumer equals new, add consumer. And then we call add consumer dot add consumer. And if we go back to interactions, we scroll down to add consumer. It takes a raffle address, VRF coordinator and sub ID. So this is where we can finally do address raffle. The VRF coordinator, and then the link address as well. Oops, excuse me, not the link. We need this sub ID, subscription ID instead. Okay, zooming out. If we do not have a subscription, we create one and then we fund it. Then we launch our raffle. And since it's a brand new raffle, we're always going to want to add a consumer. We're always going to want to add this raffle to our list of consumers in the subscription management. So, once we do all this stuff, the reason we did all this stuff was so that we can go back to our unit tests and actually do this part. We should finally now be able to call perform upkeep because the VRF coordinator contract now is expecting our call. So let's do this one more time. Test can't enter when raffle is calculating. So we'll do forge test dash M paste it in. Let's see if all of our stuff is going to pay off. And it does indeed pass. This is very exciting. And because we did all that work, this whole thing is now a giant script that we can run to in one go without ever having to interact with the UI all programmatically, we can deploy our raffle contract, we can create a subscription, fund the subscription and add the consumer in one command. This is incredibly powerful. And we're now able to test our deployment script because we're using it in our unit test. This is fantastic. So we're not done. We have a lot more to go, but you should take a pause. You should take a break. We just learned a lot. And yes, a lot of what we just went over can be a little challenging. There's a lot of advanced concepts we're going. We're, this course is ramping up quickly and that's okay. It's okay to be frustrated sometimes. It's okay to not get it sometimes. Just keep asking questions piece by piece. This is a marathon, not a sprint, which is why I'm going to encourage you to take some time to go get some ice cream. Or if you can eat ice cream, maybe some sushi. I love sushi. But take a break and come back to this soon. But take a break, all right? Recuperate your brain. Your brain is a giant muscle. Be sure to ask questions to both your AI buddy and to the discussions forum. And we'll see you soon. All right, welcome back. Hope you did actually take a little bit of a break because like I said, breaks are incredibly important. But let's keep writing these tests. Because remember, if we run forge coverage right now, we're going to get an output like this and this isn't very good. We should definitely try to get this up higher. So let's keep going. What's next? If we pull back up the raffle contract, we've written a lot of tests for enter raffle. We should probably write some tests for check upkeep to make sure that our check upkeep is working correctly. So. Do a whole bunch of these backslashes, check upkeep, like this, make it look nice there. All right, so what's the first thing we should check for? It should return false if this doesn't have a balance. It should return false if this isn't open. If this ha if enough time hasn't passed, there's a whole bunch of stuff we should test for. So let's go ahead, function, test, check upkeep, return false if it has no balance. So we're going to make everything else true. Just the fact that it has a balance be false. So we're going to have to make enough time has passed by doing the dot warp again, block dot timestamp plus interval and then plus one BM dot roll block dot number plus one. So now we'll do 
And this will be range. I want an act. This will be bool upkeep needed equals raffle dot check upkeep. I'll pass some blank data in. And now our assert will assert bang upkeep needed. Bang again stands for not. This is saying assert upkeep needed is false. So if you negate false, you get true. So assert not false. Assert not false, which is true. Forge test dash M, paste that in. Ta da, passes. All right. Great. What else? It should return false if the raffle isn't open. Function test check up, keep return false if raffle not open. To the let's do the arrange range. So in order to make the raffle not open, we have to of course enter the raffle and kick off a perform upkeep. Right, it needs to be in the calculating mode. So we're gonna do a VM dot prank player, pretend to be the player, raffle dot enter raffle value of the entrance fee like that. And now we're going to do VM dot warp block dot timestamp plus interval plus one. Beam dot roll block dot number plus one raffle dot perform upkeep like that. So we're just getting this, we're calling perform upkeep because this is going to set it into the calculating state. So check upkeep should return false if we're in the calculating state. So now we should be in the calculating state. So now we can run into act. We can say bool upkeep needed equals raffle dot check upkeep. Thanks, copilot. And then we can just say assert upkeep needed equals equals false. Or we could do assert not upkeep needed. Either one of these work. I, want to, I just wanted to show you both. This is the assert. Copy this, pull up the test, forge test, dash M paste. And that works. Perfect. So we'll clear this and keep going. We got more tests to do. And to give us a really good idea of exactly what we need to do, we can do forge coverage dash dash report. We can do forge coverage dash dash report debug. And what this will do is it'll actually give us a file that tells us exactly. And what this will do is it'll give us an output that tells us exactly what lines we haven't covered. So what I like to do is I like to hit up a couple of times, forge debug dash report, pipe it into coverage dot txt or output it into a file called coverage.txt with this little care thing. And now if we look in our files, we should have a coverage.txt file, which looks awful at the top, which is fine. We just can delete all this stuff here. But you'll see this analyzing contracts, running tests, and it'll tell you exactly which line, which lines of code are not covered for each section. So deploy raffle.s.sol, all of these lines aren't covered. We mainly care about raffle.sol, so let's scroll down to raffle.sol, and we can see we have all these things, we have all these lines we haven't covered. So, for example, branch two, path zero, location source of D27, line 126 in raffle.sol. So we'll, we'd go to raffle.sol, go to line 126. Ah, if not upkeep, revert. So we're not checking on perform upkeep, if not upkeep, we're not checking that this revert is reverting correctly, right? So that's something we'd want to check. So branch two past one, this is we're not checking. So we're not checking if this is false. We're also not checking if this is true. We don't have any perform upkeep tests. And it knows that. Go to line 127. Same thing. We're not testing these variables in here. Not doing any tests there. Function fulfill random words. Line 125. Or excuse me, 145. Yep, sure. We're Pretty much never, we don't have any tests that te test this. So, and if we look, check upkeep is 113, 114, 115, et cetera. Technically, we don't see any of those in here because we did write test for check upkeep, but we still didn't really test enough, right? We should still be testing test check upkeep returns false if enough time hasn't passed. We're not testing for that. We should write a test for that. Test check upkeep returns true when parameters are good. We're not testing check up equals true. So 
I'm going to challenge you to write these two tests and then compare them to my tests. Again, you can find my tests in the GitHub repo associated with this course. So go ahead, try writing these two tests yourself. All right, cool. Welcome back. Now we're going to keep going. It's time to write some perform upkeep tests. Let's do this. Function test perform upkeep can only run if check up keep is true. Make this public bm dot prank player raffle dot enter raffle. GitHub Copilot is letting me hit tab twice there. That's very nice. Thank you, GitHub Copilot. BM dot warp block dot timestamp plus interval plus one bm dot roll block dot number plus one and now act slash assert raffle dot perform upkeep. So in Foundry, there's no expect not revert. So if we just run this and this transaction doesn't revert, this test will be considered to be passed. So if I do forge test dash M paste, this will go ahead and pass. But say for example, we commented these out and I ran this again, this would now fail because perform upkeep would fail. Yep, see, there you go. Raffle upkeep not needed. Great. All right, next function test perform upkeep reverts if check upkeep is false. So we want perform upkeep to revert if check upkeep is false. Arrange. So if we just deployed this, check upkeep is going to be false, obviously, because not enough time has passed. So if I try to run raffle dot perform upkeep, this is obviously going to fail, right? So what I can do is vm dot expect revert. But what is this going to revert with? If we go back to our raffle, if we go back to perform upkeep, we see that we have raffle upkeep not needed. But this is our first custom error that's actually using parameters inside of the custom error. How do we do this? Before we would do raffle dot this dot select or which is good, but I want to also make sure it's reverting with the exact stuff that I want it to revert with. So I want it to have the uint 256 current balance, that's gonna be zero. The number of players is gonna be zero. uint 256 known players equals zero. And then also the raffle state is gonna be what? It's gonna be open. We wrap it in a uint 256. So the open, raffle state is going to be zero. We could also do uint 256 raffle state equals zero. So instead of vm.expect revert for this line, we can make this a little bit more clever. And if we grab this and we go to the docs, paste and expect revert, we can actually see if we scroll down, we can see an example with a custom error type with parameters. So you do this abi.encode with selector, custom selector, and then the parameters. Again, we're, I'm not going to explain what this line is doing for now. Just for now, just roll with me. <laughs> we're going to explain it in the upcoming course what this ABI dot encode with selector is doing. But we're going to follow this methodology here. So I'm going to do ABI dot encode with selector, pass in the raffle dot raffle upkeep not needed dot selector, comma, current balance, num players, Raffle state. All right, cool. So we're saying, okay, we're expecting this transaction to fail. Remember, because expect revert says the next transaction is going to fail with this error code with these parameters, right? So this is a range, and this is going to be act slash assert. So we pull up our terminal here, forge test dash m paste. All right, now, so let's keep going. So this perform upkeep function here, let's give this another emit, just because I want to show you something. So I'm going to give this another event. I'm going to scroll up to the events here. I'm going to say event requested raffle winner UN256 indexed request ID. So requested raffle winner is now going to get emitted when we call perform upkeep. So I'm going to say emit requested raffle winner, we're going to get the request ID, you went to 256 request 
ID equals that. We're going to omit this request ID. Now, quick quiz for you. Is this redundant? Is us omitting this here redundant? If you want to pause and guess your answer, feel free to do so. All right, I'm about to tell you the answer. So our VRF coordinator contract, if we go to our VRF coordinator mock or the actual VRF coordinator contract, and we look for request random words, if we go in here, we can see there's a random words requested event, which has the request ID inside of it already. So yes, this is redundant. We shouldn't omit this request ID here because we're already going to do that in the VRF coordinator mock. So it's definitely redundant. However, to, to, sh to make this easier to show you us testing this, we're going to go ahead and omit it again here. And the reason we're going to do that is because in our test, we're going to answer this question. What if I need to test using the output of an event? Remember, events are not accessible by our smart contracts. But yet we're writing our tests in Solidity, so we should be able to get the output of events. Normally, in a regular smart contract, you never can, right? You can never get the value that this emitted. However, in our tests, we actually can, right? So that's what we're going to learn how to do here. And it's important to be able to test the output of events because, for example, the way the Chainlink VRF works is it emits this event here, and a Chainlink node is listening for this event, right? And this is another reason why events are so important. The Chainlink node actually functions by listening to events. And this is how it knows to request around numbers. If I'm building a Chainlink-like system, I need to be able to test for events being emitted and the values that they're being emitted. So we're going to go ahead and write a test, say function test perf perform upkeep updates raffle state and emits request ID. Make this public arrange vm.prank player raffle.enter raffle. And we probably should change this to a modifier like we did before, where we have modifier raffle entered, but I haven't done that, but we probably should go back and refactor this as a modifier. Then we're going to do the same thing, vm.warp, vm.roll. You can see this is very redundant, right? We've done this a bunch of times in here, and we should really have a modifier. You know what? I am going to make it a modifier. I'm going to copy this. We're going to make it. We're going to make it here. Modifier, raffle entered, and time passed. Cool. Public, raffle entered, and time passed. Okay, great. We got a little modifier for that. Cool. Now we're actually going to go right into act already. So all we need to do is somebody to get in here. And what we want to do is we want to capture this omitted request ID, right? Because our VRF coordinator mock is going to create a request ID in this function here. And a raffle contract doesn't have access to this. We could go through this or make this a public variable or save it or something. But really, again, we really want to know how to test to get the output of these events. So now we're going to be an act here. And what we're going to do is we're going to use another cheat code called record logs. And record logs tells the VM to start recording all a minute events. To access them, use get recorded logs. So we're going to do vm.record logs. And what this is going to do is it's going to automatically save all the log outputs into this data structure that we can view with this get recorded logs function. So I'm gonna do vm.record logs, raffle.perform upkeep, paste that in there, which this is going to omit the request ID. And then we're gonna do vm.log array. So this is a special type that comes with foundry tests, vm.log array, memory entries equals vm.get recorded logs which is going to get all of the values of all of the events we recently emitted. And to get this vm.log, we're going to need to import that vm type. So we're going to do import vm from forge std slash vm.sol. And OK, cool. So now we have it. Great. Now we can get the request ID out of this list of events that were emitted from this. And this is where we got to know a little bit about what's happening in this transaction, right? We got to know all the different types of events. This entries array is going to be a list of all these logs that are emitted. 
but maybe I don't know how many events this has been, this is doing. There's actually a number of strategies we can use to figure out what, where in this array, our requested raffle winner is being emitted. Now there's a number of different ways for us to figure out exactly what event we're working with. And one of those is to use the debugger where we can run forge test dash debug and the name of the function that we want to test. For us, we're going to cheat a little bit and just know that this event we're emitting is actually the second event emitted in this transaction. The first one is going to come from this request random words, which again is on the VRF coordinator v2 mock. So if we wanted to get the request ID, we could just go looking at this location here, but we're going to look, we're going to use this one instead. So if I wanted to get that log, I would say bytes 32, all logs are recorded as bytes 32 in Foundry. I would say bytes 32 request ID equals entries at index one, index zero would be this random words requested in the mock index one is going to be this one here. So we're going to say one dot topics of one. So yes, even though this is the first topic in the data, technically the zero with topic, if I were to say the zero with topic refers to this entire event. So zero with topic refers to this entire event. The first topic will be this request ID here. So now that we have this request ID, we could do an assert u into 256 request ID is greater than zero. This way we can just make sure that this request ID was actually generated. If this bytes 32 is the default bytes 32, which is going to, which is just going to be zero x zero 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 zero, the uint two fifty six of the request ID would be zero, and this would not hold true. So perform upkeep starts and emits request ID. We also could probably do raffle dot raffle state equals raffle dot get raffle state like this r state. And then we could also say assert our state. We could wrap this in a u into 256 as well, equals one for calculating. So let's pull up the terminal, forge test dash m, paste that in. Yay. Cool. It passed. All right. On to the next. Let's do some fill random words tests. Forge coverage. Stuff is looking a lot better. All right. 64%. 71%. Let's keep going. All right. And again, I know this seems tedious, but it's really important that we understand how these tests work and how we can write tests so that we can make sure our stuff is actually working. So function test fulfill random words can only be called after perform upkeep. This will be public. Raffle entered and time passed like this. Okay. Arrange. So this is where we're going to try to have the mock actually call fulfill random words and it should fail, right? So we're going to say VM dot expect revert non-existent request. And here we run into kind of an issue. We want to make sure that calling fulfill random words in the mock is always going to revert, right? So what can we do? What we can do VRF coordinator v2 mock vrf at the vrf coordinator address dot fulfill random words zero address raffle so our vrf coordinator v2 mock has this this fulfill random words function which takes the request id and the address of a consumer and we want this and we should expect this to fail right because perform upkeep hasn't been called so we need to make sure that no matter what we pass, this is going to fail. And then we also need this VRF coordinator v2 mock import VRF coordinator v2 mock from at chain link slash contracts slash here, go back down. We need to make sure this always fails. So here we're actually mocking, we're pretending to be the VRF coordinator. Since we're using the VRF coordinator mock, fulfill random words can be called by anybody. So we want to make sure that this actually fails with non-existent request. If we go to the VRF coordinator mock, we look for this keyword, we can see if there's no request ID, we get non-existent request. However, if we really want to make sure there's no request, we would also probably want to check 
request ID 1. Well, if we really want to make sure, we should also check request ID 2. We should also check request ID 4, 3, and 4, and 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. We should really check all of these. Obviously, this doesn't make any sense for have this huge test which tests every single one of these variables. So instead, what we can do is something called a fuzz test. And we're going to explain this a lot more later. Now, I've got some videos on fuzz testing, and we're going to watch these a little bit later in this course. If this part doesn't make total sense to you right now, don't worry, we're going to go over it in depth later on in this course. Instead of us choosing 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, whatever, in our test here, we can say uint256 random request ID. And now we'll use random request ID instead of zero. What will happen now when we run this test is Foundry will create a random number for this and call this test many times with many random numbers, consistently checking to make sure this non-existent request error happens. So if we run this test now, forge test dash M, we'll see that this does indeed pass and we'll see on this line here, we'll see that this had 256 runs. This means that Foundry generated 256 different random numbers and ran this test with 256 different random numbers. We'll learn more about adjusting the number of fuzz runs and more about fuzzing later, as fuzzing is one of the most important skills to learn when it comes to security and testing your protocol. But all right, let's keep going. Let's finalize this testing here, which is a big, massive function. So we'll say function test fulfill random words, picks a winner, resets, and sends money. So let's make this public, raffle entered, and time passed. So this will be our full test. We'll enter, we're in our contract here. We will enter the lottery a couple of times. We will move the time up so that check upkeep returns true. We'll perform upkeep and we'll kick off a request to get a random number. And then we will pretend to be the Chainlink VRF and respond and call fulfill random words. Up here, we're doing something where we are being the Chainlink VRF. The reason that we have to be the Chainlink VRF here is because on our local fake chain, there's no real Chainlink VRF. On a real test net, this function, of course, wouldn't work because we are not the VRF coordinator v2 mock, right? We can't call fulfill random words, only the Chainlink node can. So since this is in our kind of fake environment, we can do this. For us, we're going to have to pretend to be the Chainlink node, though, to call fulfill random words in our local test. So let's go ahead and write this out. So we'll start with a range. Let's say, let's have UN256 additional entrance equals five, UN256 starting index equals one. So since we have this raffle entered in time passed, we already have one person who entered the raffle. So we'll do five more and we'll have a starting index of one because we're not going to start with index zero. Now we'll do four, you went to 56 I equals starting index. I is less than starting index plus additional entrance I plus plus. And now we're going to have a whole bunch of random people enter this raffle. So we'll say address player equals, and we'll create a player. So we can do make ADR player here, or we can do some interesting cast stuff. We can take this uint 256 I, wrap it as a uint 60, and then wrap that as a player. So this would be equivalent to being like address of one, address of two, address of three. And this will generate us an address based off of this number. So each one of these players are going to have a different address. Then we can use the hoax cheat to give our player one ether, and we can pretend to be the player. Remember, hoax is one of these cheat codes in here. If we'd look up hoax, a forge standard cheat code, which sets up a prank. So it's and gives them ether. So it's equivalent to prank plus deal. So we'll hoax the player, and then we'll do a raffle dot enter raffle value and trans B. So now we're entering the raffle, pretending to be a player who actually has some ETH associated with the account. All right, cool. So now we have a whole bunch of players in here. Now what do we need to do? 
We need to pretend to be Chainlink VRF to get the random number, and then of course, and pick the winner. So we're going to call fulfill random words, pretending to be the Chainlink node here, which takes the request ID and the consumer. So the consumer obviously is going to be the raffle contract. And we just learned how to get the request ID from an event in our last, in one of our last tests. We can do it up here. So I'm actually just going to copy this, paste it down here. So now we are going to record the logs. We're going to call perform up keep, which is going to kick off the request to the chain link node. So actually we're going to pretend to be chain link in a minute, get the request ID like this. And now we're going to be the chain link node. Now that we've kicked off a request and we're going to copy this line here, paste this down here. But instead of random request ID, we're going to do the actual request ID. But this takes a uint256. So we're going to cast this bytes32 as a uint256. So just remember this vm.log just counts everything as a bytes32. So that's why we cast it as a uint256. Now that we have the chainlink VRF actually pretending to be the winner, we can do some asserts. So we could assert the uint256 of the raffle.get raffle state equals zero. It should be back to being open, right? Because we look in our raffle, we reset the raffle state to being open. Okay, what else should happen? Well, what else do we do in here? We pick a winner. So we should have this recent winner variable should be something. So assert recent winner variable does not equal address zero. We should have a recent winner. And oh, that doesn't actually exist. So let's create a function at the bottom. Function get recent winner, external view, returns address, return s underscore recent winner. Down here, we'll say raffle dot get recent winner like this. Okay, so we have a winner. What else do we do in here? We pick a winner, change the state to open, we reset the players array. And do we have a getter there? No. Nope. So we have a get players, let's get the length of the array. So we'll do function get length of players, external view returns you into 256, return s underscore players dot length, get length of players. So assert at raffle dot get length of players equals zero, like that. What else do we do? We update the timestamp. Aha. And then do we have a function to get the last timestamp? Nope, let's create a function there. Function get last timestamp, external view, returns uint256, return s underscore last timestamp, get last timestamp. So we'll say uint256 previous timestamp equals raffle dot get last timestamp. So we should assert previous timestamp is less than raffle dot get timestamp, get last timestamp, because this should be updated. Okay, what else do we do? We should write a test to check this event is emitted. I'm not going to write it. But if you want to write it, please feel free. And then finally, we want to make sure that they actually get sent some money here. So to check how much they won, before we call perform upkeep, so we should say, we should get the uint256 prize, which is going to be equal to the entrance fee plus or times the additional entrance plus one. So this is gonna be the total prize. And then at the bottom, we're gonna say assert the recent winner balance should equal their starting balance plus the prize. So starting users are balance. Uh, what do we hoax down here? How much money? We gave them all one ether. No, nope, let's change that to starting e user balance so that we can have the same thing. So this should be equal to the starting user balance plus the prize. Like that. All right, cool. Let's give this a whirl. Forge test dash M, paste that in here. And we get an assertion violated, which is no problem. We're just going to put our dash VVV in here and see what we did wrong. Okay, interesting. So it says assertion violated. But we're not exactly sure what the issue was. Oh, and if we scroll up, we can actually see all these logs up here. So we're getting an error, but it's not exactly clear what the error is. And this is actually why it's not great practice to have this many asserts. It's really best practice to have one assert per test. 
This way, when it breaks, you know exactly what assert is breaking. We can see pretty clearly by commenting out all of these that it's this final assert that's breaking. We're not getting the value of each one of these though, which is a little frustrating. However, if we want to see them though, we can do a little console.log, paste this in here, boop, and console.log, paste the prize in here as well, and see what the difference of these are. So let's go to the top though, make sure we're importing console, we sure are. Okay, go back to the bottom. Let's clear this again. We'll rerun this. This time we'll actually see the console printouts and we actually see them printed out right here. We can see that these are indeed different. This is the hex of them. If we scroll all the way up to the log section of this, scroll down, we can see that these are different, right? We see we're getting this number. We see we're getting two very different numbers for these. So for the recent winter balance, we're getting this. And for the prize, we're getting this, right? So prize. So we should actually not just console out the prize, let's console dog log the prize plus the starting user balance, because those are the two that we're actually comparing. Let's rerun the test and we'll see why these are so different and what their so differences are. I'm going to scroll back up to the logs. And once we get to the logs, we see this is what the difference is. So it looks like the actual balance of the winner is one less than what we were expecting. And this actually makes sense because we didn't calculate the subtracted money that the player sent by entering themselves. So we should actually have this be their current balance is equal to the starting user balance plus prize minus the entrance fee, because that's how much they paid to be part of it. Now we'll run this again. And we'll see that we indeed passed because we brought our test wrong. Amazing. So this is fantastic. We have a test suite, and if we run Forge coverage, let's look at what our raffle contract, specifically how much coverage it has. We're looking at 91% of the lines, 92% of statements, 75% of branches, and 80% of functions. This isn't done, but this is much, much better than it was originally. Obviously, we still probably want to test these at some point as well. But this is great. Great job. Now, let's also try to see if this works on our forking tests, right? So this will work perfectly on our local Anvil, but will it work on our forked tests? What do you think? Pause the video and write down if you think if we run forge test dash dash fork URL, Sepolia RPC URL, write what you think will happen. Do you think this will work? Well, let's find out. Custom error. We got an error right in the setup. Uh oh. So. Forge test, let's just reconfirm. Forge test does indeed work, right? Psh, sure does. Real fast, all of our tests run, all 12 of them, they all pass. Okay, great. Then why is this failing? Let's type clear. Let's do dash V, 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 V. Let's do four Vs here. And we can see this is the error that we're getting. We're getting this must be sub owner when we try to add a consumer. So what's happening is in our setup of our test, we're calling deployer.run, which of course is our deploy raffle, which is calling run. And we're trying to add consumer with our subscription ID. So if we go back to our helper config in here, we're saying, oh, we're using subscription ID 1893. So what we could do is for our test, we could do zero and just recreate a new subscription, but we don't want to do that. We want to test with the actual subscription ID. So how do we actually do this? The reason we're running into an issue here is because of who the deployer is, who the private key is. This error that we're getting, only the person who launched the subscription can do this. Now, again, if you're doing this locally, if you're doing this on your computer and you didn't set up a subscription, we can just go ahead and set this to zero, be clear, and this is still going to fail, but for different reasons. If you didn't create a subscription and you have this set to zero, you're going to run into this issue here where our fund subscription doesn't work. So it looks like we're running into issues all over the place. If we have a subscription, then we're running into an issue where we're not doing the sub ID. If we don't have a subscription, then we're running into an issue with balances. Let's tackle both of these. Let's change our code so that it works no matter what. All right. 
two issues here. The first one, if you do have a sub ID, and if you didn't create a sub ID, that's fine. You're going to follow along with me anyways. If you did create a sub ID, in our deploy here, we're trying to add consumer. We're calling this add consumer function, but it's failing because we're using the wrong key. When we run our test suite, we run with an Anvil default key. But when we run with a fork URL, we're running on a real fake chain. So we're going to need to pretend to be the owner of this consumer address here. Well, if we're in our test, we could just do something like a vm.prank, right? But in our deploy scripts, we can't actually prank to be somebody because we, in our deploy scripts, we need the actual key. So what we can do instead is when we do this start broadcast, we can actually pass in a private key and use the private key. So we can actually define what key we want to use back in our helper config. And so we're going to do a little bit of refactoring here. So if we're on an actual network like Sepolia, what's our private key going to be? It's going to be that our environment variable, right? So what we can do is we can get our environment variable with another cheat vm.env uint. And this will grab our private key at, from an, its environment variable. Again, it's going to be this key right in our env. So since this is a hex, it's going to convert this from its hex to a number. Now, of course, since we have a deployer key, we're going to need to go up here, uint256, deployer key, like this. And since we're updating this struct, yep, we're going to have to do a whole lot of updating. So we have a deploy key for Sepolia. Down for Anvil, we're going to use the default Anvil private key. Remember, if we run Anvil, we're just going to use this as the default key. So what we can do is we can scroll up to the top here, make a constant called address public constant default Anvil key equals and paste it in here. Now, this is the only time I'm going to say pasting a private key in here is cool, right? Oh, excuse me. This is an address. This is a UN256. This is the hex of a UN256. Solidity is smart enough to convert the hex to an actual number. This is the only time it's cool to put a private key in plain text is when it is an Anvil private key. That is the only time it's cool to do this. Now, down in Anvil, we're going to say deployer key. It's going to be this default Anvil key that we created. That way, if we're on our local network, we're going to use this default key. If we're on an actual network, we're going to use a real key. And because we're using this vm.env unit, this can no longer be pure. I think it has to be a view now. Yep, it's a view now. OK, so now we can get a deployer key. So back here, when we add consumer, we're also going to do a uint256 deployer key from our config. And when we call add consumer, we're also going to pass a deployer key in. So let's go up to add consumer and let's do uint256 deployer key. And now when we start the broadcast, we can actually just pass in the private key to use for the broadcasting. So now we're going to call add consumer with a actual deployer key with a private key. And our setup is smart enough to know, oh, if we're on a testnet or a mainnet, we're going to use a private key from our .env. But if we're on Anvil, we're going to use this default one. So now our script is smart enough to do one or the other. Of course, since we updated our struct, we're going to have to do a whole lot of refactoring. So we got to do another comma here. We have to do a whole lot of adding commas and stuff. So if we scroll up anytime we have this in here, we're going to have to do another comma. Let's see where else. Yep, another comma here. Are we doing the helper config anywhere else? Let's look helper config. It's a little search thing here. Helper config. Yep, sure enough. In our deploy here, you went to 256 deployer key. And now down here in add consumer, now that we're actually getting our deployer key, we can just pass in the deployer key to add consumer. So now let's try this again. Well, let's first run forge build, make sure that I got all the refactorings. Looks like not quite. And again, remember, you can command click or control click to open this file up in the editor. Yep, sure enough, I missed one. I'm gonna do a little comma here. And this should now be good. Clear. Now let's try building again. Okay, cool. Looks like it's working now. Now again, let's try to run forge test dash fork URL, Sepolia RPC URL. And 
Remember, this is only going to fix the issue for those of you who actually did get a subscription ID. For those of you who didn't, don't worry. This refactoring is still going to be helpful for you anyways. So dash dash fork URL, Sepolia. All right, cool. We get a different error. Dash VV. Let's see what error we got this time. We still got this must be sub owner. Remember, just to run source.emb, just in case you forgot. And let's run this test again with dash V so we can see this output. And okay, great. So we got a different error here now. So now we're actually passing that last error. We're getting to a new error. So it means that adding that deployer key did fix our issue. Okay, great. So if we scroll all the way down, we can see there are two failing tests in here. One of them is this one here, and it gives a little bit of version, a little bit of information on the versioning. So let's get this test fulfill random words can only be called after perform upkeep. So this is the one where we have the fuzzing. This one is failing. Why is this one failing? It's saying call reverted as expected, but without data counter example. So it's not giving non-existent requests as its error. It's doing something else. The reason that this one's failing is let's actually look at the real VRF coordinator and not the mock contract. If we go to lib, Chainly Browning contracts, contracts, SRC, V08. Let's look for the VRF coordinator in here. Here it is. Let's look for fulfill random words. Okay. Ah, the real fulfill random words has an even different input. It requires a proof and a request commitment. Our mock, on the other hand, let's open up the VRF coordinator mock. Fulfill words is just the request ID in consumer. So our mock is a lot easier so that we can test it locally, but on a real network, it does something totally different. So what we can do is we can add some code in here to skip this test if we're on a fork. So I'm gonna create a modifier, modifier called skip fork like this. And we're gonna say if block.number, so this is gonna get the chain ID or better yet block.chain ID. If block.chain ID, does not equal to 31337, which is the Anvil chain ID, we're just gonna return. Otherwise, do it. So now we can add this skip fork piece here, and now this test will only run on, on Anvil and not when we're doing forking. If we go down here too, we see that we again, we end up mocking, we pretend to be the chain link coordinator down here. So this isn't gonna work because we're not the chain link coordinator on a forked network. So we're also gonna have to skip the fork down here. So now we have two types of tests we can run, we can just run forged test, which as we know, we're just going to pass or not. Let's see what I messed up here. Ah, and even this one didn't work. And because we're doing this setup though, with this deployer key, we need to make sure that the funding and the creating uses the exact same deployer key as well. So we're also gonna update create subscription and fund subscription to also get a deployer key passed in. So we're gonna do a little comma here, deployer key, come here, deployer key. We're gonna go to our interactions. We're gonna grab the uint256 deployer key, copy this, paste it into here add a uint256 deployer key as an input for create subscription. And now for vm.start broadcast, we're gonna go ahead and make sure we're using that exact same deployer key here. And we're gonna do the same thing for fund subscription. It's gonna get a uint256 deployer key, vrf sub id link, we're gonna pass this a deployer key, vrf sub id link, we're gonna pass this a deployer key, paste it here. And then for the start broadcast, once again, we're gonna do deployer key, and down here, we're also gonna do deployer key. So I know we just did a huge refactoring here, all right? I know that there's a lot of work. And if you get lost, if you're like, what the heck was going on? Be sure to jump in here and follow along and check the code that we used in here. And if you're a little confused, if I didn't explain this well enough, there's definitely a lot in this section, okay? So definitely be sure to go to the Go to the GitHub repo associated with this course, jump in discussions and ask some questions, okay? Or use whatever AI buddy you got, all right? Because some of this can definitely be confusing. Okay, cool. So now that we've done all that, we now have two types of tests, right? I can run forge test and hopefully everything passes still. 
And great, everything passes still, right? I've refactored the code so that for when I'm working with forge test, which works with a Anvil chain, we work with the default key for Anvil. But will forge test dash dash fork URL Sepolia RPC URL work? Let's find out. We see that this one works too. And the reason that this one works is because we're skipping those two final tests here, right? In our raffle test, we're skipping test fulfill random words and we're skipping test fulfill random words, right? Anytime we need to mock or pretend to be the Chainlink VRF, we're gonna skip those on the fork. Now this is a halfway solution. This is the easy way to do this. The harder way to do this and the more intensive way to do this would be to go into your code base here, go to SRC, V0.6, mocks, VRF coordinator, and actually, and excuse me, not the mocks, scroll down to the actual VRF coordinator, is us actually generate the proof, figure out the request commitment, and do a lot more coding here, right? We could 100% do this, and we would, in a sense, recreate a lot of the code used on the actual Chainlink node. We could 100% do that, but we're not gonna do that. We're gonna take this approach where we skip, just skip it on the fork. As long as it's working locally, we're content, because we're gonna be doing a lot of pretending anyways. Now that we've figured all this out, we can go ahead and uncomment this as well. And let's rerun these forge test. Looks good. Forge test fork. All right. And then forge coverage. All right. Awesome. We're at way higher coverage. We still have some functions that we could look over. Some of these are probably going to be the getters. We still have some branches, but we can go ahead and run that forge coverage dash report and see exactly what we don't have tests for. Again, that report is going to be your insight into, huh, have I really tested everything that I need to have tested? Is my code even ready to go on to the next step? Is my code even ready to go to audit? And all right, so we've done some unit tests. Let's do what well, you thought we were done. Let's do some integration tests. So I'm going to go ahead and grab my interactions test.t.sol, move it on up to integration. And additionally, we could and should write a script or a test, a script as a test suite to actually test all this stuff on a real live test net. Well, what kind of test would that be again? That would be a staging test, right? Remember, we start with unit tests, not you int, unit tests. Then we can do our integration tests, which is going to be testing our deploy scripts and, and various components of our contracts. Then we move to these forked tests, which are going to be our kind of pseudo staging integration tests. And then we have actual staging tests where we run tests on a mainnet slash testnet. Like I said, in this course, we're not going to do these, right? But it's really important to consider, hey, should I do a staging test where I actually deploy this to a testnet or a mainnet? Some people even deploy their contracts to Polygon or a really cheap live network to test their contracts in a production environment. In fact, there's some blockchain networks like Polkadot that have an entire staging blockchain called Kusama. It's worth real money, but it's meant purely to stage contracts, which sounds bizarre, I know, but that's the way it is. So we have some fork tests, we have some unit tests, let's write some integration tests, and then we're gonna go ahead, run this deploy script and see this lottery in action on a testnet. And like I said, you do not have to do this if you don't want to, but it is good to see it for yourself. Seeing is sometimes believing, but testnets are sometimes fickle. So if you don't wanna to have to put in all the effort to get it to work on a testnet, that's okay, but it can definitely ingrain in you it working. And remember, if you are looking for the most up-to-date testnet, come to the Foundry full course, scroll down, and we'll give you the recommended testnet at the top of the repo. Okay, great. Although to be fair, in our unit test, we did do some integration tests because our deploy setup ran all of our deployment scripts already. So maybe what we should have even done was interactions.t.sol, interactions test, and tested all of these contracts first before doing it in our raffle test. Maybe that would have been a better play. Now we're not gonna write a whole lot of staging tests this course. And a part of that is because it can be really difficult to write scripting, to do a lot of waiting and regular and stuff a normal programming language would be a lot better at. Foundry is particularly positioned at being a phenomenal smart contract framework, 
for testing and working with code that's 100% on chain. Since in our code, we're actually working with a Chainlink VRF and we are working with some off chain systems as well. Foundry can be a little bit more difficult to work with when simulating a more realistic environment where not just the blockchain is the only thing interacting. So that's why we're skipping a lot of these staging tests, but we do a phenomenal job with our unit tests. For any interactions or integration tests, I'm gonna leave this as a to-do for you. Again, if we run our Forge coverage, this is our current output right here. At least for our integrations tests, we should really be testing our deploy script to make sure that our deploy raffle works. So I'm gonna leave you with the test of upgrading your test suite so that at least this deploy raffle is all green as well. And then if you wanna go super hard on mode, also try to get that interactions test suite up and running. So with that all being said, I know we've been writing a lot of tests and a lot of code. Does this actually work on a real test net? Or does this actually work on a real main net or on a real test net? Let's give it a whirl. So we would run our forge script, blah, 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 whatever. I'm not gonna do that. Why? Because I'm lazy. I'm gonna make a make file and we're gonna define all of our commands in this make file that we wanna do. So we're gonna do dash include .env so that our make file knows about our .env environment variable. We're gonna do dot phony all test. Well, I'll just do all test deploy for now. And this way it knows that these are gonna be targets for this make file. We can do a little help here where we say at echo usage. Then we could say at echo space make deploy args equals dot dot dot. We could do a little help here. And now if we pull up the terminal, I can run make help and I'll get usage. Spell usage wrong. Usage, the usage out like that. Okay, cool. Let's make another target. Let's do build, which will do this. Remember, if you do the colon semicolon, it's the equivalent of putting this on a new line. We'll do forge build. Now I can do make build or forge build, and they both did the same thing. Oh, interactions test t .sol. doesn't have a version. Let's just do pragma solidity 0.8.18. Make build. Okay, cool. What else do we want to do? We'll want to do a install where if anybody else gets finds this project, they know what to install. So we'll say forge install chain excel org slash foundry devops at 0.0.11 dash no commit. And we'll put this and here. I'm just going to copy paste the rest of the command because it's not really that cool to watch me just copy all this stuff out. And I'm just going to do toggle word wrap. So without toggle word wrap, everything's on the same line. If I open up the command and I do toggle word wrap, it's still on the same line. You can see that there's no line numbers here because this is technically all on the same, technically still on the same line. It just looks like it's on different lines because it just wraps around once it reaches the end. So if I run install, we'll actually reinstall all the packages that we ran with forge install already, which is really helpful. We'll have a test target, which will say forge test. So if I pull this back up, I go make test. It's just going to run forge test. And now I'm going to write my deploy target. In our last course, I just said, hey, just copy paste my make file because it's going to make your life easier. In this one, I'm also going to say just copy paste my make file but I am going to show you at least the deploy script that we're going to do and why my make file is set up the way that it is. So we're going to have a deploy target so that it's really easy to deploy your contracts without having to do like forge script, script, blah, 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 with that giant line that we have to have, right? We're just going to have a deploy script. And what this is going to do is we're going to say forge script script. And we're going to literally write that command in the make file so that we only have to write it once. Deploy raffle.s.soul. And then I got to name the contract in deploy raffle, which is just deploy raffle. So this is the path, right? We have this script deploy raffle. And then in here, we're going to call the deploy raffle contract. Foundry knows to use the run function in whatever contract you specify. So path contract. And then I'm going to add this bit called dollar sign parentheses network args. 
in your make file, if you ever want to use environment variables, this is how you do it. This dollar sign and then parentheses. So what I want to do though, is I want to make my make file such that I can go make deploy args equal dash dash network sepolia and choose a different chain based off of whatever this bit is. Okay, whatever, whatever the args I pass are. So we're going to add a little section here. So in our make file up here, we can do a little basically if statement. Basically, we're going to say if dash dash network sepolia is used, then use sepolia stuff, otherwise anvil stuff. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to say this little if equals dollar sign find string dash dash network sepolia dollar sign parenthesis args dash dash network sepolia new line tab. And then let's do space here. Network args is set to this is how you do set to in this make file stuff dash dash RPC URL sepolia RPC URL space dash dash private key is going to be our private key dash dash broadcast dash dash verify dash dash ether scan API key it's going to be ether scan API key like that and then we'll do dash vvvv and then we're going to do this little end if and then above this we're going to have this network args variable that's going to default to using anvil so dash dash rpc url http dot dot slash slash localhost 8545 dash private key is going to be our default anvil key which right now we don't have in our dot env right we could just stick it right in our make file which i'm actually going to do i'm just going to stick it at the top of our make file i'll say default anvil key equals and i'm just going to paste that default anvil key that we've been working with so network args rpc url private key dash dash broadcast now what this code will do is if it detects us passing this dash dash network sepolia we're going to deploy with sepolia and then and then if it doesn't it's going to use anvil so for example if i do make deploy now you'll see the actual script output down here like this and then obviously anvil isn't up right now i'd have to run anvil right um, but then if i don't use it it's going to go to sepolia now the other thing that i like to do is i like to add this little at sign if you don't add the at sign what will happen is it'll print out the exact command that it's doing. I like to add the at sign because I don't really like my private key showing up in text. So add the little at sign. Now I can run make deploy again. It's still going to fail, but at least it's not going to print that out. But what I could do, uh, and actually I also like to make an anvil uh, as well. And I'm just going to copy paste the anvil from my make file because I really like it. I add this steps tracing and block time one bit to make it easier to debug transactions. We haven't really gone over that yet, but we will. But I'm just going to copy this, paste this here. So now I can run make anvil. Oops. Make anvil. Then in a new terminal, make deploy and compile everything and deploy to our anvil chain. All right. Let's actually kill these both. Can we deploy to a real test net? Let's give it a go. Make deploy args equal dash network sepolia. Fingers are so crossed. Okay, we got a whole bunch of stuff getting printed out here. All right, so here's the here are all the logs for this. And now the other thing that's cool is since we're using the make file and it has this dash include dot env, we don't even need to run source dot env. So we got a whole bunch of stuff printed out here. It looks like scripts ran successfully. We could see some logs up here from us running everything. We can see these transactions are on chain. We can see on chain execute completed successful. We're starting some verification. Let me even grab this. And at the time of filming, Foundry has a bit of a bug where it actually also deploys libraries that you deploy on chain. So that's what it's doing right now. It's verifying that library. But let's go to this second contract address on Sepolia. Paste this in here. Go over to contract. Looks like it's already verified for us. Ooh. Fantastic. Very nice. Very nice. It's already verified for us. And then if we go over to VRF, 
Dachinda-Link Sapolia 1893. We already have a subscription. It's already funded because they did this before. If you didn't have a subscription, you would create one and add Link. Remember, this will only work, though, if you do have Link in the wallet that you're deploying. If we scroll down, though, huh, our newest consumer has already been added has already been added here. It's our raffle contract that we just launched, which is fantastic. So when it looks like it's already good, everything passed, it means everything's gonna be in this broadcast folder now. Fantastic. All right, cool. So now if we wanted to, we could write more interactions as well. Enter lottery, wait for winner, etc. But let's go ahead, let's just play with this lottery from Etherscan right here. Let's go to write contract, connect to Web3. We can actually connect and interact with contracts directly on Etherscan and other front ends. Or if we wanted to remember like badass, we could do the cast command, but we're gonna practice doing some Etherscan stuff here. So we have our enter raffle command, right? If we read the contract right now, let's connect to Web3. From MetaMask, we can see the entrance fee. There are no players yet. Raffle state is open. There's no recent winner. There's no players right now. Let's go ahead to write contract. Let's enter this. So I'm going to pass in 0.01 ether. I'm going to hit write. I'm going to verify that it's indeed 0.01 ether. It looks like it is. I'm going to go ahead and confirm this. Now I can view my transaction and I'm actually entering my own raffle, entering our lottery. And then we'll have to wait a little bit, wait for this to go through. It looks like it has. And now we can go back. We can go to read contract. Do a little refresh, connect again. Yep, go to get length of players. And now we indeed have a player in here. So now if we come back to our Chainlink VRF subscription, we'll see we have a consumer added. The next thing we're also gonna have to do is go to automation.chain.link. And we do have to register a new upkeep. Now we didn't do this programmatically because we can launch and perform upkeep everything ourselves, but let's go ahead and register a new upkeep now. I'm going to connect my wallet. Yep. Connect here. Yep. Yep. This is going to be custom logic. We could do time base. Let's just do custom logic. Enter our contract address. I believe that's this one. Yep. That sure is. Paste it in here. We'll hit next. Upkeep name is start draw. Gas limit. Sure. Starting balance. Let's just do two link. No check data. Looks good. No, I don't want to put any of that. All right, let's register here. All right. And the reason we have to register again is because our raffle has this check upkeep and perform upkeep. Right now, anybody can call perform upkeep so long as the conditions are met, right? But we want a chain link network to automatically be calling this without us ever having to interact with it, right? And to do this, we just need to create a subscription with a with the Chainlink network to do this. We do this on chain. We now have an active drawing. We added some link to it and it looks like it already ran. If we scroll down to the bottom, we just funded it and perform upkeep already ran. And since perform upkeep ran, this means the Chainlink VRF probably kicked off as well. If we flip over to that, we'll do a re little refresh on our subscription ID. We'll scroll down. <gasps> we have one kicking off. That's very exciting. So now if I scroll back over to here, I'll hit refresh, connect to Web3. Yep, yep. Get length of players is still one because we're still waiting for the Chainlink VRF response to come back. And we can kind of literally watch it on the chain on the v, on the VRF.chain.link page. And it might take a few minutes for this to actually go through. Now we'll do a little refresh here and we'll see it was indeed successful. So if we go back to this and we type and we do a little refresh on our Etherscan, we connect to Web3 again, we scroll down, and we indeed see there was a recent winner. And now we did all this through the Etherscan UI, but we could have 100% done it through here. So if we do cast dash dash help, right, we could have sent all these transactions with cast and we could have added these into our make file. We could do cast call, right, which would perform a call on the account without publishing a transaction. We could do cast call. If we do cast call dash help, we can see all the different parameters that go in here. The main ones are two, sig, and args. So if we just wanted to see the get recent winner, we could do cast call, grab the lottery address, paste it in here. The contract, 
the function signature is going to be just get recent winner, get recent winner like this, no args. Oh, sorry, I need to also add the dash dash RPC URL, which is going to be our Sepolia RPC URL. Oops, I need to run source.env. Let's do this again. And boom, we have a contract address. And if we copy this, paste it in here, it's what's called zero padded. That's why you see all these extra zeros. But if I just go to the first zero, lop that off like this, we can see this is indeed our contract address, which makes sense because we were the only ones to enter the lottery. So we won. Woo! We won our own lottery. Now, I want to show you one more thing before we finish this project. When we were debugging, we did a couple of things, right? One of the things we did was when we ran our test, we ran forge test dash VV, right? Or dash VVV. That way it gave us the stack trace of our output. We could also write in our contract, import that console bit and do a console.log. So for example, right at the top of our raffle, we could have done import console from forge std slash console.soul like this. And then on any function, we could, for example, on any raffle, we could say console dot or console dot log hi like this. And then on any test, on any test where we call enter raffle. So let's go to our test here. Let's go to t dot soul enter raffle like this one, for example, and we run forge test dash m dash vv we'll be able to see that console output. And we indeed see that down here. So this is a way we can actually print out debugging statements in our tests. For example, we could change this to message.value and see what the message.value output is or something. Just a note though, you always want to make sure to delete these before you deploy to a mainnet or before you deploy to a testnet. Because it will spend gas, it will cost gas, and you do not want to have to do that. So be sure to remove those after you're done debugging, if you decide to use those. One other tool that we haven't gone too deep in because we haven't really worked too deep with opcodes is also the forge debug tool. So I can run instead of forge test here, I can run forge test dash debug with this same function here and hit enter and it will drop me into a code step through. So this is going to be the actual specific opcodes of our contract. And if we type H, we can see the help at the bottom. And if I type J, I can literally go opcode by opcode through this test. Now, this is going to be a much, much more granular way of debugging and looking through your code. And in the beginning, I don't recommend doing this. As you get more advanced, you will start to wonder and start to see the need for something like this and going so deep. Like I said, we're not going to go too deep into this over this course, but I am working on an assembly and security course in the future. But with that being said, we learned a ton. So let's do a recap of everything we learned. Ooh, sit back. All right, we deployed a provably fair raffle, a provably fair lottery. This is crazy exciting. Now you should ask the question, does it ever make sense for you to play another lottery that isn't on the blockchain ever again? And the answer is no, because no other lottery is going to give you the transparency of true randomness that the blockchain is. So we created this lottery contract. At the top, we've got a whole bunch of custom gas efficient errors, including one that takes many parameters. We learned about type declarations like enums that have different values that can also be wrapped as uints. We made some beautiful events and state variables all of them starting off as private. And we made getters for the ones that we wanted at the bottom. Oh, so nice. We have this verbose constructor so that no matter what chain we want to deploy this contract on, we can adjust the deployment parameters so that it works flawlessly. Whether if it's additionally, it'll work flawlessly if we're forking a testnet, if we're forking a mainnet, etc. All we have to do to update for a different network is to add a different network config. That's it. We created a raffle that emits a log for to make migration easier and make front end indexing easier. We worked with Chainlink automation to automatically call our smart contracts. And in fact, if I flip back over 
to our automation upkeep and I do a little refresh, we scroll down, we can see that it ran once because the perform upkeep was indeed met. It hasn't run again because why? Because we have this check. It doesn't have any players. It can only run if it has players. So the check upkeep checks if it's time for a new lottery draw and then perform upkeep actually kicks off the lottery draw, which kicks off a call to a Chainlink VRF. This function call is called by an external party. It's called by a group of Chainlink nodes for us. We could call this ourselves, but we're lazy. We want automation to take care of it. We want the decentralized Chainlink network to take care of it. Once it kicks off, the Chainlink VRF will respond and end up calling this fulfill random words, which picks our random winner. And this function we used, we learned about the CEI, checks effects interactions pattern, where we do our checks first. We didn't really have any checks here. But then we do all our effects on the contracts. And then finally our external interactions outside of our smart contracts. Then we have a whole bunch of getter functions. This code base was really only 200 lines of code, but yet it felt like it took so long because we learned a ton of really advanced scripting and deployment methodologies. So we deployed our contract using our helper config so that no matter what chain we deploy this on, it's gonna work flawlessly. If we work on Sepolia or another mainnet, we just add the parameters in here that we want. If we work on Anvil, we deployed mocks, fake contracts for us to interact with as if we were working on a real chain. If we don't have a subscription, we programmatically created one in our script. We scripted in Solidity, insane. Then we started our broadcast and actually deployed our raffle ourselves. And then finally, we added a consumer programmatically to our VRF. We probably also could have added an upkeep to the chain link automation, but we didn't have to do that for our testing because we could just pretend to be chain link automation ourselves. We created this interactions bit so that we could run commands to add consumers, fund subscriptions, or create subscriptions right from our command line, much easier than having to work with cast. We wrote a lot of unit tests. However, we still left some testing for you if you wanna go back and level this up. We worked with a mock chain link token we learned some really interesting testing skills, such as being able to capture the event outputs to use them later in our tests, skipping a test based off of the chain ID. We doubled down on working with modifiers. We expected a revert with this abi.encode selector thing, which we're still not sure what it does, but we'll learn about it later. We did some perform upkeep and all these other tests. And then at the end of this, you didn't have to do this, but I went ahead and did this, but I deployed this lottery on chain onto an actual test net. We funded our subscription with, we funded our automation subscription with link. We funded our VRF subscription with link, and we saw the chain link nodes take care of all of this. No problem. Whew. This was a large project and we did a lot of coding here. If you made it to this part of the course, you should be incredibly proud of yourself and give yourself a massive pat on the back. Take some time right now to go on a walk, do some push-ups, do some pull-ups, go get some ice cream, go grocery shopping, take a break, post about this on Twitter, post this to your GitHub. This is an awesome project to post to your GitHub, by the way. Post to your GitHub and be excited that you've made it this far. If you're in the GitHub repo associated with this course, you know that we have a lot of lessons left. However, getting this far is a phenomenal achievement. And like I was saying, you have the basics of Solidity knowledge down. The next couple courses are gonna teach you more intricate knowledge about the Web3 ecosystem itself. So take that break and I'll see you soon. All right, and now we're at the section of the course where we're going to start talking about ERC-20s and tokens. So you can find the code associated with what we're going through in the GitHub repo, of course, associated with this course. Now, before we actually even go into building one of these, I know we've actually worked with them a little bit with the link token, but let's actually understand what an ERC-20 is, what an EIP is, what an ERC is, and I actually have a video from my previous course which goes over this, so let's go ahead and watch that.
Before we can understand what an ERC-20 is, or even what one of these tokens are, we first need to understand what is an ERC, and then also what is an EIP. In Ethereum, and Avalanche, and Binance, and Polygon, all these blockchains have what's called improvement proposals. And for Ethereum, they're called Ethereum Improvement Proposals, or EIPs. And what people would do is they come up with these ideas to improve Ethereum or improve these layer ones, like Polygon, Matic, Avalanche, etc. And on some GitHub or some open source repository, they'll add these new EIPs, they'll add these new improvement ideas to make the, these protocols better. Now, these improvements can really be anything. They can be anything from a core blockchain update to some standard that is gonna be a best practice for the entire community to adopt. Once an EIP gets enough insight, they also create an ERC, which stands for Ethereum Request for Comments. So EIP, Ethereum Pro Improvement Proposals, ERC, Ethereum Request for Comments. And again, these can be like BEP, PEP, you know, et cetera, for all these different blockchains. Both the improvement proposals and the request for comments all have these different tags. Now, they're numbered chronologically. So something like an ERC-20 is going to be the 20th ERC slash EIP. The, the ERCs and the EIPs share that same number. And their websites like eips.ethereum.org, they keep track of all of these new Ethereum improvement proposals. And you can actually see them real time go through the process of being adopted by the community. Now, one of these EIPs or ERCs is going to be the ERC-20 or the token standard for smart contracts. This is an improvement proposal that talks about how to actually create tokens and create these smart contract tokens. I made a video about this recently. So in the GitHub repo associated with this course, we're going to have a sub lesson and we're going to watch a quick video that explains more about these different tokens. Now, first, let's define even what are ERC 20s. So ERC 20s are tokens that are deployed on a chain using what's called the ERC 20 token standard. You can read more about it in the ERC 20 token standard here, link in the description as well. But basically, it's a smart contract that actually represents a token. So it's token, but it's a smart contract, it's both. It's really cool. Tether, Chainlink, UniToken, and DAI are all examples of ERC 20s. Technically, Chainlink is in the ERC 677, as there are upgrades to the ERC 20 that some tokens take that are still backwards compatible with ERC 20s. And so basically, you can think of them as ERC 20s with a little additional functionality. Now, why would I even care to want to make an ERC-20? Well, you can do a lot of really cool stuff with it. You can make a governance token, you can secure an underlying network, you can create some type of synthetic asset, or really anything else. In any case, how do we build one of these ERC-20s? How do we build one of these tokens? Well, all we have to do is build a smart contract that follows the token standard. All we have to do is build a smart contract that has these functions. It has a name function, a symbol function, decimals function, et cetera, all these functions. We need to be able to transfer it. We need to be able to get the balance of it, et cetera. And again, if you want to check out some of the improvements that are still ERC-20 compatible, like the ERC-677 or the ERC-777, you can definitely go check those out and build one of those instead. All right, let's go ahead and get started here. This is gonna be one of our fastest lessons. We're gonna be building a repo or a repository or a project that's gonna have our own token in it, our own ERC-20. And to get started, we're gonna go ahead and run the same command we've been running this whole course, forge init. Oops, excuse me. We're gonna run make di mkdir foundry ERC-20 F23. Clear, cd foundry ERC-20 F23, code period or file open to open this up in a new VS code here, like this. Then we're gonna open up the terminal and run forge init. We're gonna initialize a blank repository here. Now, one thing I haven't actually talked about yet is this .github slash workflows. This is something called your CI CD pipeline and it's a way to automatically test your code in GitHub. Not really going to go over it, but it is a popular tool that a lot of projects use so that whenever they make a change to their code, the test suite automatically runs, and if the test suite fails, the code doesn't get pushed, but that's beside the point. Anyways, we have our basic setup here. We're gonna go ahead and delete the three of these again. Goodbye, just so we can start from scratch. Now, let's go ahead and create our token. We're gonna to create our own token here, and I'm gonna show you a hard way to do it first, and then I'm gonna show you a much easier way. So first, let's go in here and let's create a token. So we're going to do new file. We're going to call it manual token .sol. We're going to do the same thing we've always been doing, SPDX, license, tab that out. Thanks, Copilot. 
pragma solidity. Thanks, Copilot. Let's use 18. Contract manual token like this. Now, like we were saying earlier, in order for us to actually implement an ERC-20, all we have to do is follow the EIP slash ERC token standard. And if we go to the EIPs, we can go to 20, we can scroll down, and all we have to do is add all these methods that they say we need to add. Okay, let's go down. And the first method we need is a name. Okay, so let's create a name. Function name, public view returns string. Okay, cool. So let's go in here, we'll do function name, public view returns string. This is actually gonna be a string memory. And then we'll just say return manual token. This will be the name of our token. Okay, cool. That's it. And this can actually be pure instead of view. Pure got added later. But okay, cool. We have a name. A symbol is optional. So I'm going to skip it. Decimals are optional. I'm going to skip it. Okay, a total supply. We need a total supply. Okay, great. So let's do function total supply. Public will make this pure. Returns you in 256. Let's say return 100 ether. So we'll say this token needs to be 100 ether big. Now again, since Solidity doesn't work with decimals, we probably should have a decimals function to tell users that this big number, right, because 100 ether is actually going to be, it's going to be 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. We probably should have a decimals function. So let's actually create a decimals function. We'll copy this, paste it in here, function decimals, public, We'll make this pure returns 18. So we're going to tell everybody that the total supply is actually going to be 18. Oh, return 18. The total supply 100 ether has 18 decimals. So we know that this big number really is just 100. Okay, great. What next do we need? Okay, we need a transfer. We need a balance of function. Okay, let's copy the balance of function. Let's paste it in here. Zoom out a little bit. And let's turn on toggle word wrap. Okay, function balance of address owner, public view returns their balance. So how do we get their balance? Well, we probably should have a mapping somewhere to map people's address to their balances. So let's go ahead and do that. At the top, we're going to do a mapping of address to uint 256 called balances, or this should be s underscore balances. And we'll make this private balances. And we'll say return on s underscore balances of the owner. And now you can see just from adding this little piece here, someone's balance is really just some mapping in this token contract, right? That's it. Like somebody has just assigned, you know, if I have 10 tokens in this mapping, it's just going to be my address is assigned to 10 tokens, right? That's it. So holding tokens of an ERC 20 just means you have some balance in some mapping in the contract. That's really it, right? So we can keep going. There's a transfer function, right? We could actually, do this out and everything. Oh, and yeah, we could probably do instead of a function stuff like this, we probably could just do string public name equals manual token, right? Because if we do a string public like this, it's, it's the same as creating a public function like this. So we can 100% do this. So either one is pretty much the same. There's some gas trade offs, but I'm not going to go into those now. We could then create a transfer function where we do function transfer. We would say address underscore two, you went to 256 amount. This will be a public function. And we would say something like, first we would get the you went to 256 previous balances. Previous balance equals balance of from plus balance of two. So the previous balances, actually if we're gonna say from is gonna be message.sender. So previous balances of both of them, and then balance of, it's actually a public, oops, I'm sorry, this should be like this. We're gonna get the previous balances. We'll say balance of from, we're gonna do this minus equals, meaning we're gonna subtract this amount from them. And then the balance of two is gonna plus equal that amount. And then we're gonna do a require or an assert require a balance of from plus balance of two equals previous balances or something like that, right? Oh, instead of from, it's going to be, excuse me, message.sender, message.sender, right? So it's going to be something like that. And then balance of, oops, there should be parentheses like this. 
more parentheses. Oh, I just did all the wrong parentheses. Oh, we actually can't do this. So hold on. S underscore balances. There we go. This is how we should do it. There we go. So we're going to assign those mappings. Now we can keep just ripping through the rest of these functions and adding them ourselves. And we could 100% totally do that. Or we could do what most people do and just use an already deployed, already audited, already ready to go contract. So one of the most popular frameworks out there is this Open Zeppelin contracts project. So if we go to the Open Zeppelin documentation, we go to products, go to contracts, start coding. They actually have a ton of contracts that we can actually use and just copy paste into our code. They also have this really cool wizard, which allows you to make contracts really easily yourself, right? If you wanted to make a token, an ERC-20, some governance, some other custom contract, they have a wizard that automatically allows us to create these much easier. So instead of me making me randomly me implementing the token myself, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, we're going to make a new token called our token .soul. And in here, same as always, SPDX, license identifier, MIT, pragma, solidity, like that, contract our token, like this. And we're going to install opens up on contracts. And the way that we do that is let's go to their GitHub, open Zeppelin. So I'm going to copy this bit, open Zeppelin slash open Zeppelin contracts. So I'm going to do forge install, open Zeppelin slash open Zeppelin contracts. Oops, and I got to do dash dash no commit. All right, cool. It has been installed. Now in my lib, I have this open Zeppelin contracts, contracts. And if we scroll down in here to token, we can see in this ERC20 folder, they have this ERC20.soul, which is already implemented for us. Huzzah! Another one that we actually worked with before was Soulmate, Transmissions 11 Soulmate. This is another fantastic repo I recommend checking out if you're looking for another fantastic package with a lot of contracts already built for you. But now that we have this contract, we can just go ahead and import it and inherit it. So first, we're going to need to go to our foundry.toml, though, do some remappings. We'll say remappings equals at open zeppelin slash oops open zeppelin equals lib slash open zeppelin slash contracts and now in our token we can just do import at open zeppelin slash contracts slash token slash erc20 slash erc20 dot soul and we can just have our token inherit everything from this erc20 dot soul which already has everything implemented so we just say our token is ERC20. And now this ERC20.soul has a constructor, right? Where it takes a name and a symbol. And remember, if an inherited contract has a constructor, we need to use that in our constructor. So we could say constructor, constructor. We'll do a unit 256 initial supply. And we need to pass the ERC20 constructor. And we've got to give it a name. Let's call it our token. Let's give it OT as a symbol. And then what I like to usually do is most of these come with a mint function, an internal virtual mint function. And I just like to mint the original sender, that initial supply. So mint message as sender, the initial supply. Cool. We can test this out with a forge build, of course, see if all of our stuff is working. And it's indeed working. Great. So now we'd want to write some tests and we'd want to write some scripts to deploy this. As you know, we probably want to work on our script first. So let's go ahead and deploy our token.sol. And this isn't going to need a helper config, right? Because our token is going to be exactly the same no matter what chain we deploy it on, right? There's no special contracts that we need to interact with. Oh, and this should be our token.s.sol. There's no special contracts we need to interact with. There's nothing really particular we need to do that requires a config. So we're just going to ignore that step. We're just going to make our code a lot smaller. But let's go ahead and make some deployment scripts. Solidity 18 contract. 
deploy our token is script. So let's import script script from forge std slash script dot sol. Let's create our function run. It's going to be external like this. We're going to need to import our token from dot dot slash src slash our token dot sol like this. And then our run, we're going to need to do vm dot start broadcast like this new our token and we'll let's give it some initial supply so let's do unit 256 public constant initial supply equals 1000 ether so we'll deploy our our token with that initial supply because our token takes an initial supply and then vm dot stop broadcast boom like that all right cool we could make this more robust by changing the deployer key, kind of like what we saw before using the environment variable. But for this one, we're just going to make it real basic here. Boom, this is our script. And now we can do a little cheatsiness and we can either copy from our last project or copy from the Git repo associated with this course. We'll make a little make file. We'll go to Foundry ERC 20 F23. We'll go to this make file and we'll just kind of copy some stuff. So let's just copy the whole thing, actually. Yeah, you know what? Yeah, copy the whole make file. No reason to not paste it in here. Oh, I actually don't need this verify thing. And I should just be able to run make deploy. Oh, we're getting an error. So we'll run make anvil. Create a new one. Make deploy. Compiler run successfully. Script run. And we were successfully able to deploy to our Anvil chain. Okay, great. So what about some tests? Let's write some tests. Now for a lot of these more basic contracts, especially like this our token, we can actually use AI to get jump started, right? And I want you guys to use AI to get jump started and use AI to help you learn. I don't want you to use it to substitute learning. Oh, and oh my goodness, I almost didn't do a named import. That would have been embarrassing. I want you guys to use AI to help you learn not to substitute learning. Because if you substitute the learning with the AI, the 10% or the 5% of the time the AI, the AI gets it wrong, you're going to have no idea how to fix it. It's really important that you still learn all these concepts because AI is still going to get a lot of things wrong. But AI is usually pretty good at writing tests. So let's start writing some tests. And we're not going to write all of the tests. We're actually just going to write a couple, and then we're going to see if our AI can auto-complete it for us. So let's do our token test.t.sol. Let's make some really basic test stuff here. SPDX, you know the drill. Pragma solidity. Contract our token test is test, which means we're going to need to import test from forge std slash test capital dot sol. Okay, we're going to need a function setup, which will be public. Oh, we're going to need our deployer here, like this. We're going to import deploy our token from dot dot slash script slash deploy our token dot s dot sol, like that. In our setup, oh, we probably want our script to return our token, right? So we're gonna say our token OT equals new our token return OT returns turn. Okay, cool. So now at the top, we're gonna want to import our token as well from dot dot slash src slash our token dot soul. At the top, we're going to want to do an our token public OT. Yeah, our token. Now we're going to do, we'll make a deployer as well. Deploy our token public deployer. We're going to say our token, oops, no, sorry, deployer equals new deploy our token. Our token equals deployer.run. Thanks, GitHub Copilot. And that's pretty much all we're going to need. But let's also make some addresses so that we can interact with people. So we'll make an address Bob equals make ADR Bob 
and then address Alice equals make a dr Alice. So we have a Bob, we have an Alice. We'll have the two of them play around with blowing and working with tokens. The owner of our token should be the deployer. So let's do vm.prank address deployer. And then let's do, let's transfer some tokens to Bob to get started. So we'll say our token dot transfer Bob. And then let's do a little you into 56 public constant starting balance equals 100 ether. So we'll give Bob 100 ether. And we'll do a little test. We'll do function test Bob balance public assert equal starting balance. It's going to equal to our token dot balance of Bob. All right, let's test this. Test dash M test Bob balance. Oops, forge test. Transfer amount exceeds balance. The actual owner is meshed that sender, not the deployer. Sorry. So now let's do this again. And hooray. Okay, that looks cool. Great. That's one test. Let's write a couple more tests and then let's try to see if AI can do it for us. So let's even just write just like test allowances. So we'll say function test allow and says public. Now, something important about ERC20s is that they have this function called transfer from. And this is a really important function. We saw it a little bit in the last section, but if I want my contract to keep track of how many tokens it has from you, it needs to be the one to actually transfer the tokens from you to itself. In order for it to take the tokens from you, you need to allow it to do that, right? If we just allowed anybody to take tokens from anybody, that would be really bad. So these ERC20 tokens, if we go to the back to the standard, they have this thing called in the transfer function, you can actually read about it here. The transfer from method is used to withdraw workflow, allowing contracts to transfer a token on your behalf. This can be used, for example, to allow a contract to transfer for tokens on your behalf and or charge fees for sub currencies. The function should throw an issue unless from has deliberately authorized the sender of the message via some mechanism. And this is this allowances thing. And you'll see on most UIs on most applications, you need to approve the contract to pull your tokens first. And sites like etherscan.io have a beta tokens approval section where you can actually connect your contract, connect your address, connect, connect. And you can see, oh, let's switch to ETH mainnet. And you can see all the approvals that you have. I don't have any on ETH mainnet on this address again, because this is my dummy address. But it's usually a good practice to see what these approvals are and then revoke them, especially if you don't trust the contract. Because if you approve a contract to do transfer from on whatever they want, then they could just steal all your money, right? It's a good idea if you're making your own token to make sure allowances work well. So we're going to write a real quick test on this. So we'll say UNT256 initial allowance. We're going to say test allowance works. Terrible test name, but whatever. <laughs> it's just a dummy. Test allowance equals just say a thousand. All right. Now we're going to say Alice proves Bob to spend tokens on her behalf. Let's close this. So we're going to do VM dot prank or excuse me, Bob, Bob approves Alice spend tokens. So we'll say VM dot prank Bob, and we're going to run our token dot approve Alice initial allowance. And if we go to our token, if we can command click or control click into the ERC 20, and we look up approve, there's this approve function, which has this inner function approve, where if we command click or control click on that, we update this allowances mapping. And if we go to our transfer from function in here, let's just look around for it. Here it is. We see that it calls this spend allowance function, which if we look at that one, it requires that the current allowance is greater than whatever amount that you're approving, whatever amount they're spending. So you have to explicitly approve other people to use your tokens. And you don't actually have to approve anything sometimes, right? You don't have to approve anybody to use your tokens. And that's probably the way you ideally want it. <laughs> but sometimes you do if a contract wants to keep track of how many tokens that you've sent it, for example. So we're going to prank Bob. We're going to approve 
Alice to use our tokens. And what we can do then is we're going to vm.prank Alice. And now she is going to take our tokens from Bob because Bob approved her to do so. So now we're going to do our token dot transfer from. And we're pretending to be Alice here. Transfer from Bob. We're going to say from Bob to Alice. And then we're going to create some transfer amount. We'll do like unit 256 transfer amount equals let's do half of the allowance at transfer amount. We have to do this transfer from function. If we were to do just transfer, transfer, if you do just transfer, whoever is calling this transfer function automatically gets set as the from. So if you call transfer, it automatically sets the from as whoever's calling. So that's the difference. So transfer automatically sets the from as whoever is sending the message transfer from you can set anybody from but it'll only go through if they are approved. That doesn't make sense. Ask questions in the GitHub repo. Now we can do a little assert equal our token dot balance of Alice is going to be that transfer amount, right? Because she took it from Bob. And then oops, yep. And then assert equal our token dot balance of Bob is going to be that starting amount, starting balance minus the transfer amount. Transfer, there we go. Let's spell this right. And let's run this test. Forge test dash M, paste it in. You can tell that I've written forge test dash M a billion times and it does indeed pass. Okay, great. So if we do forge coverage, we're going to get, hey, you got barely anything covered. Yep, sure. We have barely anything covered. So I actually wrote, and we want to write some more tests for this. Now, tests are something that AI is actually very good at doing. And let's go ahead and actually practice sending ChatGPT or any AI a prompt to actually generate some tests for us. If you want, in the Foundry ERC 20 F23, we've got a little prompt for you to work with if you want to just copy paste it. So I'm going to copy mine, bring it over here, paste it in. But I'll tell you what it says. It says, here's my Solidity ERC 20 token. And we literally paste it in the token that we just created. And here are our first couple of tests written in Solidity. So we wrote those couple of tests in here. Can you write the rest of the tests? Please include tests for allowances, transfers, and anything else that might be important. And let's see what it gives us. And we get an output. Looks something like this. So we can go ahead and grab this and stick it in our test and see what happens. So I'm going to go ahead and copy it. And I'm going to paste it. And I'm going to highly recommend you don't just blindly copy paste code from ChatGPT. That is a very quick way to accidentally get wrecked if the AI gives you a bad answer. I've already read through this, so we're going to be good to go. But you'll notice it, it already did a couple of weird things to us. So it removed the import deploy our token from our deploy script. And so I have to add that back in. Setup looks okay. It also removed Bob and Alice. It did some other weird tests. So I'm actually going to not blindly copy paste it. I'm actually going to undo that copy paste. And what we're going to do is instead, we're going to be a little bit more intelligent with how we work with AI. So I'm just going to take the stuff that I want out of here. Test allowance. I like our test allowance. Test transfer. Okay, we'll grab that. Test balance after transfer. Okay, test transfer from. Sure, well, let's grab those and see if those are good tests. Test transfer, amount equals 100. It gives us a dummy receiver. R token dot transfer, receiver amount. Assert equals R token dot balance of receiver is going to be amount. That's a good test. Test balance after transfer. It's going to doing another transfer and testing our balance. Okay, so that's pretty good. And then test transfer from. It's doing some approve. It's doing an approve and a transfer from on itself. So that's like redundant. This isn't a great test, but whatever. Let's see how it did. Forge test. And we have some issues because of course we do. So we get test balance after transfer. This one fails. Why does this one fail? Let's do forge test dash M. Do that specific test. We'll do with some dash VVs in here. And we could see transfer amount exceeds balance. Why does this fail? Because we're not vm.pranking the message.sender. So we got to do that vm.prank 
message data sender. And we're gonna have to do that for everybody. Press transfer from vm.prank, vm.prank, although this is definitely redundant. Okay, no, that actually works. We'll vm prank the message sender. We'll prove address this and we'll do that. That one looks good. This one's gonna need a vm.prank. Yeah, let's try this again, forge test. A couple of these still failed. Test balance after transfer failed. Ah, it's because we're getting the address of this. We need to get the message.sender. So it should be the balance of message.sender instead. But you can see as I refactor this that AI can be helpful. It gave us the scaffolding to a lot of this, but we're still having to go back and redo some stuff. And this is why it's so important for us to actually understand what's going on. Still gets so much wrong. We got an insufficient allowance down here. So our token approving address this amount, our token to transfer from address this to receiver, we would need to transfer from message to sender. Now that should be most of it. Forge test. And great, now all of our test passes and they actually pass and they're actually doing some coverage, right? It's not perfect. So if we run forge coverage, it's definitely not perfect. In fact, it barely did anything, but it did more tests for the ERC-20. But we could go back to ChatGPT and say, hey, great job. Can you write some more tests? Give us some more prompts, etc." But you can see that at least it can be very helpful in getting you started, getting you going, write tests if you haven't before. And of course, if you want to actually deploy this to a real network, you would do what? You would put your .env, your .private key, or you use third web deploy or something, and you deploy to a network. So. That's it for this lesson. I know this was a quick one. Congratulations. I know this one felt a lot quicker and easier than the last one because now we're getting more advanced. Now learning actually becomes easier now that we have a solid foundation beneath us. So take a break, get some coffee, get some ice cream, and I'll see you in the next one. All right, welcome back to the next lesson in this course. You're getting closer to being able to go out in the world and actually be a Solidity developer and know what you're talking about. This is incredibly exciting. We've got a couple more lessons coming up. We have our NFTs, then we're gonna go into DeFi. Well, all of this is DeFi. Upgradable contracts, governance, and then a brief introduction into security. And then we can send you on your way to go start being a successful smart contract engineer in the space. So for our NFT project, let me do a quick overview of the code base that we're gonna be going over and what we're actually gonna be building. So here's the code base in my VS Code here. And what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be creating NFTs of these dogs, and we're gonna be creating dynamic NFTs that actually can change and have their values change. And we're gonna learn everything about what an NFT is, why they're special and what they do. And when we're finally done here, when we go up to our MetaMask, we'll actually be able to even import our NFTs and see our NFTs right in our MetaMask. Now, we're going to make two kinds of NFTs. We're going to make, first off, a basic NFT, which is just going to be this little dog, this little pug stored in IPFS. And then we're going to make a more advanced NFT where the entire NFT is actually stored 100% on chain, truly decentralized. And we'll learn a little bit more about the difference between those very soon. Additionally, the SVG on chain will change depending on some state that we give it. This is gonna be our mood NFT. So it's gonna change based off of our mood at the moment. So these are the two types of NFTs we're gonna see, and we're gonna be able to populate them into our MetaMask, which right now it's completely empty. Then we can go to a platform like OpenSea and actually start selling our NFTs or interacting with our NFTs or doing whatever we want there. So, and then we're also gonna be finally teaching you all about what this ABI encode with selector that we saw earlier and, and that weird function selector thing that we kept hearing about. We're gonna finally learn what those do. So strap in, let's get going. And let's first learn about what an NFT even is. So I made a video about NFTs a while back. For those of you who have never heard of an NFT, let's jump in and learn what those are. We're gonna watch a portion of the previous Python edition of this course where I explain NFTs from a high level. And then of course, we're gonna get into the ultimate 
NFT tutorial. So let's learn about NFTs. Look, NFTs are hot right now. NFTs, also known as ERC-721s, are a token standard that was created on the Ethereum platform. NFT stands for non-fungible token and is a token standard similar to the ERC-20. Again, ERC-20 is like Link, Aave, Maker, all those goodies that are found on the Ethereum chain. An NFT or a non-fungible token is a token that is non-fungible. This means that they are starkly unique from each other, and one token isn't interchangeable with any other token of its class. A good way to think about it is one dollar is interchangeable with any other dollar. One dollar is going to have the same value of another dollar. Those are fungible tokens. That's like ERC-20s. One link is always going to be equivalent to one other link. By contrast, it's going to be NFTs. Those of you nerds out there would know, like, a Pokemon would be a good example of an NFT. Your one Pokemon is going to have different stats, different movesets, and isn't interchangeable with any other Pokemon. Or maybe a more relatable one is like a trading card, a unique piece of art, or the like. So that's what these NFTs are. They are non-fungible, non-interchangeable tokens that, for the moment, are best represented or thought about as digital pieces of art that are incorruptible and have a permanent history of who's owned them, who's deployed them, etc. Now, like I said, NFTs are just a token standard. So you can actually make them do much more than just be art. You can give them stats, you can make them battle, you can do really unique things with them, you can do pretty much whatever you want with them. But right now, the easiest way to think about it, and the most popular way to think about it, is by calling them art, art, art. It's art. Or some type of collectible or just anything that's unique. So like I said, they're just tokens that are deployed on a smart contract platform and you can view them on different NFT platforms like OpenSea or Rarible. And these are the NFT marketplaces that let people buy and sell them. You obviously can do that without these marketplaces because it's a decentralized, but they help and give a good user interface. Now, like many of you out there, my initial thought to NFTs was, okay, this sounds pretty dumb. But I think that that was dumb. I think art does have a lot of value, and I think that artists are not always paid fairly for what they do. And this is actually a huge issue right now in the modern day world, where an artist can make some type of art, people just copy paste it, you know, everywhere, and, uh, and they never get attribution for what they made. So having a really easy decentralized royalty mechanism or some type of mechanism where these artists can get accurately comped for what they're doing, I think is really important. I love music. I love movies. Those are pieces of art that I digest and I really like. And I think it's fair for them to get comped appropriately because they are providing value to my life. I think NFTs are a great way to solve this issue as kind of having these decentralized audit trails and, and royalty trails that we can set up and and see really transparently without having to go through some centralized service. So that's the basic gist of it. Let's talk some more about the standards. The ERC-721 standard or the NFT standard. This is the basis of it all. There is another standard that's semi-fungible tokens, the 1155. We're not gonna talk about that here, but you can check it out. The main differences between a 721 and an ERC-20, on ERC-20s they have a really simple mapping between an address and how much that address holds. 721s have unique token IDs. Each token ID has a unique owner. And in addition, they have what's called a token URI, which we'll talk about in a minute. Each token is unique. Each token ID represents a unique asset. So since these assets are unique and we wanna be able to visualize them and show what they actually look like, we need to define those attributes of the object. If it's a piece of art, we need a way to define what that art looks like. If it's some type of character in a game, we need a way to define that character's stats in the NFT. This is where metadata and token URIs come in. So if you know anything about Ethereum, you know that sometimes gas prices can get pretty high, especially when it comes to storing a lot of space, it can get really, really expensive. So one of your first questions might be, well, are they storing these images and, and these art pieces on chain? And the answer is sometimes. Back when they were coming up with NFTs and artists were deploying stuff, the ETH devs and the artists were like, yeah, art, let's do that art. I'm just gonna deploy this one megabyte image onto the Ethereum chain and oh God, it's so much gas expensive. How do I <laughs> delete button? How do I? It's not dumb. It's not deleting. <laughs> and they realized that if they put all this art on chain, it was going to be incredibly expensive. So to get around this, what they did is they put in the standard what's called a token URI. This is a universally unique indicator of what that asset or what that token looks like and what the attributes of that token are. And you can use something like a centralized API or IPFS to actually get that token URI. Typical token URI has to return something in this format like this, where it has the name, the image location, 
the description, and then any attributes below. There is often this talk of on-chain metadata versus off-chain metadata. Because it is so much easier and cheaper to store all your metadata off-chain, a lot of people will use something like IPFS that is decentralized, but does take a little bit of centrality to keep persisting, but they can also use their own centralized API. However, obviously, if that goes down, then you lose your image, you lose everything associated with your NFT. Because of this, most NFT marketplaces actually can't and won't read off on-chain attributes or on-chain metadata because they're so used to looking for the token URI. Obviously, if you do off-chain metadata, you can't do anything really cool or really interesting or have any games with your NFTs. For example, if you wanted to create an on-chain Pokemon game, all your attributes would need to be on-chain in order for your Pokemon to interact with each other because if it was off-chain, then that becomes a lot harder to cryptographically prove. So if you're new with NFTs and you're like, wait, this is kind of a lot of information, I'll make it easy for you. If you're looking to render an image of an NFT, add your image to IPFS, add a metadata file pointing to that image file on IPFS, and then grab that token URI and put it and set it as your NFT. The Chainlink D&D article does a great job of walking you through this and showing you how to do this, so be sure to read that if you're looking to learn how to do that. We're not going to cover that in this video, but we will be deploying our first NFT with some on-chain attributes. Again, having your attributes on-chain is really going to allow you to build really creative NFTs that build games or have interesting properties and, and really makes the authenticity of your NFT guaranteed because those attributes are always gonna be on chain. All right, great. So now that we know what an NFT is, let's begin to work on the full code. And remember, and again, for those of you who wanna follow along, you can come on down to the course and find all the Git code associated with this lesson. And like I said earlier, we're going to be deploying our first NFTs and learning some incredibly advanced pieces of Solidity as well and some low level functionality. So let's begin. So same as always, MKDIR, Foundry, NFT, F23. Let's open that up. Code, Foundry, NFT, F23, or file, open folder. Boom, blank, VS Code. Here we go. Pull that terminal back up. Let's close the Explorer. There. Forge, init. Brand new blank folder. All right, cool. Boom, boom, boom. Let's remove these three. Goodbye. Goodbye counter. Dot git ignore. Okay, dot emv is in here. We're going to add broadcast as well. Okay, great. Now let's start to create this NFT. Like we said in the video, it's really just a token standard, just like the ERC20, the non fungible token standard. So, same as the ERC20, what we could do is we could walk through all of these functions and implement them ourselves. Or we could just use once again, our favorite package, open Zeppelin. So if we go to the open Zeppelin contracts, we go to contracts, we scroll down, they have a token folder with an ERC 721 in here, and an ERC 721 soul with most of the functionality that we need already in here. So let's go ahead and use this instead of having to rewrite all these functions out. So in here, we're going to go ahead, SRC, new file, basic nft.sol, and you know the drill, SPDX, license, identifier MIT, pragma, solidity, 0.8.18, contract, basic nft, like this. So let's go ahead, let's install this open Zeppelin contracts. So if we scroll up, we're going to install open Zeppelin slash open Zeppelin contracts, forge install, open Zeppelin slash open Zeppelin contracts, dash dash no dash commit. Great. And now that we have that, we're going to go to our foundry.toml. We'll do a little bit of remappings equals at open Zeppelin slash slash contracts equals lib slash open Zeppelin. And I'm going to do a toggle word wrap, open Zeppelin dash contracts slash contracts like that. Okay, cool. So now we should be able to use open Zeppelin in here. So we'll do a little import at oh, even auto populates a little bit open Zeppelin slash contracts slash token slash ERC 721 slash ERC 721.sol, like that. And then we can say our basic NFT is ERC 721. We will get a little red underscore here saying no arguments passed to the base constructor. If we command or control to click into this or just go to this 
folder up here. We scroll down to the constructor. We can see it takes a name and a symbol. So because of that, we're gonna have to copy this, create a constructor, boom. And then also use the constructor of the NFT base class, copy, or actually we're gonna call this dog. Instead of basic NFT, this is gonna be doggy. Boom, like this. Okay, cool. So what do we need to do now that we have this? Are we done? Well, no, not quite, right? We didn't define what this is actually gonna look like. We didn't define how to get this. There's a, there's a bunch of things we didn't quite finish doing yet. So let's add our own token counter just so that it's very easy for us to tell which number is which. And if we go back to this ERC20 token standard, there is a balance of function, but remember these are unique. Even if I have 10 NFTs of a collection, those 10 NFTs aren't necessarily all worth the same. So there's this owner of function where we pass a token ID. When we launch this doggy ERC20 contract, it actually represents an entire collection of doggies. And each doggy in this doggy basic NFT collection is gonna get its own unique token ID. So unique NFT is a combination of the contract address, which basically represents the collection, and then the token ID. So for us, we're just gonna have a token counter represent each token ID, right? So we're gonna say UN256 private S underscore token counter. Opens up one also has a built-in plugin for this, but we're just gonna roll with our own. And right when we deploy this contract, we're gonna set S token counter to zero, right? Because this is gonna be a storage variable and we're gonna update it a lot. Every time we mint a new dog, we're gonna update this token counter, right? Okay, cool. So now let's learn how to actually mint ourselves one of these puppies. So we're gonna say function mint NFT public like this, and this is gonna be the function we're going to do to do so. Now, if we scroll down to the bottom of the ERC EIP 721 section, we will come across one of the most important functions in the EIP 721, which is this token URI. What's crazy about this is this was originally considered an optional parameter. So a token URI stands for a token universal resource indicator, excuse me, uniform resource identifier. And a URL on the other hand, like what we see up here in the browser is a uniform resource locator. We can kind of see the difference between the two right here. A URL provides the location of the resource a URI identifies the resource by name and the specified location or URL. You can basically think of this as a URL, but the difference between a URI and a URL are slightly different. But this token URI actually is an endpoint, some type of API call hosted somewhere that's gonna return the metadata for the NFT. And it's gonna return an object that looks just like this. It'll have a title, a type, some properties, etc., And it's this, that defines what the NFT looks like. So for us to create this NFT, each token counter, each token URI is gonna need to have this URI that points to what it should look like. Okay, and if that's a little bit confusing, don't worry, we're gonna explain it as always. So why don't we do this first? We're actually gonna skip this mint function and just go right down to function token URI. So the ERC721 has a in Open Zeppelin has a token URI function that looks like this. So we're gonna override this since it's got the virtual keyword, so we can override this and write our own token URI function. Whenever you wanna look at what an NFT looks like, it's this function that they're calling. So we can actually see any, if we go to OpenC, you can really go to any popular NFT. I'll go to Pudgy Penguins, for example. We'll select any Pudgy Penguin. I'm just gonna pick the one on top. We can go down, we can go to the details, contract address for this. We can see the token ID is 1378. We'll go to Pudgy Penguins, we'll go to the contract, we'll go to read contract, connect to Web3, sure, sure. We'll scroll all the way down to token URI, and I'll put in that token URI, I'll hit query, and then we get a response back that shows an endpoint that should return that metadata. And if we copy that, paste into the browser, we indeed see we get some raw data that looks like this with all the traits of this NFT. And then we also get this image section 
which has this PNG, where if we put that in the browser, we do indeed get what the image, what the penguin actually looks like. So this is hosted on IPFS. We'll learn what IPFS is in a little bit. Okay, great. So let's do this token URI bit. So the token URI needs to have a uint256 token ID passed, and this is going to be a public view. We need to override the base class implementation, and it needs to return a string memory, right? Because it needs to return, if we go back to the Pudge Penguin, it needs to return a string like this. Now, in V1, in, with our basic NFT, we're also going to use IPFS. And then in our second NFT, it's actually going to return a URI that's completely hosted on chain. Crazy, I know. Stay tuned. String memory. Okay. So what we could do in here, if we wanted to just have all of these be exactly the same, we could say like return, and I could even copy this if I wanted to, return, and just boom, paste it in like that. And now all of our dogs are going to have this pudgy penguin NFT token URI, right? We don't want that. We want to have our own metadata. So for your convenience, I already have a couple of images that we can borrow. So if you come to the GitHub repo associated with this lesson, go down to images, we go to dog NFT, you can feel free to pick the puppy that you want to use for your project. The pug, the Shiba Inu, maybe the St. Bernard. They're all so adorable. It doesn't matter. I'm just going to pick the pug because that's the first one. I'm going to save this image. I saved it to my downloads. I'm going to come to our files in here. I'm going to create a new folder, IMG, which stands for image. And I'm going to drag and drop this image in here or just paste it in there, whatever you want to do. Now that we have this image in here, we can use this. We can use this to get our token URI for our basic NFT. And there's a couple of different ways that we can use it. But first, we need to understand what IPFS is and how it actually works. Now, let me explain a little bit about how IPFS works. It's this distributed, decentralized data structure that's not exactly a blockchain, but it's it's similar to a blockchain. There's no mining, though, but there is pinning data. You can add data to this. So let me explain how this actually works. And you can read how this works on the site. There's going to be a link to this in the GitHub repo associated with this course. But let me give you my basic take on it. So we have our code or, or our file or whatever it is, right? We have some piece of data. Now, as we know, when you really have anything, you can hash that thing, you can hash that data, right? And you can get a, a unique output. So, and that's actually the first thing that IPFS does. It hashes our data to get a unique hash that only points to that data. Yes, a massive code file, a ton of text. Yes, you can encode all of that into a single hash function. Your IPFS node does this hashing for you. And every single IPFS node on the planet has the exact same hashing function, kind of like a blockchain, right? They all kind of run this same spec, the same specification. So we can hash our data on our IPFS node and get this unique output. What we can do then is we can then pin that data or pin that code or pin that file or pin that whatever to our node. We have some data, we get a unique hash of it. All it does is host this data and have these hashes. That's it. Our node is connected to a network of other IPFS nodes. So there's a massive network of people running IPFS nodes. They're incredibly lightweight, way lighter weight than any other blockchain node, and they all talk to each other. So if I ask the network, hey, I want to get this hash, all these nodes would talk to each other, and eventually they'd reach up at our node saying, oh, I found a node that has that hash. Here is the file associated with it. Now you might be thinking, okay, well, that's kind of centralized because we have the data on one node here, right? Well, you're right. Well, here's the thing. What other nodes can do is they can say, oh, that data looks really cool. I want to have that persist. What they can do is they can pin your hash. They can pin your data and they'll get a copy of your data on their node. And you can keep doing this. And so you easily allow an entire network to easily replicate any code or any data in a decentralized sense. And they're incredibly easy to spin up and they're incredibly easy to work with. Something about IPFS that makes it drastically different than a blockchain is they can't do smart contracts. There's no execution. It can really only store. It's just decentralized storage that IPFS can do. Now, the issue here is that in order for our data to really be decentralized, another node does need to pin our data, right? Because if we're the only IPFS node that's got this hashed, it's kind of centralized on our node. If our node goes down, 
that data is gone and the network won't be able to access that data anymore. So we'll talk about strategies in the future about having other people pin your data. But for now, this is a way we can host data, we can send code and have it be in a decentralized context. So unlike a blockchain where every single node in a blockchain is going to have a copy of the entire blockchain, IPFS nodes get to optionally choose which data they want to pin and they can't do any execution. So you could have an IPFS node half a megabyte and you could have an IPFS node that's several terabytes. It's up to the node operators how much data and what data they want to pin. Now that we know about IPFS, let's actually deploy our wonderful application to IPFS so that anybody can use it and anybody can connect to it so long as our node is up. Are you ready? Okay, get excited here. We're first gonna do this kind of the manual way because I'm gonna show you how to install IPFS and, and work with IPFS. Hit get started. There's a number of ways to install and work with IPFS. You can get it with a desktop application, get a command line, and then we can also add IPFS to our browser. If you're using something like Brave or I think Firefox too, some of this IPFS router is automatically built in. But if you're using something like Chrome, you might have to add a little companion because what we wanna do is we can actually use those little hashes as URLs for websites, right? And so we wanna be able to put that URL in our browser and connect to that node or that piece of code. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna have you install the IPFS desktop. So you're gonna hit that. And when you do that, you should be able to open up IPFS. Now, if you install it, you might get this little guy, this little box here in your upper section. Otherwise, you might be able to open it up with, with IPFS desktop and see it as a, a regular desktop app. But once you install it, you might see IPFS is running. You can restart, stop, you can do all this stuff. We're gonna go to the file section and we're gonna get a little pop-up that looks like this. Now, I've got a ton of stuff in here because I've been using IPFS for some time. In here right now, you might have no data. So let's just go ahead and import some file. And maybe for now, we'll just import you know, our next.config.js, right? It doesn't matter, just import something. And now in here, we have this next.config.js or whatever file you imported. So what we can do with this is we can actually copy the CID and we can view this in our browser. So if we do IPFS dot dot slash slash, and we paste it in, we hit enter, we can give our browser access to actually rendering IPFS URLs. If you're using Brave, you can just do use a Brave local IPFS node, or let's go ahead and download this IPFS companion. So we'll hit get IPFS companion. There's a Firefox install for Chrome, Brave, blah, blah, blah. I'm gonna, so I'm gonna go to the Chrome store to get it for Brave. We're just gonna hit add to Brave, add extension. But once you download it, you'll get something that looks like this. Even on a little browser companion, we can see like import, we can see stuff about our node. If we click our node, we'll see a very similar setup but now that we have the companion in our browser, we can copy that CID, that hash. Now Brave, we can just do use Brave local IPFS node and we'll automatically get dropped into the file. Now, if IPFS companion doesn't work for you and you can't see the URL inside of something like Google Chrome or some other browser, what you can do is you can use something called the IPFS gateway. Now using a gateway, you're not actually directly requesting the data through IPFS requesting the data through another server, which is requesting it through IPFS. But if you are having some trouble accessing these files, you can use the gateway. So what you'll do is you'll do HTTPS slash slash IPFS.io slash IPFS slash, and then paste the hash code there. And you'll be able to see your file. Now, if you do it like this, you won't even need IPFS companion at all. Now that we've learned more about IPFS and the token URI, we can actually go to a marketplace like OpenSea and actually see this for ourselves. OpenSea is a marketplace for selling NFTs. And if we scroll down, we could go to really any NFT. Like for example, the Pudgy Penguins here, we could scroll down, really pick any NFT and look at it here. And if we go to its on-chain details, let me click this, we can see the source code of this. And if we scroll to read contracts, let's connect to Web3. Yeah, sure. Yep. We scroll all the way down and we click token URI of which ID was this? 4785. Grab that, paste it in here. We'll get this back. And if we copy that, paste it up here, 
we can see this metadata object similar to what we were looking at before. It's got some attributes, it's got a description, and then importantly, it has this name piece here. And if I copy this and paste it, we can see what the image of the NFT actually looks like. Now, important note, they're using HTTPS IPFS.io, which is okay because they're still using this IPFS, they're still using IPFS, but if the IPFS.io website goes down, this would render nothing. So ideally, when you're using IPFS, you use this syntax where you do IPFS colon slash slash and then the hash because this, starting your URI with this will point to the IPFS network as opposed to using this will point to the IPFS website. So this is a centralized website. If you start with HTTPS, IPFS.io, this is pointing to the IPFS network, which is a distributed decentralized network. So they're definitely different here. The reason a lot of people do this though is because not a lot of browsers actually support IPFS. So this is HTTP and anyone can view it in their browser, but we could also use the IPFS.io of this. So I can even just grab this hash here. I can do IPFS colon slash slash, paste the hash in here. And since I'm using Brave, I can actually see this penguin folder in here and I can see all the different pieces that go in this folder. And then I would do penguin 4785, let's look at 4785. Boom, and I can see this right off of IPFS. Now this only works for me because I'm using Brave with a built-in local IPFS node. If you're using Chrome or Firefox or something like that, you can grab IPFS companion, add to Brave, or you can just go to the IPFS site, IPFS here, install IPFS desktop, and then I can pull up my IPFS UI. And what I could do is I could once again, grab this IPFS hash, copy it, paste it into my IPFS UI. And once again, I'd see the penguin folder. See there's three gigabytes in there. We could scroll through the folder and look through the files again. So you don't have to download the IPFS extension if you don't want to. However, it is a nice thing to have in your browser because a lot of projects do use IPFS and it's much easier to render them if you're using that IPFS companion, if you're using Chrome or something, or just use Brave Browser because Brave Browser comes with a built-in IPFS node. And the other thing is, once you get your own image, what you could do is either in your own IPFS node in your browser, or you could then upload this image to your IPFS node and get the hash and use that as the image URI for your own NFT. But if you want to make this a little easier on yourself for now, for now, we can just go to Foundry NFT F23. Let's go to script. I know we haven't written this yet, but we go to interactions.s.soul. We copy this IPFS hash. We copy this IPFS URI, paste it into the browser. And if you do have the IPFS node working, then you'll be able to actually see it like so. This is going to be the metadata for the pug that we're going to use. When you're uploading to IPFS, you'd have to upload both this image and this file, which on the image section has the URI of the image. So you'd upload the image first, get the image URI of the image, and then upload a file that looks like this with the image URI like in here so that we can see this little puppy. But for us, if you want to do all that, feel free to try it out. Feel, feel free to give it a whirl. But for now, we're just going to use this. Anyways, okay. Back to our NFT. We could just literally paste the token URI in here so that every one of our dogs would be exactly the same, but let's make ours a little bit more creative. Let's allow people to actually choose their own token URI, choose their own what each one of their tokens will look like. So we'll allow them to pass in a string memory token URI. And then what we'll do is we'll say, <clears throat> we'll have a mapping at the top here, a mapping of UN256 mapped to a string called do private s underscore token id to uri where this mapping will get a token id and we'll get out a token uri so we'll say s underscore token id to uri s underscore token counter equals token uri and then we're gonna have to do s underscore token counter plus plus like that we're gonna have to add one to it and then we're going to want to mint an NFT. We're going to want to set the balance of this and everything. In the Open Zeppelin ERC721, there's a safe mint function that we can actually call. So we're going to call this safe mint function, underscore safe mint 
message.sender underscore s underscore token counter. So this safe mint function makes their balance plus one. It sets up their token counter and a few other things. So we'll have the safe mint. And then down here, instead of just returning some string, we'll say return s underscore token ID to URI token ID like this. Okay, cool. So now we have this real basic NFT, although it's even a little bit more advanced, right? Because anybody can mint an NFT and make it look like whatever they want, right? And if you do mint this NFT, this is a great opportunity for you to play around with minting NFTs that look different. All right, nice. So now that we have this basic NFT, let's go ahead and write a little deploy script. So we'll do deploy basic nft.s.sol. You already know the drill here as well. Let's zoom in a little bit. SPDX, license, identifier, pragma, solidity, contract, deploy, basic NFT is script. Import script from forge std slash script. We're gonna have our function run, external returns. And we've done this enough. We're probably going to use this for our testing as well. So we'll have it return a basic NFT. So we're going to want to import that as well. Import basic NFT from dot dot slash src slash basic NFT dot soul. And in here, we'll do vm dot start broad cast like this. We'll do basic NFT basic NFT equals new basic nft like this vm.stop broadcast return basic nft okay that looks pretty good let's do a quick forge compile nice compiling successfully and you already know what comes next it's time for some tests but look at how fast we're going here so basic nft test dot dot soul once again same business, SPDX, license, identifier, MRT, pragma solidity, 0 0.8.18, contract, basic NFT test is test. That means we're going to have to import test from forge std slash test dot soul like this. In here, we're going to need our function set up. This is going to be public. We'll make a deployer. We'll do a deploy basic NFT deployer, say public deployer. And then we'll also have a basic NFT, public basic NFT. Up at the top, we're going to do import deploy basic NFT from dot dot slash src slash script slash deploy basic NFT dot s dot soul. Import basic NFT from dot dot slash src slash basic NFT dot so what do I do here deploy NF deploy basic NFT dot s dot so oh it's not here there we go all right cool so now we're gonna say deployer equals new deploy basic NFT basic NFT equals deployer dot run looks good and let's write a test so we're not going to write all of the tests here but i do highly encourage you to pause the video after we write a couple tests here and you continue and write some of your own tests so let's start here and let's just make sure that the name is correct so the name here we have is doggy and dog let's go ahead and write a test to make sure this name is correct so we'll say function test name is correct this will be a public and I know this is going to be a view function, so I'm going to do view. And now here's where we run into our first issue. So string memory expected name is what? It's going to be doggy, right? That's the expected name. And the string memory actual name is going to equal what? Basic NFT.name, right? The open Zeppelin package that we imported, if we click into it and we click into this, we scroll down, there's this function name down here which just returns the name, right? This is a public view. So we know it has this name function that we can call. So in our test, we could do basic nft.name. But if we do assert 
well, assert equals or assert and do the equal stuff. Actually, let's do assert. We can't do expected name equals equals actual name. If we do it, we get this little red squiggly line that says built in binary operator equals equals cannot be applied to types of string memory and string memory. And why not? Well, remember how we said strings are a special type, right? Strings are an array of bytes or bytes array, right? And with bytes arrays, we actually can't compare arrays to arrays. We can only we can only compare primitive types or elementary types like a UN256, a bool, an address, a bytes32, etc. Right? We can't compare array of bytes, which means we can't compare strings since we can't compare arrays. So how do we make sure these strings are the same thing? Well, since it's an array, we could do like a for loop and loop through the array and then compare the elements of the array, right? If it's an array of bytes, let's say it's a array of bytes 32, right? Bytes 32s we can compare. So why don't we just loop through and do that? Well, we could, but to be honest, that's kind of too much work for us. <laughs> we, we want an easier way to actually compare these things. Now, what we could do is we could do this thing called abi.encode pack the entire array and take the hash of that. Remember what a hash is. A hash is a function that returns a fixed sized unique string that identifies that object. So if we hash these arrays, that would be an easier way to actually compare the two of them. We would just compare the hashes instead of looping through the array, which is going to be a lot more coding and it's going to be a lot more verbose. So this is something again, where your whatever AI buddy you're working with will probably get this right. We ask them, how can we compare two strings in Solidity or strings, I should spell correctly, ChatGPT and hopefully most AIs are actually able to get this for you. Hey, strings are more complex types. They're essentially dynamic arrays. Yep. And therefore can't be compared directly with equals equals. So if we scroll down, they're doing something similar. They're converting the strings to bytes and getting the hashes of that. That works too. We're going to convert them to bytes using ABI and code packs. Now, this is where I will often use a tool like chisel, which comes built in with foundry to help me get a good idea of what I'm doing makes sense, right? So what I can do is I can say string memory cat equals cat, say string memory dog equals dog. If I put type in cat, I get this crazy weird output that looks like this, but this is kind of the hex of this cat, if you will, right? What I can do is I could say bytes memory encoded cat equals abi.encode packed cat. And now I have encoded cat, which is of type dynamic bytes. And now we have a bytes object. We can actually hash a bytes object. So we could say bytes 32 cat hash equals kid check 256 encoded cat. And now we have a cat hash, which is just a simple bytes 32. So we can convert our strings to bytes and convert the bytes to a bytes 32. And we just compare the hashes of both of those. So we'll hit control C twice to exit, clear the terminal. And let's use that methodology here. And I know I haven't explained this ABI dot encode hacked yet, but I will very soon in this lesson, I promise. So for now, just kind of think it's magic. All right. But I promise I'm going to explain it very soon. So what we can do is we can do assert kitchak 256 of the abi.encode packed of the expected name is going to equal kitchak 256 of the abi.encoded to the code encode packed actual name, and I'm going to open up the command palette, do toggle word wrap here, like this. And this is how we can actually compare the two strings by encoding them. So now if I pull up the terminal, forge test dash M, test name is correct, or just forge test, boom, we get this indeed passes. So this is how we can tell these two names are the same. If this was something like Toggy, and we ran this now, you're going to see that it's going to fail, fails. Great. So let's bring it back to doggy. Awesome. So we have a way to actually test if these strings are the same. Great. Let's write two more tests. So we'll do function test can mint 
and have a balance. Make this public. Let's create some user. So back up at the top, we'll do address public user user equals make addr user like this. We'll make a user down here. We'll prank them bm dot prank user. And we'll do basic nft dot mint nft. And this is where we're going to need to add some token URI. And this is where I'm going to recommend we come over to the GitHub repo associated with this course. And let's for now just grab an IPFS hash to use. So we're going to say string memory. Actually, let's just do this at the top. String memory public constant pug equals paste it in here. Oh, sorry, not memory. Obviously, this is a storage variable. And then if you want to, I recommend you trying to upload your own metadata file to IPFS. Remember, it needs to be in this JSON format with a list of attributes. And then the image is going to be its own file uploaded to IPFS. And then you're going to take that and put it in the image section here. Definitely recommend you guys trying out. But we have this pug. We're going to use this down here, mint NFT pug. And then we can do a little we can do a little assert. We can say assert first off basic NFT dot balance of user is going to be equal to equal one. And we can also do a little assert. We can make sure that the token URI of this NFT is this pug, right? So we can say assert. And this is where we do the catch act 256 again, ABI dot encode packed pug. It's going to be equal to a check. Oh, it's just K. I don't think it's CK. 256 ABI dot encode act basic NFT dot token URI zero. Ooh. All right, let's try this one. Let's just do forge test. Let's run both tests. And we did it. Okay. Awesome. Now we're probably going to want a way to mint this token programmatically, we could of course use cast, but maybe we want to do an interactions.s.soul. And here, you already know the drill, we're going to do SPDX license identifier, IT, pragma solidity contract, we'll call it mint basic NFT is script, import script from Forge std slash script dot soul. In here, we're going to have a function external, oops, function run external, which is going to mint our NFT. And we always want to be working with the most recently deployed NFT. So we're going to, we're going to use this foundry DevOps package. We're going to go ahead and install this, copy the URL, forge install. Chaining cell slash foundry devops dash dash no commit. Clear it out. And in here, we're going to say address most recently deployed equals, oh, we're going to have to grab this devops tools. So we're going to say import devops tools from foundry devops slash src slash devops tool dot so. And this is actually lib right here. Now we're going to say equals this, this most recent deployed is going to be the DevOps tool dot get most recent deployment. And we're looking for the basic NFT, I'm a block dot chain ID, oops, like this, and I'm going to toggle the word wrap here as well. And then we're going to have a mint NFT on contract function where we're going to pass in the most recently deployed, and I'm going to make a function mint NFT on contract, address, contract, address, this is going to be a public function, vm.start broadcast. And then we'll take this address, we'll say basic NFT, contract address dot mint NFT. And I'm actually going to grab this pug string from my test, paste it into the interactions up at the top, pug, mint NFT, Pug beam dot stop broadcast. All right, cool. And I probably need to import this basic NFT. So import 
basic NFT from dot dot slash SRC slash basic NFT dot soul. All right, cool. So we have a way to deploy this, a way to mint this, and all those goodies. Now, there's a couple of ways we could actually see this for real, right? So having it in our test here is cool, but I want to see it like in my MetaMask, right? Right now, if I go to NFTs, I don't see it in here. So I am going to deploy this to a testnet, but another way we could work with this is we could deploy this to Anvil. We could deploy this to our own Anvil and we could switch over to Anvil, right? Oh, obviously my Anvil isn't up right now. We could switch over to Anvil and we could see it in, in an, on the Anvil chain. If you don't want to have to wait for the test net, if you don't want to spend the gas, I recommend that you do that. But for now, I'm going to go ahead and deploy it to a test net. You do not have to follow along with me here, but if you want to, you can. Now, once again, though, I'm going to make a make file just so I don't have to write out those super, super long scripts here. And I'm going to save you the trouble. If you just come to the Git repo associated with this lesson, you can just copy my make file instead of having to rewrite all this stuff yourself. Copying stuff is usually pretty good. There's going to be a couple of these that don't exist yet. So actually, if you want to just copy everything down to the deploy, go ahead and do that. I'm going to paste everything in there here. It's got most of what we've already talked about. We've got our deploy script, which this is what we're going to run to deploy our basic NFT. And then let's also add a mint in here. And I don't have this, but we'll, we'll I will add this. And this will be forge script, script slash uh, interactions.s.soul mint basic NFT network args. And of course, we should write some tests before shipping this on a test net, but I just want to show you guys what this NFT looks like. So we're going to do make deploy args. Oh, and actually make sure to add our dot I'm going to add my Sepolia key in here and my private key. Since I'm going to be working with my make file, I don't even have to run source.env since the make file includes the .env. But now I can just run, scroll down in my make file. Let's run make deploy args equal dash dash network folia. And we're going to go ahead and deploy this. We're deploying our basic NFT to this contract address. Okay, great. We're gonna have to wait a little bit for it to be verified. All right, cool. After it's up, we could even go see this on Sepolia testnet. Contract is verified. Okay, very nice. We could go ahead and write contract from Etherscan, but we're gonna do it the cool programmatic way. So now that we have this, we're gonna have our broadcast folder, which is gonna have our latest run in here with our created basic NFT. And because it's in here, that's how our DevOps tool actually works. It grabs the most recent from that folder. We do need to turn FFI equals true in here, FFI equals, in order to run this command. So what we can do now, and remember, anytime you set FFI to be true, you want to just double check that the package that you have is actually going to do what you want it to do. So if we look in this lib, Foundry DevOps, we go to SRC, we can see the actual bash script that's going to be running. If I guess if you're familiar with bash, you could read through this and figure this out. You drop it into you could also copy paste this into something like ChatGPT and say, what does this code do? Paste it in. ChatGPT and most AIs are usually pretty good at bash. So it gets it right. This bash script is is designed to search through JSON files in a specified directory and find the latest created contract address for a given contract name on a specified blockchain. That sure is what it's supposed to do. So, and just one more thing on this DevOps thing. So this is kind of my temporary solution to not seeing a better DevOps tool in the wild. I'm going to have in here as well, up at the top, similar to recommended testnet, I'm going to have a recommended DevOps package. So right now, the one that I'm using is the one that I made, but I'm going to have a recommended DevOps package because a couple other people are working on improvements to this. So FFI equals true. Now that we have all this, we're going to run make deploy or excuse me, make mint args equals dash dash network sepolia like this. And now we're going to grab that most recently deployed 
basic NFT, and we're gonna call the mint function on it. Now, while this is minting, what we can do is we can come up to our MetaMask here. We'll go to this contract address that we just deployed. We'll copy this. And once this finishes going through, once this transaction finishes going through, we can copy this address, go to our MetaMask, go to NFTs. Oh, let's actually switch to Sepolia. We'll go to NFTs. We'll select import NFTs and we can paste the address and then our token ID should be zero because we should be the first ones to have created this and we'll hit add and it'll wait a little bit and then we'll be able to see our NFT right in our MetaMask. We see our cute little doggy and we can do whatever we want with it. We can see it's smart enough to grab this token URI. We can see the image here and we can see the contract address on chain. We could send it, we can do whatever we want with it, right? So we can see the NFT right in our MetaMask. And this is what we would see on a marketplace like OpenSea as well. Fantastic. All right, we deployed an NFT. We can see it in our MetaMask. This is great. Now there's a couple of things that we still need to go over. Number one, what's the issue with this NFT? Why might IPFS not be the best place to have your image stored? It's better than using HTTPS and then a website, but why might this not even be as good? And then additionally, what the heck is this ABI.encode pact? We've used this ABI encode function selector, encode this, encode that. What is this? Well, one at a time. Let's first answer the question, why might this still not be the best place to host this data? So if we host our image on a website, right? Like you saw some of the pudgy penguins were HTTPS, you saw a couple of my images use HTTPS. Again, like I said, if those websites go down, if you go to view that NFT, you're gonna get nothing back. You're gonna get a broken JPEG link, making your NFT essentially, well, worthless, right? So IPFS is much better because anybody can pin this and keep that image up forever. So let's actually begin to work on a solution where we can actually host our NFT on a more decentralized, more censorship resistant, more permissionless, more immutable way. The issue, as I was saying with IPFS, is that if I'm the only IPFS node that has this data pinned, and my node goes offline. For example, if my IPFS node is just on my computer right here and I turn my computer off, nobody can have access to that file, which means that if we went to my MetaMask or to OpenSea, we would see a broken JPEG image here, right? We wouldn't see anything. The reason IPFS is better than a centralized server is because other people can pin this, right? If I put this NFT up and other people like this NFT collection or this NFT, they can pin it to their own nodes. But this method is so popular because it is incredibly cheap to do, right? It's really easy to spin up an IPFS node and pin your data to that node. This method that I'm about to show you is a little bit more expensive, but it's way more decentralized because all of your metadata is actually going to be on chain. Now, here's one thing that you, here's one thing you can do so that when you pin data to an IPFS node, it actually stays up there for a good. What you can do is you can come to different services like pinata.cloud and actually have them pin your metadata for you. So what I can do is I come here, let's start building, sign up, I'm a builder. And once we're logged in here, just like an IPFS node, we can hit add files, choose a file, and then just drop your file in here. And when you do that, you'll be able to get a hash of each one of your projects like this one. And this way, you know you have somebody else at least pinning your data. And whenever I'm using a project that uses some type of file in IPFS, I always deploy the file to my own IPFS node, and then I'll also pin it to something like Pinata as well. well. What we can do is we can use something called an SVG. Now, I've got a tutorial on this using Hardhat with your SVG being 100% on chain. If you want to go check that out, it's going to be very similar to what we're doing here. And we've got an example of a totally on-chain SVG, which this looks pretty ugly, I know. But this was a, a project where I had a Chainlink VRF create random lines to make a provably random SVG on-chain. So we're going to use this strategy where 
we're going to basically encode our image as an SVG type. And this image is stored 100% on chain. Now this image is gross and doesn't really look like anything. The images that we're going to do are going to be in this image folder, dynamic NFT. It's going to be like this happy SVG and that sad SVG, right? So a little bit more interesting. So let's first understand what an SVG even is. So if we go to w3schools.com, we can go to this SVG tutorial. So SVG stands for Scalar Vector Graphics. And we can actually scroll down and we can see an example right in this SVG example, right? So this is it. So it looks, it's just kind of this tag where it has very specific parameters for defining what an image looks like. And the reason that SVGs are so cool is because no matter how big or small you make them, they're always going to have the exact same quality because they're scalable. You know how like if you take an image like this one, let me view this. Now if we take this image, right, and I make it super, super big, I'll make it super big, the bigger I make it, the worse the quality gets. So with an SVG, you don't ever have to deal with that because you define exactly what it'll look like no matter what size. And what we could do is we can actually make our own SVG sort of like this, right? And if you're in the W3 schools, if you try for yourself, you can see my first SVG over here. And I could change this. I could say the fill is now blue. We'll run and it now turns blue. I can say the stroke is black, right? And it turns black. So there's a ton of different parameters and functions that we can do to make an SVG look a certain way, right? So if we're back in our VS code, we can even go up to IMG, new file, example.svg, we can code some SVG in here. So we'll do SVG, XML and S equals, and this is just some version stuff, HTTP, www.w3.org, slash 2000, slash SVG, give it a width of 500, a height of 500. These need to be in strings, and then we'll have a closing SVG tag. And here we'll make some text. We'll say fill equals black. Hi, you decoded this backslash text like this real minimal SVG like this. And then if we go to extensions, we can look up SVG. And there's a couple of different SVG viewers and SVG previewers. I forget which one's the best one. Let's go with this one for now. And now what we can do is go back to our SVG, open up our command palette, type in SVG. Preview SVG. I'm going to install this SVG preview. I'm going to go ahead and hit install. Now we can come back to our SVG, open up SVG preview, open preview to the side, and it looks blank. So let's fix that. We'll say x equals zero, y equals 15. x equals zero, y is 15, fill is black, text. Okay, that looks good. Preview the SVG, and boom, we can see. Oh, this little high your browser decoded this on the side. Now this is just the SVG. And this storing all this on chain is not a URI, right? Our NFT needs a URI, right? It needs this string. This is not a URI, this is an SVG. But what we can do is we can actually convert this into a URI that our browser can understand. And we're going to pass all the data we need in the URL of our browser. This is going to sound really bizarre, right? But what we're going to do is we're going to CD into that image folder. And we're going to run a command called base 64. Now, not all computers have this, you can check by doing base 64 dash dash help. If you don't have this, don't worry, you can just copy paste what I'm going to be doing. We can actually base 64 encode the out everything in here. And what I can say is I could do base 64 dash I, which means we're going to input a file. And we're going to pass in this example that SVG, we'll see we get this weird thing as an output. So now if we take this weird thing, and I'm going to actually create a little little readme to make some notes here. So this weird output is the base 64 encoded example that SVG we just created. Now at the start of this, we can add a beginning piece to tell our browser that this is an SVG. So I'm going to say data colon image slash SVG plus XML base 64 comma like this. 
And if I copy this whole thing, oops, sorry, this isn't, this should be a semicolon here. If I copy this whole thing and I paste it into any browser, we're gonna get this, hi, your browser decoded this. So basically what we did was we encoded this SVG file and put this data image SVG plus XML colon base64 so our browser knew how to decode it and then just passed the entire image through our browser URL and boom. So we can also do this with images. So if I go back to the repo associated with this lesson, go to images, dynamic NFT, we go to happy SVG, happy.svg, we go down to code instead of preview and see the exact code here, right? So we create this view box, oops, we create some circles, we create this path, which is how we just kind of draw lines. I can copy this whole thing, paste it into my image. So I'm gonna say, oops, image, I'm gonna do happy SVG, happy.svg, paste it in here. If I pull up the preview, I see the preview is a happy. Now what I can do is I can do base 64-i happy.svg. We get this output and copy this output. Let me go over to the readme, paste it. I'm gonna add this beginning piece to it and then copy this whole thing. Go back to my browser, paste it in and boom. We passed all of this data to generate this SVG right in the URL. And this is, looks like, yes it does, a token URI, right? So now instead of using an IPFS hash for our token URI, we can actually 100% on chain use this SVG thing. And because this SVG is basically code on chain, we can update it and interact with it to make it do whatever we want it, right? For example, if our has happy SVG, we could say, okay, if, if somebody has 10 tokens, right, they get 10 circles or something like that, right? We could do whatever we want with this. So let's learn how to make one of these SVGs on chain and we'll make it so that our NFT is actually dynamic, right? so that our NFT can change, it can evolve, it can grow, whatever we wanna do with it. And then at the end, we'll finally learn what this ABI and code packed stuff is, right? And this is gonna be incredibly important for those of you looking to go the extra mile, looking to go really far and looking to become really advanced smart contract developers. So let's build our mood SVG NFT, which can change its mood, change the image of the NFT, and it's 100% stored on chain. So let's show you what we're gonna be building. We're gonna be building this NFT called a mood NFT, a mood NFT. And in here, we're gonna have a function called flip mood. And what this is gonna do is if we're happy, it's gonna make us sad. And if we're sad, it's gonna make us happy. And it's gonna flip between these two images between the happy and sad, right? If I go to images, dynamic NFT, we have this happy SVG. If we're happy, our NFT will show happy. And if we're sad, we'll show sad, right? We're gonna have this 100% be on chain. We're gonna learn more also about how to work with this metadata and everything. And we're gonna do this end to end. So let's create this mood NFT. So let's go to SRC, new file, mood NFT.soul. And you know the drill, SPDX, license, identifier, MIT, Pragma, oops, Pragma, Solidity, 0 0.8.18, little carrot. Contract, mood, NFT, like this. This is gonna be an NFT, so we're gonna copy some of the stuff from the basic NFT. We're gonna copy this import, paste it in here. And all right, we're gonna say this NFT is an NFT, make a constructor, ERC721, this is gonna be called mood NFT, NMN for mood NFT, like this. And we're going to write in the constructor, we're gonna pass the happy mood and the sad mood SVGs. So an image, right here we have our happy SVG, great. If you guys wanna create your own sad SVG, go for it. But I recommend you just come here, go to code, and let's copy this new file, sad.svg, paste it in here, like this. I don't know why I have this first line, I'm gonna delete that, preview it, 
Yep, looks good. So we have a sad face and a happy face. Nice. Okay, cool. And then, yeah, actually, if we pull up our happy face, right, if we preview this again, and we're going to change the circle from, like, 61 to, like, 20, I'm, like, literally moving the eyes <laughs> as we go, you can make whatever monstrosity you want. Feel free to do that. But we're going to take those SVGs as input parameters. So we're going to say string memory sad SVG string memory happy SVG. All right, cool. And you'll see why we do that in a second. Let's create a token counter. So we'll do u into two to six private s underscore token counter. We'll set the token counter in the constructor to zero. And let's save these as well. So we'll do string private s underscore sad SVG string private s underscore happy SVG. We'll say sad SVG equals the sad SVG. Oops, equals sad SVG and happy SVG equals happy SVG. Okay, cool. So now we're going to make it so that anybody can mint one of these. So we'll say function mint NFT. This will be public. Anybody can mint their own mood NFT. We'll do a little safe mint function or we'll give the message dot sender the s underscore token counter so they get their token ID. We're going to say s token counter plus plus. We'll add one to it and that looks pretty good. And now we'll want to define what this NFT actually looks like. So this is with the token URI function, of course, which takes a UN256 token ID. It'll be a public view override and it's going to return a string memory like this. Now, how do we actually get our NFT to show this stuff, this SVG NFT? Well, we're going to pass the SVG text in here, right? But what we could do instead of that is we could just pass in the encoded image already, right? We could just encode these images ourselves. So if I, for example, and we kind of already did, right? If we open up our readme, I'm just going to delete everything. Let's do happy SVG. What we can do is we could pull this up, clear. We could do base 64-i, happy SVG, copy this, hit enter. We need to prepend with data, image slash SVG plus XML, semicolon, base 64, comma, paste that in. If I copy this, I can just double check by pasting it in the browser. Yep, okay, that looks good. So that's gonna be our happy SVG. We can do the same thing with our sad SVG, base 64-i, sad SVG. Do the same thing. We're going to copy this output it gave us, which is a lot bigger. Paste it in here, and we're just going to prepend it with this as well. Boom. Copy the whole thing. Paste it in here. And cool. We have a sad SVG as well. Nice. So we have those already. So why don't, instead of us passing in the text, of the SVG and the NFT, instead of passing in these, we can just pass in the already encoded version, right? It'll save us a step. We can base64 encode these on chain, and I'll show you how to do that in a second, but it'll probably save us some gas if they're already encoded. So instead, let's say sad SVG image URI, set happy SVG image URI. Let's have these be the imports instead. And it's important that it's just the image URI we're passing. We're not passing the token URI. Right? Why not? Because well, the token URI, if we go back to our our pug test, the token URI is gonna look like this, where it's not the actual image, it's this JSON object, it's this metadata object. The actual image URI is here, the actual token URI is here. Okay, so this is the token URI, this is the image URI. Token URI, image URI. This is what the NFT looks like. This describes everything about the NFT. This is the token URI. So this, in our readme, this giant thing, well, or this thing is the image URI. It is not the token URI, it's the image URI. So back in our mood NFT, we're getting that image URI. So let's make this more specific. Let's call it sad SVG image URI, happy SV image URI. So sad, happy. So we're gonna pass this already encoded data to our NFT. Nice. 
So how do we actually store this, this object on chain? Well, we can actually encode JSON objects the same way we encoded SVGs using that base 64 stuff. And we can actually do it on chain using Open Zeppelin's base 64 package. Open Zeppelin has some utilities where one of them is a base 64. Base64 utils allows you to transform bytes32 data into a base64 string representation. So that's what we're going to do now. We're first going to make our metadata JSON object, and then we're going to use Open Zeppelin to convert this JSON object into a JSON token URI. So let's learn how to do that. So we already have Open Zeppelin installed. Oh my goodness, I'm such a noob. I'm so sorry. Named import from here we go. Okay, cool. Now let's go ahead and let's import. We're going to import this base64 file from at open Zeppelin. We've already got the remappings and everything. Contracts slash utils slash base64 dot soul. It's in the package, I promise. And we can use this base64 thing to actually encode stuff. So let's scroll down to our token URI. And let's first let's just write out this as if it were just a giant string. Right, let's just create this metadata object. So first, boom, name. Let's get rid of that. What's our name gonna be? And let's make this just a giant string. So let's say string memory token metadata equals name. And we're gonna need to combine this string with the name of our NFT project here. So do a little comma, boom, boom. We could do this, oh, and then comma here, but we could do abi.encode packed to concatenate this whole string together. Or we learned another way to combine strings, we could do string.concat like this, boom. So we can concatenate this. And what this will print out is name mood NFT, right? Because we're combining the name and the mood NFT. So that looks pretty good. However, we need the rest of the stuff. So we need name, description, image, and then attributes, right? So we got a name in here. Let's keep going. What else do we need? Well, we should do, so we shouldn't finish it here. Let's even just delete this. We should do a comma, space, and I'm gonna toggle word wrap again, just so that it's on. Description, and then we can just add whatever we want in here. Let's say an NFT that reflects the owner's, oops, the owner's mood. Great, we'll do a comma, attributes. Now our attributes are gonna be in this list style here. So we're gonna say attributes, little list here, another bracket, we're gonna say trait type, say just kind of a silly attribute here, moodiness value 100, and then close it off, close off the list. Okay, cool, looks good. Image. And now this is finally where we put our image URI, right? Image URI, and then we'll say comma, and then we'll finally close off the text here. So this is gonna be the metadata of our token. Since we're parameterizing it a little bit, it, it will look like this once this the two of these populate, right? Our image URI though, we need to derive based off of the mood of each person, which we haven't defined yet. So we should make a little mapping of like token ID to mood. So we can do that up here. We'll say mapping u into 256 to, to mood. And let's even create an enum mood of happy and sad. And this way, if we wanted to add more moods later, we could add more moods later. So mood, this will be a private s underscore token ID to mood. And when an NFT gets minted, let's just default them. We'll say the mood is going to be of S tone counters will be mood dot happy. So we're going to default them to being happy. So to get the image URI up at the top here, we could do a little if statement. We could say if S underscore token ID to mood of the token ID equals mood dot happy. Let's do this. Let's create this blank string memory image URI. We'll say image URI equals S underscore happy SVG image URI. 
and we'll say else image URI equals s underscore sad image URI. So now we have a way to add the image, whether their person is happy or sad, right to the token metadata here. Of course, we're probably going to want a way to flip our, our mood and we will add that later. So this is looking pretty good. But this is just the token metadata, right? This isn't so this isn't the whole thing. This isn't the whole shebang. Because this is just a string, we need this token URI to return a string that looks like, like this a string we can post in the browser, this string, eh, you can't really post this in the browser URL, right? So what we need to do is with this token metadata string, we do string dot concat or string dot concat is nice, but we actually need to convert it to bytes, and we need to do ABI dot encode packed, like this, and it needs to not be a string. ABI.encode backed, and we need to make it a bytes like this. We actually could do string.concat, but we'll just do ABI.encode packed because we need to convert this to bytes in order to use the Open Zeppelin Base64 encoder. If we look at the Open Zeppelin Base64, it says it allows you to transform bytes data into strings. And you can see actually in the examples here of the Open Zeppelin docs, it also uses an NFT as its example. We need to convert ABI.encode packed to bytes, and then we can do base64.encode this whole thing like that. And now, now that we're base64 encoding it, that's equivalent to us getting this giant piece when we did it from the command line. We still need this beginning piece. So we can get that by just adding, concatenating this beginning part. So this is where we're going to need this beginning part. Now, since this is a JSON object, it's not a data image SVG XML, we're going to need to create a function, let's create a function called underscore base URI. It's gonna be internal your override because the ERC 721 also has a base URI function that we're just going to override, it's going to returns string memory. For working with JSON objects, we'll say return data application slash JSON semicolon base 64 like this. So this is going to be the base URI of our metadata return. We're going to concatenate this with this by doing ABI.encode packed or string.concatenate ABI.encode packed like this. And then we're going to wrap this whole thing up as a string like this and then return it. Okay. That's kind of a big thing here. So we'd still want to be able to flip the mood and everything, but let's write a test just to see if this is working correct. First, we created this string. We concatenated together using ABI to encode packed. We turned it into a bytes object. Then we encoded that bytes object. We combine that with a base URL, and then we turn that whole thing into a string and return that. So let's do a quick sanity test here. So we're going to create a new file, mood nft test.t.sol. And we're not even going to write a deploy script yet. We're going to write a deploy script, but we're going to skip it for now. And we're going to do, and we're going to just make sure that this token URI function is working correctly, right? it should default to the happy SVG. So we'll do SPDX license identifier, pragma solidity, carrot 0.8.18, contract mood NFT test is test, import test from forge std test.sol, function setup public, and we're going to, of course, need to import our mood NFT from that dot slash SRC slash mood NFT dot soul. We'll say mood NFT, mood NFT up at the top. And then we'll even just deploy this ourselves. We'll say mood NFT equals new mood NFT. And our mood NFT takes what? Takes the sad SVG URI and the happy SVG URI. So we could do string public constant happy SVG happy SVG URI equals we'll go back to a readme because we already created these and we'll copy this put a little string here like that. 
then we'll do the same thing. String public constant sad SVG URI equals same thing. We already created this one. Copy this, paste it in here, semicolon. So what goes first, the happy or the sad? Sad goes first. Okay, why did we put the sad first? Sad first, happy SVG URI. Okay, cool. So now we have our mood NFT. Now we'll do function view or function test view token URI like this. We make this a public view or no, just public actually. And what we'll do is we'll do mood NFT dot mint NFT. And now we should have look at our mint function. We should now have a token URI, a token zero. And then we could just do a console.log mood NFT dot token URI of zero. Right. And of course, we're going to need to import console from test.sol. We can do that console.log. Okay, cool. We'll pull this up, go down to the foundry NFT F23 directory, PWD. Cool, we're in the right one. Forge test dash M dash VV. So we can see the console.logs. Transfer to non ERC721 receiver implementer. So this is already an interesting error that we're getting. So when we call mint NFT in our test, we're actually minting it to this test contract, right? And this test contract doesn't have a receive function and open Zeppelin baked in some code so that people wouldn't accidentally send NFTs to contracts that can't transfer them or do anything with them. So instead, we're just gonna do vm.prank, we'll create a user, we'll do address user equals make ADR user, and we'll prank the user so that it'll go to a user, it'll go to an address as opposed to a contract. So we can actually see this error, we go to the ERC 721 contract, we look for that error, and we see on the safe transfer from there's this check on ERC 721 received. And if we click into this function, it does a whole bunch of checks in here, it basically checks to see if there's a function selector called on ERC 721 received, right? And again, the reason for this is to make sure that if you're sending this NFT to a contract address, it's expecting to get an NFT so it could possibly remove them, right? Or, or transfer them or whatever, right? So for now, we'll just prank a user. We'll rerun our test, pull this up. And okay, we get this as our log. So this is gonna be our token URI. We can see the data application slash JSON base 64. And we're assuming this is the encoded JSON object. So if we grab this, paste it into our browser now. Okay, that looks pretty good. That looks like a JSON object. Then if we grab this, paste this into our browser, we see the happy SVG NFT. So this is how we can know that our token URI function is actually working correctly, right? Because we can see that it's printed out. And what we could do if we wanted to is we could start up our Anvil chain, right? Make Anvil and deploy to Anvil, then mint an NFT on Anvil, switch over to Anvil and try to see it in our MetaMask as well. So if you wanna do that, highly recommend you give that a try. Our NFT is looking pretty good here. We got our token URI to work. We just need to be able to flip it, right? We need to be able to change its mood. We also need to write a deploy script as well. Let's write the flip mood function and then we'll work on the deploy script. So down here, We'll create a new function called flip mood, where we're just gonna change the mood of the NFT. So UN 256 token ID, it's gonna be public. Now first, we're gonna say we only want the NFT owner to be able to change the mood, right? So first, we're gonna have to make sure that it's the actual owner that's calling this. And the ERC721, from Open Zeppelin actually comes with a function called underscore is approved or owner. So we can say, okay, if they're not approved or owner before we're sending this message of the token ID, then we're gonna, gonna go ahead and revert, right? So if they're not approved or owner, we're gonna revert. We're gonna make a new error at the top, errors. We'll say error, mood NFT, underscore, underscore, can't flip mood if not owner like this. Copy this, come down here. 
and we will revert with that. And then all we're going to do is we're going to say if s underscore token ID to state or to the to mood of the token ID is equal to mood dot happy, then we're going to change their mood to sad equals mood dot sad. Else, we're going to copy this line again, else we're going to change them to happy. All right, cool. So now we have a function that can actually flip their mood as well. Great. Everything's looking pretty good here. Let's go ahead and create a deploy script. So new file, deploy, mood nft dot s dot so. All right, so let's go ahead and deploy this mood nft, or write the script to deploy it anyways. So you know the drill, SPDX, license, identifier MRT, pragma, solidity, oops, like so, contract, deploy mood NFT dot, or contract deploy mood NFT is script. We're gonna import script from forge std slash script dot soul, like that, contract, contract. And this needs a semicolon. Okay, nice. We of course need a function run external. We already know this is gonna to need to returns a mood NFT, which let's import that now. Import our mood NFT from dot dot slash SRC slash mood NFT dot soul bada bing bada boom. We are cooking. All right, now our mood NFT. How do we deploy this bad Larry? Well, let's go to it. What does it take as input? It takes a sad SVG image URI and a happy SVG image URI. Now we could hard code those in here, right? Right? Like we did in our little, little kind of test over here. We could definitely hard code these, but I'm going to teach you some fancy schmancy ways that no matter what is in here, no matter what text you put in here, it'll automatically encode this for you, right? So you can make this SVG, whatever your heart desires, and this will automatically encode it for you. So I'm going to create a little function down here, first of all, called function SVG to image URI. And we're going to pass it a string memory SVG public here returns string memory. memory. Let's zoom out just a little bit. And we're going to have this function do this base 64 dash I blah, blah, blah thing for us. That way we don't have to do that step and it'll automatically base 64 encode it for us when we deploy this. So we're just going to make our lives a little bit easier here. So for example, right, we're going to pass in something that looks like like this, right as text. So SVG with blah, 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 something like this. I'm just going to copy part of this. Boom, something like this dot, 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 something like that. We're gonna be able to pass this in and we're gonna get as a return data. Let's go back to that test. Or yeah, that works too. It's gonna return something like this. Boom, boom, boom. Dot. It's gonna return something like this. We're gonna pass this in, return something like this. We're gonna do it all from our Solidity scripting. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna say string memory base URL is gonna equal that data image slash SVG plus XML base 64 comma, right? Because this is always going to be the prefix, which is easy enough to do. But how do we do the postfix? How do we encode that SVG stuff on chain? Well, this is where we're going to use that open Zeppelin base 64 package again, it can already do this for us. So we're going to go ahead and import base 64 from at open Zeppelin slash contracts slash utils slash base 64 dot soul like that looks good. And down here, we're gonna do something very similar to what we did in our mood NFT, where we encoded it with the opens up on package, we're gonna go ahead and do string memory SVG base 64 encoded equals base 64 dot encode bytes. Yeah, and it looks like GitHub copilot is being correct here. String ABI dot encode packed SVG. 
So what we're doing is we're doing abi.encode packed the SVG. So we're taking this massive input and we're packing it together as a bytes object. We're converting it to a string and then converting it to a bytes and then encoding it. I know that's a little confusing, but that's what's going on here. So that way we can actually base64 encode it. And then we just combine this encoded string with the base URL. And we can just say return string abi.encode packed or string.concat base URL comma SVG base 64 64 encoded. We probably should use string.concat instead of this abi.encode packed, but I'm just so used to this abi.encode packed and I'm not really sure which one's more gas efficient. Maybe I should do some benchmarking later on. Or maybe you can tell me which one's more gas efficient yourself. So we have this function now where we can actually take an input of the SVG and convert it to this. But we should probably test to make sure it actually works, right? Well, why not? Let's do a little test. Deploy mood nft.t or test.t.sol. I'm actually going to copy a lot of the setup from our mood NFT stuff over here. I'm just going to paste it in like this. Deploy. This is going to be deploy mood NFT test is test. We don't need this mood NFT yet. We do need deploy mood NFT from deploy mood NFT script here dot s dot so I know it went kind of quick there, but this is where it's getting it from. And we're going to do function setup, of course, public. And we're going to need one of these deploy mood NFTs deployer. We'll even make this public. Why not? And we're going to say deployer equals new deploy mood NFT like this. And now let's test it out. Function test convert SVG to URI public. And now with our deployer, we're going to call this SVG to image URI, we're going to pass it in SVG. So we can just to test here, we can take one of our SVGs, for example, this one, right, we can put everything on the same line. And this is going to be the high your browser decoded this, right? I can run base 64 dash I, we're going to go to dot slash image, example that SVG, and it'll give me this output, right? And then if I copy this, we'll go back to the readme. Let's scroll down, paste this in here. I'm gonna say like example. And then I'm just gonna grab this prefix, paste it here. If I copy this, stick it in my browser. Boom, higher browser decoded this. Okay, cool. So this URI is correct. So what we can do in our test here, I know we have a lot of stuff open. We can say string memory expected URI equals and just paste that super long string in here. That's gonna be the expected URI. And then we're gonna say string memory SVG equals, and we'll go to the example that SVG, everything is on one line here, we're gonna copy this whole thing, come back here and use a single quote, to paste it in, because we're using double quotes in here. So we'll use a single quote. And what we'll do is we'll do Employer dot, what's the name of the function? SVG to image URI, SVG, like this. And we'll say string memory created SVG equals deployer, excuse me, created or actual URI. And now we'll just assert that. And we got to compare these strings. So how do we compare strings again? That's right. We'll do a little check 256 ABI dot encode hacked actual URI equals the check 56 ABI dot encode packed the expected URI like that wonky function. And then this is probably going to be a view. Yep. Okay. So we're gonna do a view function here. Great. And now let's test this forge test dash M paste it in. So it looks like our way of encoding an SVG in Solidity is matching our command line way of doing it. And remember, if your command line doesn't have base64, that's okay. There's some online decoders as well you can use, or just follow along with me. Like I said, it's all good. Okay, phenomenal. So tested that works. Great. Let's keep going. Let's zoom in a little bit. A little zoomed out here. So now let's actually read in 
these files, these SVG files into our Solidity. Now you can only do this in Foundry, right? Because you can't actually read in scripts in Solidity Smart Contracts. You can only do this in Foundry and we can do this with another Foundry cheat code. Go in the search bar here. There's a read file cheat code, file signature. There's this read file here and we can use this to read an entire file and we can read an SVG. Now, in order to do that, we're gonna need to go to our foundry.toml and our project. And we're gonna need to add this FS permissions, permissions equals access equals read path equals dot slash images. Cool. So now we can read from different paths and that's the only access that we're gonna give. And this actually brings up a good point. Interactions test.sol, we're using this DevOps tool which requires FFI to be true. I'd much rather this DevOps tool use this, this read permissioning instead of just saying, hey, do whatever you want in the shell. It's much safer to just say, hey, you're only allowed to read what's in this shell. So if somebody wants to refactor this DevOps tool to instead of having F FFI be true to only allow the FS permissions to be true, that would be great. The repo is open source. I highly recommend you contribute. Maybe even come to it. You scroll down and, and you'll see something on top. Hey, it's Congratulations, it's been revamped to not use FFI as true. It now uses the read permissions. You really don't want to have FFI equals true in your foundry.toml if you don't have to. So in fact, anytime you're working with code outside of my tutorials, try to make this false, okay? Try to make this false any and everywhere you can. Okay, deployed moon NFT, great. So now what we can do is we can use this read file cheat code and read in our SVGs. So we'll do String memory sad SVG equals vm dot read file dot slash image slash is it just an image here? Yep. Image slash sad dot SVG. Why do I keep doing the sad ones first? String memory happy SVG equals vm dot read file dot slash image slash happy dot SVG. We would probably want to write tests for this too. But if I want to just kind of quickly sanity check it, we'll add the console in here. We'll do a little console.log, sad SVG. We'll pull up our script. We'll do forge script, script slash deploy mood nft.s.sol. We'll hit enter. It should run this on its own fake anvil chain. Path is not allowed to be accessed for read operations. Oh, that's because not images, this should just be image. That's clear. Let's read this now. Aha! And cool, that looks correct enough. Yep, that looks correct enough. Okay, awesome, so it's reading in this path, perfect. So now what do we do? Well, we finally do vm.start, start broadcast, mood NFT, mood NFT equals new mood NFT. And we're going to pass in the mood. So the mood NFT needs what? It needs those image URIs as input. So we're going to say SVG to image URI of which one goes first? I think we keep doing sad first. Yep, sad first. Sad SVG. Oops, that should be a comma. Copy that. SVG to image URI. Happy SVG. Like this. Semicolon. And we'll do a little vm.stop broadcast like this, and then we'll return our mood NFT. And now we can use it in our tests. Nice, okay. All right, so now that we have this up and running, this actually shows a little bit of some of the difference between integration tests and unit tests. So this is kind of more of a unit test, right? We're deploying kind of our own way here, just to say, hey, mood NFT is this new mood NFT, whereas we could use our script, and that would be more of an integration test. So if we even wanna do that, Right. This is a better example of us saying, okay, new folder, unit, and we're gonna put both of these in here. Well, actually this one is using the deployer, right? So that was kind of more of a staging test, or that's kind of more of a integrations test. So integrations, we're gonna put both of these over here. Mood NFT test that's oops, deploy mood. This is also gonna go, oh no, sorry. This is gonna go in units since we're not using, since we're just deploying like this and we screwed up some of our imports. Let's 
fix the imports in here and in here and in here. All right, cool. But now we could do another, we could do a new file, mood NFT tagration, tagration test.p.sol. And I'm actually just gonna copy this whole test, paste it in here, change the name, moon NFT integration test. And instead of deploying like this, we're gonna use the deployer. So we're gonna import deploy mood NFT from dot dot slash dot dot slash script slash deploy mood NFT dot s dot sol. Copy this. And instead here we're gonna say deploy mood NFT deployer like this. And we're gonna say deployer equals new deploy mood NFT. And we're gonna say deployer dot run. This is gonna equal our mood NFT. Boom. And this function test view token URI integration should work pretty much the same. So now if we run forge test dash M paste it in, Sure enough, it works exactly the same here. Awesome. Okay, so one thing that we have definitely not tested, and I'm just gonna do it in this integration test because I way prefer, and I want you guys to get used to also testing your deploy scripts. I've seen way too many projects not do this and then get wrecked. So I'm gonna, we're gonna do most of our stuff in here. We'll do function test flip token to sad. We're gonna test flipping it from happy to sad. Remember it starts with happy. We do a vm dot prank our user mood nft dot mint nft like this. We're gonna do vm dot prank user again. I should do start prank instead of two pranks, but whatever. Mood nft dot flip mood zero, and then we're gonna assert this is now a sad nft. So we're gonna assert kick kick two fifty six abi dot encode hacked of the mood nft dot token uri zero equals pack 256 abi dot encode packed sad what is it called sad svg uri boom oh and then semicolon spoke a check wrong again i've seen this word so many times and i've heard it pronounced correctly and i still i don't know if it's kachak or kakak i think it's kachak kakak i don't know Forge test dash M paste it in. Failed. Let's do some dash VVs. Let's see what's up. Oh, that's not enough V's. Four V's. Okay. Assertion violated. Mood token URI is going to be this. Hmm. And so this is actually where I prefer assert equal rather than assert. Because if we do assert equal, we can put a comma here and it'll print out both of the results for both of these. So I'm gonna do a comma, we're gonna do a cert equal. I'm gonna try this again, pull this up, and we'll see. Oh, well, maybe it didn't print out both. Oh yeah, it did print out both. So, yep, so print out the left val and the right val. So it looks like these are different for some reason. So do we not, hmm. Well, this is where we can do a little console.logging. Let's do console.logging, mood, a token URI of zero. So let's see what this token URI is. So let's run this again. Now with the console.log and practicing debugging is really important. So that's why we're gonna actually do this together. Dash VV so we can see this console.log. Let's pull this up a little bit here. We'll see logs. So this is that token URI that we're actually seeing. So this should be sad. We copy this, paste it. We see we get the metadata. Let's copy the image, paste that. Okay, we do indeed get sad. So what's wrong with this? Sad SVG URI. And this is the sad SVG URI. Oh, I'm being silly. Okay, so this is the sad SVG URI, sad SVG image URI. Okay, so that's where it's, Good to be explicit. Image, image URI, image. So these are obviously not gonna be the same because one is an image URI and one is not. But so we want this token URI to 
equal not the sat SVG image URI, right? We don't care about that. We want it to equal our sat SVG URI, which I'm just going to paste in here. String public constant sad SVG URI equals, and we already tested this actually. I know we're running around kind of like a lot. We tested this in here, expected URI. Is this the happy one? Let's see, let's paste this in the browser. Oh, that's just the your browser decoded this. I'm gonna cheat a little bit. I'm actually just gonna copy this and do sad SVG URI and just paste it in here. Copy this, paste it here, run this again. Cheating a little bit here, but that SVG URI looked right to me. And now we're gonna go ahead and pass. Okay, cool. Awesome. So let's talk about what we, what we just did, because I know we've done a lot. So I kind of sped through integration unit test stuff over here, but this was a really good example of some of the differences between a unit test and an integration test. So in this unit test, we only tested one specific function on our deploy mood NFT. Additionally, we only tested one specific function on mood NFT, although we didn't put an assert here, but you get the picture. Our integrations test, we combined the deployer with the mood NFT, or excuse me, the basic NFT. On both of these, we did that, right? So these are a much better showing of what an integration test would look like, right? And now, if we run forge test, we'll get everything to run. Everything looks good. And if we test this on a fork, everything should look good too. Forge test dash dash fork URL. Polia, RPC URL, remember to run source.env if you haven't already. And that passes as well. Nice, good. Okay, so we have all that. We have a script where we can deploy both of these. We can flip the mood of our NFT as well. We don't wanna to have to write all that forge script stuff. So we're gonna come in the make file. We're gonna add a line in here called mint mood NFT at Forge script script slash interactions dot s dot soul mint mood NFT. Do we actually have that? I don't think we have that. Interactions mint basic. We only have mint basic. We don't have mint mood. Well, okay. We should have a script for minting the mood. We should also have a script for flipping the mood. But I'm going to skip those because there's no real more information. It's just practice. I highly recommend you try to actually implement these yourselves. Right, try to implement a script for minting the mood NFT, a script for flipping the mood NFT as well. And you can do it with cast or forge scripts, whatever you want to do here. Okay. So we have a way to deploy both of these. We have some tests, some real basic tests. So your other action item here is going to be, you guessed it, get that coverage up. If we do forge coverage, what do you think we're going to get? Sure. Oh, whoa. Okay. Basic NFT looks good. Mood NFT looks okay. It definitely should be tested more, but some of these scripts don't look so great. We should definitely be testing our scripts more. So you guys ready to see this for real? See this in our MetaMasks and everything? For you all, I'm going to recommend you actually do this on an Anvil chain instead of on a testnet. If you want to deploy to a testnet, you're free to do so. But remember, testnets are slow, they're annoying, and we should be able to do all of this with Anvil. So in our make file, if you copy pasted it with me, we do a toggle word wrap, there should be an Anvil target, there sure is. So we're gonna do this Anvil target here, make Anvil, we spun up a chain, create a new one, Let's create a new shell, and now we're gonna run make deploy on our mood NFT. Oh, we should do that. Deploy mood. This one we do have a script for forge script script slash deploy mood. What is it called? Deploy mood NFT. Deploy mood NFT. Mood NFT dot s dot soul. We're going to be calling deploy mood NFT network args. Great. And so now if we just run make deploy mood, should deploy, oh, did an error here. No such file or directory. And I'm getting this error here. <clears throat> I think it's because I don't have deploy mood in phony. Yep, I sure don't. Let's add deploy mood in here. So now it knows that that's a target. Let's try this again. 
Nope, still getting that error. Ah, it's script. Whoops, .s .sol. There we go. So now we can go ahead and deploy this. We deployed the moon NFT to here. And we could write a make file. Actually, I am going to write a make file to mint one. But I'm just going to use cast. So I'm going to recommend you guys do this on the Anvil chain. Let's go ahead and get our Anvil chain set up. Let's go to our MetaMask. Let's go ahead and do add network. And we're just going to go ahead and reset our Anvil chain. The way we can do that is by using this make anvil target here. Now that we have a target, go ahead and like just edit this a little bit. 377, boom. You can change the currency to like go or something, save. Now that our anvil is up, we should reset the chain. Great, it looks like we do indeed have an address in here. Our account four, if you don't have an account four, we can just import one from one of these private keys, right? Just import a private key. So now that we have an Anvil chain, a fresh new Anvil chain, let's also go to accounts, settings, just to make sure, advanced, we'll do clear activity tab. Great, now that we have this here, we can do a make deploy mood, which should deploy to our Anvil chain. Oh, looks like we're, whoops, we need this. Let's try this again, make deploy mood. Okay, cool. We now have a contract address, mood NFT. What we can do is then copy this and use some cast. So we'll say cast send the contract address. We'll call mint NFT like this. This will mint us an NFT. Oh, we need to actually pass in our private key, dash dash private key, which we're going to use the private key from this account, which I already have mine here. Dash dash RPC URL is going to be our anvil RPC URL, which we can also find in the make file. Copy this. Paste it here. Kill me. Do account details, export private key, put in our password, copy the password. Do this cast send with a private key that actually has some money in it. Paste it in. And cool. We now have a transaction. And what we can finally do is we can grab this contract address on Anvil. Go to import NFTs, paste it in, add the token ID, hit add. And we have a mood NFT in here. Now let's flip it. So now we can do, we hit up, we'll do the same command, but we'll change the function that we're gonna call to, what, what's the flip flip function called? It's called flip mood. We're gonna call flip mood on token zero. This is how you do that. You put flip mood, you went to 256 as the input it takes with token zero. All the rest is the same. Looks like it's in here. And what we have to do for MetaMask to get this reflected though, is we need to copy this address again. We're gonna go ahead and click on this mood NFT, hit the little quotes here, remove NFT. And then we gotta re-add it, import NFTs, paste it in, token ID is still zero, hit add, and now it's sad. And we did it! We created an NFT 100% on chain. We deployed it to our own local network on Anvil. We showed it in our MetaMask and it is showing up correctly. And we could 100% deploy this to a testnet if we wanted to. We could deploy this to a mainnet if we wanted to. And we have just done amazing work learning about Fiji's to make sure our NFTs are 100% on chain and not centralized by using like a website or anything like that. Okay. So, all of you who are here learning about this, when you go make your NFTs, remember to try to keep these as decentralized as possible when you're storing that NFT metadata. Now I will point out, there are a couple other decentralized storage solutions out there where you can store your NFT metadata. Arweave is one of them, and Filecoin is another one. These are two of the most popular ones. There's a great site called nft.storage, which will help you actually deploy your NFT metadata onto Filecoin, onto this decentralized storage solution. So you don't have to just do SVGs on chain. You can also do actual images on decentralized storage solutions. If you want to learn more about Filecoin, I've got a video on it on my YouTube, just a quick eight minute video to explain Filecoin a little bit more. And if you go into this video in the description, there's a blog that teaches more about decentralized storage and some of the different solutions out there. It's a really interesting space and I'm expecting in the future decentralized storage to become more and more prevalent. And to explain a little bit more about Filecoin, we have a special guest, Ali, to give us some more information. Take it away. 
Hello world, I'm Ali. I'm a developer relations engineer at the Filecoin Foundation. And today I wanna to chat about our vision here at Protocol Labs and the Filecoin Foundation for a truly open and democratic internet and web and why we're building out some of the foundational tooling to enable that. This quote here is one I particularly like from Juan Benet, our founder, and it really encapsulates his vision and mission of what both Protocol Labs and Filecoin are aiming to achieve. So the access we have to data, as well as what uh, restraints we have on using it, depending on our geography, country, um, access or resources, are incredibly important parts of how equal we are in today's society and world. And it's also one of the reasons I went into tech originally, because of just how fundamentally innovative and technological advancement can change and improve our human lives. But I probably don't have to tell you that if you're watching this video. But anyway, I just wanted to uh, show you a bit of background there. But as anyone that's played in the tech ecosystem would know, data is an absolutely essential part of our day, not just our daily lives, but also the tech stack. So it's also a super fast growing field in Web3 and one of the fundamental necessities of the decentralized web stack. So particularly when a majority of our data is held by like these centralized monopolies in the Web2 world. Um, but the problem is most blockchains are not really built to accommodate internet scale data onboarding. And that's just due to the inherent decentralized ledger properties of blockchain tech, which are also amazing, but it makes for a fundamentally expensive data storage. So um, much like the DeFi movement is aiming to democratize the financial industry and inject more trust and confidence into it, our Protocol Labs is trying to democratize this data uh, and internet by building out kind of a purpose-built distributed network for data. So Protocol's first la uh, project was IPFS, a peer-to-peer -peer protocol that uses content addressing rather than location addressing, and which I've got no doubt that you've probably heard all about from Patrick here already. Uh, IPFS, however, has no mechanisms for storing data with any permanence or reliability guarantees. Uh, so this is where Filecoin comes in. The launch of Filecoin in uh, 2020 uh, as a data storage blockchain, an internet scale data storage blockchain, was the first pillar of decentralizing the data infrastructure for the internet. We've since recently launched FVM, an EVM compatible layer one for Filecoin, so it enables smart contract functionality on chain and brings these new cap capabilities to the network and some like really cool ones which aren't available in just any other EVM network because we're also dealing with a data storage blockchain in Filecoin. So it enables kind of order renewal of Filecoin data deal making, it enables tokenization of data sets uh, really excitingly and kicking off the possibility of data DAOs as well as you know, DeFi for specific use cases like lending and staking of Filecoin, which is really helpful for Filecoin storage providers, which are required to put up collateral to store data on Filecoin. Uh, and there's many more use cases that I encourage you to check out in the docs as well. Uh, so we're also now adding on to those capabilities and working on bringing both L2 and computation over data layers to Filecoin with projects like IPC and Bakuya. So we're aiming to truly build out like the full infrastructure for a robust computations over all the useful data that's stored in Filecoin much like the Web2 already has, but we want to do it in this distributed way that allows us to own our own data. So uh, IPC, which is or it called, uh, which is Interplanetary Consensus Project, provides L2 capability by acting as a framework to enable on-demand horizontal scalability of Filecoin. Uh, so you can deploy subnets or self-governing chains that can spawn their own state, validate messages in parallel, and seamlessly interact with any network in the hierarchy, as well as roll up to the Filecoin root network. Really exciting project, encourage you to check that one out. Uh, secondly, Bakuyao is a peer-to-peer -peer verifiable compute network that enables complex computation over data. And we have so much amazing data stored in Filecoin that we want to be able to do this. Uh, so this computation over data brings like this rich layer of data processing uh, like ML or AI computations to the Filecoin network. And you could see this like collaborating with things like DataDAO to really enable these really robust uh, Web3 applications. Um, and since Patrick only gave me three minutes, I'm going to leave you with a quick visual of some useful tools in the ecosystem here. Feel free to join our Slack, check out the docs or get in touch with me if you're interested in knowing more about the network and how it works though. Otherwise, 
go and deploy a smart contract to FBM and play around with the tech. Even if you didn't like smart contracts, try out some of our uh, storage helpers like web3.storage or nft.storage, which you can use directly from uh, your front end as well. Alrighty, thank you so much everyone uh, and happy learning. All right, this is phenomenal. You have deployed an NFT, possibly to a test net, hopefully at least to your own local Anvil net. We've learned a ton about IPFS, SVGs. We've learned a little bit about decentralized storage solutions. The only thing we haven't covered is what the heck is this ABI.encode pack stuff? You, we've been using it this entire course, and I don't know what it does. Well, guess what? It's time for us to explain that to you. Let's jump back into Remix and we'll explain it. Remember, all the code that we're gonna be working with can be found in SRC, Sublesson, right in here. So, and you can find all the images that we're about to show you in here as well. So from a really, really high level, this is basically how you concatenate strings. Right, this is how you combine strings together. And we're gonna jump over the remix to actually explore this ABI.encode pact and this ABI encoding stuff a little bit more. Now, the section that we're about to go through is definitely advanced, and we're gonna be going over some really low level stuff and how Solidity works behind the scenes, how the binary works, and this thing called opcodes, and all this crazy low level, tricky, difficult things to understand. If you want to move past this section, there are timestamps in the GitHub repo to help you move past this. However, I do encourage you to at least try to absorb most of this material. If you don't understand it the first time, that's 100% okay. This is more advanced anyways. For most of your basic projects, you won't really need this information. It's only later on, once you get more advanced, that knowing all this is really going to make you a phenomenal Solidity developer. And when you approach this section, when you approach this sub lesson on EVM opcodes and coding and calling, just know that if you don't 100% understand it the first time, that is okay. If you want to watch this section a couple times, fantastic. So if you want to jump over to Remix and follow along, let's do it. Now in our contract section, let's go ahead and create a new file. We're going to call it encoding.soul. And remember, all the code that we're going to be going with in here is going to be in this sub lesson folder of the Hardhat NFT FCC. And all the code we're going to be working with is going to be in this encoding.soul. And then in a little bit, we're going to work on this call anything.soul. So we're in this encoding.soul. And let's just make our basic code here. So we'll say SPDX license identifier MIT pragma solidity caret 0.8.7 like that. We'll do contract encoding. Boom compile or command S or control S great things are looking good. Now remember the whole purpose for this is to first understand what's going on here and more about this ABI.encode packed stuff. So let's first just write a function that shows us wrapping ABI.encode packed with some strings and wrapping it around a string is going to return a string. So we could do function combine strings or concatenate strings. This will be a public pure since we're not going to be reading any storage, we'll say returns string memory, and we'll say return string abi.encode packed. Hi, mom, comma, let's put space in here. Miss you, like so. So we need another parenthesis here. Okay, great. Now let's go ahead and deploy this. We'll stay on a JavaScript VM. We'll deploy encoding, coding.sol, and we'll come down here. We'll click combine strings and we get that whole string output. Hi, mom, miss you. So what we're doing here is we're encoding hi, mom, miss you together into its bytes form because abi.encode packed returns a bytes object and we are typecasting it by wrapping it in the string thing to be a string. And Solidity says, okay, yeah, bytes to a string. That's fine. That totally works. And this abi.encode packed, one of these globally available methods and units. And actually in Solidity, there's a whole bunch of these. There's this Solidity cheat sheet, and there's gonna be a link to this in the GitHub repo as well, that has a whole bunch of operators and it has a whole bunch of these global variables and methods. You can see if we look in here, we look for abi.encode packed, we see abi.encode packed right here. 
we scroll down, we'll see some more that we're familiar with as well. Like for example, message.sender, sender of the message, message.value. There's a whole bunch of other globally available methods and variables that we can use when we're coding our stuff. Now, I will say though, in 0.8.12 plus, you can actually do string.concat, you know, string A, comma, string B, if you want to, instead of doing this ABI.encode pact, but I still wanted to show you the ABI.encode pact because it's a great segue into all this ABI stuff that we're about to go over. But let's focus on this encode pact thing. So what is actually going on here? Well, before we dive deeper into this encode pact, let's understand a little bit more about what happens when we send a transaction. So when we compile our code, and again, all these pictures are going to be in the GitHub repo. Remember back to ethers.js, we had those two files. We got a .abi file and a .bin or .binary. Back in our ether simple storage, when we ran yarn compile, the two main files that we got were this simple storage.abi, which was this, you know, th this ABI thing that we've become familiar with. And then the simple storage.bin, which is the binary, which is a whole bunch of just numbers and letters and stuff we didn't understand. And you can see that in Remix too. Like if we were to compile this, you go to compilation details, you get a whole bunch of stuff in here, right? You can see the ABI in here, which this is kind of like a different way of viewing that ABI. We also get this bytecode bit and it's this object that has the same stuff that has like those random numbers and letters, but this is actually the binary. This is actually what's getting put on the blockchain. It's this binary, it's this low level stuff. Now, when we actually send these contracts to the blockchain, we're sending, like I said, we're sending this binary thing. That's exactly what we're sending to the blockchain. And remember how, again, back in our ethers project, we saw what is a transaction, right? A transaction has a nonce, it has a gas price, gas limit, two value data. We kind of skimped over the VRS a little bit because that's kind of that mathy component of the transaction signature. But again, back in our ethers project, we did this as well, right, in our deploy script ended up sending a transaction ourselves using just ethers. We passed a nonce, a gas price, gas limit, two value. Data was this massive thing to deploy our contract and then also the chain ID. We didn't work with the VR and S because ethers does that for us, but there's also this VR S component that we, we don't bother to look at. When we send a transaction that actually creates a contract, the two is gonna be empty. We're not gonna send this contract deployment to any address but the data of this is gonna have the contract initialization code and contract bytecode, right? So when we compile it, we, we get all this code, like how do you initialize the contract and then what the contract actually looks like. So if you look at any of the contracts that you deployed, for example, I'm gonna look at our raffle that we deployed. If you go to the transactions of your contract, we can see create raffle, right? Let's go to that transaction. If we go down and click to see more in the Etherscan, we can see this input data thing. And once again, it's got all this random garbled numbers and letters. This is that binary data of the contract initialization code and the contract bytecode, right? What we send in our transaction is this data thing. We send this, this weird bunch of jarbled nonsense. Now we're gonna head back to Remix. And I'm just gonna leave this as comments in here. In the encoding.soul and the GitHub repo, there is a ton of comments in here explaining exactly what I'm explaining. So if you wanna follow along there, you can as well. But now in order for the blockchain to understand, okay, what do these numbers and letters even mean? You need a special reader. Ethereum or the blockchain needs to be able to read all this stuff. It needs to be able to map all these random numbers and letters to what they actually do. How does Ethereum or Polygon or Avalanche know that all this nonsense is basically telling it to make a contract? You kind of think of it as saying like, take off your coat. The only reason that we as human beings understand what take off your coat means is that we understand English. We're all reading English. For Solidity and for blockchains, instead of English, they read these numbers and letters kind of like words. Just instead of take off your coat, it's like deploy contract and the contract does X, X, Y, Z and all this random stuff. So this bytecode represents the low level computer instructions to make our contract happen. And all these numbers and letters represent kind of an alphabet, just like how take off your coat is an alphabet. And when you combine them like this, it makes something that to us makes sense. You can kind of think of the alphabet for these as what's called opcodes. If you go to create a new tab, if you go to evm.codes, 
we'll get to this place where it just has a list of all these instructions. On the left side, you can see this thing called opcode, and then you can see name. So this opcode section is saying, hey, if you see a zero zero in this bytecode, that zero zero represents this opcode stop, which does what? Which halts execution. If you see a zero one, you're gonna do some addition stuff. A zero two is multiply. There are all these opcodes that are kind of like the alphabet or the language of this binary stuff, right? And they go all the way down to, to FF self-destruct. These opcodes also have, and that's what this is reading, right? So if we look at our transaction here, and your, yours might be a little bit different, 061 says, okay, the first thing we want you to do is the 061 opcode. And if we go to EVM opcodes, we look up for 61, it's saying push to, place two byte item on the stack. That's exactly how it's reading this. Any language that can compile down to this opcode stuff, down to this specific set of, of Ethereum opcodes or EVM opcodes, is what's known as the EVM, the Ethereum Virtual Machine. So being able to read these opcodes is sometimes abstractly called the EVM, the Ethereum Virtual Machine. The EVM basically represents all the instructions a computer must be able to read for it to interact with Ethereum or Ethereum-like applications. And this is why so many blockchains all work with Solidity, because Solidity compiles down to this bytecode here and Polygon Avalanche, Arbitrum, Ethereum, they all compile down to the exact same type of binary and they all have the exact same readers. Now, why are we telling you all this stuff? You might be saying, hey, Patrick, this is cool and all, but it looks like ABI.encodePact, all that does is concatenate strings. ABI.encodePact can do actually way more. And if we look at these global variables, ABI.encodePact is like, what, the third one down the list? Because it's a non-standard way to encode stuff to this binary stuff that we just talked about. We can actually encode pretty much anything we want to being in this binary format, basically. And let's take a look at, at encoding something. So let's create a function called encode number. And this will be a public pure function since we're not going to read any states and we'll say returns a bytes memory. We're gonna have this function return a bytes object. We're gonna have it return the what this number is gonna look like, but in binary. So we'll say bytes memory number equals abi.encode one, and then return number. So we're gonna encode number down to its ABI or its binary format. So I know a lot of the times when we say, oh, what's the ABI, what's the ABI, right? Previously, we say, oh, the ABI is, is this thing, right? It's, it's, it's all these inputs and outputs. This is kind of the human readable version of the ABI. But again, the ABI is the application binary interface. We want to encode our numbers down to it's basically it's, it's binary. This ABI.encode is gonna be a little different than like the ABI that you see when you're looking at compilation details. This is technically like the ABI, it technically is how to interact with this contract. However, it's not the actual binary version of it. So we're saying, okay, uh, encode this number one down to its binary version so that our contracts can interact with it in a way that they understand. So we're just saying, okay, cool, that number one, let's make you machine readable. And if we go, we compile this and we deploy this, right? Let's delete that, that old contract. We deploy this. We now have combined strings and encode number. If we click it, we get this big hex thing. This is how the computer is gonna understand the number one. Now we can encode pretty much anything, actually. We could encode a string. So we'll say function encode string. We'll make this a public pure as well. It'll return bytes memory because we want to give it that binary stuff or that bytes stuff and we'll say bytes memory some string equals abi.encode some string and then return some string now let's compile that we'll delete our old contract deploy that encode string we get this big 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 object here and this is the binary now you'll notice something here there's a ton of zeros and those zeros take up space, right? That's a lot of space for the computer to take up, even though they're not really doing anything. They're just kind of taking up space. So Solidity also comes with this ABI.encode pact, which performs pact encoding of the given arguments. And you can read more about it in the Solidity docs if you want. And this is called the non-standard pact mode. And it does the same encoding, 
with some stipulations. Types shorter than 32 bytes are concatenated directly without padding or sign extension. Dynamic types are encoded in place and without the length. Array elements are padded, but still encoded in place. You can kind of think of encode packed as sort of like a compressor, right? It's the encode function, but it compresses stuff. If we wanted to encode some string, but we wanted to save space and we didn't need the perfect low level binary of it, we could do function encode string packed, make this a public pure and have it return a bytes memory. And we could say bytes memory, some string equals abi.encode packed. Once again, some string. And so we're doing encode packed instead of encode. And we'll return some string here. We'll compile this and we'll see the difference, right? We'll compile, we'll delete our old one, we'll deploy this. Now we have encode string, which again, that's what encode string is going to give us. And we have encode string packed, which returns us this much, much smaller bytes object here. So you see the size difference. If we're trying to save gas, encode string packed is going to be a way for us to save a lot more gas. Now, abi.encode packed is actually really similar to something that we've done before which is typecasting. If we did function encode string bytes, public pure returns bytes memory, bytes memory some string equals bytes some string, turn some string. These two are gonna look nearly identical, right? So if we compile, we'll delete our old contract, we'll deploy this encode string bytes, which gives us this, and encode string packed using the ABI to encode packed, they give us the exact same output, whereas encode string still gives us this big piece. So the two of these get the same result, but behind the scenes, they're doing something a little bit different. And I'm not going to go over exactly what that is, but uh, I've left a link inside of the code here if you want to learn more, which is exactly what we're doing in our NFT, right? We're doing ABI to encode packed. We're combining two strings by putting them together. We're encoding them to their bytes implementation to their packed bytes implementation. And then we're just typecasting them back from bytes to string. And that's how we concatenate them. Now at this point, you might be thinking, okay, cool, great, Patrick, I'm all set. I understand this. I'm happy to go back to my project. And if you wanna do that, absolutely go for it and skip over this section. But some other views might be going, okay, Patrick, this is seems pretty cool, but I'm sure this encode packed and this encode function aren't just here to concatenate strings. They probably have some other function. What, what do they actually do? Well, if that's what you're asking, I'm glad you ask and I'm glad you're curious because we're going to find out. Now, not only can you encode stuff like strings and numbers and really anything, but you can decode stuff. So I could say function decode string public here returns string memory, string memory, some string equals ABI dot decode this is going to take a couple parameters. So if we look in the docs here, abi.decode, it takes as a first argument, the encoded data, and then it takes a tuple. You can kind of think of it as a list, but not quite a list, a set of types to decode this into, and it returns the number of parameters that you gave it. So we might want to say this string memory, some string, let's give it as input, this encode string function, the result of this encode string function, right? Which again, is going to be this big thing. So this is kind of equivalent to sticking this massive thing in here, but we're just not going to stick the massive thing in there because that's really big. So we're going to say, let's decode the result of encode string and let's decode it into a string because we need to tell solidity, Hey, we're going to decode this, but it, it doesn't know what to decode it into. It does, it's like, okay, cool. I can decode this, but like, what, what do you want me to do with it? And we say, oh, oh, this is a string. So decode it into a string. And then we can do return some string. Now, once again, we deploy that old, con or we delete the last contract. We deploy this new one. So encode string, encode string, where is encode string? Encode string returns this massive thing. As a human being, we're like, God, uh, I, I can't read that. Computers can read that, but we can't really read that. So we say, okay, let's decode that back into its string form. We hit decode string and we get back some string. And now we can actually multi encode and multi and decode, right? We can encode as much stuff as we want. So I can say function multi encode public pure returns bytes memory. We're going to encode a couple things. We'll say bytes memory, some string equals ABI dot encode 
some string, comma, it's bigger. So we're going to encode two strings here. We're going to encode some string, and it's bigger. So we have two strings we're going to encode. And we'll return some string, even though it's, you know, bytes. And then we can actually multi-decode. So we'll say function multi-decode. This will be a public pure. Returns, we'll say it returns two strings, string memory and string memory. And instead of doing string memory sum string equals ABI decode, we'll say string memory sum string, comma, string memory some other string. So we're going to get two returns equals ABI dot decode. Let's decode this multi encode result, which is the doubly encoded strings into a string and another string. And then we'll return both of these or some string. There we go. And then we'll return some string and then some other string. I need a semicolon here. So now when we deploy this, let's close this out, deploy this new one. Right, we now have this multi encode, which gives us this even bigger bytes object, right? Because this is two strings encoded. And now if we hit multi decode, take a second, what do you think it's going to put out output? Let's go ahead and hit it. Now it's going to give us two strings, right? It's going to give these two strings, some string, it's bigger. So we can tell solidity to encode a bunch of stuff. And then we can even decode it by telling it, okay, this big object here, it's two strings combined and then we decode it. Now you can even multi encode with that encode packed thing, right? We could do function multi encode packed public pure returns bytes memory and then bytes memory some string equals abi dot encode packed some string comma it's bigger and then return some string. We could do this, right? But this is going to give us the packed version of these two strings. So the decoding actually isn't going to work on this because this is packed encoding. So if we tried to do, and I'm going to say this doesn't work. We tried to do function multi decode packed public pure returns string memory, string memory, some string equals ABI dot decode multi encode packed and then in a string kind of exactly what we did above to if we do return some string, what do you think is going to happen? Well, let's, uh, let's try it. Delete the old contract, deploy a new one. We'll do multi decode packed, multi encode, multi decode packed. And we actually just get an error. Solidity basically goes, um, yeah, this looks like it's packed. I don't know how to decode that. But instead, what we can do is we can do function more T string cast packed, make this a public pure returns string memory, string memory, some string equals string multi encode packed return some string. This one will work, right? Because again, this packed encoding is kind of similar to just typecasting. So we'll compile, we'll redeploy multi string cast packed. We get some string, it's bigger, right? And we don't have a space here, but we should have put a space in there. Now that we've learned more about this in ABI.encode and decoding, and we know that, okay, this is what the computer, this is what Ethereum, this is what the EVM or any EVM compatible chain is looking for. It's looking for this byte code. It's looking for this this binary stuff. And we just learned a little bit more about how to encode different variables into the binary, into that data bit. Well, uh, what do we do now? Now, since we know that our transactions are just going to be compiled down to this binary stuff, what we can do then is we could actually populate this data value of our transactions ourselves with the binary the code is going to use. So here's our transaction for a contract deployment. The data field of the contract deployment is going to be all that binary code of the contract. For a function call, the data piece is going to be what to send to the address, what data, what function to call on the two address. Let's look at another one of our transactions on Etherscan, right? On one of our contracts. You don't have to. I'm going to look at enter raffle from a previous section. And if we select down, we look at input data, it says function enter raffle method ID. But if we look at the original, this is what's getting sent in the data field. 
It's this binary. It's this hex. It's this weird low-level bytes thing. This is how the Ethereum blockchain or the or whatever EVM chain you're working with knows which function to call. It translates this into a function. And we can do the exact same thing and call these functions ourselves. So what we can actually do with this crazy newfound data encoding stuff, what we can actually do is send the data field of a transaction ourself in a transaction call. Remember back in this Ethers throwback where the, this data thing was the contract creation code? Well, instead, we could populate this data thing with our function call code, the exact function that we want to call in the binary in the hex edition. Now, you might be thinking, oh, well, why would I do that? I can always just use the, the interface, the ABI, all that stuff. Well, maybe you don't have that. Maybe all you have is the function name. Maybe all you have is the parameters you want to send. Or maybe you want to make your code be able to send arbitrary functions or make arbitrary calls or do random, really advanced stuff, right? That's where sending our function calls directly by populating this data field is going to be incredibly important. So remember, I said you're always going to need the ABI and the contract address to send a function. Now, when I said you always need the ABI, originally we were kind of talking about this thing, this big, this big thing, which is cool, which is the ABI, but this is like the human readable ABI. You can also do it with the not human readable ABI. And additionally, you don't need all this stuff. You can really use just the name of a function and then the input types to send a function call. So the question is then, okay, how do we send, how do we send transactions that call functions with just the data field populated? And then the next question is, how do we populate the data field? What do we populate the data field with to, to make one of these function calls? And then how do we send these transactions? Solidity actually has some more low level keywords, namely static call and call. We actually, we've used call in the past before. Does this code look at all familiar to you? Well, it should, because this is, we use a similar setup in our fulfill random words for our lottery, right? We sent money doing this recent winner dot call, right? Recent winner was the address of the recent winner and we did dot call. And then we had this weird stuff in this brackets here and then nothing in the parentheses. So we did actually, essentially, we used this call keyword previously, but we didn't really tell you what it did. So call is how we can call functions to change the state of the blockchain. Static call is basically how at a low level we call our view or pure functions, right? Static call is going to be like, okay, don't change the state of the blockchain with this one. Just give us the return value. So this is kind of similar to like a view or a pure function at, at low level. There's also a send word, but like basically forget about it. <laughs> We're just going to be working with call and static call. And, you know, later on, we'll learn about another one called delegate call, but don't worry about that for now. Recent winner dot call like this in these little squiggly brackets, we said, okay, we updated the value directly of our transaction in solidity. So which again, if we had these transaction fields and we just directly updated value in these little brackets, right? We can also directly update gas limited and gas price in these little brackets if we wanted to as well. And in here, these parentheses is where we're going to stick our data. Since all we wanted to do with our withdraw function previously was send money, we said, OK, send money, change the value that we're going to send, but don't pass any data. Keep that data bit empty, which is why, again, remember how we hit this button before, right? And we had call data be empty. That's the, essentially running this command with call data be empty, with this section be empty, and then just updating the value that we sent with the transaction. And so it's this section that we can use to populate data to actually call specific functions. I'm going to put a whole bunch more comments here. So in our squiggly brackets, we're able to pass specific fields of a transaction like value. And in our parentheses, we're able to pass data in order to call a specific function. But in here, there's no function to call since we were just sending Ethereum. If we want to call a function or send any data, we can do this in the parentheses. Oh, and I think I spelled that wrong. Now, we've learned a ton here. So let's do a quick refresher of what we just learned. And then we're going to actually learn how we can call any function just by using this syntax here. What we learned from really high level, if we want to combine strings, we can do abi.encode packed and then typecast it to a string. And in newer versions of Solidity, you can do you can do string.concat, you know, hi mom, comma, 
miss you. In newer versions of Solidity, this works as well, but not in older versions of Solidity. Then we learned a lot about some low level stuff. We learned, okay, when we compile our contracts, we get an ABI file and this weird binary thing. It's that numbers and letters stuff that gets, when we deploy a contract, that gets sent in the data field of our contract creation transaction. So for contract creations, the data is populated with that binary code. For function calls, is going to define which functions to call and with what parameters. And this is what we're going to go over next. Now we learned that we can actually encode stuff into this binary, into this low level code. And any program, any process that can read this low level stuff and execute accordingly, read this EVM stuff, read the specific binary that Ethereum has specified or the EVM has specified is considered EVM compatible. We can encode numbers. We can encode strings. We can encode pretty much anything we want to encode. To save space, we do encode packed. We can decode stuff that we've encoded, but we can't decode stuff that we encode packed. We can multi-encode stuff and then multi-decode stuff. And then finally, we can use this call function and add data in here to make any call that we want to any smart contract. And this is what we're going to learn next. All right, so now's a great time to take a break because we just learned some really difficult concepts. And like I said, if you don't get it the first time, that is okay. All right, welcome back. Now that we've learned about this encoding stuff, let's learn how we can populate this parentheses, this data field, so we can call any function and we can do essentially what the blockchain is gonna do at the low level. We can work with just that binary. We can work with just that bytes. We can work with that hex to interact with our smart contracts. So let's create a new file and we're gonna call it call anything dot soul. Uh, start off with SPDX license identifier MIT and let's talk about this. Now in order to call, now in order to call a function using only the data field of the call, we need to encode the function name and the parameters that we wanna add, right? Cause when we call a function, we call the function name and we call the parameters. So we need to encode these down to the binary level so that the EVM or these Ethereum based smart contracts, the Solidity stuff can understand what's actually going on. In order to do this, we're going to need to work with two concepts to encode the function name so that the EVM or Solidity can understand it. We actually have to grab something called the function selector. Now the function selector is going to be the first four bytes of the function signature and the function signature it's just going to be a string which defines the function name and parameter. Now, what does this actually mean? Well, if we have a transfer function, this right here is known as the function signature. So the function name is going to be transfer and it's going to take an address and a U256 as its inputs. If we encode this transfer function and then we take the first four bytes of it, we get this, which refers to the function selector. So that's how Solidity knows. So in the byte code, in the binary code, this function selector is how Solidity knows, oh, they're talking about the transfer function. They want me to call the transfer function. And this is one of the first things that we need to use call to call any function that we want. We need to get the function selector and we can get it a number of different ways. But one of the ways is by encoding the function signature and grabbing the first four bytes. So we'll create this contract. We'll do pragma Solidity 0.8.7, say contract, call anything. And we'll give this two storage variables, we'll give this two storage variables an address public s underscore some amount or some address, and then u and 256 public s underscore amount. And then we'll create a function called transfer function transfer. Now, normally in here, we would actually do like transfer for like an ERC 20 transfer, but we're just going to do address some address and then u and 256 amount amount here. We'll make this a public function. And then all we'll do is we'll set s sum address equals sum address, and then s amount equals amount. So here's going to be the function that we're going to work with. And the function selector for that function is this. The function signature is this. So it takes an address, sum address, amount that gets boiled down to the function selector and the function signature. And of course, in our bytecode, there's going to be some code saying, OK, here's what this function does, blah, blah, blah. So we can actually even write a function to get that function selector. So we can say function get selector and I'm going to say get selector one because I'm going to show you a few ways to get the function selector. We'll make this a public pure and we'll have this return a bytes for selector. We could say selector equals 
bytes four, and then we hash with the check 256 of the bytes of that signature, which is transfer, and it takes an address and a uint 256. All right, if we compile this and then we run it, oh, let's get rid of our old contract, deploy, make sure we're on call anything if you have the other one up. And here now we have a couple of things. If we hit get selector one, we get this OX A905 blah, blah, blah. Right, and that's the same as the example I just gave. So this right here tells Solidity, tells our smart contract that, okay, when we make a call to this contract, if you see this in the function data, this is referring to our transfer function with an address and a UN256 as input parameter. So we see address UN256, our function knows to execute this data here. Great, and then of course, S amount and S address are zeros. Now, while we're here, we can also see, okay, what happens if we call the transfer function? Right, it takes an address and an amount. So let's just give it its own address for an address and we'll do 777 for an amount. If we hit transfer, we have the log up, right? We'll get a little check mark here saying success. Now, if we hit S amount, we'll get 777 and then the address will be the same, right? So that's us directly calling transfer. When we directly call transfer, we're, we're basically saying, hey, grab this function selector and then do some other stuff, which we'll, we'll tell you the other stuff in a minute. Now we have the function selector. Okay, great. What else do we need? We also now need the parameters we want to add. So we're going to need to encode those parameters with our function selector. So what we're going to do is we're going to say function get data to call transfer. And in here, we're just going to have this get data to call transfer. We're going to have it take these input parameters and we're going to encode these to work with our function selector. So we're going to say address some address. 256 amount, public pure returns, bytes memory. And then we can return and use one of those ABI encodings from the cheat sheet. Now, so far we've just been doing ABI encode for a lot of our encoding. So it's, since we have the function selector, we can actually do ABI.encode with selector. This ABI encodes the given arguments starting from the second and prepends the given four byte selector. When we do encode with selector, we're just sticking our selector onto the data that we're going to give it. So we're going to do return abi.encode with selector, and we're going to pass it the result of get selector one, and then we're going to give it some address and amount. So what this is going to do, it's going to give us all the data that we need to put in that data field of our transaction to send to this contract to let this contract know, hey, go use the transfer function, pass in some address and then an amount. And then if we compile this, we run it, let's delete our old contract, we'll deploy it. We now get a new function called get data to call and transfer. We'll just pass, you know, we'll just pass this contract's address and then we'll also do 777 again. And so this thing right here is what we're gonna put into the data field of our transaction in order for us to call transfer from anywhere. So this is the bytes, this is the binary encoded data of, hey, call the transfer function with this address that we specified with, you know, 777 amount. So what we can do once we have all this, we can actually call our transfer function without even having to directly call it. So what we can do is we can say function, call transfer function directly, or I guess with, Binary might be a better title, but you get the gist. We'll say address, some address, UN 256 amount. So we'll make this a public function. And we'll have a returns, a bytes four, and a bool. You'll see why in a minute. And we'll do that same call thing that we did to send our raffle money. So what we'll do is before we did recent winner.call, right? We're going to do some address. And then for us, we're going to do address this dot call and then we're saying this contracts address which we could put any address here address dot call and we're going to call the encoded data that points us to the transfer function with some parameters so we're going to do address this dot call and we could just do get data to call transfer some address amount right we could do it like this or we could do it kind of the raw way we could do abi dot encode with selector get selector one comma some address oops, comma amount and actually there's no semicolon there sorry 
So those are going to be the same. And this dot call thing, right, it's going to return exactly what we saw before. It's going to return a bool success. So whether or not the transaction was successful, and then bytes memory return data, which is going to be, you know, whatever the call returns. So right, and this is where we put like require success, right? But for us, we're just going to return bytes four, bytes four of return data, and then success. So we're just going to return the first four bytes of whatever data we get returned. And then we're going to return whether this was successful or not. So this function is going to have us directly call tr the transfer function by passing these parameters without us having to do like contract dot transfer or or transfer or whatever, right? And you could do this across multiple contracts across different contracts, just by changing the address that you call on. So let's go ahead and compile this. We'll run this now. We'll delete our old contract. We'll deploy call anything. Now, if we, if we were, so right now, S amount and S sum address are both zero. Now, if we do call transfer function directly and we'll pass in this one's address and then we'll do 777. Now, if we pull up the logs, we hit this, we're going to get this transaction response here. But if we scroll down, we'll be able to see the decoded output which is a bytes four of just a bunch of zeros, right? Because our transfer doesn't actually return anything. So it's just gonna be a whole bunch of zeros. And then our Boolean true, which means it was successful. So since it was successful, these two should have changed based off of that. So let's go ahead and try them out. And we do indeed see that they're changed. So we have just directly called this transfer function without having to call the transfer function itself. We can also do encode with signature instead of selector. So if we go to our cheat sheet, there's also this encode with signature down here, which takes the string memory signature and it's equivalent to doing abi.encode with selector, bytes for, kakak, bytes, you know, signature. It's it's equivalent to doing exactly what we did up here, but it does this step for us. So we could copy this whole thing, paste it down here, right? And we could do, instead of encode with selector, we could do encode with signature, the function signature. And then we'll copy our function signature from up here, paste it in here, compile, we ran into a compilation error. Oh, these are the same uh, call transfer function directly sig, we'll call it that. Compile, delete our old contract, deploy. Now these two are both zeros again. Now if we copy the contract address, we do call contract, call transfer function directly sig, we paste that in here, we do 777. We call it, then we check these, we can see that that does the exact same thing. So this is abi.encode with signature. This is abi.encode selector. Encode with signature just turns this into the selector for us. That's all. Up here, we just, we encoded the selector ourselves. Now there are a whole bunch of different ways to get the selectors and I'm not, we're not gonna code these out ourselves. I'm just gonna say a bunch of different ways to get selector. And who knows why, why you might want to use one of these other reasons, right? There's, there's a ton of reasons why you might want to get the selector a different way. And here's some. Now, in this video, we're not going to explain or go over all these different, all these different function selector getting methods. But if you go through them in the GitHub repo associated with this course, they all have a ton of commas to explain what they're doing. What we are going to show you, though, is actually how two contracts can interact with each other without actually having all the code for each contract. So we're going to make a second contract that has all this binary, this bytes information to call the transfer function on a different contract. And we're going to show you how that can work. Uh, this is just another contract that I made called call function without contract. Actually down here, we're going to call the transfer function just by using the address and the function selector signature and stuff. We're going to update these storage variables in our call anything contract from another contract just by doing this binary calling, if you will. All right, so let's compile. Let's go to deploy. We can actually leave this up, right? We can leave this up is let's deploy our call function without contract. We'll pass it as an input parameter, the call anything contract address. We'll deploy it. Now in here, I can call the transfer function directly by, you know, maybe I'll switch it to this, this contract address, this new contract address, and we'll give it a new number of one, two, three, right? And we'll click call transfer function. And then when we go back up here, we see that this has indeed been updated. Now doing this call stuff is considered low level. 
And it's a best practice to try to avoid it when you can. So if you can import an interface, it's much better to do it like that because you're gonna have the compiler on your side. You're gonna be able to check to see if your types are matching and all this other stuff. So usually doing these low level calls, some security auditor checkers might say, hey, like uh, this spooks me out a little bit, you, you doing this low level stuff. But with that being said, you have just learned a ton about lower level solidity. This is some really advanced stuff. And like I said, if this was hard, if you're kind of confused here, don't worry, you can always come back to this section and try it again when you're a little bit more advanced. If you wanna try to understand it all now, awesome, absolutely. We've left some links in the GitHub repo associated with this lesson that I definitely recommend you check out. One of the ones you should definitely check out is gonna be this Deconstructing Solidity by Open Zeppelin. It really breaks down exactly what's going on behind the scenes of a contract. If you wanna learn more about op codes, about low level stuff, definitely give this a read. It is a phenomenal read. So essentially, it breaks down a little bit more than what we went over here. Uh, a couple other videos as well, and I've left a whole bunch of links in here too. Now we can finally go back to what we were talking about with MetaMask and that decoding the transaction data and all this weird stuff. If we come to a contract address, and this is WETH, this is a contract that wraps native ETH and turns it into an ERC-20 token. But if we come to a contract, right, we hit write contract, let's connect to Web3, sure. You don't have to actually do this, just feel free to follow along with me. We're gonna open up our MetaMask, let's go to Sepolia here. I'm gonna connect here, okay, cool. And we want it to call transfer from, right? And let's just add some stuff in here. Let's do source, address, and you know, this. This is probably won't go through because I don't have any width right now, but let's just hit right, right? This transaction's MetaMask is probably gonna be like, hey, this is gonna fail, or whatever. Yeah, sure, whatever. But when we get a MetaMask transaction that pops up, if we scroll over to the hex, we scroll down, we can now actually start to understand what is going on here. And this is what we always wanna make sure is actually correct when we're working with our MetaMask and when we're dealing with all this. So what we can do is we can actually copy this whole thing and pull up our terminal here. I'm just gonna make this nice and big here. What we can do is we can do cast dash dash help. We hit cast help and we scroll all the way up. There's a command in here called call data decode. Decode ABI encoded input data. So if we do cast dash dash call data decode, like this, we can see we need to pass in a SIG and the call data. So luckily for this transaction, our MetaMask was smart enough to know that we're calling the transfer from function. But sometimes it's actually not gonna be smart enough to figure this out. So that's where we are gonna need to match what we expect this to be calling to what, to what it's actually calling, right? So first off, we are expecting this to be calling the transfer from function. So I can grab this function selector, which we just learned, come back here, I can do cast sig, and I'll pass, pass in here transfer from the whole function signature, which what? It takes a address, address, and a unit 256. So we'll do address, address 256. And we'll see that this is what the function selector should be. So I can say, okay, great, the two of these match. This is indeed calling the function selector that I want it to call. Okay, awesome. If it doesn't match, what can happen sometimes, again, we can go to something like the Sam CZ Sun signature database or open chain.xyz slash signatures, paste this in, hit search, and we can see that there's actually two different functions that have the same signature. One is transfer from, and one is gas price bit ether with an int 128. So what's interesting here is you can't have a function with the same function selector. So if I actually went into remix, let eat.org, let's actually create a new contract called conflicting.soul, right? And we'll do a little, little zoom in here. SPDX license identifier, my T, contract conflict. If I made a function called transfer from with an address U two fifty or address hi U and two fifty six hello U and two fifty six sup public like this, and then I also have a function function with this one gas price bit ether paste it in here gas price bit ether int one twenty eight sup public 
and I try to compile this, guess what's going to happen? Compile. Oh, that's pragma solidity 0 0.8.18. This should be an address too. And now I try to compile. If we scroll down, it'll say function signature hash collision for gas price bit ether. You can't have a contract in solidity where two functions have the same function selector. So in any case, we could be calling one of these two functions on our, this is where it's important to actually go through the contract code and say, hmm, okay, there could be a couple different function selectors here. Let's make sure it's the one that we expect, right? So in any case, so this is calling this transfer from function. If this contract has a gas bit, gas price bit ether, it might be calling that. But in any case, we know, so we could go through the code, right? We go through transfer from, okay, great. There's a transfer from function. That is indeed what we wanna call. Function selector's working, perfect, okay. So now that we've verified the function selector, we should also verify the rest of this stuff. So now that we know what the function selector is, and we know what the function signature is, we can take this whole hex here and go back into our terminal and use that call data decode. So we can say cast dash dash call data decode. And we can see what it what we need. We need the sig and the call data. So I'll hit up. The sig is going to be transfer from, and it takes an address, an address, and a uint two fifty six. Right. We can just double check that. Address, address, address. Uint two fifty six sure does. And we can paste in that call data and hit enter. And we can see what this call data stuff is using for input parameters to that function. So it's our address, our address, and then 1000. And then if that's what we expected, so let me reject this for now, go back to write. And that, and if that's what we wanted to call in this function, we would go ahead and put this through. This is especially important when we're using front ends, like for example, if I wanted to use Uniswap, right? Let's go ahead and connect here, the MetaMask. Yep, connect, looks good. Go away, go to, let's say if I was on ETH mainnet, I wanted to swap ETH for, so so I'm on a testnet here, so obviously nothing's showing up. But when I hit swap, if I was on a real network with real money, what I want to do then is do that same process of going through and checking to make sure that the transaction that it's sending is actually the one that I want it to be sending, right? So if we want to be absolutely sure of what our transactions are doing, we can first check the address. We can take these exact steps to say, I know exactly what transaction, I know exactly what function my transaction is calling. So we check the address to make sure that the contract is what we expect it to be. And then we can read the function of that contract that we want. We check the function selector that we're using so that it, it so that we know that it is indeed the function that we're calling. And then we decode the call data to check the parameters that we're sending. So this is how we can actually make sure our wallets are doing what we expect them to do. And you think, hey, Patrick, why doesn't our wallet just do this by default? And I agree, it should. At the moment, there's projects being worked on. One of them is Fire, where they get some of the transactions right, but more wallets are being created right now that actually decode these call datas by default. And I hope more of them show up so it's easier to be safe. We've seen people send transactions not checking every detail of the transaction. And sure enough, it was a malicious transaction, right? So you want to make sure you check the details of your transactions, especially when you're sending and working with a lot of money. Whew. Guess what? We just learned a ton this lesson. And you learned ways to be safer with your wallets, which is even more exciting. So let's do a quick recap of all the things we learned, because I know we learned a whole heck of a lot. So first off, we learned about what an NFT even is, right? And we created our own basic NFT, which had all the main functions that we needed. The token URI, which pointed the metadata, we had a mint NFT function and all of that. We stored our NFT on IPFS. We learned about the difference between IPF storing on IPFS, which is gonna be a little bit cheaper versus storing on versus storing our metadata on chain, which is gonna be a little bit more expensive, but it's gonna be a more decentralized version of our. We also briefly touched on Filecoin and Arweave, which are two decentralized storage platforms that we could alternatively use instead of IPFS, or instead of actually even storing on ETH mainnet. 
and just point to our Filecoin or our Arweave implementation. We didn't show you how to do that, but those are definitely resources for you to check out. We learned a couple more cheat codes in our scripts. We can actually read from files, and we were able to base64 encode our files to a data URI. We learned about base64 encoding as well, which is something cool in itself. We learned how to call anything, even if we don't have the interface. All we need is the function signature. We learned what this ABI.encode with selector finally is. We learned about function signatures, function selectors. We learned all about the different types of encoding and the different things that you can do to actually encode your data and what is really going on when we send transactions. And then finally, we learned exactly what's going on under the hood when we have a transaction. So we can even start viewing some transactions on our block explorer, scroll down to more details, and we can even see what input data people have sent with their transactions. So if I go to one of my accounts and I select one of my previous transactions, for example, the enter raffle from a previous lesson, I go click to see more, and we can see the method ID or the function selector here, enter raffle is gonna be this, and I can view this as the original, which shows the input data is just this, and I can go ahead, maybe I could go to the Sam CC Sun database, hit enter, it looks like this, sure enough, this function selector is for enter raffle, and we learned how to decode hex data, so we can actually make sure the transactions that we send in MetaMask are secure. Now is a perfect time to take a break, take some rest, go get some ice cream, go get some coffee, Tweet at me on Twitter because you're so excited that you learned all these super advanced methodologies. Just by you getting this far, I'm being 100% honest, you are better, you have learned some skills that even some top Solidity devs don't even know. So you are growing incredibly quickly and we're not even done. We've got a few more lessons left. We're gonna get to the most advanced section next, which is gonna be this Foundry DeFi stablecoin. I'm probably gonna combine these into one or two lessons instead of three, then upgrades, and then governance, and then introduction to security. But you are on your way to becoming a phenomenal smart contract developer. So take that break, you need it, you deserve it, and I'll see you in the next one.